hot that night. I wanted to grab a beer and turn in early. So what happens? I get my beer, but with it comes a gunshot, a beautiful woman in trouble, and murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime mystery, CBS presents his most famous character, brought to you now in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, Red Wind. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Angeles that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair and make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends in a fight and meek little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards on the ground glass of my office door. So I locked up and decided a nice cold beer would taste good before I went up to my apartment. Killer up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlow. Uh, Marlin. Yeah, Marlin's a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Marlin's also the name of a lady on the radio. Marlin, comma, Mary, the story of. Yeah, my wife listens to it. Oh, yeah, good for her. All right. Hey, you, bartender. Another ride. Yeah, that drunk again. What do you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Major Sappy. You hear? Be right with you, sport. Gotta draw this man a beer. Crying out loud, these stumble bums. Hey, Bud. You got another customer, Bacchus. Uh, hey, Bud, you seen a lady in here lately? A lady? A tall, good-looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, nobody like that, Spinion. All right, straight scotch fast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As the man drank, I noticed the drunk was grinning at him. And then, without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke. Very little. You other guys, don't move. So long, Waldo. Don't move, you two. Poor Waldo. I bet I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. Get on the phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. Too late. He drove away in the dead guy's car. Uh, maybe he ain't dead. No, he's dead all right. Oh. That guy was using a twenty two target pistol. Yeah. When they use that kind of gun, they don't make mistakes. Where's your phone? This uh, is for the police. Uh, Prowl car boys were there in five minutes. Waldo was out of business all right. Nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. With that kind of heavy coin, you can buy a good 1910 automobile even today. Well, I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's brown-haired pretty girl in the bolero jacket. It was about 9 o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a brown-haired pretty girl in a bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. What is I'm it? a great admirer of bolero jackets. What? Now, take the one you've got on, for instance. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. No, 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 wait. If you'll be good enough to let me... Bu- oh, you've made me miss the elevator. It's just as well. What? Well, it's better you don't go out in those clothes. Just what do you mean? Tall, good-looking, bolero jacket, blue silk dress. Mm-hmm. Lady, 
Might I take the trouble of telling you that you're in trouble? Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you. In those clothes. I haven't done anything. Maybe not. But if I were you, I'd have a little talk with me. We've all the I'm in nerve. room 41 across the hall. And I know things about you. Well. Good girl. Come along. It took a firm grip on her arm, but I managed to get her to my room. I rustled up some drinks, but when I turned to give her hers, I... I saw she held a small automatic. She looked at me steadily. I put down both glasses slowly so I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, I I, I know it's hot tonight and heat does funny things to people, but uh, let's put that little thing away and have a nice cool drink, huh? Don't move. Oh, I'm strictly frozen in my tracks. Stay that way. Okay, okay. But wouldn't you like to know that I'm a private detective? Private detective? I can prove it if you'll let me. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I don't like those things pointed at me. I'll have that drink. Oh, good. I don't often give good liquor away like this. I can't afford it. Why are they after me? Well, a man was just shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket. What did he look like, this man? Oh, he was tall, about 5'11". Slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter. Dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you early at night to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? He used to be my... My chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? I... He asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell him. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Waldo to steal. Fifteen thousand dollars. Peanuts. But it wasn't the value. You see, it meant something to me. The man I loved gave it to me. And now he's dead. He was shot down over Germany. Now go back and tell my husband that. He'll, he probably hired you. He did? How much is he paying me? And uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. He's a hydroelectric engineer. Never mind about him. What about Waldo? Why was he knocked off? You mean he's dead? Waldo is dead? Yes, yeah, sister, he's dead. Very dead. Oh. Screaming won't bring him back. I'm not going to scream. Who would that be? There's a dressing room behind the door. Hide there. Take your glass with you. All right, all right. I went to the door, making a loud, yawning sound. Foolishly, I didn't have my gun. That was a mistake. Because when I opened the door, the guy on the other side certainly had one. A twenty-two target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head, the flat, shiny eyes, and the face like a poisonous lizard... Well, he put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I backed into the room and Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. What did Waldo do to you? Who's asking? Just making conversation. He stooled on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan Penn. How is he? Dead. <laughs> well, I'm still good. Drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the bar keeping me talking. I told him my name and where I lived. Hmm. That's how, pal. I said why. Skip it. The hangman won't ask you to guess why he's there. You're pretty tough at that, ain't you, pal? But you're slamming off. All right. But uh, could you get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else? Just any place. This better? This suits you all right? It's just so it is in my neck. Say when, pal. It's your party. I leaned against the gun weakly. The door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little in spite of the heat. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her irises. She was scared. She had a gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead Sorry. She'd try to make the door a scream. Either way, it would be curtains for both of us. Scared, mister? Worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Baldy. 
and her horrified face was drifting toward us. My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? You ready yet? Say the word. Well, don't take all night about it. If you're going to do something about it, do it. Why not, pal? I like this. Suppose I yell. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Put up Go your ahead. hand. Hey, look. Oh. Oh. Thanks, sister. Advise me. Everything I have is yours, now and forever. Is, is he dead? You flatter me, no end, lady. I only punched him. Now get out of here while I call the yes. cops down on this killer. Yes. Good night. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That jacket marks you for the cops. Leave it here. You don't need it in this kind of weather. Oh, yes, here. Okay. See you again. Why? I don't know. Who am I to be the rival of a dead flyer and things like that? Now, on second thought, forget the whole thing. I'll see that the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. Yeah? You mean me? Yes, please. Oh, you again. Get in. I want to talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters? Yes. I went down to headquarters with the law and gave him the story. I left you out of it. Oh, thanks. And you saved my life. So no one knows anything about you. Incidentally, neither do I. My name is Mrs. Frank Barsley. 212 Fremont Place. Olympia 24596. Is that what you wanted? I guess so. Well, there it is. Now, where'd you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Oh, no. Pearls, too? Yes. All right, tell me about the pearls. <laughs> We've had a murder, a beautiful mystery woman, and a sadistic killer, and an heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from the man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets. There weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? It's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do, in this apartment house. And why didn't I know him, at least by sight? Well, he just moved in last week. He managed to get a sublet. Sort of amateur magician on the side, huh? It's, uh, getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. Good. Why did you say that? I didn't have any answers. We just sat there looking at one another. I was suddenly aware of the hot desert wind stirring up the night. I took hold of her and I kissed her. She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. Oh, I wasn't always this way. Only since Johnny Dalmas was killed in the war. He gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them. With a diamond propeller clasp. <laughs> I'd have loved them if they were wooden beads because he gave them to me. I loved Johnny. The way you love just one time. You understand that? Yes, I can. What I don't understand is how you could explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband. I told him they were imitation. That I bought them myself. How did Waldo latch onto them and what they stood for? When my husband was in Argentina, Waldo and I would go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together. But that was all. But you confided in Waldo about those pearls. Yes. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you. He'd tell Papa. Oh, I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment? I suppose it's a lot to ask. I've been paid. I'll go look. Wait here. Was I gone long, no. Lola? Well? No. 
No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. Man? Who? You know a guy named Leon Velasanos? No, not by name. I don't know him. Mexican, South American, about 45, small, iron-gray hair, very neat. Fawn-colored suit, wine-colored tie. No, I don't think I know such a man. You say he was in the room? Yeah. What did he say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He was dead. You are listening to the adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by one of America's most outstanding writers of crime and mystery fiction, Raymond Chandler. Our story for today, The Red Wind, continues in just a moment. But first, a message of interest for all young men. How would you like to be up there in the wild blue sky, flying America's mightiest bombers, fastest fighters, and newest jet jobs? Believe me, it's a great feeling to know that you have the skill, the courage it takes to become a pilot officer in the United States Air Force, the Air Force that's second to none. Keep your eye on the local newspapers and your nearest Army Air Force recruiting station. An aviation cadet recruiting team will be in your community soon. If you're between the ages of 20 and 26 and a half years of age, single and a high school graduate, plan to see the aviation cadet interviewing team. If you pass the mental and physical examination, you'll be accepted for the 52-week aviation cadet training program. When you graduate, you'll be a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force, the mightiest of all. And now, back to the adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore as our star, we continue today's adventure. I sat with Lola Bosley in her car, listening to the hot wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Waldo's room in a very dead condition. I held her hands until they stopped trembling, and then I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun in a shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could set up in business with a gun. Someone? You mean Waldo? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars ahead of us? Oh, it's been there for hours. It's there before I parked here to wait for you. Well, Leon, the guy in Waldo's room, came in that car. But according to the key container he carried, it isn't his car. Well, whose car is it? And does it matter? Yeah, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the car keys. Eugenie Kolchenko, West Los Angeles. I've never heard of her. Mm-hmm. Well, you better go home now. What are you going to do? Uh, drive that flossy convertible around and wave at my friends. <laughs> Impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date. What is it, please? Miss Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes. What is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Oh, don't be alarmed. I found it. Brought it home to you. Oh, come in, please. Uh, it is a reward you wish. Shall we say... Snap out of a dragon, lady. Who was he? Who was who? A little guy. Leon, you loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? Oh, no. No. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, my dear? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about a car? Well, the gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. He's dead, darling. He is dead. That's putting it more bluntly, of course. Dead, huh? Yeah, completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Mm. Have you told the police yet? Never do at once what can be profitably deferred pending negotiation. Aesop. I might negotiate. Peachy. Just what do you know, Marlowe? Well, a man named of Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happen to have the insight as to who he was, and when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leon Velasanos dead. He wouldn't have had $500 and 20s on him, would he? No. But this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed in that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Mm. Is there a basis for negotiation yet? Very well, Marlowe. There were certain bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But, darling, you told me I might charge to your account. All right, my dear, so I wasn't bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the bills safely in my briefcase. Somehow, this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. 
I hired Leon, gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's coupons, was forced to kill Leon in the process. Then he went out to keep another date and walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down. Huh? And somebody still has those bills and I'm in for a divorce suit, huh? Mm. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it, could be. Cops caught him. And the police have the briefcase? Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crimes, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. I have a friend or two at headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth $500 to me, Marlowe. Then that's what it'll cost you. All right. Good luck and thank you, Mr... Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember? Marlowe. My name is Frank Barsley. Barsley? Oh. And just what does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer. Yeah. Yes, how'd you know? Never mind. May I use your telephone? Someday I must tell you about Ibarra. Now he's a salt of the earth, Ibarra. Detective lieutenant over at Central Homicide. Well, I phoned Ibarra from Miss Kolchenko's house and told him where he could find a well-dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibarra time to check my tip and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Yeah, I thought Waldo might have had them up there. Whose pearls were they? The ladies. Go on. Or they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Yeah. What? Yeah. They might have. Yeah. Also, a batch of bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Bosley. Yeah. The police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They want to prevent or solve crimes, right? So? So, I've got $500 for the police fund. Mm. If those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. Quit your kidding. It's a valuable necklace. Yeah. There's your necklace. Take it away. On the level, Ibarra? Just tell me straight what it's all about. All I ask. Sure, sure. Well, you see, this Waldo was blackmailing a wife with the pearls and her husband with the bills. Mm -hmm. Bosley, that's the guy's name, sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Waldo killed him and then stepped out and got nailed by that guy in the bar he'd stool pigeoned against once. Mm -hmm. Well, if Bosley's name stays out of the papers, I get 500 bucks. It goes to the police fund. Thanks. We'll keep him out. I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. Sure. And like you say, Marlowe, the police aren't in business to sling mud. Look, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, you better take them to her, Marlowe. You see, except for that diamond propeller clasp on them, they're phony. Phony? But look, Marlowe, I know pearls. Real pearls feel gritty between the teeth. These are hard and glassy. Try. Yeah. Yeah. They're phony. All but the clasp, Marlowe. All but the clasp. I took the pearls and had them appraised the next morning at a gilt edge place in Beverly Hills. Phony all but the clasp. <laughs> An imitation as good as these couldn't have been made that fast. These were the pearls that Waldo had stolen. I took the glass pearls to a dive on Melrose and had them duplicated for $20. I had the jeweler attach the diamond clasp to the $20 duplicate string of pearls. Then I called up Lola. Hello, Lola. Okay, you're in? Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Yes, it's okay here. I have a string of pearls for you. Oh, really, Philip? Really, did you get... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Lola. Waldo was getting set to jip you. We sold the real pearls and made up a string with the diamond clasp. Sure. Meet me at four at Nikolaev's. Nikolaev's at four. I'll be there. There you are, Lola. These are the pearls the police found in Waldo's car. You were right. They're not my pearls. I'm sorry, Lola. No. I still have the clasp that Johnny gave me. Well, I'm happy if you are. <laughs> happy? No, not quite happy. See, this morning my husband told me we're to separate. No, I'm very sorry, Lola. You've been very kind. That's all right. 
This is goodbye, I suppose. Yeah. You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas. Goodbye, Lola. And if anybody ever bothers you again, let me know, huh? Name's Marlowe. Philip Marlowe. I'll remember. Philip Marlowe. I drove almost to Malibu, and then I parked, and then I walked way out on a rock cliff jutting into the Pacific Ocean. And then I reached into my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra had found in Waldo's car. <laughs> I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. Should have seen the gulls swoop down on them. Then they flapped up again, screaming indignantly. Phony pearls. They'd fooled Waldo and Lola Barsley. But they couldn't fool a seagull. I said aloud, To the memory of Johnny Delmas, just another four-flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once I realized that the wind had died. The Santa Ana had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. It was cool again. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. In tonight's story, Red Wind, Lola was played by Peggy Weber, and Barry Kroger was Baldy. Joan Banks played Eugenie Kolchenko, Jeff Corey was Lieutenant Ibarra, Parley Bear was Barsley. Lou Krugman was Waldo, and Wilms Herbert played the bartender. The special music was conceived and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Philip Marlowe will be back in just a moment. Young man, be a Marine. Combine travel, adventure, and education at no expense to yourself. When you're a Marine, you can travel to the far places of the earth and carry on at the same time your own educational program through free Marine Corps Institute correspondence courses. You have plenty of courses to choose from, and an ideal way of studying geography or history is to take a course dealing with the background of the area in which you are stationed or any of the more than 160 Marine Corps Institute courses. Thanks to this Marine Corps Institute, thousands of Marines are making continual educational advancements during their service in the U.S. Marine Corps. That opportunity upon becoming a U.S. Marine is yours for the asking. Check with your nearest Marine Corps recruiting office tomorrow for complete information. <laughs> Next week at this same time, be sure to tune in for another adventure of Philip Marlowe when Marlowe says, I was low, very low the night I set out searching for the girl with the strange hazel eyes. The fog which hung over Los Angeles didn't help. And I felt even worse when I found her. For by then I had death on my hands. <laughs> If you like your laughs mingled with spicy music, be around tomorrow to hear the premiere of Alka-Seltzer Time, featuring Herb Schreiner and Raymond Scott's quintet. There'll be guest stars, too. 
Here's a show that's guaranteed to keep Monday from being blue. It's coming your way Mondays through Fridays over most of these CBS stations. So consult your local newspaper for the time of Alka-Seltzer time. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I felt low, very low the night I set out searching for the girl with the strange hazel eyes. The fog which hung over Los Angeles didn't help. And I felt even worse when I found her. For by then I had death on my hands. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Barlow, we bring you tonight's gripping story, The Persian Slippers. One of those thin, chilly fogs had sneaked in from the Pacific and it hung vaguely to the streetlights along the Sunset Strip. It was a kind of a fog that you could see through, but everything was out of focus. It made you start wondering what you were going to do when you were 90 and you were all alone. I'd have liked to have spent the night in a room full of noisy extroverts playing charades. But instead, I had to eat a quick dinner and drive up into the secluded Hollywood Hills to meet a guy. A guy who had nothing but trouble on his mind. When I pushed the buzzer, I had the feeling of wishing I was someplace else. Carl Delaney himself opened the door. He was grim and brusque and to the point. Marlowe? That's right. Come in, Marlowe. I appreciate this. You're coming up here after business hours, I mean... I wouldn't have asked, except, uh, well, perhaps I've waited too long as it is. Sit down. Thanks. Waited too long for what, Mr. Delaney? Thirty-six hours ago, my wife disappeared. Marla, you've got to find her for me. Find her just as fast as you can. Wait a minute. Disappeared, you said. Would you mind playing that part back a little slower? Norma simply walked out that door, got in her car, and drove off to get hold of herself, as she always does when we've quarreled. And always before, she's come back in an hour or so. This time... This time she simply didn't come back, is that it? Look, Mr. Delaney, I could... You'd uh... better let me finish before you do anything. Lately, my wife has been brooding over something, something serious that she refused to discuss. I've caught her crying several times, and she's not a woman given to tears. Marlowe, I'm sure that unless we move fast, when we do find her, we're going to find her dead. Suicide? Yeah. Yeah. With his thick, blunt hand, Delaney reached for a color portrait lying face down on the table and gave it to me. I looked and saw the face of a dream. A beautiful dream with strange hazel eyes and soft black hair. I felt Delaney watching me as I glanced up in time to catch the fading end of a very ugly expression on his face. I handed the picture back to him and he laid it on the table again, face down. Then he took me upstairs to Norma's room. It was a nice, frilly room, typically haunted by elusive, sweet smells. There was only one incongruous note. What was the horoscope doing on her desk? From the looks of a picture, I knew that Norma was attractive enough that she didn't need to look to the stars for a future. A horoscope? Yeah, you know how women are. Marlowe, will you find her for me? Well, I'll try. My rate is $25 a day plus expenses. And remember, you hired me to find her, not bring her back. Fair enough. You just find her. I'll be satisfied. Hmm. I'll need a starting point. Were there any phone calls or letters or anything that might be a lead? What about friends? We have no close friends. Norma always stayed to herself. Wait, uh, there was a phone call yesterday from, uh, Madame Jeanette, I think it was. Who's that, a dressmaker? I haven't any idea. She wanted to speak to Mrs. Delaney. I told her Norma was out, and she asked that my wife call her when she got back. That's all there was to it. Anything else you can tell me? No. Uh, no, it's not much to go on. Well, that's what I can do, Mr. Delaney. I'll be here all night, Marlowe. Call me if you need anything. Yeah, I'll do that. Good night. I drove back through the persistent fog to Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, it was 9.30. I knew it was going to be like tracking a hummingbird through the petrified forest by the bent twigs, but 
I got a classified directory and I started digging. I checked the hairdressers, the manicurists, and the milliners, and I was just about to start on the interior decorators when I remembered the horoscope on Norma's desk. I quickly turned to the personal consultants. Yeah, there it was. Madame Jeanette. Her establishment, located in a dubious neighborhood south of Olvera Street, turned out to be a tacky cottage set back next to an alley. It was as dark inside as out. I was pounding on the door like a vampire at sunrise when a newsboy came up the path. Looking for Madame Jeanette? Yeah, yeah, you know her? Sure, she tells fortunes. Says I've got a great career line. You want to see it? Not right now, thanks. And I'll say for her that she's a sound sleeper. Maybe, but not so early as this. About this time, she's always hanging around that bar on the corner. Tonight, she's throwing a farewell party in there. Farewell party? Who for? Herself. She's leaving town. Oh, thanks a lot. Here, kid. Gee, a buck. My old man will start up and shooting crap again. Give me another one, Charlie. Not every night I say goodbye to my dear old neighborhood. Muscatellian, Jeanette? Yeah. Did I say dear old neighborhood, Charlie? I think you did, Jeanette. Must have had one too many then. Because of all the low, flea bitten row of shacks I ever lived in, this is the new low. Ah, oh, Jeanette, that's no way to talk. You hurt my feelings. Pinky. There ain't nothing like a little beer to soothe her feelings. <laughs> yeah, you said it. Jeanette, can I have another? Huh? Yeah. Charlie, give Pinky another. Now, this is his last. The last? I thought you said it was a farewell party. Hey, you with all your dough. This does to get me out of this rat trap of a town, see? It's the last I want to see out of it in all my life, see? Yeah, 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 Another must see. tell, Charlie. Uh, hold on a minute, Jeanette. Hey, what'll it be, mister? Something just a bit drier than Muscatel. Say, Scotch? It's on me, mister. It's my party. Well, well, this is indeed a pleasure. You're the Madame Jeanette, aren't you? Yeah, why? You're all of 20 years younger than what I expected. Probably the life I lead. Hey, wait a minute. Why should you be expecting anything about me? I don't know you. Perhaps not, but I know you. From where? Oh, you're more famous than you think. Your reputation is spread far beyond Old Vera Street. In fact, it's gone up as far as the Sunset Strip, Madam Jeanette. No kidding. How would you kid a fortune teller? Don't you know all, see all, and tell all? Well... And judging from that Spanish shawl, your Hungarian skirt, and those embroidered Persian slippers, I'm beginning to think your fame is not only local, but international. Say, you're beginning to make me feel like I shouldn't be giving up this racket after all. Giving up fortune-telling? No. Yeah. I'm leaving town on the midnight train. Going to spread my talents all over the East, and I'm not coming back. Don't tell me your crystal ball has laid a golden egg. So to speak, yeah. I come into some lettuce. Suddenly. That's always nice. Well, I guess it means you won't be interested in the few paltry dollars I'd intended to spend with you. Hey, can I have another beer? Shut you? up, pinky blow. Ah, oh, just a... Traveling lady can always use a little extra moolah. What was it you wanted, bud? I'm looking for someone. Norma Delaney. Norma De... I'm afraid I don't know anybody by that name. I'm afraid you do. What's your angle? Who are you, anyway? I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective. Some private dick you must be to have resort to fortune tellers. Come on, Jeanette. Look into your crystal muscatel. See if you can spot Norma Delaney. I told you once. I don't know the name. Now, blow. Just a minute, Dark Eyes. Hey, Charlie. Yeah? This bird's crabbing my party. What kind of a joint is this, anyway? Lady can't sit here and have a farewell party without being insulted by every jerk that drops in. Well, mister... I haven't finished my drink yet. You got pockets, ain't you? Just pour a drink into one of them and take it along. You ain't finishing it here. Charlie reached under the bar for his pick handle, so I left without pursuing the subject further. But I knew Jeanette was lying right in her purple lipstick about Norma. I walked back to my car, lit a cigarette, and spent a few precious minutes trying to decide whether or not to break into her place and snoop. Then I caught the shadow of a figure slipping up on me from behind. I turned. Wait, wait, don't swing, Mac. Don't swing. It's only me, Pinky. I, I was in the bar when you was talking to the madam. That tight wad, Jeanette. Yeah, I saw you, so? She did something the minute you left. <laughs> I figured you might like to know what it was. That all depends. 
Well, I, I thought it might be worth something to you, like a saw, maybe. Come on, you no. spill it! Wait a minute, spill wait, it! Wait. If it's any good at all, it's worth a five or no more. Oh, all right, all right. She, she made a phone call. Who to? What'd she say? Nothing. Just some swear words in Spanish. The line was busy. <laughs> but I, I kept my eyes open and I got the number. All right, let's have it. If you can still remember it. Oh, I can remember it easy. Uh, five of first, huh? Here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the number was Crenshaw, 1929. <laughs> Don't you get it? <laughs> like the year of the big crash. <laughs> Thanks to the thirst of an underweight lush, I wasn't at the end of my rope yet. I drove as far as the nearest drugstore, dropped a nickel in the slot, and died. Crenshaw, the year of the big crash. Hello? Hello, let me speak to Norman Delaney, please. I'm afraid you must have the wrong number. Look, you, I'm trying to locate Mrs. Delaney. I suggest you help me. How did you get this number? From a client, Mr. Carl Delaney. But that's impossible. Let's stop sparring. We can save each other a lot of wear and tear if we get together and talk this over. Maybe you're right. Yes, that sounds sensible. I'm at the Beachwood Apartments, number four. Check. I'll be right out. Mr. Uh, Pierre Gillum, it says here on the door. Yes. You the man who called? Uh Uh-huh. Philip Marlowe. Come in, won't you? You said you were looking for Norma Delaney, Mr. Marlowe. Tell me what's wrong. Has anything happened to her? Well, her husband seems to think she might have killed herself, but I have a hunch that you might have something interesting to say. No, poor kid. Poor Norma. Well, I'll tell you what I can, Marlowe, but it isn't much. Oh, I'm all ears, and I'll sit. Thanks. Well, I was in love with Norma once, briefly, a long time ago. She was a wonderful girl, but her husband was insanely jealous. Mm-hmm. Even though she hadn't loved him for years, he refused to give her up. He even threatened to kill her first. Oh? Norma and I realized that serious trouble lay ahead, so we parted. Good friends. And I haven't seen her or heard from her in months. I buy it all but the last line. You have seen or heard from her, and recently... I'm not going to argue that. I've told you the truth. You can take it or leave it. I leave it. I suppose we both put our cards on the table. You lied to me when you said Carl Delaney gave you my number. I know because Madame Jeanette called me shortly after you did. Touche. But uh, why did she run to call you at the mention of Norma's name if you two broke up months ago? And incidentally, how did that ersatz oracle Jeanette get mixed up in this in the first place? That is a long story, Marlowe. Good, I like long stories. I'll bet it begins just for a lock. Norma and I went down to Olvera Street once to have our palms read. Yes, that's exactly how it started. <laughs> Madame Jeanette was an unusual woman, a, a character, you might say. Uh-huh. Well, we became friendly with her. Norma got quite sentimental about her. One day we made a sort of uh, pact. If ever either of us was in trouble and needed the other, we'd go to Madame Jeanette or get a message to her. She would notify the other. So and... when I walked in asking for Norma, the madam assumed she was in trouble. Right, right. Called me immediately because she herself was leaving town in less than an hour. I know. Well, Mr. Gillum, it's all very interesting, but it's getting me no place. Thanks. If I need you oh, again... Oh, no, no, wait, Marla, don't go. Hmm? Uh, I know a lot of details about Norma that, uh, that I'm sure will be helpful. Uh, for instance, she, she drives a Nash Coupe, a powder blue. Powder blue coupe, huh? Thanks, that'll help. Oh, and and uh, she has a fondness for white gloves. Wears them quite often. I see. Well, I better get moving. No, no, no. Wait just a minute, Marlowe. I've got to go. Now, listen, Marlowe. I told you I was in a hurry. Now, take it easy. Stick around a while. Get away from that door. Well, just who do you think you are? Come busting in here, prying, asking questions, you dirty... Oh! You asked for it, Gillum. Ah, uh, oh! You got a left, too, huh? So have I, brother. Uh. Gillum sprawl all over his coffee table as limp as a five-cent salad. Outside, I glanced at my watch. Madame Jeanette's train left in 40 minutes. I ran through 22 bucks worth of red lights getting down to a cottage because I was sure Gillum's attempted stall was tied in with a departure, but I couldn't figure out why. 
That is, I couldn't until I switched out my lights and coasted to a stop in front of her place. Then I saw it. Half hidden in the shadows back of the house sat a powder blue coupe. I got up on the porch close to the front door and listened. Jeanette was talking to a woman. I couldn't catch what they were saying, but one thing was certain. The woman was Norma Delaney. All at once I realized the talk had stopped. That was my cue. I shoved open the door and went in. Jeanette sat at a table alone, facing me. Well, Mr. Marlowe, you've returned. What is it this time? I'd like my fortune told. Yeah? Now, listen close, Gumshoe. I'll make this a short and snappy reading because I'm catching a train in 15 minutes. There's a woman very close to you. In fact, she's right behind you, sucker! What? No! again, nothing changed. It took me a long time to figure out that the lights were off and it was dark. I climbed up the table leg hand over hand and switched on a lamp. Jeanette's house was absolutely quiet. I had caught a glimpse of a white glove holding what is known as a blunt instrument just before I dozed off. And that reminded me what I was down here for. I wobbled through the kitchen and out the back door, but the powder blue coupe was gone. It was 12.15. My head and the fog both had gotten a little thicker. So I just stood there, useful like a ping-pong ball in a bowling alley. It was the sound of footsteps that finally moved me, and the newsboy was back. Well, hi again, mister. Did you ever get a hold of Madame Jeanette before she left? Yeah, yeah, but not tight enough. Say, a blue coupe left here a few minutes ago. Did you see it? Nope, I did. Gee, I'm sure sorry she went away. She gave me a buck tonight, too. Said she was coming into a fortune. Hey, you and your career like... Say, what's that down there, in those weeds? I don't know. It looks like some kind of a shoe. Yeah. Yeah, it is a shoe. Here, see? What do you know? A Persian slipper. I took the slipper along as a souvenir for my scrapbook and walked back to my car trying to fit Norma Delaney's lovely hazel eyes in with that crack on the skull. But I couldn't. Between throbs of my headache, I figured Pierre Gillum would know why Norma had dropped in on Adam so close to train time. I decided to go back and ask him. <laughs> Gillum was as reliable as a two-headed quarter and just as tricky. So when I got to his apartment, I pushed the buzzer, stepped back, and braced myself. But there was no fight left in it. He opened the door in his robe, fingered the mouse I had given him, and grinned. Oh, so you found your way out by yourself. Uh-huh. Say, Gillum, what was so important about Norma seeing Madame Jeanette just before her train left? I don't know. Uh, you knew enough to try to keep me here to delay me? Why? Oh, Marlowe, I did that for old time's sake for an old friend. Jeanette asked me to hold you here until midnight, and I tried my best. <laughs> Obviously wasn't good enough. Well, that's all I know about it. I see your phone is off the hook. Do you know that? Yeah, I took it off. It's given me nothing but trouble tonight. I hereby wash my hands of this whole business. I'm going to bed. And I hope to sleep. Good night. I envied him and left to call my client, Carl Delaney. He said he'd be in all night, but the phone kept ringing and ringing and no one answered. I suddenly got a very creepy feeling. And Twenty minutes later, I pulled to a stop at that small but elegant house. The lights were on, and I saw the powder blue coupe in the garage next to Carl's big black sedan. I ran up the steps. The front door was ajar, so I went in. I found Carl Delaney in front of the fireplace, face down on the floor, dead. There was a handbag on a chair. I opened it, compact cigarettes and a key to room 340 in the Bradford Arms Hotel. No identification. That color portrait of Norma was standing up on the table this time, and those searching hazel eyes seemed to follow me all the way to the telephone. Lieutenant Ibarra speaking. Bill Marlowe, Ibarra. 
There's a dead one at 1077 Hollycrest Road. Named Carl Delaney. Murdered. I'll be right out. I hung up the phone and then the hair on my neck crawled as I heard the unmistakable sound of a woman's heels on the floor upstairs. I ducked behind a door as the heels clicked down the steps. And then she entered the room. Norma Delaney was lovely. As lovely as a picture. She moved calmly and deliberately. Put a note on the table, picked up the handbag. And then turned to face the door I was hiding behind. You can come out now, Mr. Marlowe. Hello, Mrs. Delaney. You can call me Norma now. And if you're thinking of using your gun, perhaps you'll be good enough to read this note first. Here. To whom it may concern... I, Norma Delaney, purposely and with premeditation, shot and killed my husband, Carl. It is beyond me to express how deeply I hate him, and since I must pay for this and cannot endure a public spectacle, I shall take my own life within the next few minutes. Now, look, Norma, no guns. Easy, Marlowe. I'll kill you if necessary. But it would be so pointless now. I'm free at last, and I want to spend a little time left to me in my own way. Norma, if you'll listen to me, Stay just back. a minute... Tonight I made my only friend, Madame Jeanette, happy. And I killed a man who needed killing. Something good. Something bad. So I'm quitting, even up. What do you propose to do with me? You mustn't try to stop me, Marlowe. See that closet? Mm-hmm. Get inside. And careful how you move your hands. Turn around to the wall. That's it. Marlowe, I'm sorry I had to hit you with Jeanette's tonight. Goodbye. It took three shots to smash the lock on that closet door. I heard her driving away just as I got it open. In spite of what she'd said, I couldn't let her kill herself. I ran outside to my car. One glance under the hood was all it took. There was nothing left of the wiring but loose ends. I ran into the street and a miracle happened. The first time in my life, a taxi in Los Angeles when I wanted it. I'm sorry, fella. I'm going to call. Skip it. This is an emergency. Hey, wait a minute. You Police can't... business. A girl is driving up the road in a blue coupe. we got to catch her before she kills herself. Let's go. Think I saw a taillights just then. Yeah? Can't you go any faster? Not on these curves, brother. I got a wife and kids. Okay, fella. We'll be at the top of the hill when we can get around the next bend. We should spot her then. Yeah. You can see the whole road down the other side. Here we are, mister. This is the top. But I don't see her. Where is she? Hey, wait a minute. Stop here. Turn up your motor. This is haywire. I don't get it. We were gaining on her, and now she just disappears. Hey, what's that? Motor. That side road we passed. That's it. Hey, look. Look! Holy smoke. We both saw the awful sight for just an instant. A powder blue coupe with a woman crouched over the wheel. It shot out of that side road, crashed through the guardrail, and fell end over end down into the gorge. By the time we got to the hole in the fence, the wreck was an inferno. Well, no use trying to get down there. The whole hillside will be on fire in another minute. I guess she pulled over here into the side road and waited for us to go by. And we did. Yeah. It's Sandy here, too. It's a wonder she didn't get stuck. What's the matter? There's something buried here in the sand. One of her tires ran over it. What is it? Why, it's... It's plenty, brother. Come on, turn that hack of yours around. Let's get off this mountain. I just found the answer to a lot of questions. <laughs> Yeah, Lieutenant. We found the body and the wife's suicide note. And one of the boys spotted that fire up on the hill. What is it? Car went off the road. An accident? Or the suicide? Just a little of both, Ibarra, but we'll talk later. Right now, we got to go to the Bradford Arms Hotel on the double. And please, no siren. The 
I put on was a three-story walk-up. When we got there, he borrowed a station one man in front, sent another to cover the back, and we started up the stairs. We had reached the second floor when we saw him on the landing above. Kill him. He spotted us at the same time and turned back fast. There, Marlow. Who's that? That's our boy, Bar up here. Gillum, let's go. There he goes. He's heading for the fire escape. Second Lieutenant, he's all yours. I got business the other way. Hey! Hey, you stop or I shoot! <laughs> Room 336, 38, ah, 340. All over now. You've dropped the gun. Please, it's been neat so far. Don't mess it up. Come on, beautiful, drop it. That's better. Well, Marlow, I got him. I had to wing him to bring him down, but here he is. And uh, the lady must be... Uh... Yes, Lieutenant. The lady is Norma Delaney. The girl who wanted to kill her jealous husband and then commit suicide, but didn't want to die doing it. So she used someone else's body, Madame Jeanette's, which was a logical choice because Jeanette was blackmailing her. Thus two vultures with one stone leaving two lovebirds free to fly away together. Right, Norma? Didn't you give Madame Jeanette money so she'd leave town and tell everybody she was going away? Yes, I did. That way the body wouldn't be missed, huh? Yeah. Isn't it pretty? Oh, lay off, Marlowe, can't you? Okay, Gillum, okay. Ellie Barra, I've got a sour taste in my mouth. I think I'll go home and goggle. Anything else you need? No, I guess not, Phil. I've had all that's necessary. Uh, wait. Just one thing. How'd you get inside this setup? How'd you find out it was the dead Madame Jeanette who went over the cliff instead of the very much alive Mrs. Delaney here? Well, Jeanette had on a pair of Persian slippers, Lieutenant. One fell off down at her cottage where Norma murdered her and put her in the trunk of the car. The other one fell off in the sand of that side road when she took Jeanette out of the trunk and propped her up behind the wheel. (laughs) Was lucky, Burra. Just dumb luck. I took a walk later, a long walk, all by myself, through that thin, empty fog in the dark, empty streets. A pair of hazel eyes and a pair of Persian slippers went round and round in my head. And for some reason, I kept thinking, a pair of Persian slippers has two soles and two heels, and it's hard to tell just exactly where the one becomes the other. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. In tonight's story, The Persian Slippers, Virginia Gregg was heard as Madame Jeanette, with Larry Dobkin as Pierre Gillum and Louis Van Ruten as Carl Delaney. The additional players were Gene Bates as Norma Delaney, Gil Stratton Jr. as the newsboy, Frank Richards as the barkeep, and Tony Barrett as Pinky. Detective Lieutenant Barrow was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again next week at this same time when Philip Marlowe says... Sounded good, real good. A weekend at Malibu, expenses paid with a cash bonus thrown in. But that was before I knew about the henchman, the redhead, and the corpse. These three and a white Panama hat ruined it all for me. The big star-studded array of CBS Sunday shows starts tonight. One, two, three, four, five top entertainment programs that make listening to your CBS station a happy habit. One, Cabin B-13... The popular dramatic show by John Dixon Carr, renowned mystery writer. Two, the new electric theater, guest starring Henry Fonda tonight. And regularly starring Helen Hayes, first lady of the theater when she returns from London. Three, Our Miss Brooks, the hilarious comedy success starring Eve Arden. Four, Lum and Abner, a brand new half-hour show of smiles and chuckles with the merchants of Pine Ridge. Five, Strike It Rich. The sensational quiz show with a heart to wind up the sparkling parade of entertainment. Mystery, drama, comedy, excitement tonight over most of these CBS stations. And next Sunday, the first broadcast in the new season for two of radio's greatest stars, Amos and Andy. Yes, Sunday nights are great on CBS.
Check your local newspapers for program times. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sounded good, real good. A weekend at Malibu, expenses paid with a cash bonus thrown in. But that was before I knew about the henchman, the redhead, and the corpse. These three and a white Panama hat ruined it all for me. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, The Panama Hat. I was sitting in my office bombing the ashtray on my desk with paper clips, wondering what kind of a job a private detective gets when clients stop calling completely. I was seesawing between the picture of me as a well-starched huckster and the more comfortable portrait of Marlowe, author in English tweeds, man of distinction. And the telephone brought me to a rude awakening. Marlowe speaking. My name is Isabel Gordon, Mr. Marlowe. I must see you at once. My husband Bruce is in terrible danger. Could you possibly meet me in an hour at the Pelican Inn? It's a small roadside place on the way to Malibu. I'll explain everything then. Pelican Inn, one hour, Mrs. Gordon. The Pelican Inn was strictly a liquor license with chairs And a bored piano player in one corner grinding away The place was empty and I was about to order a drink When the front door opened and a woman entered She was tall and thin and right out of Harper's Bazaar From double ankle strap shoes to close cropped hair One look at her fear crowded eyes And I knew it was Isabel Gordon I got up and introduced myself Then we went to a table and she started to talk. For two weeks now, Mr. Marlowe, my husband Bruce has been receiving unsigned, threatening letters. I'm almost sick with worry. I I don't know what to do. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Gordon. The first thing to do is to get hold of yourself. And tell me the whole thing right from the beginning. Yes. All right. Well, first of all, Bruce and I have only been married a little more than a year. We're living with my uncle, Avery Fairchild, on an estate out beyond Malibu. I see. What does your husband do for a living, Mrs. Gordon? He's a photographer. Movie or commercial? Well, at present, it's neither. You see, Bruce has been terribly unsettled since the war. Lost, sort of, and mm-hmm. then recently he got interested in photography, and it's been a great help to him. But he doesn't exactly work at it. Huh? Well, he's converted one of the rooms in the guest cottage into a studio, and he spends almost all of his time there experimenting with portrait work. But he doesn't actually have a job, if that's what you mean. How does that appeal to your Uncle Avery? Oh, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Marlowe. My uncle thinks the sun rises and sets on me, but with Bruce... It's total eclipse, is that it? I'm afraid so. All his life, Uncle Avery has been concerned only with dollars and cents. He he simply doesn't understand or sympathize with an artist's viewpoint. Uh Now, what about these unsigned letters? Well, Bruce has been getting them for the past two weeks. They're always made up of words cut from newspapers and pasted on ordinary paper. That's a cheap stunt. What are they saying? Each one threatens my husband's life. Yet both he and Uncle Avery consider them nothing more than the work of some harmless crank. In spite of the fact that for the last several days I've seen a strange man lurking around our place every night. Can you describe him? No. No, except well, he's about your height and build. Is that all? Yes. No. I... Wait a minute. There is something else. Each time I saw him, Mr. Marlowe, he was wearing a white Panama. Well, that's not much to go on. Tell me, why haven't you called the police? Uncle Avery wouldn't hear of it. He hates publicity, dreads it. That's why I suggested contacting you, a private detective. That's sort of a bodyguard for Bruce, huh? Yes. However, Mr. Marlowe, Bruce is somewhat temperamental, and 
I know he'd rebel at the thought of being watched over, so I'd, I'd rather you posed as a, a house guest, an old college chum of mine, perhaps. My fee is 25 a day plus expenses, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, any price is all right, Mr. Marlowe. Let's see, it's a little after seven now. Can you be at our place at Malibu at nine? I think so. But as a fellow alumnus, Isabel, one last question. Where'd you go to college? Southern California. Why? Well, I was afraid you might say Vassar. <laughs> after Isabel left, I remembered that I was already on my expense account. So I had a tasteless, cold, hot, blue plate special and a burned cup of coffee. And I stepped out of the Pelican Inn and headed across the paved parking lot to my car. It was already dark. And I was admiring the full moon and the beautiful wash it made over the ocean when it happened. Hey, mister! What the... Are you all right, mister? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Thanks to your sounding off. That nut was aiming right for you. Yeah, yeah, it looks that way. Did you happen to get his number? No. What no, about his I face? Didn't. Can you describe him? No. Matter of fact, I, I only noticed one thing. What was that? The hat he was wearing. It was a white Panama. I tried to be broad-minded, but there was no other way to look at it. The gentleman in the white Panama hat definitely meant business. I returned to my apartment in Hollywood where I shaved, showered, and packed. And then I headed for Malibu. At a quarter to nine, I was inside the grounds of the Fairchild Estate. Another mile, and I was at the front door. When I entered, Isabel greeted me like I was a keg of brandy around a St. Bernard's neck. Then we waded through an inch-thick carpet to the library where Uncle Avery, fat, bald, and looking like he'd just bitten into an underripe persimmon, was waiting. I wasn't asked to sit down, and I wasn't offered a cigar. Avery Fairchild was not one to waste time. I'm a very rich man, Mr. Marlowe. As such, I'm the target for all kinds of fortune hunters, confidence men, and cranks. In my lifetime, I've been threatened and pestered by a score of crackpots, each one slightly more psychopathic than the last. It never bothered me, and it never will. However, in this case, the approach is a bit different. Meaning you think somebody's trying to get at you through your nephew, huh? Never refer to him as my nephew. My niece's husband, if you please. And don't forget it. Uncle Avery... Isabel, my feelings about your husband are no secret. You're being unfair, Uncle Avery. Just because Bruce is an artist and he... Artist, is he? Why, Isabel, that man's no more an artist than I am a horse jockey. Good evening, everybody. Hello, Bruce. Hello, darling. You were saying something, Uncle Avery? Bruce, um, I want you to meet Philip Marlowe. We were great friends at school, and when I heard he was in town for a while, I insisted that he spend a weekend with us. How do you do, Mr. Gordon? It's a pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Marlowe. You're very welcome. I do the welcoming around here, Bruce. Uh, Mr. Marlowe's had a long trip, and I'm certain he'd like to turn in early. Bruce, darling, he's going to stay in the guest cottage, the room next to your studio. Will you show him there, please? Oh, I'll be glad to. By the way, Isabella, I, I'm going to work late, so I'll say good night to you now. Good night, dearest. Good night, sweet. Please, please be careful. Yes, Bruce, by all means, be careful. Remember, the true artist belongs to posterity. Or something. The guest cottage was only a landscaped hop, skip, and a jump from the museum that Uncle Avery called home. And as Bruce and I strolled along a flagstone path, I feigned a deep interest in photography. That was all my host needed. He struck at the bait like a shark with malnutrition. Well, Mr. Milo, it didn't even occur to me that photography might be one of your hobbies. Isabel never said a word. Well, good for Isabel. I'm strictly a dabbler. Now tell me, Mr. Gordon, how long have you been at this? Portrait work? Mm. Oh, about six months. You see, I divide my time between my studio here and a school I attend in Hollywood. That way I capture both the theory and practical experience at the same time. Oh. Well, here we are. Would you like to see the studio? Yes, I would. Yeah, let me get the light. Well, this is all right, huh? And larger, two cameras, dark room. Are these your pictures? Yes. What do you think of them? Uh, I don't know exactly. They're certainly different, huh? They are unusual, aren't they? Yeah. You see, Marlo, each picture is actually made up of two separate studies which are superimposed. I call it uh, interpretive photography. Uh-huh. Now, uh, uh, this one. A splash of light and a bent pipe cleaner. The sun and the plant shoot. It's called metamorphosis. Oh. 
Well, what about that one there in the corner? The uh, girl's face and uh, clouds, maybe. Clouds, uh, Mr. Marlowe, you, you'll excuse me, but that picture isn't ready for display. Yet. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pry. I thought it was just another interpretive photograph. Well, it's not. That is, it, it isn't finished yet. Now, Mr. Marlowe, I'm afraid I've forgotten what my wife said about your long trip. Shall I show you to your room? Yes, please do, Mr. Gordon. My room on the other side of the guest cottage was wider than Hollywood Boulevard. After Bruce apologized for his display of temperament and bid me a polite good night, I climbed into the silk pajamas that were laid out for me, stretched out on the bed and tried to figure who belonged to the white Panama hat. About an hour passed, and I wasn't getting any sensible answers. So I switched out the light, put my gun on the table next to me, and snuggled into what felt like a mile and a half of mattress. I was almost asleep, and the clatter of a shovel falling on the walk outside brought me straight up in bed. I grabbed my gun and made for the door. But the second I threw it open, I knew that I'd made a mistake. Whoever kicked over that shovel had heard me and met me with a large fist that came straight at my face. Oh! As I came back into the world, I was embarrassed to find myself alone and flat on my back. When I started to get up, I felt like the L.A. Dons, water boy and all, had run over my face. My gun was a few feet away, and when I went to pick it up, I stopped short. It was a souvenir from the man with the great big fist. A gold cigarette lighter that was engraved to Skipper on his birthday. Putting it in my pocket, I picked up my gun and made for Bruce's studio. He wasn't there. I threw on some clothes and went back to the house and found Isabel in the living room. I was about to give her a biased account of the shortest fight on record when I noticed... Uncle Avery quietly entering the house from a side door that led to the garden. What's the matter, Phil? Bruce isn't in the studio anymore. What? Now, Isabel, there's no reason for alarm. Why, Bruce often goes off into the night like this. Calls it a search for beauty or some such rot. And what was it you were after just now outside, Mr. Fairchild? I was looking for my niece, Marlowe. Isabel... Your cousin John telephoned to say he wouldn't be down this weekend. Oh. I didn't know there were to be other guests. Oh, just my cousin, John Martin, Phil. Not really a guest. He comes down often. Uh, too often to suit oh, me. Oh, Uncle Avery, please. You know that I'm fond of him. Yes, but I don't know why. He's a chronic gambler and of no use to anyone. Living at the Wilshire Gardens when he can't afford it. Driving expensive cars. Oh, you're too hard on him. Skipper is Skipper? There. Yes. Do you know him? Uh, No. No, no, I don't. Well, you're not missing anything, believe me. Oh, I do believe you, Mr. Fairchild. I believe your every word. What? Good night, all. I left the house and headed straight for my car with the Wilshire Gardens in Hollywood in mind. It was just a chance that John Skipper Martin might own a white Panama hat. When I got to the prodigal cousin's bungalow, it was dark inside. So I pressed one hand close to my gun and the other against the door, though. There was no answer. The side window was open and I started toward it when a nasty voice greeted me from the shadow of a palm tree. Good evening. Lovely night, isn't it? I hadn't noticed. I've been busy. I know. We've been waiting for you for a long time. We? Uh-huh. Me and my nice shiny revolver here. 38. Oh, I see. Well, you make a handsome couple, and I hope you're both very happy together. Now, what do you want? I don't want anything. I'm here to give you something. Advice. Look, brother, I've already told you I'm busy, so if this is a heist, let's get it over with fast. You know, I think you're confused. I'm holding the gun, Mr. Martin. Martin? John Skipper Martin. Surprised that I know your name? Why, uh, yes. Yes, I am. I don't recall having had the pleasure. You haven't? People never forget me, Mr. Martin. My tag is Brock. Does that mean anything? No, what do you do? Sing, dance, tell jokes? Yeah, that's it. Last one. I tell jokes. I can't wait. You won't have to, Mr. Martin. I'm going to tell you one right now. It goes like this. Once upon a time, a young punk borrowed $10,000 from a generous gambler on his promise to pay money back within a week. 
But the young punk never came across. So the gambler told a nice fellow named Brock to call on the young punk and tell him that he had 48 hours in which to get the money together. And that if he didn't, he'd never see the 49th hour. What's the matter, Mr. Martin? Don't you like jokes? Brock grinned, shoved his 38 into a shoulder holster, and walked away. As soon as he rounded the corner, I went to the open window and climbed in. I rummaged through two closets looking for a white Panama you-know-what. I was about to search a third when I heard something that brought me to a dead stop. It was a key front door lock. I closed my right hand over the gun in my pocket, moved flush against the side wall, and waited. But the moment the door swung open, the telephone rang. And the hulk of a man that entered went straight for it. He was wearing a gray fedora. Hello? Oh, hello, Isabel. What? Bruce? Are, are you sure? But that's impossible. I, I mean, things like that just don't... Excuse me, Isabel. I, I think I have a visitor. I'll call you back. Reach, Mr. Martin. Who are you? The name is Brock. You owe a client of mine $10,000. He wants his money in 48 hours. I'll get it. I, I swear I will. I'll have it right here, on time, all of it. How are you going to do that, Mr. Martin? I, I, I've got a way. Someone's going to give it to me tonight. Why? Why? Because it's the healthy thing to do. That's why. That, that's all you wanted to know, isn't it? That's all. Good night, Mr. Martin. <laughs> Marlowe, Isabel. I'm calling from a drugstore in Hollywood. Has Bruce returned yet? No, and he won't. He's been kidnapped. What's that? And whoever did it wants $50,000 before morning or we'll never see Bruce alive again. As I walked to my car opposite the Wilshire Gardens, I felt like my brain had spent the night in a cement mixer. I was about to head back for Malibu when I suddenly saw Skipper Martin dash out of his bungalow and pile into a long, glossy convertible. I followed him out to the Pacific Palisades, where he made a call at a little house which sat on a bluff overlooking the sea. Once he was inside, I moved up quietly and saw that the name on the mailbox was Miss Carla Winters. I crawled up to a lace curtain window where I could see what was going on. One look at Miss Winters made the damage I was doing to my tweeds worthwhile. She was strictly dragon lady, with flaming red hair and a waist you could span with two hands. If you were lucky enough to get that close. And the rest of the measurements oh, fit yeah. just perfect. Why, you sniveling coward, you wouldn't dare open your mouth about us. Wouldn't I? Listen, Carla, I've got myself Skipper Martin to look after. First, last, and always. You remember that. Why should I? You've always been cheap talk and no more. Look at you now. You're in trouble, so what do you do? You holler blackmail. Go on, get out of here. Get out of here before I kill you. <laughs> Skipper slammed the front door, stomped to his car, and roared off. I couldn't figure any reason, legitimate reason, that is, for calling on Carl Winters. So I returned to the Fairchild place. Isabel was somewhere between hysteria and collapse over the fact that she and Bruce had less than $2,000 in their own name. Uncle Avery, of course, was more than reluctant to pay the ransom demanded for the return of a man he'd rather not have returned. But his niece won out. All right, Isabel, I'll give you the money. But understand, I'm doing this for you, not for yes, that no yes, good... Yes, Uncle Avery, I understand, but can you get that much cash at this hour? The banks... Who are... said anything about banks? You know, I don't like them. Money will be in your hands in 30 minutes. In the meantime, tell Mr. Marlowe here what arrangements you've made with your husband's abductors. One minute, Mr. Fairchild. What about the police? The police have already been notified, Mr. Marlowe. They've agreed not to interfere until tomorrow morning. By that time, I suppose we'll have Bruce return to us. To... to us, Uncle Avery? Uh, that's a mere slip of the tongue, Isabel. I'm only paying for his return. You take over from there. I don't want him. A half hour later, Avery Fairchild handled me a bundle of bills which added up to $50,000 cash. 
The bills seem slightly dirty. The old geezer must have had them buried someplace. For a moment, I couldn't help thinking, boy, to get at this place with a shovel sometime. But then I got back to the more pressing matters at hand. I wrapped up the money in a shoebox, and I drove north along the Pacific Coast Highway. I covered the 60 miles to the rendezvous, which was a junkyard near Ventura, in about as many minutes. Then, according to instructions, I slowed down to 10 miles an hour. I blinked my lights twice, tossed out the shoebox. I was just about to resume my speed when the headlights of an approaching car fell on a man as he darted back into the junkyard. And I saw what I'd been expecting all the time. A white Panama hat. But I was still playing by the rules. So there was only one thing I could do about it. I slammed my foot down on the accelerator and kept it there until I reached the nearest telephone, where I telephoned Skipper Martin at the Wilshire Gardens. It was just possible that he owned two hats. But that little balloon exploded in a hurry. Hello? Mr. Martin? Yes. Who is this? This is Brock. Remember me? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. I've been hoping you'd call. You mean you got the money right now? Well... Well, no, not, not not this minute, but I will have it in a couple of hours. You're sure, Mr. Martin? I'm positive, Brock. Now only one thing figured. The man in the Panama hat worked for Skipper Martin. It had to be. An hour later, I pulled in at the Fairchild Estate. And the moment I put my double A over the threshold, I knew that the kidnapper, too, had kept his part of the bargain. Bruce Gordon was back, safe and sound. It happened shortly after you retired, Mr. Marlowe. I was working in my studio when a man wearing a, a white, white Panama, Panama hat. Yes. But how did you know that, Mr. Marlowe? They're very popular this season, Mr. Gordon. Darling, Mr. Marlowe was a private detective. Huh? But I'll tell you all about that later. Go on with your story. Well, this man was wearing a handkerchief over his face, and he forced me to go along with him at gunpoint. He took me to a car parked in the service driveway and told me to turn around. And I was hit from behind and went out cold. Oh, darling, how terrible. Oh, it wasn't pleasant to you. When I came to, I was bound hand and foot, blindfolded and gagged. I had no idea where I was. Oh, but didn't you see anybody before you were released? No, Uncle Abe. Before uh, they let me go, they, they hit me again. Uh, when I came to that time, I was lying on the road out near Ventura, untied. That's about it. I suppose you've told the story to the police already, huh? No, he hasn't, Mr. Marlowe, and what's more, he isn't going to. I'm sorry, but I was forced to lie to you earlier this evening. The police mean reporters, and they mean publicity. And I hate publicity. I'm sure you see my point. I wouldn't make book on that, Mr. Fairchild. Secrets like this only encourage kidnappers. Well, since we no longer see eye to eye, Mr. Marlowe, I'd suggest that we consider your services at an end. I'll have my check at your office in the morning. Good night, sir. Avery Fairchild wasn't the kind of a man you argued with. I threw my coat over my arm, tipped my hat to Isabel, and stepped outside. I hadn't once mentioned Skipper Martin to the family. That might have been a mistake, but I still wanted to look around before I yelled copper. As I walked past the guest cottage, I decided to go in and check Bruce's studio. Maybe the man in the white P.A. had left a few odd footprints on the ceiling. I tossed my coat in a corner chair and started through the clutter. Uh, ten minutes later, I found nothing. I was about to leave when I suddenly remembered the picture of a girl and some clouds that Bruce had been so careful to keep out of sight. Uh, it hadn't been moved. And when I brought it into the light, I didn't have to look twice. <laughs> It was the portrait of Carlotas, the red-headed dragon lady that Skipper Martin had visited. Now things began to add up. At the chauffeur's quarters, there was an outside telephone, and I put through a hurry call to Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide in L.A. The best I could get was one Sergeant Neely. I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe, but the lieutenant's out on a call right now. There's some kind of a row up town. Well, do you know where he is? The address, I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's uh, one of those bungalows at the Wilshire Gardens. The Wilshire Gardens? That's right. What's so special about that? Maybe nothing. I'll know in a minute. Thanks, Neely. Hello? 
This is Marlowe Ibarra. What brings you to Skipper Martin's at this late hour? Well, it seems as though some person or persons unknown fired a gun several times a little more than an hour ago. Four shots, to be exact. Well, you think Skipper Martin fired them? No, Marlowe, I'm sure Martin didn't fire them. You see, he stopped them, personally. <laughs> Before I hung up, I gave Ibarra a quick rundown on the whole story. After making me feel like a schoolboy for keeping him in the dark so long, he told me to sit on the Fairchild's front steps until he got there. Well, it gave me a half hour to kill, most of which I spent walking around aimlessly, trying to get something close to four out of two and two. But I couldn't. Finally, I heard Ibarra siren up to the front door. I was about to head for him when the chill in the morning air reminded me that my top coat was still in Bruce's studio. I went back and got it. When I turned for the door again, I noticed a little slip of paper that had been under the coat fall to the floor. I picked it up. I must have held it for a full minute before I realized what it meant. Just a small slip of paper, and yet it made everything, the kidnapping, call of the murder, fall right into place. <laughs> I entered the living room at the house. One glance at Isabel and Bruce told me that she'd already knew about Skipper's death. Only Uncle Avery, who was not one to shed crocodile tears, hadn't changed. Ibarra, of course, was unhappy. Marlo, we can't run any kind of a police department when every private detective acts like he's the commissioner himself. Why didn't you call me when this business first began to smell? You know better. I'm sorry, Ibarra, and I hate to sound immodest, but I happen to be one of the two men in this room who can name Bruce Gordon's kidnapper. And Skipper Martin's killer. You know what you're saying, Marlowe? I think so. The man in the white Panama hat who kidnapped Bruce Gordon, Lieutenant, is Bruce Gordon himself. In other words, Bruce Gordon kidnapped Bruce Gordon. No! Uh, you're out of your mind, Marlowe. Am I? Would you still say that, Gordon, if we paid a call to Carla Winters and asked her to hand over the $50,000 of so-called ransom money she's holding for you, too? Or would you prefer... Stop, Gordon, stop her... The window, he Bruce! <laughs> Then in other words, Marlo, Bruce, who eventually planned to divorce Isabel and marry Carla Winters, wanted to have a little stake like $50,000 around first. That's right, Ibarra. But Skipper Martin knew about Bruce and Carla's plans to marry later, and he tried to blackmail them to pay off his gambling debts. That's why he came to Bruce's cottage on the sly. However, he got there just in time to see Bruce leave of his own free will and therefore knew later that he couldn't have been kidnapped, which gave him two holes over Bruce. That's right. But he made a mistake when he went to Carla's house and got too demanding. Because she told Bruce about it, and before he uh, released himself, he took care of Skipper. With four gunshots, to be exact. Charming people, aren't they, Barra? Lovely. Sometimes I think I should shoot higher and save the state a lot of money. And he almost got away with it. Uh, by the way, Marlowe, how do you know that Bruce was the man in the white Panama hat? Well, I was pretty certain, but I got my proof accidentally. Promise not to repeat this, Ibarra? Yeah. Well, I practically fell over a little slip of paper in his studio. It was a receipt from a department store, and it was made out to Bruce Gordon. For one Panama hat? Uh-huh. Nothing else but. When I finally got back to my place on Franklin Avenue, the sun was already up. And the people who work at nice, sane jobs were beginning to fill the streets. I'd been on the go for a steady 24 hours, so I could think of nothing but my bed. I was about to put my key in the lock when a next-door neighbor walked by, bid me a cheery good morning, and started down the corridor. Now, that alone wouldn't have disturbed my sleep, but why... Why did he have to be wearing a white Panama hat? <laughs> The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's story were Jacqueline DeWitt as Isabel Gordon, Wilms Herbert as Uncle Avery Fairchild, Bill Lally as Bruce Gordon, Shep Menken as Skipper Martin, and Lou Krugman as Brock. Detective Lieutenant Abar is played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard O'Ron. <laughs> Thank you.
Be sure to be with us again next week at this same time when Philip Marlowe says... When her will was read, everybody figured she'd been crazy when she wrote it, and that included me. But I changed my mind after spending the night on an island with a pig, a cat, and an ape. Because in reality, they were people. Tonight, Amos and Andy return to the CBS network. And along with all their friends, Kingfish, Lightning, and Henry Van Porter, they're settling down for a permanent stay. Be listening for them later this evening over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. When the will was read, everybody figured she'd been crazy when she wrote it. And that included me. But I changed my mind after spending a night on an island with a pig, a cat, and an ape. Because in reality, they were people. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, Where There's a Will. I had spent the whole day on a noisy job which had concerned itself with a lot of people who talked a lot and said nothing. When I finally locked up my office for the night, I was worn out. As I drove slowly along the street, I was glad to be heading for home and little peace and quiet. At least, that's what I thought. But when I pulled up for a full stop sign, only a half a block from my apartment, something happened which brought my little dream of peace and quiet to an end. A car door opposite me flew open and something mighty excited jumped in. I'm being followed. Drive on, please. The law? No, please drive on. Okay, lady, get a good grip on the upholstery. to do it. Now, what's the... Say, you look a little pale and beautiful. I'm always pale when my heart's in my mouth. Well, then why don't you swallow once, take a deep breath, and tell me who was after you? There isn't much to tell. He was a nasty little man, that's all I know. So thanks for making like Barney Oldfield, and good night. Hey, hey, not so fast. <laughs> it's impolite to hitch and run. Look, mister, right now I'm up to my earrings in trouble, and that leaves very little time for small talk with strangers. Even nice ones. Well, in that case, the name is Philip Marlowe, which takes care of the stranger part, and I'm a private detective, which makes trouble my business. <laughs> Where do we go from there? No place. $300,000 worth of hidden bonds, a screwy old lady and a sculptor with a red beard are too much for any one-man police force, Mr. Marlowe. So again, good night. Before I could say anything, she was out and gone. <laughs> there was only the heady scent of taboo in the air. And the memory of a gorgeous profile with jet black hair and pale blue eyes. I sighed like a schoolboy and decided to put her under the heading of things that pass in the night. But I couldn't. Why out of all the cars in Los Angeles should she have picked on mine? Well, the next morning as I was walking down the corridor to my office door, I was still seeing pale blue eyes. Maybe that's why I didn't notice the man who waited outside my door until I was almost on top of him. He was well-dressed and about 35. He looked like a man who had forgotten how to smile. Marlowe. Right. I want to compliment you on your behavior last night, Mr. Marlowe. Barbara told me about it. Oh? Come on in, Mr. Uh... Shields. Edward Shields. Would you be interested in aiding three people in a search for more than a quarter of a million dollars in negotiable bonds, one percent of which will be yours if the bonds are found? 
Uh, being a fairly fast man with figures, yes. Yes, I would. Splendid. I'd like a few details. Well, Mr. Marlowe, my aunt, Bernice Mayhew Shaw, died, leaving her entire fortune to charity, with the exception of the bonds I mentioned. Those are to be divided equally among three of us. The sole heirs, if we find them within 24 hours. Hmm, that sounds like something you dream about after a midnight snack of pizza and pig's knuckles. Perhaps. But you didn't know my aunt. Beside myself, the beneficiaries are Barbara Haynes, the girl you met last night. She was Aunt Bernice's personal secretary. And another nephew, Harlan Crane, who, at the moment, happens to be a sculptor. Happens to be? Six months ago, he was a sailor. Before that, a (laughs) writer. Without even a rejection slip to his name. My cousin is irresponsible, impetuous, and completely self indulgent The will itself, Mr. Shields, what are the exact conditions? At precisely noon today, the three of us are to meet with Luther Willard, my beloved aunt's lawyer, who will give us each a large sheet of tissue paper covered with specific markings. Individually, the sheets mean absolutely nothing. But combined, one over the other, the transparent sheets form a coherent map to the location of the bond. But uh, why all the intrigue? My... Dear departed aunt had a peculiar sense of humor. In addition to this, she was never particularly fond of any of us. She was sure that our individual shortcomings would make cooperation among us impossible, even for so short a period as 24 hours. And the fact that a man followed Miss Haynes last night convinced you that there was something to that, huh? Convinced me? No. He may have been nothing but a purse snatcher. Nevertheless, I do feel that to play safe a fourth party, a custodian of the map, so to speak, would be advisable. That's fine. When do I go to work, Mr. Shields? At noon, at the lawyer's office. However, I regret that first you must be approved by the third heir. I don't like to ask this, Mr. Marlowe, but would you mind very much calling on my cousin Harlan personally? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I think he might prove very interesting. Yes, I'm sure he will. As interesting as an ape in the zoo. <laughs> felt like saying, look, Shields, I'm not as gullible as I look. But then I thought a client's a client, and I decided to play along. Harlan Crane, six-foot, red-bearded giant, talked as he worked, wielding a ten-pound sculptor's mallet like it was an 18th-century quill. I'll be frank with you, Marlowe. Money isn't everything to me and never has been. Over $100,000 will buy a lot of marble. Half the state of Vermont, I'd say. But tell me the point, Mr. Crane. Do I get your seal of approval? I imagine you'll be all right. Anyone who can get by Shields, the all-American Scrooge, ought to do. Thanks, a million. I'm not being personal where you're concerned. It's just a matter of facing a fact bluntly. Edward Shields is conniving, avaricious, and dull. I heartily recommend him to nobody. And the girl, Barbara, you feel the same way about her? No, I don't. And the truth of the matter, Marlowe, is that I know very little about Barbara Haynes. But what I do know, I like very much. Yeah, that I can understand. Marlowe, do you realize that once you have the whole map in your possession, you're worth an awful lot of money? Of course I do. The whole map, I have a market value of exactly $300,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, fellow. $300,000, dead or alive. <laughs> I know it was small of me, but I didn't exactly see the joke. And things got less funny as time went on. Later, as me and my trio got off the elevator at the lawyer's office, old Luther Willard, Aunt Bernice's attorney, was waiting for us, so excited he could hardly talk. I... I've been held up. What? what? Yes. A little man. He wanted the map. He a little man? Dark the... complexion? Yes, yes. Had a scar on the side of his neck. How yes. are the maps all right? Hmm? The maps? Oh, yes, yes. They're all right. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, everybody. Give him a chance. Mr. Willard, tell us exactly what happened. Uh, This is Mr. Marlowe. We told you about him, Mr. Willard. Uh, Of course, yes, yes. Uh, Come into my office. Uh, You see, I was putting some papers into my safe when this little man stepped up behind me and uh, demanded the maps. Uh, Were they in the safe? No, no, thank heavens. Uh, Make yourselves comfortable. The maps, Mr. Willard, where are they now? Uh, Right here, where they were all the time. Here under the blotter on my desk. (laughs) Clever of me, wasn't it? (laughs) Wax seals. Still intact. I'll take all three of them right now, Mr. Willard. That is, if there are no objections. <clears throat> all right, then I guess we can be on our way. Hold on, Mr. Marlowe. There are still two things you people must know. 
First, in the event the bonds are not recovered within the 24 hours, I am instructed to open another sealed envelope, which I'm happy to report is kept in my bank vault. That envelope contains a complete and simplified map and is to be turned over to a designated charity. And second, if any of you die before the allotted time is up, the bonds are to be divided among the surviving persons. And if none of us survives, Mr. Willard? Why, in that case, the bonds again go to charity. You see, Harlan, your aunt was a very generous woman. After arranging to meet with the three heirs at Shields' place later that afternoon, I headed for the nice and public public library where I figured I'd be able to examine the maps in safety. By placing the three maps exactly one over the other, I saw that the bonds were hidden on the larger of two squares of land called Twin Islands, which were the personal property of the late Bernice Mayhew Shaw, and located in Indian Lake in the San Bernardino Mountains. As I left the library with the three maps in my pocket, I, I felt like a well-fed mallet on the opening day of hunting season. And then I knew I was being followed. As I slipped into a doorway and turned, I saw it was the nasty little man with the scar. All right, you, we're through playing tag. Oh, no, let me go. Not yet, shorty, not until you talk loud and clear. No, no, don't hit me, please. Please hit me down, I'll talk. I'll tell you everything. All right. If you're sure you can get it all straight the first time, <clears throat> There. Now, the whole story, beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Yeah, like you say, whole story. Okay. Starts like this. By the time I figured out that it had been the sawed-off end of a broomstick that had slammed my stomach up against my backbone, the little man was out of sight. Another five minutes went by before I quit calling myself sucker and I started to think straight. The nearest public locker was in the Santa Fe Trailways bus depot in Cahuenga. I went up there and deposited two-thirds of the map for safekeeping until we were ready to leave for Indian Lake. And I found a telephone and a half a dozen calls later I knew that a caretaker named Jumbo was the sole inhabitant of Twin Islands. And my last call was to him. I wanted some kind of a welcoming committee ready for us. When I left the phone booth, it was only one o'clock. So I returned to my apartment where I figured I'd rest until three when we were all to meet at Shields' place. But that was my second mistake. Because the moment I closed my apartment door, I was positive I wasn't going to get much rest. I had an unannounced visitor. Yeah, you look surprised, Mr. Marlowe. I am. I didn't recognize you at first without your broomstick. Yeah, I traded that in on this twenty-two target pistol here. It's more expensive, but it's better. Makes me as big as you are. Maybe bigger. Yeah, but how much does it do for your personality? Quite a bit. Gives me poise. And poise gives me manners. So in asking for that map in your pocket, I'll even say please. Come on, Milo, I won't say please twice. No, I don't think you would. Here. Thank you. Now, before I go, one more thing. The hall outside here is straight and narrow, right to the stairs, and that makes it fine for shooting. So after I step out, don't do anything rash. For a while. So, loving life as I do, I didn't do anything rash for a while. In fact, I could have whipped up a nice seven-minute frosting before I moved at all. And I phoned the three heirs to get together at my apartment. When I finally had them all seated in front of me, I related the saga of the little man, including my premonition that one of the three present was signing his paychecks. Of course, I got nothing but Cupid doll innocence out of any of them. So after adding that we'd get underway just as soon as the missing one-third of the map was returned to me, I threw my trench coat over my arm and told them I was going for a walk. But before leaving them, I reminded them that whoever was behind the little man could fire him. Because I would never have kept all three maps in one place anyway, unless all of the heirs were on hand to watch one another. And then I left. I hadn't walked more than a half a block up Franklin when I stopped at the sound of Barbara running after me. Phil, Phil I'm scared. Harlan and Shields are acting like a couple of wild men, calling each other every name under the sun. What'd you expect? Chit chat about the weather? I quit acting like a bobby soxer within squealing distance of Sinatra and try a cigarette. 
It'll calm your... What is it, Phil? Why are you smiling like that? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, Barbara, nothing. <laughs> it's just that I found this in the pocket of my trench coat when I went for my cigarettes. It's the map. That's right. The missing third. It's back already. <laughs> When that missing third part of the map turned up so fast, I figured the heirs had decided to play ball. But I made a mental note to keep my eyes on them anyway. At three o'clock, I went to Edward Shields' hillside house in Laurel Canyon for the scheduled meeting. Shields wasn't home yet, but Cousin Harlan was there admiring the view. Barbara showed up a few minutes later in a convertible, and Shields arrived last by cab. It finally began to look as though we might actually start out all together. Well... I see we all arrived, safe and sound. Yeah, disappointed. Only by your clumsy attempts at humor, Harlan. Stop it, boys. Let's get started. Phil, have you looked at the map? Where are we going? To Indian Lake. It's a four-hour drive, so if you're all ready, I suggest we get started. Very well. I'll go up to the garage and get the car. So Aunt Bernice hid the bonds in a roost at Twin Islands, eh? Well, well, well. <laughs> Nobody seemed surprised at the location Aunt Bernice had chosen to hide her bonds. And Holland, Barbara, and I stood on the front porch watching Shields as he climbed the very steep driveway to his garage in the car. But Barbara got more of my attention than Shields. Ah, she made a mighty dreamy picture. And she leaned casually back against the rail of the porch. She wasn't aware that I was watching her. And I suddenly saw her go tense, her eyes filled with fear, and I quickly turned to follow her stare. Shields' car was going at a rapid clip down the steep driveway. I still couldn't figure out Barbara's concern, and then she started screaming. The car's out of control. The car was headed for the edge of a cliff. His brakes are out. He'll go over. Oh. The tree. The tree stopped him. Shields, are you hurt? No, no, I'm all right. The, the brakes, I, I tried to stop you him. You hadn't hit that tree. You'd have gone over the edge. Let's have a look at those brakes, Shields. Well, no wonder. What is it? Brake lines broken. Every drop of fluid drained out. I might have been killed. No might about it, Shields. We stood there for a while, all looking at one another, but nothing was said. Brake lines rarely snap accidentally. And I remembered that Harlan had been at Shields' house early, and the car had been in the garage, and Barbara... Well, I had to admit that she actually had anticipated the car going out of control. Well, the 24 hours for finding the bonds were slipping by, and I knew we had to get to Indian Lake. We held a short powwow without passing the peace pipe, and we decided to take Barbara's car. We picked up the rest of the map, which I'd checked at the bus station, and we shoved off. After a four-hour drive that was about as relaxing as the thought of an overdue time bomb in a day nursery, we finally pulled up to the shores of Indian Lake. Jumbo, the caretaker, was waiting at the dock. He knew how to handle a boat, and a few minutes later, we could see Twin Islands. We headed for the smaller of the two, where I could make out a rambling lodge. The other island, a quarter of a mile away, seemed deserted. Shields was the first one ashore. Here, Barbara, let me help you. Run along, boy. I'll help Barbara. Thanks, Harlan. Well, Marlo, what now? Well, first we go up to the house. Oh, Jumbo, you got everything ready for us? Hey, Jumbo. Huh? Oh, oh, sure, sure, everything's ready, Mr. Marlowe. It's like you said, I opened four of the upstairs rooms. Open the rooms? We're not going to sleep out here, are we? We're going to try. But this isn't a vacation. We're here to find the bonds and get out. You realize it's almost nine already? That leaves us just 15 hours, Marlowe. Yeah, I know. I got a good watch and I count to 24 and I'm also giving orders to Don't you three. Don't get high-handed, Marlowe. You're an employee of ours and that's all. Let's get the map together and start looking for those bonds right now. Take it easy, big man. The bonds are hidden on the other island. The map is as tangled as a second-hand spider web. We wouldn't get anything at all down in the dark. That's your opinion. Look, you I... people hired me to help you find those bonds. If I have to get nasty to make you take orders, I can do that too. Now let's play like we're smart and go up to the lodge and relax. All right, Marlo. But remember, we'd better have those bonds by tomorrow, or someone else will be nasty. Very nasty. And I mean me. What? You too? <laughs> Getting the three heirs settled down at dinner table was quite a chore. And when I was sure they'd keep an eye on each other, I slipped outside. I hid one third of the map in a drain pipe. Then I went upstairs to my room and I hid another third in the window shade. Now the maps were settled and I began to think about other things like... like the accident to Shields' car. 
And there were too many accidents and coincidences to suit me. So I decided to drop in on Cousin Holland's room to see what I could see. After 15 fruitless minutes, I was about to leave when something in the wastebasket caught my eye. The corner of a half-hidden handkerchief monogrammed H.C. I had just picked it up when I saw Jumbo standing in the open door. That handkerchief there in your hand. That blood on it? No. No, it looks more like brake fluid. And in this case, it's practically the same thing, huh? I think we'll leave it right here in the wastebasket, Jumbo. Oh, did you want something? Just wanted to say I'll be in my own place out back if you want me. Okay. You know where Mr. Shields is? He's out in the veranda. Alone? Yeah. Thanks, Jumbo. If I need anything, I'll call you. Good night. Shields. Oh. Oh, it's you, Marlowe. What's wrong? You sound like a man expecting trouble. <laughs> I was nearly killed in my car this afternoon, and I don't think that was the end of it. Yeah, and don't stand too close to high windows. Thank you. It's comforting to know that I am not alone in my suspicions. Maybe, uh... How are you betting? On the beauty or the beast? Don't be absurd. I hope someday to marry Barbara. Yeah? Well, a guy might be beating your time right now with a sculptor's mallet. You may be naive, Mr. Marlowe, but Barbara isn't. I saw them just a moment ago walking down to the boathouse. Harlan's galloping after her like a half-baked idiot, as usual. But if Miss Haynes prefers me, what can he do about it? There was an answer for that, but it seemed a little obvious under the circumstances. But a few minutes later, Shields went inside, and I made a beeline for the boathouse to water down a certain hot-headed sculptor named Harlan. When I got within earshot, I knew I'd be as welcome as whooping cough at a glassblower's convention. So I stopped and listened. Barbara, darling, I'm falling in love with you. You know that, don't you? Let me hold you close. Harlan, I... Oh, Harlan. This is real, Barbara. For the first time in my life, I'm truly in love. I want to do things for you, make you happy. Please, wait. I'm not completely free. There are still ties with Edward, you know. Shields, that fat, stingy Babbitt. He's no man for you. Why, if he so much as touches you from now on up... Wait a minute, Barbara. Marlowe, you cheap snooping eaves. Up He's dropping some minor vice compared to some of the shenanigans going on around here. Just what do you mean by that? A word to the wise is sufficient. You, I'll give a few more. Now, somebody's trying to cut our little triangle down to two sides before noon tomorrow. What I've seen so far, I don't like, so I'm warning everybody. Just what are you accusing me of? Well, Marlon, I'm... stop it. Don't be a fool. Will you cavemen control yourselves until those bonds are found? Come on, Harlan, let's go in. Good night, Marlowe. Don't get your head caught in any transoms. Deciding sleep wouldn't be very healthy for a man in my position, I decided to sit up that night. And it was about two o'clock when I looked out the window and saw something mighty interesting. A light was moving on the other island opposite us. I got hold of John Boyd and went over there as fast as we could. Beach. That light's dead ahead, Mr. Marlowe. Looks to me like it's up in the picnic shelter. Yeah, I'll see you later, Jumbo. Well, who's there? Guess who? Oh, Marlowe. I didn't hear you come up. The wind's too strong, I guess. I'm glad to see you. It's spooky here all alone. Oh, sure, sure. What's the idea? Decide to do a little freelance prospecting? No, that's right. Bernice May, you love this spot. And I had a hunch she hid the bonds here in the base of this table. Oh, I guess I was wrong. Oh, come on, Marlo, limber up. You can't blame me for trying. Listen, beautiful, don't flap your eyelashes at me. I can't see anything but double crosses right now. All right, if you've had your fun, let's go back to the lodge, don't huh? Don't be that way, Phil. Phil, the sun will be coming up in two or three hours. Why not wait for it here with me? Barbara, baby, don't burn up too many calories with that routine. Because I only keep one-third of the map on me. You think you're so smart. Bright ideas hatch in that cute little brain of yours, too. Now let's... Oh, comes the gun with a pearl handle, no less. Stay away from me, Marlo. Over there. Hey, what's going on here, Eddie? Jumbo! Look out, Jumbo! When Jumbo stepped into the light and Barbara turned. I made a swipe at a gun hand that knocked pistol-person lamp all over the picnic shelter. 
I found the gun and gave it to Jumbo. Then I started to pick up an assortment of knickknacks that had spilled out of a purse. But I never finished. Because one of the items made my eyes pop. It was the monogrammed handkerchief covered with brake fluid that I'd found in Holland's room. It all made sense now. It tied up everything that I'd suspected right along. Only two of my trio had planned to split up the $300,000 worth of bonds from the first. As I ran for the motor launch, I yelled at Jumbo to bring Barbara over in the rowboat. All the way back, I had the panicky feeling that I was probably too late. But when I sneaked in the front door of the lodge, there were still two voices. And they came from the open kitchen door. With my hand on my gun, I edged along the wall and peeked in. Seals, you're a fool. Perhaps. But I'm going to kill you and have a perfect case of self-defense. What are you talking about? Your hopelessly framed cousin, Harlan. I ruined the brakes on my own car. I planted your handkerchief, stained with brake fluid in your room. Marlowe found it. He's convinced that you tried to kill me. He's also convinced that he was brought into this whole thing by coincidence. He doesn't know that he was deliberately involved in our search for the bonds, just so he'd make a reputable witness. You're out of your mind. Not at all. I'm going to kill you and say it was self-defense. Marlowe will testify that you tried to kill me before. What Marlowe's going to do is blow your head off if you don't drop that gun, Shields. Marlowe. Yeah, Marlowe. Who knows he wasn't brought into this thing by coincidence, but has stuck around to see the fireworks and almost saw them just now. Bill, what happened? Barbara, couldn't you hold Marlowe on the other island? You shut up, Shields. Barbara's little mistake was that she should have gotten rid of Holland's handkerchief after she took it out of his room so he wouldn't see it. Barbara, I don't understand. You you planned all this with Shields against me? I did in the beginning, Harlan, but I changed my mind when I fell in love with you. I, I let Marlowe find the handkerchief in my purse. I, I wanted him to stop, Edward. Oh, darling, don't you Come see... Come on, that... Miss Bankhead, cut the dramatics. The show's over. Let's have it straight, huh? All right. We might as well if we're going to find those bonds before it's too late. Edward and I did plan it. We even hired the little man who tried to get the maps from you. And when that didn't work, you planned to get rid of Harlan and split the 300 grand. So we failed. So what? We're right back where we started. A hundred thousand apiece. Now, let's go find those bonds. Not so fast, beautiful. What happened to Harlan just now was a little more serious than a hot foot. It was attempted murder. He can slap you two in the jug this minute if he wants to. But I'll leave it up to him. Okay, Harlan, what do you say? It's your move. No. I've got a better idea. Marlowe, one-third of that map is mine. Give it to me. Okay. There it is. Harlan... What are you going to do? Harlan, no. Don't burn it. There. Now we all lose. Now none of us will get the bonds. That's probably how Aunt Bernice wanted it anyway. It was almost noon... I was standing on the veranda of the lodge, and a scrawny old crow was perched up on the roof. I saw Barbara and Shields quietly pull away in a boat with Jumbo, and I saw Holland lumbering off to the far end of the island to sulk. And as I watched the three of them, I couldn't help thinking. A pig in a pinstripe suit, an ape with a red beard, and an alley cat in nylon. Yeah. Keep laughing, Aunt Bernice, you were right. Greed, treachery, and rashness don't mix, even for 24 hours. And the 1% of the bonds I was to get? Well, that's my contribution to charity. Who knows? Maybe I can take it off my income tax. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's story were Mary Ship, Parley Bear, Don Diamond, Ted Von Eltz, and Wilms Herbert. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard Orant. <laughs> Be sure to be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I got the crisp $50 bill in advance. I figured my client had a heart of gold. But after I was beat up, double-crossed, and shot at, I realized just how hard a heart of gold could be. (laughs) 
Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, John Dixon Carr. Three great names in the world of mystery and thrills. One down, two to go today on CBS. Now that you've heard Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe in action, CBS invites you to hear Dashiell Hammett's Sam Spade in action tonight, followed by John Dixon Carr's personally written radio series, Cabin B-13. Chandler, Hammett, Carr, today and every Sunday, over most of these CBS stations. It's a mystery if you miss them. Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. When I got the crisp $50 bill in advance, I figured my client had a heart of gold. But after I was beat up, double-crossed, and shot at, I realized just how hard a heart of gold can be. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, The Heart of Gold. I had spent the day trying to decide how to spend the day, and finally convinced myself Sunday afternoon was a good time to catch up with neglected bookkeeping. But I only got as far as the office door because a special delivery letter was stuck in the mail slot. I ripped it open and watched a crisp $50 bill flutter to the floor. Bending it down with my toe, I turned to the letter, which was dated Saturday. Dear Mr. Marlowe, kindly investigate the party who lives at 1903 North Ogden Street to find out if his name is really Elliot Perdue and what his occupation is. Then please come to my residence at 5 tomorrow, Sunday. I live at the home of a friend, Arthur Stewart, 33 Lemonwood Drive in Bel Air. I sincerely hope that $50 will be a sufficient retainer. Truly yours, Helen Asher. Judging from the tone of her letter, it was obvious that Helen Asher didn't hire private detectives very often. Nevertheless, I glanced at my watch, which said I had to work very fast, and I headed for 1903 North Ogden. It turned out to be a small house near Selma Street. I got out of my car and walked up to the door. Good afternoon, sir. You the resident here? That's right. What do you want? I represent the Dr. Potter Poll of Public Opinion. I'd like to ask you a few questions well, regarding... Sorry, but I don't have any opinions to express. Oh, even the opinions of a man with no opinions are important to us. Now, let's just let me step inside here and get out my notebook. There we are. Uh, all right, but make it fast. Right. Now, what is your occupation? I'm an investment broker. With which firm? I'm uh, independent. I see. And what is your name, sir? What do you need my name for? Well, for my personal records in case I have to come back. Elliot Perdue. Uh-huh. Do you have any hobbies other than horse racing? What's... What do you mean? Those dope sheets and racing forms there on your desk. I'm quite an admirer of horse flesh myself. <laughs> You're quite a character, too, aren't you? Working on Sunday and all? Well, you know how public opinion is. It goes right on rain, shine, or Sunday. Excuse me a moment. Oh, by the way, uh, what's your name? Marlowe. Philip Marlowe. Hey, Mr. Marlowe. Stand still, because I'm not kidding about this gun. I'll beat it back to whoever hired you and tell them they're being very clumsy about a very delicate situation. One more move like this, and they won't get another chance. I knew Perdue meant business, so I left without an argument. Well, at least I had a repeat on the name, Elliot Perdue, and the occupation of bookie to toss at Helen Asher when I met her at 5 o'clock. In Bel Air, I eventually found 33 Lemonwood Drive. 200 yards of palm trees stood at rigid attention while I drove through the gate and up to the house. When the butler opened the door, he stared at me like my hat was on fire. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, did you 
Did you wish something? Yes, yeah, I'd like to see Mrs. Asher, please. Mrs. Asher? Oh, good heavens, uh, Mr. Stewart. What's the matter, Robert? Who is it? Why, I'm Philip Marlowe, Mr. Stewart, a private detective. I have an appointment with Mrs. Asher. Is she at home? Oh, Mr. Marlowe, perhaps you can help. I don't know what to do. It's such a terrible thing. What's happened? Upstairs, not five minutes ago, Mrs. Asher shot herself. Shot herself? Please, if you'd come up with me. Yeah, sure, of course. I'm certainly grateful for your help, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, this is her room. Uh, she's in here. There. Yeah. She's dead, all right. Shot herself in the left temple. Whose gun is that, Mr. Stewart? Well, it's mine. I kept it in the desk downstairs. Did you find her? Uh, no, Roberts did. I was out in the hothouse working with my orchids. You see, I've been out of town. I just came in this morning on the super chief from Chicago, and I wasn't expected back until Wednesday. Yeah, uh, look, Mr. Stewart, do you mind telling me how well you knew Mrs. Asher? Oh, very well indeed. Ever since the accident three years ago, she lived in my house under my care. The accident? Yes, that's how she got those uh, scars on her cheek and neck. As you can see, uh, my hands were burned at the same time. Do you mind telling me about it? Well, I was living in Canada at the time. One day, my wife Florence and I went to a camp near Quebec, and we met Helen Asher our first day there. She was a pathetic, lonely woman, a widow. Oh? And that very night, while she was visiting us, the oil stove in our cabin exploded. Oh. Florence, my wife, was killed, and Mrs. Asher was severely burned. It was ghastly. I can imagine. Mrs. Asher had no one, so I thought the least I could do would be to care for her, since I knew the accident had been caused by sheer carelessness on my part. You took over full responsibility for her? Yes, I did everything I could think of, but she never quite got over the shock of that night, and now, now this, it's horrible. Have you notified the police yet? Uh, no, you no. better do it right now. Uh, yes, I'll go right downstairs and call them. The dead woman on the floor had been beautiful once. No doubt about it. This was my client's. And a certain $50 bill was burning a hole in my pocket. I wandered over to a writing table, and as I looked down, I noticed that the Sunday sheet had been torn off the memo pad. It bothered me. Tomorrow should mean nothing to a suicide, yet Mrs. Asher's memo pad showed Monday already. The sheet was blank, but on a hunch I tore it off and stuck it in my pocket. I was about to turn away when I saw a book of matches from the Conga Club. So I picked that up, too, and then I left. I drove around for some time trying to figure things out. Then I went down to police headquarters to see one Lieutenant Ibarra. It's suicide as far as we're concerned, Marlowe. Everything checks. Mrs. Asher was despondent and she killed herself. She didn't leave a suicide letter, but they don't always. How'd you get in on this? Well, she paid me 50 bucks in advance to air out a small-time bookie or worse named Elliot Perdue. Incidentally... What's the background on Arthur Stewart? Oh, he's a big money fashion designer. Started his business on his wife's insurance. She died in an accident in Canada. Mm. He did a lot for Mrs. Asher because he felt responsible. Yeah, yeah, I know all that. But was she left-handed? Did Stewart come in on the super chief this morning, and was it the butler that found the body? That's right. We checked it all. Oh. Hey, look, Phil, do you have any good reason to think this isn't suicide? No, no, not really. It's just that $50 in advance that bothers me, I guess. Oh, by the way, I've got a piece of paper I'd like the boys in the lab to run a test on, okay? Sure, Casey will fix you up. Uh, Marlo, I figure suicide now, but I can always change my mind. <laughs> I went down the hall of the police laboratory and handed the blank page of the memo pad to Casey. Ten minutes later, he explained that the impression showed a left-handed person had written a number, Bradshaw 7, 7 with a wide point fountain pen, probably on the page just above the one I'd given him. And I thanked him, dropped four bits in the Christmas fund bottle, and found the phone. I dialed Bradshaw 7, 7 and waited. Hello? Hello? Who's this? The man in the moon. Come up and see me some other time. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I like your voice. And besides, 7711 is a very lucky number. Uh-huh. Three passes in a row. But don't let it fool you, Jack. The answer is no dice. Goodbye. Yes. Well? I gathered she was in no mood for playing, so I decided to be strictly business and dialed again. Hmm. There was no answer. I let it ring for some time, but Miss Golden Voice obviously wasn't taking any more anonymous calls. 
I'd left only the long shot, the book of matches I'd found on Mrs. Asher's desk. The conga club was on the Sunset Strip, so I drove out there, found a parking space on a side street nearby, and went in. I didn't know exactly what I was looking for, so I paid a buck ten for a scotch and soda worth 40 cents just to help pass the time. An amber spotlight was glistening down on a set of sequin contours that would have melted the Ice Age down to a fortnight. And she was singing. For wherever my man is, I am here. Forever. I knew it was Benita, the conga's featured songstress, and I knew something else, too. There was no mistaking that voice. She was the girl with a lucky phone number. I wrote her a note, called a waiter to the table to deliver it, and then sat back to watch her as she glided over and sidled into a chair opposite me. It was your penmanship that intrigued me, Mr. Malone. It was your voice and so forth, mostly the so forth, that got me, Benita. Uh, would you care to decipher the Sanskrit you call a note? The waiter said you wrote it. Sure. It says important business. Uh, that's an idiom. <laughs> if you wanted to talk uh, turkey, how would you translate it? Do you know a woman named Helen Asher? Not that I remember. Why? Uh, your phone number showed up on a memo pad. How do you account for that? How should I know? Maybe she intended to call me up. Look, you're quite a handsome man, Mr. Marlowe. But <laughs> you look silly with your nose bent. Why do you keep sticking it into other people's business? Because besides being paid for it, it sometimes leads to meeting interesting and beautiful people. Present company included. What do you want? Mrs. Asher killed herself tonight. Mrs. Asher's dead? Yeah, yeah. And considering you said you didn't know her, you look very put out about it. All right. I'll you win. But let's not talk about it here. Finish your drink while I get out of this costume. Then meet me outside by the front door in ten minutes. she headed for the back of the club, I headed to the front. I got out the door and down to my car just in time to see her leave by the stage entrance. She jumped into a yellow convertible, ripped down Sunset Boulevard, turned on to Doheny, and scraped to a halt in front of the region apartments. At the door, a tall, sunburned man popped up from somewhere and intercepted her. It was Elliot Perdue. A short but hot argument took place, and apparently Perdue won, because they went in together. I found the name Benita Malone over the mailbox in number five got to her apartment door just as the second round started. No, I haven't changed my mind, Elliot. I've been doing a little research since you threw me over, Benita. I've got you and your precious plans right here in the palm of my hand. What are you talking about? This. This little heart-shaped locket on this little golden chain. Let me see oh, that. No, no, no. I'm not showing this trinket until just the right moment. Listen, Elliot. I don't know what's brewing in that slimy brain of yours. But get this, if you try to monkey with my life again, so help me, I'll kill you now. Get out! Benita, would you be interested if I told you that I know Mrs. Asher's secret? And would you be interested if I told you that Mrs. Asher killed herself tonight? That slows you down, doesn't it, bright boy? Yes, but it doesn't stop me, beautiful. I'll be seeing you before you know it. I ducked into an alcove and heard Benita slam the door and produce coattails as he left. <laughs> Purdue, a locket, and Benita Malone added up some way to a bullet in the head for a scarred woman with a secret. I went back to my car and drove out to Stewart's house in Bel Air. When you were here before, Marlowe, I was so upset I hardly realized you were a private detective. Uh, you had an appointment with Mrs. Asher. Had uh, she hired you? Yes, to investigate someone, but she didn't live long enough to give me the details. Now, what sort of trouble could she have been in to have needed a private detective? I don't know. But perhaps you can help me find out by answering a few questions. Right? Anything. Anything at all, Mr. Marlowe. Does the name Elliot Perdue mean anything to you, Mr. Stewart? Elliot Perdue? No, I'm afraid not. How about uh, Benita Malone? Well, I've never heard of her. Hmm. You know anything about a heart-shaped locket on a gold chain? A locket? A gold locket? Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Asher had a heart-shaped gold locket. Where'd she keep it? Well, upstairs in her jewelry box, I should imagine. Come on, let's have a look, huh? Yes. Right up these stairs here. Yeah, this is her room, Marlowe. I know. I was here once before. Why? 
It, it, it's not here. It's not on her dressing table. Her, her jewelry box, it's gone, Marlowe. But you think that... Elliot it... Perdue has it. I can't understand, Bruce. That's the locket like. What's inside it? Just a picture. It was valued by Mrs. Asher because it was the only one she kept of herself the way she looked before the accident. Now, why would anyone else want that? I don't know. But when we get that locket, we'll get a lot of answers along with it. Now I was more convinced than ever that Elliot Perdue, Benita, and the late Mrs. Ash's secret were all dangling from the same chain that supported the gold locket. I said goodnight to Arthur Stewart and started back for Hollywood. But a moment later, I changed my mind and abruptly swung onto a shadowed side road and parked lights out. It had suddenly occurred to me that a gallivanting Mr. Perdue might call on Stewart. And if so, I wanted to be on hand. Well, Forty minutes later, I was about to call off the cloak and dagger routine when I, I heard the sound of a powerful motor roaring out of Stewart's driveway. I looked up just in time to see a long black mash whip by with Stewart at the wheel. From the speed of the car, I was certain he wasn't going out for the morning papers decided to go back to the house and question the butler while I could have him to myself. Oh, why, no, Mr. Marlowe. I haven't any idea where Mr. Stewart went. I only know that he had a telephone call, after which he dashed out of the house highly upset. Well, maybe some sick friend needed sitting up with, huh? But tell me, Roberts, did you ever hear of a man named Elliot Perdue? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, he called on Mrs. Asher here once or twice while Mr. Stewart was away on business. When did you last see this Mr. Perdue, Roberts? Uh, yesterday morning, sir, about 10 o'clock. Hmm. And one thing more, did you ever see Mrs. Asher wearing a gold locket, a heart-shaped one? Oh, quite often, sir. As a matter of fact, she asked me about it just yesterday morning, shortly after Mr. Perdue left. She couldn't locate it anyplace. A singular coincidence, huh? Oh, by the way, what do you know about a singer named Benita? Benita? Uh, I've never heard of her, sir. Are you sure she's never been out here as Mr. Stewart's guest? Why, I'm positive, sir. Uh, Mr. Stewart never has any ladies out here of any kind. Oh? Doesn't that strike you as being strange, Robert? After all, Mr. Stewart's a very eligible widower. Widower, yes, Mr. Marlowe, but philanderer, no. Good night, sir. As I drove back to Hollywood, I tried to figure out where Arthur Stewart had gone. But I had about as much to work with as Gypsy Rose Lee after a third encore. And after discounting Benita's place in the conga, there was only Elliot Perdue's house on North Ogden. Fifteen minutes later, I walked up to it, but the place was as dark and as quiet as the inside of a coffin. I was about to turn back to my car when suddenly I caught the reflection of a sliver of light bouncing off the glass in Mr. Perdue's living room. I found the back door lock easy to bluff. A moment later, I stepped into the living room. Hello. How, how did you know I was here? Mr. Stewart told me. You're a liar. Arthur wouldn't... Arthur? Uh, I... Well, you see, Mr. Stewart and I... Oh, I... no, it's Mr. Stewart, huh? Wait a minute, there's someone outside. Purdue. Put out your light. Now, when he finds you, keep talking, say anything. I'll be behind the door. Here he is. What? Well, Benita. <laughs> what a waste of time, my dear. While you've been here rearranging my socks, I've been talking to your boyfriend with the locket safely tucked away right here in my breast pocket. How clever of you. How absolutely ingenious. It's a bit late for nasty words between us, Benita, because possession of you was part of the bargain I struck with Mr. Stewart. You see, we... What are you staring at? My big blue eyes, for two. Don't move or I'll blast you. You'll do nothing. Don't... Get the gun, Benita. Now, for two, we'll play some more. <laughs> Now the gentleman's breast pocket. Ah, here it is, Benita. Safe and sound. Which is just the way I want it, Phil. What? My own gun. Why, you beautiful the snake. The locket, Marlowe. Come on, I get nervous with one of these things in my hand. Throw it here. Thank you. Now when I leave, Phil, don't come after me. Because I'd hate to fill you full of little holes. Good night, dear. <laughs> Benita stepped out of that house. I solemnly swore I wouldn't trust another woman for the next hundred years. But a groan from the body on the floor brought me back to 1948 and Elliot Perdue. I knew that he had seen the picture in the locket, so I went to work on him. Come on, Perdue, snap out of it. Come on. 
Huh? Oh, it's you, Marlowe. Who'd you expect, St. Peter? What was in the locket, Purdue? I don't remember. Maybe a call on Lieutenant Ibarra will refresh your memory. I doubt it. And we better start playing games again. We'll start with one called Slap Slap Purdue. No, no, no. Let me alone, Marlowe. Get your hands off me. Uh, you're ready to start singing, huh? All we need now is the right lyrics. Oh, no. come on, Purdue. Talk. Stop it. Stop it. I'll talk. Good. Now, why did Mrs. Asher kill herself? Because she had a good reason. Like what? No, it's a long story. Make it short. Okay, Marlo. Here goes. Lieutenant Ibarra speaking. Marlo Ibarra has a five-minute-old corpse lying in his living room at 1903 North Ogden. Name is Elliot Perdue. Three shots through a closed window. I was lucky. Any description of the killer? No, none. Now, look, Ibarra, right now I'm going after a songbird named Benita Malone at the Regent Apartments on Doheny. Will you cover me there without sirens? Sure, Marlowe. I'll attend to it in person. It was only a healthy centerfielder's peg from Bedew's house to Benita's. When I got there, the place was dark and a car wasn't in sight. I decided to try the conga club. But as soon as I walked in, I began to worry because if Benita had wanted to get rid of that lock, she'd have had enough time to bury it at Forest Lawn. But I didn't know Benita because Miss Oomph herself was singing in the amber spotlight and dangling from her soft white neck was the heart-shaped gold locket. I love Because he's wonderful. Because he's just mine. When she caught my eyes, she smiled like a maitre d', and the moment she was through with her song, she headed back in my direction. But before she got to me, I saw her give the high sign to an ape in a tuxedo. He looked at her, and then across toward my table, and left the room. I watched Benita glide across the floor in my direction. She was distinctly a thing of beauty. Well, Phil, what do you think of my singing? Oh, I'm just crazy about it. That and your jewelry. Especially that locket, family heirloom. Mm -hmm. It was more or less handed down to me, generation to generation. That's an old uh, Spanish custom. Yeah, 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 so I've been told. And I imagine tradition prohibits your parting with it, huh? That's right. Unless, of course, someone, someone with oodles of money offers me lots of it in exchange. Then naturally I'd be obliged to part with it. I don't think you'd feel obliged to your mother on the second Sunday in May. Besides, I don't have oodles of money. Oh, you should have told me that earlier. Goodbye, good luck. Hey, wait a minute. We couldn't do any business in a minute. And don't follow me if you want to stay pretty. She pivoted on a spike heel and took off for a dressing room, and I knew that if I followed, I was scheduled for a nasty tete tape with an ape in a tuxedo. When I made the lower floor and saw that the long corridor to a room was empty, I knew the setup. The ape would be on the other side of the door waiting. Benita still had my gun, so I got the nearest substitute for a blackjack, a full bottle of Paul Masson champagne. Then I walked noisily down the corridor as far as her door and knocked. Turned the knob slowly, kicked the door open, and stood clear. It worked. The ape's hairy hand was wrapped around my gun, and it came down in a knock that was never interrupted. And that left him on balance. <laughs> hit the floor, and before Benita had a chance to close her mouth, I ripped the locket from my neck, picked my gun up, and ran. I didn't stop until I collapsed against the store window. Then I opened up the locket. Two minutes ran out of me before I realized what was wrong with the picture. Then I knew. Arthur Stewart's home in Bel Air was my next stop. <laughs> Thirty minutes later, I pulled up away from the place and parked. And keeping in the shadows, I approached the house where only the library and an upstairs bedroom showed any light. The library had French windows. When I moved up close, I was startled by the sight of a figure going through Stuart's desk. I stepped into the room and found it was my little friend, Benita. I've got my own gun again, Benita. Phil. Oh, doing a little dusting, honey? Oh, don't be funny. I'm not trying to. How is it you're not upstairs helping Stuart pack? Because I've already finished packing, Mr. Marlowe, and don't turn around. 
That was well done, Benito. Oh, fine. Sucked in by a little decoy sprinkled with sequins. Don't mind the pose, Marlowe. Just toss your gun on the couch over there. Now. Uh, that's better. You know, Marlowe, I can't say that I'm very sorry for you. I don't expect condolences from a character who murdered a woman this afternoon and a man this evening. You killed Mrs. Asher? Yes. And that blackmailing scum for you as well. But both murders were very necessary, Benita. Even as Marlowe's here will be. Come over here, Benita. Behind me. Hurry, Arthur. Let's get out of here. Don't worry. And now, Mr. Marlowe, it's time for you. <laughs> well. <laughs> Thanks, Benita. You swing a beautiful bookend. You know, I had you figured all wrong. No, don't mention it, dear. I heard the cops coming anyway. You sweet child. We're in here. He bought all of us. Oh, Marlowe, I figured you'd be out here when he didn't show up at that songbird's place. Well, what's this? A little man on the floor with a large bump on his head is Arthur Stewart. The man who killed Elliot Perdue to keep him from telling me the truth about Mrs. Asher. And the man who killed her this afternoon. So Mrs. Asher didn't commit suicide after all. No, but she wasn't murdered either. She died in that accident in Canada three years ago. What are you talking about? Well, the woman that Stewart killed here this afternoon wasn't Mrs. Asher. It was his wife, Mrs. Florence Stewart. You see, there must have been a mix-up in identifying the bodies of the two women at the time of the accident. Mm -hmm. Stewart and his wife had Mrs. Asher buried as Mrs. Stewart. And they collected the insurance neat, huh? Yeah. But what happened? Yeah, it's simple. Stewart got bored with his scarred and unattractive wife, and he started running around with choice little numbers. Like Benita here. Still honest, I didn't know a thing about this. Stewart told me that Mrs. Asher depended on him so heavily that she'd be crushed at his seeing another woman. But I didn't know she was his wife. Marlowe, how do you figure this all out? From a locket that belonged to the woman we knew as Mrs. Asher. It had a picture of Stuart and Mrs. Asher taken in dress clothes before she was scarred. Yet Stuart claimed that he and his wife had only met Mrs. Asher the day of the accident. And on a camping trip at that. But, Phil, I saw the picture, too, and I didn't figure that out. That's because you were too busy trying to figure just how much the locket was worth to Arthur Stewart. Or to anybody. In cold cash. You were blinded by all the dollar signs in front of your eyes, baby. Why, Phil, how can you say such things? Now, Marlowe, just so I don't toss and turn all night, tell me just why you were hired in the first place. Well, Ibarra, it goes something like this. When Purdue knew that he was losing Benita to Stewart, he decided to check up on the opposition. And he not only found out what he wanted to know, but he found out a lot of things, too, that he didn't want to know. Mrs. Stewart, the late Mrs. Asher, became suspicious of his questioning. And incidentally, of her husband. So she sent for me. Well, Marlowe Stewart certainly had me fooled. I doped him out to be a very generous guy, a great benefactor who was doing the right thing for a lonely, unfortunate woman. Yeah. Looked like he had a heart of gold, all right. But a funny thing, he bought her. In the end, it was this heart of gold, this locket here that got him. Mind if I keep it? Not at all. You had a tough enough time getting hold of it. Good night, Phil. Well, by the time I got back to my apartment on Franklin, the sky was beginning to fill with a soft gray of morning. I pulled the blinds down in my bedroom and sat down for a last cigarette. I had mixed with a lot of funny people that day. And for some cockeyed reason, I kept thinking of Benita Malone, a girl who was no better than she had to be. Finally, I put her out of my mind, and I was about to turn off the desk lamp when I noticed my memo pad. Still that Sunday, which was understandable. But scrawled across the top sheet was a telephone number. And I couldn't figure how it got there. It was written in crimson lipstick. Bradshaw 7. 711. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's cast were Gloria Blondell, John Daner, Jack Moyles, and Ben Wright. Detective Lieutenant Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. 
The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard O'Ron. <laughs> Be sure to be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... They were all after it. An importer, a beautiful woman, a nut, and a guy I couldn't figure out. But before we were through, one was in the hospital, two were in the morgue, and the fourth was waiting for the hangman. All that because of a blue burgonet. Something I'd never even heard of before. <laughs> Dr. Fabian, the ship's doctor in cabin B-13, tells a new story of danger in far ports tonight over most of the CBS network stations. Tonight's story, The Island of Coffins, is another original drama by John Dixon Carr, famed mystery writer. You can hear it when the ship's whistles sound outside cabin B-13. <laughs> This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I started, I thought one man was in trouble and three were trying to help him. But after I found two pounds of tobacco, two pieces of brass, and a boat without a pilot heading straight out to sea, I knew they had all been in trouble. And all had taken the hard way out. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Hard Way Out. I had killed a shank of the afternoon in a Hollywood department store, trying for the fifth consecutive year to select something unique in a personalized Christmas card. A bright-eyed sales girl finally suggested in desperation a smoking 38, spelling out Noel in delicate wisps of white curling smoke. Well, I gave up, settled for a reissue of last year's unoriginal message. An hour later, I was driving out towards Sepulveda and my new client, August Quigg, and I was glad to be away from the pre-holiday crowds and back to work. When I pulled up in front of the factory building, a... Uh, an immodest sign told me the man I was to meet inside was president and co-founder of Quig and Slater, manufacturers of nothing but the best in construction materials. Come in, come in. If you in a minute, I'm on the phone. Listen, August Quig does not change his policy overnight, Slater. Not after 25 years. You should know that, you of all people. Never mind the excuses, Slater. Those you always have, and they make me sick. Partnership trouble, Mr. Quigg? Mm. Oh, no, my partner is dead now ten years. That was his son, Keith Slater. But he has nothing to say here. His father left it that way. Well, sit down, Mr. Marlowe, please. Slater is not what I want to talk to you about. All right, Mr. Quigg, who is the man and what's his problem? My general manager, Frank Emery. No? He has embezzled $60,000 of this company's money in the last year. Hmm. Then isn't this a great time for you to climb the nearest rooftop and scream copper? No. Because I want to save Frank Emery, not condemn him. Why? What's so special about a general manager who keeps dipping itchy fingers into the till? Mr. Marlowe, Frank Emery has worked for me for seven years. And in that time, he has climbed from shop worker to plant foreman to general manager. And that is something which took me 15 years. Which proves what? That Frank can one day go right to the top. Here, to my job. The honest way. And that is just the path he was on until a year ago when he got married. Oh, 
And he started to fill his pockets with company lettuce before he'd even gotten rid of the rice, is that it? Yes, but don't leap to any conclusions, Mr. Marlowe, because his wife, Sheila, is a very sweet woman. Everybody knows that. And if anything, she should be a good influence. Mm -hmm. Mr. Quigg, what's Frank Emery's salary? 175 a week. Oh. When'd you last see him? This afternoon, about 2 o'clock. I called him in here, but I didn't say anything about the shortage. We just talked. I asked him if he thought he needed a vacation. He only sulked. He said he'd be all right in a little while. Then he left. But when he got back to his desk, he only stopped there long enough to pick up his hat. That was three hours ago. You've called his house since? Uh, twice, but I got no answer. Here's the number, Marlowe, and the address. Mm -hmm. Now we better stop talking, start moving. I must know what Frank Emery plans to do. Yeah, this is my private number. Oh. The plant will close in half an hour, but I'll be here working late. Okay. But before I get going, Mr. Quigg, one more question. Mm -hmm. Just so all this will make some sense to me. Were you ever in a jam like this yourself? A long time ago, maybe? And you know what it's like to be in Emory's shoes? <laughs> You're a pretty alert fellow, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> I do seem to remember a rich man who once kept me out of a lot of trouble. But the details aren't very clear anymore, so... Good night and good luck. Hello? Mr. Frank Emery, please. I'm sorry, he's not in. Is this Philip Marlowe? Yeah, that's right. That should make you Sheila Emery, huh? Yes, I just finished speaking to August Quigg at the plant, Mr. Marlowe. He told me about you. And about Frank. Take it easy, Mrs. Emery. Crying isn't going to help Frank any. Yes, I know. But how can I help Frank? What can I do? I'm not sure. But look, can you meet me right away? I'm at the Golden Crown. It's a cocktail lounge on Santa Monica Boulevard near Bradley. Yes, of course, Mr. Marlowe. I'll be there as soon as possible. Exactly 34 minutes later, a two-tone, sleek convertible about the size of a Pullman car glided to a stop in front of the Golden Crown. The loveliness behind the wheel was wearing a hundred-dollar hand-knit dress that just wouldn't let go. I knew it couldn't be Sheila Emery, but it was. She was a tall, luscious blonde with blue-gray eyes that were set wide apart in a face that any angel would have gladly traded his wings for. Now, five minutes later, we were seated inside at a quiet corner booth. But only two weeks ago, everything was perfect, Mr. Marlowe. Frank didn't seem to have a care in the world. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, he changed. He became quiet, almost morose. You never suspected that he was stealing from Quake? Of course not. And I still think there's some explanation, something we don't know about. Maybe. But from where I sit, it looks like you two have been keeping up with the Vanderbilts instead of the Joneses. It always dents the bank account. Just what do you mean by that, Mr. Marlowe? Exhibit A, that knit one pearl two number you're wearing. What? Exhibit B, that splash of automobile you drove up in. But Frank said we could afford those things. I know because I was worried when we bought the boat. Yeah, what boat? The Carefree. It's a 30-foot sailboat. We dock it near our cottage just beyond Santa Monica. Hey, wait a minute. A sailboat, a cottage at the beach, that car? Just how far do you think 175 bucks will stretch these days? What do you mean? Frank makes twice that, plus bonuses. Not unless he has a very fancy paper route on the side. Because 175, period, is the figure that Quig quoted to me an hour ago. Oh, no. No, I can't believe that. Frank wouldn't lie to me that way. Yeah, some guys do funny things when they're too much in love. Oh, now, look, tears take time, honey. How about holding him back long enough to give me some dope that'll put me on Frank's trail, huh? I mean names and numbers, his clubs, his friends, anything that'll give me a line. Yes, of course. But all that information is, is, in, is in his address book at home. All right. Home's our next stop. Uh, just between us, Sheila. What are the chances that Frank has an extracurricular interest on a back street somewhere? Another woman? Oh, no, I'm sure that's not the way things are. Frank loves me very much. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Believe me, if he doesn't, we're not looking for an embezzler. We're after a maniac. Come on, let's get out of here. When we left the Golden Crown, Sheila was still crying in a no-shape to drive. 
So after parking my coupe in a nearby lot, we floated out to the Emory Place in Brentwood in a two-tone Nash, which did everything at the push of a button except dry a girl's tears. At her house, Sheila pulled herself together long enough to give me a handful of addresses that might possibly lead to Frank Emory. But just as I was about to leave, I... I noticed a single phone number scribbled in pencil on the edge of a desk blotter. It was Crenshaw 22131. And since Sheila couldn't explain it, I wrote it down on a slip of paper and filed it in my pocket and left. But once outside, I remembered that my car was still on Santa Monica Boulevard at the Golden Crown. So I started back to the house to call a cab. I stopped suddenly at the sound of somebody in the shadows alongside the house. When I moved toward the noise, a man darted out between two trees, and I went after him. Get your hands off. Why? So we can play another round of hide and seek? No dice, brother. I'm getting too old for it. Now, who are you? What are you doing around the Emory place? Come on, let's have it. Say, wait a minute, aren't you? Aren't you Marlowe? The man August Quigg hired? That's right. But you still haven't answered my question. Oh, no, but I will now that I know who you are. I'm Quiz Keith Slater. Surely dear Quig must have told you of me, the wastrel son of his late partner. He did, but you're still parrying, Slater. Why were you hiding behind those trees? Correction, Marlowe. I wasn't hiding. I was waiting for Frank Emery. All right. We won't argue terms. Why were you waiting? Because I want to get hold of Emery and help him before he goes too far. You see, Marlowe, he came back to the office after you left. What? Did he talk to Quig? No, the place had just closed and the old man was out for dinner. Did you talk to Emery? Yes, and it wasn't much fun. That poor fellow's just about out of his mind, Milo. Mm. Well, he raved on for an hour and a half about how unfair Quig was. Said he knew that I was the one who'd get to run Quig and Slater after the old man died. I don't follow that. When did you become the fair-haired boy around there? Oh, I'm hardly that. But I do own a quarter of the plant unless, of course, Quig fires me one day. Those are the terms of my father's will. But Quig won't fire you, is that it? He wouldn't think of it. After all, that would keep my dear father from resting easy in his grave. Okay, okay, let's skip it. Exactly what did Frank Emery tell you, Slater? He said that August Quigg was a two-faced liar and that he'd settled with him in his own way. I told Quigg that when he got back from dinner. And I also reminded him that Frank had a key to the office. That didn't faze Quigg, did it? No, he said he never worries twice. If Emery walked in on him, he'd think about what to do about it then. I tell you, Marlowe, we've got to get hold of Frank Emery and stop him before it's too late. <laughs> In just a moment, back to the adventures of Philip Barlow. But first, just one hour from now, over most of these same CBS network stations, Eve Arden will be midway through her regular Sunday night role of Our Miss Brooks, America's most charming and most highly unusual school teacher. You've seen Eve Arden make her hilarious way through many a Hollywood movie. Now you can hear her every Sunday night as Our Miss Brooks, just a little later over most of these same CBS network stations. And now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Hard Way Out. It was nearly an hour later before I was back in my office on Cahuenga with my finger in the dial of the telephone checking the names and places that Sheila Emery had given me. Two nightclubs, three hotels, and five friends later, I'd run through the list without a single kosher lead. Sitting there thinking of all the places a guy could disappear to, I I reached into my pocket for a lifesaver and found something else. A slip of paper that read Crenshaw 22131. The number I'd seen on the desk blotter at Emory's place. So, with nothing more to lose than another millimeter off the tip of my index finger, I went back to dialing. Newton's what? Pipe and tobacco shop. What can I do for you? <laughs> Not a thing, old timer. My mistake. Pipe and tobacco shop. Marlo speaking. This is Sheila Emery, Marlo. I think I know where Frank is. You do? Yes, at our cottage at the beach. It's closed up, but I was just going through some things in my desk when I discovered that the keys to the place were gone. And I clearly remember seeing them only yesterday. What's the exact location of that cottage? It's two miles north of Santa Monica and down on the beach, directly behind a large white frame house on the Pacific Coast Highway. Number 1221. You can't miss it. 1221. Okay, I'm leaving right now, and I'll call you as soon as I can, so try not to worry. <laughs> So 
Somehow or other, I made it straight out along Sunset to the beach and then north as far as the large white frame house without being tagged for low flying by any of the boys in blue. But when I got down to the cottage on the beach, I found it deserted and boarded up like opening night at an unlicensed peep show in Boston. Except for a couple of stray gulls who probably had insomnia, I was all alone. But the gregarious streak in me didn't suffer very long. Because a minute later, I had an unannounced visitor. It was a nasty caliber 45 automatic. And the man on the other end who gripped the handle like he knew what he was doing was none other than the general manager of Quiggin Slater, Mr. Frank Emery. Mind telling me who you are and what you want here? Well, a name which probably doesn't matter, Mr. Emery, is Philip Marlowe. But my business with you is something else. I'm working for your boss, August Quig, and believe it or not, he wants to help you. That's a lie, Marlowe. Nobody wants to help me, and you know that. This is a smart trick, but it won't work. It can't work. And I'll tell you why. When the police do get to me, Marlowe, they won't find anything but a corpse. Is that clear? Suicide. Don't be a fool. What about your wife? Marlowe, that's why I took the 60,000 bucks. So say your breath, unless you're interested in joining me, do exactly as I say. Now, here. Pick up these keys and open that door. Go on. Throw the keys back gently. Please, Emery, listen to me. No, I've listened to too many people already. Now it's my turn to talk. But all I'm going to say is goodbye in my own way. You don't know what you're doing, Emery. Stop a minute. Think. This isn't the time to think, Marlowe. This is the time to act. Now, get in. Emery backed me into the cottage, stepped outside, and pulled the door shut. I waited a moment until I heard his car start. Then I tried the door and knew I was wasting my time. Emery had run a piece of pipe through the handle, and Gargantua himself couldn't have opened it from the inside. It took me ten minutes to kick enough boards off one of the windows to wiggle out, and another five to get to a phone. When I told Sheila that her husband was on her way home in a very desperate frame of mind, she promised to hold him at all costs until I could get there. Twenty minutes later, I was in Sheila's house on Bundy Drive. Marlo, what happened? Where's your husband? I don't know. He hasn't been here. Oh, fine. After you called me, I waited, but he didn't come back. Marlo, what did you mean when you said Frank was desperate? I, I'm afraid Frank intends to kill himself. Kill himself? Oh, no, he can't. Now, we still may be able to stop him. When he left the beach house, he was heading someplace to say goodbye. I figured for sure that meant you, but wherever he was going, he didn't want to be followed. He locked me in and... The gun. Holy smoke, where's your phone? Right over there. Oh. Uh, well, what about a gun? Does Frank have one? Yeah, yeah, 45. Didn't come here to make his last goodbyes. That only leaves all this quick. You know what you're saying. Come on, come on, answer that phone. No answer on Quig's private wire. You're accusing Frank of murder. He hates Mr. Quig, yes, but I know he couldn't kill him. He couldn't. Now, you listen to me. Your husband's cornered, and he's decided to blast his way out of a hopeless situation. I'm going to Quig's office. If Frank comes back, try to keep him here. But don't try too hard, because it might be dangerous now, even for you. <laughs> drove down Sepulveda to the black, hulking plant of Quig and Slater, pulled over, parked, and walked up the alley toward the side entrance. Through a barred window, I saw the feeble nightlight that glowed in the outer office. Otherwise, the place was dark. When I got to the door, I stopped. A diamond-shaped key stuck out of the lock, and the heavy door was ajar. I eased it open and listened. Nothing. I pulled the key out of the lock and dropped it in my pocket. And I went inside and switched on the lights. Oh, I found him on the floor next to the desk in his private office. He'd been shot in the chest point blank with a forty-five, which meant that even before he fell, August Quigg was dead. The room was untouched. Quigg's key case lay in the pencil tray on his desk. I snapped it open and saw what I expected. His diamond-shaped key. I switched off the lights and started out. I heard heels clicking up the hallway. I backed up against the wall and waited. It was Keith Slater. He hesitated in the open door, a startled look on his face. Good Lord. Quick. Hello, Slater. Who is it? Marlowe. I wouldn't touch anything if I were you. The police will want to see it just as it is. Marlowe, he's been murdered. I had no idea Frank would go this far. Yeah, he's full of surprises tonight. Are you sure he's not carrying any grudges against you? Frank and I are old friends. That old man in there was different. He wasn't human. He was a machine, a rock crusher with a concrete heart. I'm only sorry it was Frank who did that to him because he'll never be able to get away with it. He doesn't intend to. Plans to commit suicide any minute now. Tell me something straight, Slater. How does he feel about his wife? Is he jealous? Jealous? Why, I... Marlo, you don't think that he might kill Sheila? 
I'm going to call her right away. Wait a minute. If Frank is there, a phone call would only hurry things. Come on, let's go. I don't like the looks of this, Marlo. Neither do I. Sheila? Frank? Anybody home? They're not here. Neither one of them. Yeah, unless they are, they're not talking. Oh, you've got a macabre sense of humor. Nobody's laughing, brother. Look, you check upstairs. I'll see what I can find down here. And for once, I hope it's nothing. I gave the ground floor a fast run through. It was neat and tidy from copper potted ivy on the dining room wall to the sunbeam toastmaster on the breakfast tray. The only thing out of place was a bottle of scotch near the kitchen sink and lipstick on the glass beside it said Sheila. I was back in the living room before I found out why she had needed that bracer. Propped against the bowl of violets on the coffee table were two notes pinned together. The top one was for me, from Sheila. It said, Marlo, I just found this note from Frank. I'm sure he means that he's going out in our boat the carefree. I've got to stop him, Sheila. I turned to Frank's note and was reading it as Slater came down the stairs. Nothing unusual upstairs, Marlo, did you? What's that? What have you found? Frank's suicide note. He asked Sheila to forgive him and forget him. Yeah, read it yourself. I'm going to call the police. Sure, he means that he's going out now. Both the carefree are Say! What's wrong? I, I thought you were going to call the police. I was. But I noticed this phone number here on the desk blotter again. It's a tobacco dealer. Slater, I've got a very wacky idea. I'm going to give it a try. Newton Tobacco Shop? Yes, but wait. It's closed. It's after midnight, you know. Yeah, I know. This is the police, Mr. Newton. We want some information. Police? What, 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 what did you want? It? Take it easy. Do you have a customer named Emery? Frank Emery? Yes. He was in late this afternoon. What'd he buy? Tobacco. A special blend I make up for him. I see. How much of it did he get? Oh, my. Let me think now. Two pounds. Yes, that's right. I'm sure of it. man could lay quite a smoke screen with two pounds of tobacco, couldn't he? Mm. Thanks, Mr. Newton. You've been a big help. What's the matter, Slater? You look troubled. Are you thinking the same thing I am? I don't know what you're thinking, Milo. This. It's mighty weird for a guy who's planning suicide to go buy himself two pounds of tobacco a few hours before he blows his brains out. Put it succinctly, pal. I'm thinking that Frank Emery's suicide's a big, fat phony. This is Lieutenant Ibarra. Milo Ibarra. Catching you at this hour is the best break I've had all night. How so? What's up, Marlo? Guy's been murdered, and his killer, one Frank Emery, is getting away by boat. Can you sell the harbor patrol on running him down for me? It's his own, a sailboat called the Carefree. A 30-footer with an auxiliary motor. He'll be out a ways, off Topanga Canyon. Well, that could be arranged, but where will I find you? I'll need some particulars. I'm going to his beach place. It's in a little cove two miles above Santa Monica. There's a pier and a boathouse a couple of hundred yards beyond. Okay, Marlo, we'll find it. Now, listen, don't get your feet wet. Wait till we get there. The Emory Beach house was deserted and dark. So Slater and I went out to the boathouse, which was dark, too. But that's where we found Sheila lying on the planks, sobbing out the end of a long, hard cry. Slater ran to her and lifted her to her feet. Oh, Sheila. Sheila, what happened? Where's Frank? Oh, please. I was too late. I saw him leave. He waved to me and called goodbye. I begged him to come back, but no, he never will. Don't be too sure of that, honey. Oh, what do you mean, Marlo? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That boat coming in is probably Barra. So I came directly here. Uh, who's this? Uh, Mrs. Emery, Mr. Slater, Lieutenant Ibarra. How do you do, Lieutenant? Well, Marla, what's it all about? Well, the embezzler killed his boss, set up a strong case of suicide, and at the moment is pulling a very fast switch. You mean he's not really checking out? How do you figure? He bought two pounds of his favorite pipe tobacco today. What's that? Wait, Sheila. Well, that's interesting, Phil, but suicide's a peculiar people. Okay, but I'll bet you my sea scout insignia against a dead jellyfish that he's got a small boat aboard. And that he's going to get off the carefree and row to shore. How about it, Mrs. Emery? Is there a small boat? There's a rubber life raft in one of the locks. That'll do it. It's all he needs. Senator DeBarra. Yes, Mooney, what is it? We just got a call on the radio from the other boat. They've spotted the carefree running without light southwest about two and a half miles offshore. He's holding a steady course, but there's nobody at the wheel. 
Bag seems to be abandoned. Well, tell him to stand by, but leave her alone. We'll be right out. Well, Marla, we'll know in a minute. Let's go, folks. Get aboard. A harbor patrol cutter sliced through the black swells with the easy grace of a head waiter after a $10 tip. And all the way out, it looked as though Marla was going to be the bright boy of the evening. When we pulled alongside the carefree, we made her fast and boarded her. It still looked that way. It looked great. Right up to the point when Ibarra peered through the porthole in the closed cabin, jerked the door open and went inside. <laughs> After that, it didn't look so good. Marlo, come in here. Is this Frank Emery? Yeah. Yeah, that's him, Ibarra. He's been shot over the heart from up close with a forty-five. Undoubtedly, the one he still has gripped in his hand there. Lieutenant Ibarra... Is it Frank? Yeah. You better not come in, Mrs. Emery. Your husband has killed himself. I walked back to the stern and sat down. Ibarra was going through his grim routine inside, and I felt lousy. I stared down vacantly at my feet and only gradually became aware of the little brass cylinder that danced across the deck with every roll of the boat. I picked it up. It was an ejected cartridge from a forty-five. I had found an empty forty-five cartridge. All at once, things began to take shape for me. He borrowed! He borrowed! Hold everything! I was right. Emery didn't commit suicide after all. Phil, the man's body's right here, the gun in his hand. I know, I know, but he was murdered. Now, look, I found this out on deck, and the door to this cabin was closed. Do you remember? When a man is shot with a forty-five, he drops. He doesn't walk in, close the door, and then fall. Well, that's... Did Emery have any keys on him? Yes, these are his. They're in the ignition by the wheel. Sure, sure. Look, look, this diamond-shaped one. It matches one I've got in my pocket. Come on out on deck, Ebar, and watch closely. Hey, Slater! Slater, can I see your key to the side door of the factory? Why, certainly, Milo. It's right here in my pocket. Uh, it's not in your pocket because it's here in my hand, Slater. You were so excited when you shot Quig, you ran off and left it sticking in the lock. No. And here's one for you, Mrs. Emery. While the carefree was still tied up at the dock, you stood right here, surprised your husband in the cabin door, and shot him. This little cartridge was ejected back to the stern. But you forgot about that, because after you shoved him inside and put the gun in his hand, you closed the door. Then you started the motor, locked the wheel, and cut the boat loose. I don't know what you're talking about. Look out, Ibarra, Ibarra, he's after your gun. Ah, that was nice, Ibarra. Marlo, I wouldn't have believed this. Don't lose your place, because you'll have to go over it all again. Don't worry, I won't. You see, it's sort of like an equation. Two pounds of tobacco and two pieces of brass added up to two bodies and two murderers. Well, Marlo, it beats me that Mrs. Emery seemed to be nothing but sweet, soft, and stay-at-home nights. Yeah. And yet she pulled one of the richest double crosses on record. Ibarra, she let her husband steal a fortune for her and even helped them plan a fake suicide to get away. <laughs> then she turned around and used this plan, only no fake this time, to kill him. So she'd be free to marry Slater. But she didn't want Slater without the money, right? Right. And as long as August Quigg lived, Slater could never be sure of his income. So Slater killed him, and they hung that on Frank Emery, too. Mm-hmm. And they worked a fast routine of past the detective right through the middle of it all. <laughs> While Slater killed Quigg, I was with Sheila. Then Slater took me over while she killed Frank. They make a great team in a shell game, Wallow. Yeah. But you did all right. Well, see you tomorrow, the report, you know. Good night, Phil. I sat alone on a pier for a long time. I watched the waves come in, and gradually my mind got untangled in the treachery and violence it had been wrapped up in all night. And the lady turned out to be the tiger. And then as my thoughts plowed back through the whole mess of the afternoon when I'd been shopping for Christmas cards, I made up my mind to cancel my order and have an entirely new set printed up. They say it pays to advertise, and if that's true... Right across the top of my new cards in big block letters, I'm going to have the words, Goodwill Toward Men. Who knows? Maybe it'll help. Anyway, I hope so. The Adventure. 
Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in tonight's cast were Barbara Fuller, Louis Van Ruten, Bill Daly, and Edgar Barrier. Lieutenant Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I walked into it smiling because it had all the corny elements. The weird doctor, the beautiful girl, the gloomy house on the windswept cliff, even the hulking menace. Only one thing was missing, the body. And that's when I stopped smiling because I turned out to be the corpse myself, almost. wedding in New Year's Eve were only six hours away, and I didn't think the bride-to-be would make either one of them. But that was before I ran up against the slot machine operator, the escaped convict, and above all, the old acquaintance. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Old Acquaintance. At six o'clock in the last evening of the year, I was sitting with my feet up on my office desk thinking of impossible New Year's resolutions and what the girl on my butcher's 1949 calendar would or would not be wearing. But at that pleasant point, there was a soft, almost apologetic knock on my office door. I said, come in and saw a quiet man in quiet clothes who extended a quiet hand. He introduced himself as Paul Riker, a Beverly Hills insurance broker. But the tremor in his voice said, very worried client, which on New Year's Eve was something I could do without. Hey, Mr. Marlowe, you've got to find Nancy Marshall for me. Just for a springboard, Mr. Riker, who is Nancy Marshall? Uh, she's my fiance. Uh, we were to be married at my place in Beverly Hills tonight. On New Year's Eve? Yes, you see, it was at a New Year's Eve party a year ago that we met for the first time. Oh, when did you last hear from her? Uh, two hours ago. She called and said that she was in terrible trouble, that, that nobody, especially the police, could help her, that, well, that the wedding was off. I see. You're sure it's not just a matter of your being left at the altar? Huh? Uh, another man. Oh, oh, no, no, I, I'm certain that's not it. Now, please, Mr. Marlowe, will you help me? Uh, Mr. Riker, to you, New Year's Eve means wedding bells, but to me, it's something else, specifically a cozy little apartment on Wilshire Boulevard where there's a very nice girl and a couple of chilled bottles of sham. Oh, what is it, Mr. Marlowe? Shh, what, what's wrong? somebody outside, Riker. Get away from my door. Oh, quick! Whether through those shots through the frosted glass in my office door, I wasn't interested in checking up on his marksmanship. Because by the time I got to my feet, he was taking the stairs to the street. When I got outside, I was just in time to see him pile into a pickup truck and roar off. And the best I could do was get a face full of exhaust fumes and the last three numbers on his license plate, which read 711. When I got back to Riker in the glass on my office floor, I found the potential groom whiter, shakier, and less quiet than at our first meeting. Marlow, did you get him? Uh, do you know who it was? No, I don't. Now relax a minute, Riker. And th- yes. Who could possibly object to you and Nancy getting married? But, but that's just it. There's nobody I know of, Mr. Marlow, and I'm positive that the, the same is true of Nancy. All right, now tell me, where does Nancy live? Uh, in a villa at 1428 North Havenhurst Drive, number 12. Mm-hmm. But I, I've already been there, and she's gone. Were you inside? Uh, no, no, the door was locked. But, Mr. Marlow, I, I thought you had specific plans for this evening. I do. But from the way things stack up right now, they've got a better chance of keeping than Nancy Marshall. Now, look, go back to your place in Beverly Hills, stay away from frosted glass windows, and will you hear from me? We're real lucky, Mr. Riker. It still might turn out to be a happy new year. When Riker left the office, I called Lieutenant Ibarra at police headquarters. And after being told that it would take at least a half hour to get my kind of lead out of the 7-Eleven I had on the pickup truck's license, I... Headed for Nancy's villa on North Havenhurst, where it took me ten minutes to outsmart the catch on the back door. 
Inside, except for a carelessly overturned box of old snapshots, which meant nothing to me, and a lot of half open drawers and closets, I was no place. And in the kitchen, where there's a full cup of cold coffee next to an open newspaper, the setup was almost the same. But not quite. Because on the front page of the paper, there was a banner story complete with pictures that shouted the news of three men who had broken out of the state penitentiary that morning. And one of them, a man named Steve Doyle, had a face that I'd seen only minutes ago on one of the snapshots in the overturned box. I grabbed the paper and started back to check with the snapshot once again for good measure. But the second I stepped into the living room, I stopped. Hello. I don't believe I know you. Oh, the voice matched the lady perfectly. She was tall, beautiful brunette, about 30. Wearing a beige metallic wool jersey that covered more curves than a ride on a roller coaster. But the large monogram day on her purse meant that this was not the woman who had planned to marry Paul Riker. I said I don't believe I know you. The name is Arthur Murray. You're late for your rumble lesson. Oh, never mind the jokes, bright boy. It's a waste of your time and mine. All right, then we'll play it very straight. My name is Philip Marlowe. I'm a private detective, and I'm working for a very worried man. Now you, what's your connection with Nancy Marshall? I'm just, shall we say, an old acquaintance? That's all. Not enough. I'll prime the pump some more. I was hired to find Nancy, who seems to be in a lot of trouble. And coincidentally in trouble on the same day that Steve Doyle breaks out of stir. Now once more, exactly where do you fit in? I don't think I'll tell you, Mr. Marlowe. If you don't mind. Well, I, oh. Pearl handled, huh? A very chic. But deadly. Now get in that closet there, Marlowe. Go on. All right, all right. Just so we don't go through this same routine when we meet again, and we will. Who are you? You don't listen very carefully, Marlo. I've already told you that I'm an old acquaintance. It's the season for them, remember? Now get in there and shut up. Nancy Marshall's villa was post-war construction at its worst, closets included. So I didn't stay tucked away with the mothballs any longer than it takes to say old acquaintance. And the minute I'd kicked my way out, I went right for the telephone in my only 100% bona fide lead, the number 711. This is Lieutenant Ibarra. Malo Ibarra, anything for me on that license number? Oh, yeah. If you're sure it was a pickup truck, the chances are pretty good that it either belongs to a party named Maurice J. Calder at 409 South Main. Or one Jerome Graff, 3221 and a half, Melrose Avenue. Check. Uh, what's up, Phil? Anything I might be interested in? That depends. Ever hear of a guy named Steve Doyle? One of that gang that broke out this morning? The very same. Matter of fact, he's probably driving that pickup truck right now. Oh. But look, he bought it. I think I know what I'm doing, so how about letting me run this end of it until I get stuck? Well, There's a me... girl named Nancy Marshall mixed up in this, and a delay at this time might cost her her life. All right, I'll stay clear, Phil, for a while. Good. But just so you don't get too careless, remember... Doyle got out of jail this morning the hard way. He killed two guards. Oh, fine. Goodbye, Marlo. I got the 409 South Main. I knew that my first choice had to be wrong. Because Maurice J. Cole had turned out to be a bankrupt junkman. And his pickup truck, which was loaded with everything, including the kitchen sink, had three flat tires and hadn't moved in a week. So if the numerals 7-Eleven were going to live up to their reputation, Jerome Graff had to be my man. And that made the time to be careful now. Thirty-two twenty-one and a half Melrose was a higher cottage set back about 50 weed-covered feet from the sidewalk. And from the rusted sign, Jerry Graff, mechanic dangling at a crazy angle from a weather-beaten beam over the front door, I gathered that the place doubled as both Mr. Graff's living quarters and shop. I didn't see any truck out front, so I decided to try the alley in the rear before I knocked on any door. It was then that I noticed for the first time I was being watched by a short man with a long face who was slouched against a nearby tree like a marionette with no strings attached. If you're lost, mister, maybe I can help you. Maybe? I was looking for a pickup truck. Seen one around? A pickup truck? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now, I wonder what that could be. Well, it's a small deal, about a half a ton, and... Oh, I get it. Okay, here. Here's five. Now my question. Jerry Graff owns a pickup truck, but ain't here. It's been out since dark. But Jerry's in. 
He's working late tonight. Working at what? Come on, you got your five talk. Okay. It ain't no secret. Jerry's a nurse made for one-armed bandits. Slot machines, huh? Is that his record? Yeah. He used to be a big boy with them, too. But times have changed. Now he just works on them for other guys. What other guys? Oh, mister, I wouldn't answer that for even another five. I wouldn't stay in business very long if I did. But I'll tell you one thing for free in case you're going to visit, Jerry. What's that? Watch out for him. He's a very nasty man. Thanks, but I can take care of myself, Buster. What do you want? Information. Where's your pickup truck, Beth? Somebody stole it, but he didn't leave his card. Why, what are you, a private dick? That's right, but one that works close to the law. So why don't we call the boys in blue and tell them all about it? The cops? No, wait a minute. I don't like the law pattern around here. Come on in. I'll tell you what you want to know. Let's not skip any of the details, huh? Like, for example, the name Steve Doyle. Doyle. Uh, I don't know. Well, okay, fella, you win. The story goes something like this. Want to try again? That may be a monkey wrench. You'll convince you. You don't throw any straight in your talk. Come on. What do you say? Do we play some law? Come on. Talk. Come on. Come on. Wait a minute. I'll talk. All right. That's good enough. So far, I know a girl named Nancy Marshall's in some kind of trouble because Steve Doyle broke out of the pen this morning. Now, you fill in the blanks. Oh, sure, sure. Why not? Oh, Steve Doyle, he used to be crazy about Nancy, but she didn't go for him. About a year ago, a little more, maybe, Steve got picked up knocking over a grocery store. He figured he was caught because Nancy tipped the law to get him out of her hair. Now he's out to get Nancy for revenge, is that yeah, it? Yeah, that's it. And anyone who's close to her gets the same treatment. Now, Chummy, now tell me, was Doyle here? Is he the one who's driving a pickup truck? Yeah, but it wasn't my idea. He shoved a gun in my face, said we were old friends, and asked for the keys. You know where he is now? No, but if I did, I'd keep it to myself. Doyle's full of hate, brother. You can count on that. Now, what do you say about clearing out of here? Just as soon as I find out one more thing. Now, there's another girl mixed up in this. She's a brunette with a lot of curves in the initial A. Calls herself an old acquaintance of Nancy's. Any idea who she no, is? No, not the slightest. You're a liar, Graf, and if I had time, I'd beat the truth out of you. No, you haven't, believe me, because if you don't hustle, mister, when you do catch up with Nancy Marshall, you're going to catch up with a corpse. Nothing more. When I got outside, two things stood out in my mind like a pair of cleats at Carnegie Hall. First, my client's fiancé was not the most innocent dame in greater Los Angeles. And second, I wasn't going to get any place until I could locate the old acquaintance. But then, just as I started for my car, the slouch who had sold me the dirty thumbnail sketch on Jerry Graff came running toward me. Hey, 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 mister. Did everything work out all right? I was called away on some other business, or I'd have been here waiting. Waiting for what? Well, you know, in my game, I now and again give a guy a little more dope than he bargained for, and in that case, I sometimes end up with a bonus, so to speak. Well, right now, we're about even. But if you can tell me anything about a beautiful brunette whose first name starts with an A, I'll give you a bonus. It'll keep you in beer and pretzels from now until the 4th of July. A name that begins with an A? Yeah. Hey, she she visited with Graf this morning, maybe? Yeah, it's possible. Come on, think. Think hard. She's kind of tall, dresses like a million bucks. That's and... right. Now, what's her name? Here, look. $20 bill. Mm. A name, what is it? It's, uh... uh... Yeah, yeah, I got it. Adrian Starr, 1312, Lookout Mountain Road. How do you know that? It was on the registration card in her car. I took a peek while she... Trouble at Graf's. I'll take my 20. Goodbye. I beat it up the walk to Graf's. When I got inside, I found exactly what I expected. Doubled up on the floor in the middle of a lot of oily machine parts and still holding his stomach with both hands was Jerome Graff, a very dead man. I started for a telephone to call Lieutenant Ibarra, but then I noticed something small and gold lying a few feet away from the body. When I picked it up, I saw it was an ornamental buckle, the kind that a lady might wear on a coat. So I decided to skip Lieutenant Ibarra for the time being and call my client instead. Hello? This is Marlowe, Riker. Oh, yes, Marlowe. What is it? Uh, what have you found out? Quite a bit. But first, I've got to know one thing. Does Nancy Marshall have a gold belt buckle? A uh, gold belt buckle? Yeah. Why, why, yes, she does on her black coat. But 
Well, what about it, Marlowe? What, what does it mean? I'm not sure, Mr. Riker. But it may mean that Nancy Marshall just killed a man. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, by this time, a week from tonight, Jack Benny will have made his first broadcast exclusively on the CBS network. Starting next Sunday, you'll find Jack here with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, Don Wilson, and all the others who have made The Jack Benny Show a regular Sunday evening delight for millions of Americans. Just for fun... The Jack Benny kind of fun. Make a New Year's resolution to hear the Jack Benny show every Sunday starting a week from tonight, January 2nd, over these same CBS network stations. And now with our star, Gerald Bohr, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Old Acquaintance. I told Paul Riker that the chances were good that his bride-to-be had just knocked off a slot machine operator. My client reacted like I'd kicked him in the stomach. When he caught his breath again, he started telling me I was wrong and didn't stop until I hung up on him. Next thing on the agenda was I called on Lieutenant Ibarra. Lieutenant Ibarra speaking. Hello again, Lieutenant. Oh, did you find the owner of that pickup truck, Phil? Yeah, I found him, Ibarra. I'm calling from his shop now. I had a talk with a guy. It was Jerry Graff. What do you mean, was Jerry Graff? Well, somebody came in here and shot him just after I left. He's dead. dead. He knew Steve Doyle all right, but I'm pretty sure Doyle didn't kill him, Ibarra. No, then who did? Any idea, Marlowe? Well, looks very much like my client's fiance, Nancy Marshall. I still don't know where she is or how it all fits together. Look, I got a lead on an old acquaintance of Nancy's named Adrian Starr. She lives up on Lookout Mountain Road. Now, if you don't hear from me in, say, an hour, you might check. Number 1312, that's my next stop. Okay, just be sure it's not your last stop. Goodbye. Drove up Laurel Canyon to Lookout Mountain. The only sign of life was a young couple parked where they could look down at the city lights, if they wanted to. I backed into a bushy driveway across Madrian Star's bungalow and stopped. It was small, modern, and looked deserted. Except for one dim light upstairs. I was about to get out and verify that when a pair of headlights flashed down the road and a yellow convertible swept to a halt in front of the place. It was Adrian Starr who got out. She started up the walk toward her front door, stopped suddenly, and then ran back to her car and drove off again. I kept the yellow convertible in sight. When it turned on Havenhurst and stopped in front of Nancy Marshall's villa, I pulled up in time to see Adrian step inside and close the door. So I followed her. Marlowe, what do you want? I want to know what Jerry Graff means to you, Adrian. I don't know any Jerry Graff, so it means nothing. Come on, stop it. You went down to his shop to see him this morning. I thought you might like to know that he's dead. Dead? Mm-hmm. And the cops are hungry for anybody who so much as knew his name. Maybe I'd better come inside and talk it over, don't you think? Yeah, maybe you better. Just a minute. Thanks. Hey, it's dark. Why don't you turn on more lights? Because I like it this way. Okay. But, honey, if you've still got that pearl-handled popcorn of yours, let's leave it out of the conversation. And let's make it straight. Why'd you drop in on Graff this morning? Because I knew that sooner or later Steve Doyle would head there. I had to know if Steve intended to leave town or was still determined to get his crazy revenge. And all for Nancy Marshall, huh? You know, you're sticking your neck out quite a ways just for old time's sake, baby. Steve Doyle's a pretty tricky guy to mix with at this point. You can say that again, folks. Steve! Oh, Steve. Steve Doyle. That's right. Who are you, mister? Marlowe, private detective. Sit down over there, private detective. Keep your hands out of your pockets. I don't like you because you're half cop, but play it smart, you won't get hurt. Well, Adrian, like hold home week, huh? Oh, it's been a long time, Steve. Yeah, yeah, it sure has. Where is she, Adrian? Where's Nancy? Uh, I don't know, Steve. You're lying to me. This is her place. You got her with a key. You've been down to see Graf. You know where she is, all right. So tell, tell me fast. Oh, Steve, listen, forget it. Forget about Nancy. This revenge will only get you in the gas chamber. Please, let's get away. We can still make it across the border. Please take me with you. I love you, Steve. Just like I always have, even when you threw me over for Nancy. Shut up, shut up. Just tell me where Nancy is. Come on, Adrian. 
I don't know, Steve. Stop it, Doyle. Where is she? Steve, you, you're hurting me. Doyle, don't move, Marlo. All right, Stella, I told you to behave. I've been through a lot, and I'm tired, and I'm running out of time. You're getting in my hair, and that's bad. Oh, oh no, Steve, oh. don't. I won't shoot him. I can't afford the noise. Well, I can give him something just as good. Oh. Oh. Now, Adrian, try again. Where's Nancy? I don't know, Steve. Come on, where is she? I don't know. Where's Please. Nancy? I don't know. Where's Nancy? I don't know. Where's Nancy? I couldn't remember where I was. Or how long I'd been lying there, but gradually I got the crazy idea that I was being robbed by a very unhappy crook. Because I was sure that somebody was crying and going to my pockets at the same time. Oh, I tried to open my eyes. But all I could see was a little gold buckle danced back and forth in front of me. When it finally disappeared altogether, I rolled over and hauled myself up onto my knees. And then it all came rushing back to me. I'd been in Nancy Marshall's villa with Steve Doyle and Adrian Starr. And they were gone now, and I was alone. I heard a car start outside, so I got on my feet and made it along the wall to the door. It was Adrian, and she was behind the wheel of my coupe. Stay away from me, Marlowe. Where's Doyle? He took my car. He's going off to Nancy. I've got to stop him, Marlowe, so get out of the way. Somehow I managed to jump back just in time to keep from getting a press job with the tread of my own fist tires. And it took ten minutes of steady concentration to get it through my throbbing head that Adrian had actually stolen my car and was gone. Oh, the cold air must have helped me because one thought led to another and I finally began to separate the facts from the fancies. I hadn't dreamed all I thought I had. And when I realized that, the whole idea hit me and hit me hard. I knew that I'd better get out to Lookout Mountain in a hurry. I made it to Sunset. Hailed a cab and collapsed in it. Where to, mister? Look out Mountain Road. Get fast. Oh, it's rugged in this crowd. Two years easy, you know. Here's ten bucks. Does that help? It's important. Oh, it helps plenty. I know a great shortcut. Uh, a new road that's not yet finished. But how are you on bumps? You more won't matter, pal. Let's go. When it was over, I felt like I'd crossed the country on a pogo stick. But the cab driver was a genius, and with a shortcut, we made the distance to Lookout Mountain less than ten minutes. When we got near the place, I sent the cab back down the hill out of danger. I went the rest of the way on foot. As I got within sight of Adrian's bungalow, I saw Steve Doyle getting out of the yellow convertible. He ran up to the house, tried the door, it was locked. Nancy, where are you? So have we, Doyle. Drop that gun. Stand still. Okay, sucker. You won't need that gun anymore, Doyle. Just kick it over there out of the way. Someday I'll get you for this fella. I doubt it, Steve. You're all finished, but you're too thick-headed to see it. Well, I guess it's time to relax and wait for Adrian. And we call the cops, Adrian huh? Adrian just arrived, Marlowe. Don't what? turn around or I'll kill you. Adrian. There we are, Marlowe. Touch your gun back here to me. Come on now. Oh, Steve. Steve, are you hurt bad, darling? Can you make it to the car? I'll try it, Ben. Got me on the side. It's bad. Oh, Steve, hurry, darling, hurry. I'll be with you in a minute. I'll make it okay. Well, Marlo? Yeah. Okay, Adrian. Tell me one thing first, Marlo. Did Steve get to Nancy? No. You killed Graf in time to shut him up, too. So Steve will never know the truth, will he, Adrian? Could be it was you who crossed him and sent him to prison. You'll never find out. Not now. And you'll never realize how much I love him either. That's why I did it, Marlo. It was the only way I could hold him for myself. And I was willing to wait. Can you understand that? Yeah. I guess I can. Too bad a love like yours has to be wasted on a guy like Steve. You'll never get away, honey. Not with him. You'll never make it. Maybe not. But if he goes out, at least I'll be with him, Marlo, and that's the way I want it. Well, if you're going to do anything, Adrian, you better get it over with fast. That siren's a friend of mine. He's coming here. Adrian! He's coming, Steve. You're a good guy, Marlo, and a smart one. Just don't follow us, that's all. So long, Marlo. Happy New Year! Marlowe! Marlowe, 
right, Carl, just pull out of here. Who is in it? Steve Doyle and Adrian Starry, Barry. That road makes a horseshoe turn. That'll bring them out down below us there, that junction. I've got one of those streets blocked, but the other one's wide open. Look, Ibarra, there they are. She's stopping at the crossroad. Yeah, they've spotted my men down there. She's turning around. They're heading out the other way. She must be crazy, Marlowe. They'll never make that curve at that speed. They're not slowing down, Ibarra. She's heading straight for that stone wall. Well, Speed, that's it. It's all over. They're both dead when the boys got to them. Killed instantly. By the way, how's your head feel now? Any better? I'm okay, Byrne. Did you take care of Nancy Marshall all right? Yeah, she locked herself upstairs. Sent her home to Paul Reich on the squad car. The driver hurries. They can still be married on New Year's Eve. Yeah, the peg does Jerry Graff's kill earlier tonight, Marlowe. What made you change your mind? Well, I found a gold buckle near Graff's body bar. I figured it was a fancy little belt buckle that Nancy had dropped. But I saw exactly the same buckle when I was coming to it. Doyle hit me on the head. And it wasn't on a belt. It was on a shoe. Adrian's shoe. It was the mate of the one I'd found. Once you know Adrian Starr killed Graff, you put the rest of it together, is that it? Uh-huh. See, for a price, Graff helped Adrian double-cross Steve. She had to kill him to keep him from talking. She hid Nancy out for the same reason. If she knew that if Steve ever got to Nancy, he'd learn the truth. I wonder why she didn't kill Nancy, too. I think she intended to, Ibarra. And she did it all, really, because she loved that guy too much. Strange deal, Marlowe, right to the end. You know, she didn't have a chance to make that curve down there the way she was driving. Not even if she wanted to make it, Ibarra. Yeah. Well, it's five minutes to midnight, Phil. Happy New Year, fella. I want to see a lot of you in 1949. Same to you, Lieutenant. Good night. After Ibarra and the others left, I stayed up on Lookout Mountain and watched New Year come to Los Angeles. A new year. Didn't seem to change things much, at least on the surface. Somewhere down the road, a gang struck up old Lang Syne. I thought again of Adrian Starr, a girl who loved not wisely, who had called herself an old acquaintance. Yeah, I'd never forget her. As I walked back to my car, the city was ringing out the old and ringing in the new. And I wished then that someplace on everybody's list of resolutions, they'd make room for that cup of kindness they were singing about. And then a guy could say, Happy New Year, and mean it. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gloria Blondell, Edgar Barrier, David Ellis, Lou Krugman, and Stan Waxman. Lieutenant Abarro was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... They all knew he was aboard the yacht when it exploded and sank. And everybody called his death an accident. Yeah, that is everybody except the corpse himself. He said it was murder. An hour of wonderful, delirious comedy is still to come to you tonight on CBS. You'll soon hear Hollywood's Eve Arden starring as the unusual schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks. Later, Lum and Abner will open the doors of the Jotham Down store in Pine Ridge, Arkansas, and let you stock up on the last from their never-failing supply of wisdom and good humor. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is heard at 9.30, and Lum and Abner at 10 o'clock, both Eastern Standard Time, over most of these same CBS network stations.
starring on the electric theater which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. aboard the yacht when it exploded and sank, and everybody called his death an accident. That is, everybody except the corpse himself. He said it was murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Restless Day. It had been a long, hard Saturday night that topped off a long, rugged week. When I finally got to bed dog-tired at 5 a.m. Sunday morning, I was planning to stay there until I'd caught up in all the sleep I'd lost and gained a running head start on the coming week. And by three in the afternoon on the day of rest, I figured that job was only about half done. But whoever it was that started riding my doorbell had a different idea. I held out until the buzzer stopped, but it was only a change of tactics, so I gave up. All right, all right, I know when I'm licked. Just a minute. Thank heaven you're in, Mr. Marlowe. Hmm? I don't know what I'd have done otherwise. <coughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. Here, read this. This story on the front page. What? No, down here. Oh. Yacht explosion, death label accident. Huh? Yes, yes. Mm. Mystery blast which destroyed the Rollins yacht at Santa Monica Friday night, and in which Benjamin Rollins, noted cosmetics manufacturer, was killed, was established today by police investigators as accidental. <coughs> oh, I smoke too much. That's all right. The explosion which shattered and sank the 50-foot pleasure boat was caused by a leaking fuel line. Rollins, known to be a chain smoker, is believed by witnesses... To have continued on page seven. Never mind, Marlowe. I'll tell the rest. Yeah. Think you'll make it? There are two frightening things wrong with that story. Well, go ahead. Frighten me. First, the explosion was no accident. That fuel line was repaired a week ago. Second, Ben Rollins was not killed. You're yeah, shaking my faith in the American press. How do you know all this? Because I am Benjamin Rollins. Yes, well, look, fella, you better dial 116 on the phone and tell the police all about it, Oh, huh? no, that's exactly what I can't do. Someone's tried to murder me. If they find out I'm still alive, I'll be a target for a second attempt. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I need two things right now. One, a cup of coffee. Would you like some? No, milk, if you please. My doctor insists. Okay, come on. The yeah, other's a good, solid explanation of why everybody thinks you were aboard that yacht. Well, first, they believe my body was lost in the explosion. You see, I intended to spend the night there because Lucille, my wife, and I quarreled. Mm -hmm. But I got a call, and I had to go out of town on business at the last minute. I went out to the boat, but only to pick up some papers. I was in a hurry. I must have left the lights on. I lost my hat in the wind on the way back. <laughs> it, was found. it was found in the water. Apparently, I didn't secure the dinghy because that was a drift offshore. Mind you, I read all this in the paper when I got back this morning. Back from where? Phoenix. Arizona. Figures. I came in on the California Limited. You can check on that. Marlowe, I must know who tried to kill me before they know they've failed. Uh -huh. That could be tough. Have you got any ideas? Yes, I have. It might be any one of three people. Three? For instance, Walter Pittman, my ex-partner, threatened to kill me less than a month ago in New York when I won another court decision from him. Mm -hmm. And there's my business manager, a fellow named Slater. I almost fired him last week, the arrogant fool. <coughs> it's always when I get cross this country. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say it, but... Mrs. Rollins herself would no doubt rather have me dead than alive. <laughs> That's quite a lineup for a mere cosmetics chemist, isn't it? Yes, it is. Look, you haven't been running lipstick experiments with somebody else's live equipment, have you, Rollins? Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly not. I've been working so hard I haven't time for my wife. <coughs> Say nothing of another woman. Oh, Marlowe, I'm frightened. I must get to the bottom of this. I'll pay you double your usual fee. Will you help me? Okay, Rollins, it's a deal. 
If I hurry, I might get in on your funeral. Under the circumstances, that should make somebody due for a very big surprise. <laughs> Shave in a shower later, and I checked my wheezing client's credentials, settled him down in my apartment with orders to answer the phone, but not the door. And drove out to Santa Monica, where the not very late Ben Rollins had made his home. I had a list of names, addresses, and phone numbers of people close to Rollins. That is, close enough to kill. I decided that Arthur Slater, the business manager, was my best bet for an opener. He had been described as soft spoken, efficient, and somewhat arrogant. But after I found his cottage on Seaview Drive and walked up to the door, I heard someone inside you offering a similar it. description, but with more color. Mighty routine, Arthur Slater. If you think for two minutes you could throw little Angie over any time you feel like it, after all the promises you've made, you're wrong. That's just about enough, Angie. Not by half, brother. I know which way the wind is blowing, and it's a nice big wind. Nobody kicks me out, and I mean nobody. So think it over, Mr. Big. Oh, <laughs> get out of my way. Yes, ma'am. Cute kid. Friend of yours, Slater? Who are you? Another insurance investigator? That's right. My name's Marlowe. May I come in? Uh, certainly. All the others did. Thanks. Who knows? I may be the last. Slater, I've got three reasons for believing that yacht explosion was no accident. Not an accident? What reasons are you talking about? The one, Walter Pittman. Pit- Pittman? You mean Rollins' ex-partner? You know him, huh? Well, only by name. I never met the man. All right, then. Let's talk about reason number two, Lucille Rollins. How do you feel about it, Slater? Well, you must be out of your mind, Marlowe. She and Ben fought constantly, yes. Yeah. Later, I asked how you felt about Mrs. Rollins. I don't like her. And now, what or who is reason number three? You are. You had an argument with Rollins last week. He practically fired you. And you think I'd kill him over that? Could be. Look, Marlowe, Ben Rollins drove himself like an overloaded truck. He had a cigarette cough, nervous shakes, and bad dreams. To me, bureau drawer eyelashes and glue-on fingernails simply aren't that important. So we had frequent arguments. Now, do you have any more smart reasons you'd like to discuss, or would you care to leave? Just one thing more. Why does your girlfriend think you're a little stuck up these days? You're becoming a bit too personal, Marlo. Get out. I'm not compelled to answer any of your questions. There's an established legal procedure. Skip it, Slater. If I need to, I'll be back. And I'm fairly chummy with boys in blue myself, so I'll get the answers if I want them. Good night, big shot. <laughs> Arthur Slater was like a billiard ball, hard to rub the wrong way. And if he did have an angle, he was playing cagey. So as long as I was in the neighborhood and the trail was hot, I figured I'd have a talk with the Spitfire, Angie. It wasn't hard to trail her. A corner newsboy had heard her get into a cab. The cabbie swore he'd never forget her. Swore again. So finding her apartment was less trouble than unfolding a $5 bill. When I pulled up across the street from a place, I noticed a big car as big as the average garage and older than last year's college graduate parked in front. It was a black Pierce Arrow and someone with a mouthful of cigar hooked behind the wheel. The cigar was pointed at me as I crossed the street. When I went up the stairs to Angie's door, it was still pointed at me. But I forgot about that when the apartment door opened. Angie was relaxed. There were little glints of gold in her green eyes. And the warm lights behind her shimmered on soft waves of hair. A shade of burnished copper. Maybe she was a spitfire, but at the moment, her damper was down. Yeah. Well, Buster, you got your mouth open. You might as well say something. Uh, Angie, who do you think murdered Ben Rollins? Oh, murdered? My mistake, Chum. Good night. Uh, just a minute. This is business, honey. Who are you, anyhow? Philip Marlowe. You ran over me on your way out of Slater's place a few minutes ago and dented my ego. Well, sue me. Who are you working for, Shaman? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. But I will tell you this, sweetheart. The explosion on that yacht was no accident. So I'm checking up on wives that'd rather be widows. Lucille Rollins? Mm. Nah. She was rolling in dough either way. She hated her job, but she sure didn't have to kill to quit. Get your compass fixed, Marlowe. Wrong way, huh? Well, suppose Lucille were in love with, uh, Pittman, maybe. Pittman? Who's he? Shot in the dark. Tell me something, Angie. Your boyfriend Slater has picked up a lot of push lately. How come? Well, some big deal they've been working on at the plant. And he makes me sick. Gets the first sniff of a success, and suddenly all his hats are too small. Especially his old hats, honey. And you can't blame the guy if he's really on his way up now, can you? Listen, Mac, I'll tell you, him, and the whole world something. Nobody is going to put little Angie on the skids. 
If there's an Eve hole pulled around here, Mr. Hotshot Slater himself will get it and ride him a neck. So if you happen to be snooping for him, Marlowe, you can put her right back and tell him so. Now beat it. That's not a bad idea. Oh, by the way, what's Angie stand for? Angelica. But don't count on it, brother. Don't count on it. As I went down the front steps, the cigar and the black Pierce arrow lined up on me again and followed me as I crossed the street and got into my car. It was still pointing at me as I drove away, but after all, the street was public property and the guy could smoke a cigar if he wanted to. Now, by the time I knocked on the front door of the Rollins' home, I was braced for a deluge of tears and a session of red-eyed hysteria. So I was caught off balance by the handsome blonde woman of 35 with a dry, crisp waistline who was cool, calm... And well collected in green slacks. She introduced herself as Lucille Rollins. Sit down, Mr. Marlowe. You said you're a friend of Ben's? That's right, Mrs. Rollins. I stopped by to offer my condolences. But apparently condolences aren't much in order today. No tears, huh? Not even crocodile tears. I'm not a hypocrite, Mr. Marlowe. That's why. I'm merely stunned and confused over this terrible accident, and... I'm not sure yet how I feel. Yeah, it was an accident, all right. Especially since that leaky fuel line that caused it was repaired a week ago. It had been repaired? Oh, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Who are you, Marlowe? I'm a private detective, and I know a lot more than that. I know, for instance, that the insurance on the boat alone will keep you and pretty doodads for several years. And that's only a drop in a bucket. Mr. Marlowe, I think you'd better leave. And I think you'd better climb down off that high horse and listen. Because I haven't started yet. Ben was a hated man by Pittman, by Slater, and maybe by you. And I can prove he didn't die accidentally, baby, so I'd like some nice straight answers, huh? When did you see Pittman last? I've never seen Walter Pittman. I don't even know what he looks like. Ben and I were married two years ago. He broke with Pittman long before that. But you're pretty chummy with Arthur Slater. That's a lie. Why, we hardly spoke until a week ago. You picked a poor time to get friendly, baby. Listen here, Marlo. Art, Mr. Slater, I ran into each other purely by accident one afternoon last week. I happened to stop in at a small bar in downtown Los Angeles. Mr. Slater was there at the table talking with some man, a stranger to me. When he saw me, he came over. He seemed upset. So upset oh, that... Is there anyone else here now? Well, no. My maid went out to the movies. I heard something, a noise. Sounded like it came from the service voice. Come on, let's have a look. Well, I don't know what any... Hey! Was... The light went off. Somebody turned him off. You better... Lucille, look out! <laughs> Bullets which had been intended for Lucille had only traveled the width of the kitchen, but miraculously both had missed. However, had thrown them moved out fast, because when I got through the service porch and into the backyard, nothing stirred, except the restless ends of a pepper tree. But a second later, a heavy, cranking motor roared on the side street, and I got to the fence just in time to see a boxcar on rubber tires skid around the corner. It was a black Pierce arrow. back to the house, found the master switch, and turned on the lights. Lucille, her face strained and bloodless, stood in the kitchen door and watched me. A hole had been punched in the back screen door, and on the floor was a strange object which had been used to unhook the lock. It looked like an oversized bobby pin wearing rubber pants, which didn't mean a thing to me. But to Lucille, who stared at it like it was a centipede she just found in a cream puff, it meant plenty. Ben. What? It's like Ben himself was here. Like he wasn't killed at all. What are you talking about? What is this thing, anyway? I... I don't know. Part of some new invention he was working on. For the last month, Ben carried two or three of these things with him everywhere. Look, Lucille, where's your phone? Right there. Oh. But, Marlowe, you... You don't suppose... Who are you going to call? A friend of mine. He'd better be in, too. Hey, Marlowe. What's the matter, Marlowe? Busy? Yeah, yeah, busy. He's either talking to someone or he's gone out after leaving the phone off the hook. Neither way, Lucy, that makes my friend very busy. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, it may have taken a little detective work finding a much-wanted man last week. But an unprecedented number of listeners seem to have turned Philip Marlowe. For Jack Benny's largest audience this season found him here on his opening show on CBS. 
Tomorrow night, Jack will be back with Mary, Dennis, Phil, Rochester, and Don for more of the fun that's made the Jack Benny Show the number one comedy in radio. You'll find him right here on CBS every Sunday at 7 Eastern Standard Time. And now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Restless Day. Lucille Rollins, the feminine target for tonight, I headed for Angie Gordon's, where I'd first seen the man with a cigar in his face, who I suddenly figured might be Walter Pittman. And as I drove, I felt like my brains had spent the night playing leapfrog in a squirrel cage. Because any way I call the dice, every one of my clients suspected of murdering him suspected somebody else. And just to keep things from making any sense at all, I suspected my client. I pulled up near Angie's and saw the Pierce Arrow parked, lights and a man with cigar out. When I got close to the bungalow door, I... Knew that the lady was at home. Now look here, and that she was receiving oh, a gentleman yeah, caller, like more or less. Tell me your name is Smith, which incidentally I don't believe. And then you start asking a lot of very personal questions. How cozy. Now, please, you do not understand. There are certain things about the death of Ben Hollins that I must know. Things that mean a lot to me. How much a lot? Well, a uh, hundred uh, dollars, maybe. <laughs> what? Now, don't tell me that's all you could stuff into that briefcase there in your hand. Listen, girl, I I must know whether that explosion on the boat was an accident or not. The police let it go as an accident? Never mind that. You are Slater's girl. You must know something about him as well as the other one who was here. Now, you tell me. Oh, stay away from me, you big lug. I don't know anything. Let, let me... go of me. <laughs> you heard the lady. Pittman, let go. Now... How do you know my name? I read tea leaves. And while we're all asking questions, do you mind telling me why you were throwing bullets at the chinaware on Mrs. Rollins? I did no such thing. I don't even know Mrs. Rollins. You're a liar, and it's dull as to sauerkraut. The gun in your pocket will prove it. I, I have no gun in my pocket. Here. Here, look for yourself. All right, I will. But if it's all the same to you, I'll start with your briefcase. Don't well, give me that. Why? So you can get to the gun first? No, because I... Uh... All right. All right, Mr. Smart Man. Go ahead and look. See for yourself that there's absolutely nothing there that concerns you. Oh, 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 oh. When I get my hands on you, I'll break into you. Marlo. And don't look so astonished, Prince. It's called a gun. Why, you little... Uh, 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 skip it, Marlo. It isn't my idea of returning a favor, but it, it is good business. You see, baby, little Angie sells out to the highest bidder. And no matter how I add things up, that isn't you. So exit Pittman, huh? Briefcase and... What are you staring at? That. That little gadget there. Must have fallen out of Pittman's briefcase. Uh, what is it? Twin brother of an item I found a little while ago. Rubber pants included. What are you talking about, Marlo? Nothing, baby. Just tell me how long I sit here. <laughs> as long as you like. Now... You see, Marlo, I just can't afford to let you get the pitman ahead of me. Yeah. That good business you were talking about. Uh-huh. After all, a gal's got to make a living. One way or another, Marlo. Don't she? There was room to debate Angie's point, but no time. So I skipped her invitation for a drink. Both promised and threatened to see her again and headed for my car in the only direction left. The residence of the local pivot man, Mr. Arthur Slater. When I got to within a block of the place, I parked and then approached slowly, keeping to the shadows all the way. But the house turned out to be as dark and quiet as the inside of a coffin. And I was about to leave when some noise a dozen yards behind me said that I was no longer alone. I turned quietly and got ready for what I figured would be a reunion with my old buddy, Walter Pittman. But I was wrong. Sneaking through a nearby clump of orange trees with all the deftness of an ox with bunion trouble was no one else but my client, Ben Rollins. When I called his name out loud, he ran toward me, arms and legs flailing the wind like a Kansas scarecrow caught in a tornado. Marlo, Marlo, I've been looking all over for you. Rollins, why aren't you back in my apartment where you're supposed to be? I couldn't wait any longer. I was afraid something had happened to you. When you didn't call, I was sure of it. I thought you might be here at Slater. But I did call, and all I got was a busy signal. Oh, about an hour ago. Why, that was a friend of yours. He wanted to know if you'd play cards with him tonight. <laughs> How do you believe me? Now, well, for the time being, yes. Incidentally, Rollins, do these mean anything to you, these oversized bobby pins? Good Lord, the curlers. 
Where did you get those curlers, Marlowe? They should be in my safe. Well, I found one at your house and the other in a briefcase that belonged to Walter Pittman. <laughs> Marlowe, these are samples of my newest invention, these hair curlers. They can produce a home permanent wave overnight that will last for six months. <laughs> it's, it's worth millions to me. If you live. Yes. Uh, it should be easy to figure out who wanted to kill me. I'm not so sure. If you didn't even know these were missing... Why should someone have to kill you to get hold of them? And second of all, how come the shooting's still going on? What shooting are you talking about? Over at your place. Somebody tried to kill your wife there just before I called you. And that brings us right back to your alibi about talking to Ibarra at the time. It's a little too pat, Rollins. Besides, that curler could very easily have dropped out of your pocket. Why should I shoot at Lucille? For the best reason in the books, you wanted to kill her. And when that yacht business almost boomeranged on you, you still hadn't changed your mind. <laughs> And that led to this whole routine with me double-billed as Patsy and star witness both. Well, you're out of your mind, Marlowe. I couldn't have set that explosion on the yacht as a trap for Lucille. Why not? Because it was on account of me that Lucille wasn't on the yacht herself that night. What? Now, after we argued, we decided not to spend any more time under the same roof. Lucille said that suited her fine and she'd sleep on the yacht. And we let it go at that until about noon on Friday. Then you got small about things and said the yacht was yours, maybe? That you'd sleep on it? Uh, yes. I was just bickering. Just a minute, Rollins. I've heard enough, and I think I finally understand this whole screwy deal. I'll know for sure just as soon as I can make one single phone call to your house. We'll get back to Slater. Come on. When I got to a telephone and threw it made at the Rollins' place... I was almost positive that in another minute I'd have both a solid answer for my client and a couple of clumsy customers for the law. But when the shaky voice at the other end of the tube told me that Lucille had just left the house in high gear, after mumbling something about a place called Inspiration Point, I stopped being confident and started to worry. And when I tossed the jackpot question at the maid and got the winning answer, that worry became something worse, and it must have showed. What is it, Marlowe? What did you find out? Too much to explain now. Where's Inspiration Point, Rollins? About a mile south of here, mm -hmm. straight along the shore. Good. What kind of a car does your wife drive? A blue Nash. What's Inspiration Point got to do with Lucille, Marlowe? Everything. Now, look. You call the cops and tell them to get out there as fast as they can. Do you get me? As fast as they can. <laughs> Inspiration Point turned out to be an acre of windswept rock that overlooked the cold January sea. And after I saw Lucille's empty car, I crept, staggered, and fell down the narrow winding trail that led from the road to the promontory itself. I was afraid that I was going to be too late to stop what I was sure was a hastily scheduled murder. But a minute later, when I rounded the last crazy turn in the trail, I felt better. Because standing only a couple of yards away from me, her hair slapping wildly against the upturned collar of her coat, and very much alive was Lucille Rollins. I was about to breathe a sigh of relief when suddenly I caught the expression in her eyes. I turned to follow the line of her unblinking gaze and I knew that I hadn't arrived any too soon because the lady was being held at the point of a gun. A gun held by Arthur Slater. I closed my hand tight around the cold 38 in my pocket and moved closer. When you called me at the house, you said that my husband was alive and with you. Why did you lie to me? Because I knew that would bring you running. I had to be alone with you, Lucille, so I could do what I missed doing last time. Last time? You mean the yacht? You did that? Yes. But somehow or other, Ben was out there instead of you. So that accident was a waste of time. But this one, the bereaved wife who jumped or fell to her death from the edge of Inspiration Point, won't be. But why, Slater? Why do you want to kill me? There's no time to explain, Lucille. And we'll take time, Slater. Marlo, you... Damn me. Don't you... Marlo! Marlo! Oh, he's going to kill me. Yes, honey, I know. He had to. And why, Marlo? Why? Because he stole your husband's invention to sell the wall of Pittman. He's going to go into business with him. And now when the cops get here, he's going first to a hospital and then to jail. A grand larceny and attempted murder. Attempted murder? What about Ben, Marlo? Ben was a near miss, honey. Nothing more. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Lucille found out that Ben was still alive. There were a lot of tears and promises to be good from both parties. And it wasn't until an hour had gone by and the police had already booked both Slater and Pittman, who was picked up heading back for L.A., that Mr. and Mrs. Rollins were in any condition to sit down and talk things over. 
Even with the help of coffee and cigarettes in the Rollins' home. Then the whole scheme, Marla, was designed by Slater, who was my business manager, had access to the new curlers. That's right. Knowing how Walter Pittman felt about you, Slater secretly contacted him to handle the manufacturing end, you see? <coughs> yes, I see. Hmm. Well, a few changes in the design, and the whole thing would have been patented and on the market while you and Slater... You pretended that Pittman was a stranger to him. Uh-huh. We're still laboring away at last-minute changes. And when we learned about Pittman's product, Slater would act as surprised as Ben here. Uh, you're so right, Lucille. That was the plan. Oh, <laughs> but it fell apart. See, it fell apart when you accidentally ran into Slater in that small bar in downtown L.A., do you remember? Yes. When he was with Pittman, the man you described him as a stranger? Yes, of course. All right. Well, he realized then that with Pittman's product a success, you would sooner or later see a picture of Pittman, oh. the newly rich inventor, and recognize him as the man you saw with Slater before Pittman's product was on the market. So that meant that Slater either had to get rid of Lucy or give up his entire plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have you got a match, Mr. Mo- no. No, I'm going to give them up. Well, Marlowe, was Pittman involved in the murder attempt, too? No, no, no. He drew the line at the theft. See, when he found out you had died mysteriously, he turned up here to check on Slater because he couldn't afford to be mixed up in your murder. I see. But how did you figure all this, Marlowe? Well, after I had tangled with everybody, I was no place. Angie Gordon was looking for an angle. You, Lucille, were getting shot at. Poor darling. Yeah, and Pittman and Slater were not on the same team. At least as far as the business on the yacht was concerned. Nobody seemed to have a clear-cut motive. But when I told you that Lucille herself was supposed to stay on the yacht that night, you had the answer. That was the time. After I called your house and asked the maid the jackpot question, which was, who aside from you, Ben, knew that Lucille was going to sleep on the yacht Friday night? And she said Slater, didn't she? Yeah. Said something else, too. She also said that you had left for Inspiration Point in a big hurry. Yes. Then Slater tried to kill me first on the yacht... Second in the house here and finally out on the point. Mm-hmm. But in the end, it worked out fine, darling. Because the third time was the charm. <laughs> For us. Well, by the time I was through tying in all the loose ends for my client and his wife... It was three o'clock in the morning, and I was dog-tired all over again. When I got into my car and started away from the place, Ben and Lucille were standing in the doorway waving at me and smiling. So as I drove back to L.A., I forgot about the sleep I was missing and thought about them. A couple who couldn't get along until one or the other of them had been robbed, dynamited, and shot at. Yeah, I guess it's really so. As the old bromide has it. The path of true love never does run smooth. Uh, smoothly. It's smooth. Hmm. Oh, well. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman McDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lorette Philbrandt, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, John Daner, and Jack Moyles. The special music was by Richard Aron. 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 Somewhere in the cold, persistent rain that made the city itself seem a thing of evil, a girl had disappeared, and it was my job to find her. But before I did, I found death and a devil. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Black Halo. For 
Three days in ugly storm had lashed at the west coast from northern Oregon to the tip of lower California. And although it was only noon when I drove up to the sprawling red brick house just south of Santa Barbara to meet a new client of mine, the black that was in the sky and the driving rain that was everywhere left the day bleak and wet and cold. Left it the kind of day that made you feel that logs blazing in a fireplace and a warm, dry robe were the only things that could matter to anyone. But when I got inside the house, Felix Drum, 350 uncomfortable pounds of executive in a wheelchair, who made his living importing perfumes, was very worried. And not about the weather outside. Marlowe, Julia Perry is gone. I want you to find her and bring her back. And the sooner you do that, the better. And the more I know, Mr. Drum, the easier it'll be. Exactly who is Julia Perry? My assistant. Very capable girl. Who in the past six months has practically taken over my entire business. She handles most of the work from her cottage here on the grounds where she lives. Mm -hmm. She also has some little cubbyhole in Los Angeles where she keeps her files and some sample stock. Do you have the address of that cubbyhole? If I knew the answer to everything, I wouldn't have hired you. And anyway, it isn't important. Uh, uh, hand me that little bottle. This there. one? Yes. No. Uh, here. Thank you. Mm. <coughs> mm. Uh. When did you last see Julia, Mr. Drum? Three days ago. No. <coughs> it was three days ago. When she left on one of her regular weekly trips down to Los Angeles to bid on perfumes. Usually she stayed away overnight, but the Beachwood Plaza Hotel most of the time. And she was back here by noon the next day. I suppose you've already checked the Beachwood Plaza, huh? Yes, of course. My man Ruby, the one who showed you in, has called the place a dozen times. But they only know that Julia registered there three days ago and hasn't been seen since. Well, what about the girl herself, Mr. Drum? I mean her background, friends, family, that sort of thing. Yeah, as far as I know, Marlowe, Julia has no friends, no family either. She's just a sweet but smart little girl from someplace in Kansas. Mm -hmm. No bows, not even nice ones, huh? I don't think she had the time. You see, when Julia first came to work for me, she wanted to get ahead, and I gave her the chance. She made good. Mm -hmm. Today, she's as much my right arm as Ruby is my leg. Mr. Drum, did you notice anything unusual about Julia's behavior lately? Yes, and that's the reason I'm worried. About two weeks ago, I saw changes in the girl, Marlowe. She seemed less spry, more preoccupied. Oh? No. Yes. I figured it was overwork myself, since the end of the year always means detailed annual reports... So I made no comment at the time. I see. Tell me, Mr. Drum, what does she look like? Well, I have no pictures, but she's a blonde of medium height and was wearing a plaid raincoat and a little circle of a hat when she left. Uh -huh. Altogether, she's sweet and simple, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Do you mind if I stop into the cottage on my way out? Um, Marlowe, you turn the place inside out if it'll help any. Only since I'm certain that Julia's in some kind of bad trouble, you be quick and find her. Julia Perry's cottage was strictly the 50-50 arrangement the drum had mentioned With one room office and the other living quarters In the office, I found everything in its proper place So I moved to the other room The moment I stepped over the threshold The white fluff that trimmed the quilted bedspread And the splash of color in the drapes Said that Julia Perry had to be something soft and warm the half a dozen quietly tailored suits that were lined up in the closet like... like a squad of soldiers facing right... told me that she was also simple and neat. I ran through the pockets of her clothes and all the drawers and closets in the room... trying to find something that would give me a lead that I was sure I had to have. But after 20 minutes, I'd found only a leather cigarette case... a package of peppermint lifesavers and a maroon and gold monogram book of matches... the cover of which was half torn off so that I could only be certain that the middle initial was a V and that an E or an F were on either end. But since the name and address of an L.A. novelty company was on the inside, I bought the matches as a starting point, dropped them into my pocket and headed for the door. When I opened it, I was surprised to find Ruby, Drum's right-hand man, purple scar and all, standing in the rain, and staring at me like my ears were spinning. You seem to be a very thorough man, Mr. Private Detective. And you seem to be a very nosy one. What do you want? To help Julia, nothing else. But here's a postcard that came for her this morning. It was mailed in L.A. yesterday. Yeah? Dear Julia, tried to reach you at Santa Barbara 1181, both 
yesterday and today, but got no answer. Am, am leaving. I'm leaving town tomorrow. As one little girl who fled life in Haven, Kansas, to another, I would have enjoyed seeing you again. For a bit before I moved on to who knows where. And hmm. Santa Barbara 1181. That the number here? Yeah. It's Julia's private business phone. Well, what do you think? The postcard any help? Possibly. Tell me, Ruby, why didn't you show this to Mr. Drum? I forgot about it until just now. You're a liar. Well, it's on account of the postcard was delivered here to the cottage. Which is no man's land for you? Yeah, sort of. Mr. Drum doesn't like people who work for him mixing socially with each other. Well, maybe a sweet kid like Julia hasn't got any use for the passes you've been making at her, huh? Hold it. I like Julia, and even if she don't go for me, anything I can do to help her, I still do, understand? Yeah, I understand. I'm not so sure I believe. Goodbye, Ruby. It was pushing five o'clock and still raining by the time I got back to L.A. and over to the novelty company. Once there, I presented the torn book of matches that I had found in Julia's cottage to a bald man with horizontal question marks for eyebrows. And who, with the crinkle of a five-dollar bill, tore himself away from his racing form long enough to check the files for a set of maroon and gold initials that had a V in the middle. And it was six o'clock before I had the answer, which was E-V-E. And they weren't initials, but the front name of Mrs. Eve Bentley, who lived in a villa at the Swank Sunset Terrace Apartments. And according to the gentleman who said he knew his oats, was a very classy filly. An hour later, I was at Mrs. Bentley's front door, and while I made with the chimes and waited, I wondered just how much a guy who loves the ponies could know about women. But when the door opened, I had my answer. Yes? What is it? Mrs. Eve Bentley wasn't beautiful, but she was everything else, including a shimmering yard of gold hair piled high on her head and held in place by a knot of pearls that no Boy Scout ever tied. Her face was wide blue eyes and open red lips on a backdrop of soft, fair skin. She wore a black silk jersey dress that must have been sprayed on. <laughs> she smiled when I said my name was Philip Marlowe and that I wanted to talk. Talk about what, Mr. Marlowe? Julia Perry. Ever hear of her? No, I haven't. Hmm. So I'll try again. What do you know about Ann somebody from Haven, Kansas? Absolutely nothing. This uh, torn book of matches says otherwise. I found them in Julia Perry's cottage. Julia Perry's missing. I'm a private detective who was hired to find her, and the matches turned out to be yours. Now, may I come in? Why, why yes. Thanks. Now, well, Mrs. Bentley, maybe we ought to start all over. No, I... wait just a minute, Mr. Marlowe. Mm -hmm. I may be able to help you. Did this uh, uh, Julia Perry deal in perfumes? That's right. Now, how did you know that? Because I just remembered something. And now I'm sure I can explain why my matches showed up where just they did. Just a minute, just a minute. You know, whenever I'm talking to a beautiful woman, somebody's always creeping around in the kitchen. Who is it this time? Oh, oh really, Mr. Marlowe. There's a storm outside and there are windows and trees. If you put those three things together, that noise could have been a branch scratching on a glass pane. Oh, somebody with squeaky shoes and a lot of curiosity. Somebody like Mr. Bentley, for instance, huh? Oh, I doubt that, Mr. Marlowe. You see, Mr. Bentley's been dead now for three long years. Oh, yes. Well, you were saying something about the matches. Oh, yes. This, uh, uh, Julia Perry must somehow or other gotten hold of them through my fiancé, Marvin Whitaker. How does that figure? Like two and two. Marvin is in the perfume business. Ditto Julia. Also, I think he mentioned her name once. Said she was... Very clever for a girl who looked like somebody's kid sister. That fits all right. Where will I find said fiancé? At his favorite bar and grill. But won't you have a drink first, Mr. Marlowe? No, thanks, Eve. There, there isn't time. <clears throat> now the bar and grill. The blue boar. Blue which? Boar, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah. It's a very English spot over on Wilshire, opposite Arthur Murray's studio. But uh, before you dash... Do you at least have a match? Yeah. Whole book of them, honey. Torn cover and all. And I want you to keep them. After all, they brought us together, didn't they? When I got outside, I postponed my run between the raindrops over to Wilshire Boulevard long enough to take a look behind the villa. And there, in a newly planted strip of clover lawn below Mrs. Bentley's kitchen window, 
I found something which was no surprise. Two clear prints of a man's shoe. But from there on out, I got nothing more than a lot of rain down the back of my neck. So ten minutes later, I dripped into my car and headed for the Blue Boar and Eve Bentley's gentleman friend. I located Marvin Whitaker, a handsome, hailed fellow well met, in a white turtleneck sweater and riding breeches. Behind a hot rum toddy in a corner booth, there was pictures of steeplechase mounts against newly antique mahogany. And when I told him that I was looking for Julia Perry, he flashed a lot of glistening teeth at me, insisted that I join him in a warming glass of spirits, and started to talk, gesturing all the time with a riding crop. Why, yes, old man, I know Julia Perry. In fact, almost did some business with her today. You mean you were supposed to meet Julia someplace? That's right. At 1881 Selma Avenue, to be precise. But she called me this morning and postponed the whole transaction. Indefinitely. Could you stop projecting long enough to tell me why? She didn't say. Of course, it's of no bother to me on a day like this. No sane man should be any farther away from a toddy than we are right now. So drink up, old boy. It'll do you a world of good. Yeah, yeah, I bet it will. Look, Mr. Whitaker, one more question. Did Julia ever speak of a girlfriend named Ann? Someone she knew years ago in Kansas? No, I don't believe she did, Marlowe. Matter of fact, Julia never talked of anything but perfumes. Now drink your drink, fellow, before it's chilled through. Thanks, but no thanks, old bean. I do have to run, really. It was a 20-minute drive to the address on Selma, and the rain had stopped by the time I got there. The place was one of those once-upon-a-time rooming houses that had been partitioned off into a couple of dozen two-by-four cubby holes, just big enough for the very small businessman to fill his fountain pen in. When I got to the door and asked the scrub woman, who was a lot of wild red hair around two pop eyes for Julia Perry, I knew I was moving in the right direction because the lady standing in front of me was anything but calm. And more important, she had just heard a pistol shot from the back of the house. Yes, that's right. A pistol shot not over two minutes ago. I'm sure that Perry girl had something to do with it. Because when I come from inside, I saw her rush out down these steps. Did she say anything? I don't know. She was gone out of sight before I could open my mouth. Mm. But I know it was her on account of that plaid coat and little hat she wears. Yeah, yeah. Now, which room is hers? Come on. Well, uh, that one there with the light showing under the door. Mm -hmm. But it's locked. You won't be able to get in. I just tried. Well, we'll try again for luck. It's not the best one, but believe me... This is terrible. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I... Oh, it's a man. Yeah. A dead one at that, Granny. Do D- you know who it is? Uh-huh. From the mud and clover grass on the bottom of his shoes, I tag him as a guy who was looking in a lady's kitchen window about an hour ago. But from that purple scar on his chin, I can do even better than that. The name Granny is Ruby. A guy I thought was still in Santa Barbara. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, given clues, even the newest of Philip Marlowe fans can deduce the characters in CBS's great new early Sunday evening comedy lineup. The washboard leads you to the one and only Spike Jones. The bumblebee? Well, of course, that's for America's most famous non-virtuoso violinist, Jack Benny, who follows Spike Jones on CBS. The two A's, Amos and Andy, who are heard on CBS immediately following Jack Benny. So it's really no mystery at all why millions of Americans now stay tuned to CBS on Sunday nights for these three superb comedy shows in succession. Spike Jones and Amos and Andy over most of these same CBS stations, and Jack Benny over them all. And now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Black Halo. Ruby's body sprawled on the floor, and the girl in the plaid raincoat running away from it meant one thing. Julia Perry's trouble was important, like life, but more like death. A half-sneer was congealed on Ruby's face, and his eyes turned waxy, still held a look of mild surprise. And I wasted some breath telling the scrub woman not to touch anything, and then I put in a call to my overweight client in Santa Barbara. He was glad to hear from me at first. Oh, well, now, I didn't expect a call from you this soon. You sure work fast, don't you, lad? Have you found her? Have you located Julia? Not quite. She's about five minutes ahead of me. 
Incidentally, Mr. Drum, she works fast, too. What do you mean by that? Let me ask the questions, huh? Number one, what was your leg man Ruby doing in L.A. tonight? Uh, Ruby? Yeah. Why, I, I sent him in to pick up some medicine for me. Why? Come on, Drum, you can talk straighter than that and you're better. I just found Ruby dead. Dead? Ruby's dead? Uh, what happened to him, Marlo? He was shot. So forget the gags and tell me why he was snooping around. All right. I didn't trust you. No. It's my policy to trust nobody until he proves himself. I sent Ruby in to follow you and check on your progress. That was brilliant. You only made three mistakes. First, I don't need to be checked on. Second, you got your man killed. And third, you forced Julia's hand. Because it was Miss Perry herself who pulled the trigger on Ruby. Julia? I... Marlo, I don't believe that. Which proves nothing, Mr. Drum, but skip it. Tell me, do you know a man named Marvin Whitaker? Whitaker? Yeah. No, should I? Well, he says he's in the perfume business. Well, I know everybody on the coast who bought more than two bottles of perfume at one time in the last 40 years, and I don't recall that name. I, I think the man must be a liar. So do I. Thanks for the help. And, Drum, if you've got any more expendable flunkies around, keep them out of my hair. I'll call you when I've got something. <laughs> called Homicide next and told Detective Lieutenant Ibarra where to find the body and who was responsible for it being in that dead condition. When the question of why came up, I admitted I was still shooting blanks. Oh, I told him about the razzle-dazzle Whitaker had handed me and named the Blue Boar on Wilshire as my next stop. Ibarra said he'd call me there, and when I got to the entrance of the place, I saw Whitaker, draped in a trench coat that involved enough cloth to rig a four-masted schooner, standing in the ante room, impatiently smacking his leg with that riding crop. <laughs> He looked positively dashing. Question was, which way? Hiya there, Marlo. Hey, old boy, you look upset. Anything wrong? I may be upset, Whitaker, but you're the one that's going to spill. First, are you leaving or coming back? I'm just leaving. Been here all the time since I talked to you? That's right. You see, my coat is perfectly dry. It stopped raining half an hour ago. <laughs> well, well, you see, if I'd been outside, I would have known that. But why this third degree, Marlo? What's up? It's a long story. Maybe we'd better sit down and talk it all over from the beginning. Oh, I'm afraid I can't. Not just now. I, uh, I've i got a date. She'll keep. Uh, not this one. It's something uh, something rather special. Special, huh? Like Eve Bentley? Now, look here, old boy. You're prying into my personal affairs. Whitaker, I'll rip the lid clear off your personal affairs if necessary to get a clean answer out of you. Now, what do you really know about Julia Perry? I told you once. Are you implying that I'm a liar? At least that. For instance, who puts out a mirror? Come on, Whitaker. It's a well-known fragrance. Why, uh, I, uh, I don't recall offhand. That's strange, because any woman knows Amir's a Dana perfume. Just what are you trying to prove by all this? That is a perfume dealer you stink. And try this for size. When I got to that address you gave me, I found a fresh corpse there with a bullet hole in it. A murder? Yeah. And your routine was pat, brother. So before homicide starts combing out the snags in your story, you better untangle it yourself right now. You lied to me. Now, why'd you do it, Whitaker? Why the double talk? All right, Marlowe, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the oh! It was as quick as a wounded cat. The riding crop slashed across my face even before I'd realized it moved. And by the time the red light stopped dancing in my eyes, Marvin Whitaker was gone. I turned as the head waiter walked up to me. He studied the hot red welt rising on my face for a moment and then murmured discreetly that if my name was Marlowe, I was wanted on the phone. It was Lieutenant Ibarra. Marlowe, you can stop beating the brush for Julia Perry. We found her. You did? Where is she, Ibarra? She's out in the alley here, behind the Beechwood Plaza Hotel, Marlowe. Exactly eight floors down from the window of her room. She fell through the glass roof above the rear entrance. Oh. It's not pretty. Oh. She explained the whole thing, including that ruby guy's murder in a note we found in her room. I'll, I'll be right over, Ibarra. Okay, don't hurry. The old story, Marlo, and Drum finally got around to trusting her. He practically gave her his business. It was too much temptation. Mm -hmm. She'd been stealing from him in a big way for almost a year. Her note says... And she decided to run for it when she knew she couldn't hide the thefts any longer, huh? That's right. That ruby caught on some way and she killed him, but I guess murder was too rich for her blood, so she came back here, thought it over, and then checked out. Yeah. And all she left behind was a little plaid raincoat and a purse over there. Hey, she was wearing a dinky hat, too, Ebar. Did you find that? Mm-hmm. 
Come over here to the window, Phil. See down there on that canopy, that little black circle? That's her hat. I sent Mooney down to get it. Can't leave any loose ends around, you know. Yeah. That light, Lieutenant? Oh, sure. Here you are. Thanks. Hey, what happened to you? That welt on your face, Phil. Oh, I backed that horsey liar named Whitaker into a corner and he slapped his way out with a riding crop. And speaking of loose ends, if I ever catch up with that... Hmm? Ibarra, where did that stuff on the dresser come from? Well, this out of the pockets of Julia's plaid coat. Why? But that's impossible unless... Holy smoke. That's why Whitaker lied to me. Hey, where are you going with that, Phil? Come back here. I got to check on something, Ibarra, and keep your notebook handy. If I'm right, this deal is still wide open. <laughs> All the way from the suicide's room in the Beechwood Plaza, out to the widow's villa in the Sunset Terrace, my mind juggled a jumble of facts trying to beat them into a brand new pattern. A pattern that had to include an object Ibarra had found in the pocket of that plaid raincoat. It almost made sense, but I needed just a little more. Now, when I turned into the parking lot at the Sunset Terrace, rain began to fall again. Thin, cold rain. I walked to Eve Bentley's door and pressed the bell. Just as I expected, it was Marvin Whitaker, unsmiling and nervous, who answered the door. I didn't give him a chance to think. I just swung hard. Okay, horseman, that squares us up. Come on, heavy, roll over. Let's see if you're carrying a gun. Okay, no gun. Now, be a good boy, Whitaker, and you'll make out all right. But one funny wiggle out of you and I'll crack your skull. It's a promise. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I heard you. All right. Now, where's Eve? Is she here? Yeah. Find out for yourself, Marlow. I'm through. Fair enough. But just so I'm not talking through my hat, I'll take a look in her closet first. She won't be in there, I guarantee. No, but her future may be. Now, let's see. It's got to be in here someplace. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is probably it. Brown cloth coat, as chic as a pair of hobnailed boots, and still damp. And the label says the BH Company, Haven, Kansas. That does it. I've got it all now, and my chivalry just died. Where is she, Whitaker? Where's Eve? Right here, Marlowe. Uh-oh, uh don't try that. I guess you really do have it figured out, haven't you? Yes, Eve, I have. Sorry it turned out this way, because you had your points as Eve and as Julian. Don't put it in the past tense, Marlowe. As Eve Bentley, my life is just beginning, and now I've got everything I ever wanted as Julia Perry. Then you're Julia Perry. I was, Marvin. She still is, Whitaker. At least that's what the bailiff will call it in court. There won't be any court, Marlowe. Oh, I'm afraid there will, baby. You're twice a killer now, and both for the same reason, remember? First Ruby, because he saw you as Eve. And the girl you pushed out of the hotel window, who was no doubt Anne, your old chum from the hometown. She must have seen you posing as Eve, too. All right, Marlowe. Anne ran into me by accident and ruined everything. I had no choice. I promised her money and then told her to go to my room at the Beachwood Plaza and wait for me. Eve, I, I can't believe this. It can't be true. Yes, Marvin, it is true. Darling, I didn't want this mess. I'd have left town this morning as I intended if sweet, sly little Anne hadn't seen me. I tried to get rid of you the easy way, Marlo. When I sent you to Marvin, the Selma Street address he gave you should have led you to the end of Julia Perry. Is that why you phoned me and told me to lie to Marlo? Yes, Marvin. I was going there to write my suicide note and use the stock room for my disappearing act. But Ruby caught me, and after that I had to work fast. But it's all right now. It all worked out perfectly. They were the only two who knew besides you, Marlowe. Aren't you forgetting little Marvin here? Forgetting him? Oh, no, Mr. Marlowe. Marvin's the one person I can count on. That's what you think. You don't get me mixed up in this. Marvin! I bargained for an heiress, not a murderess. Why, you dirty load! All right, then. I'll use this gun on you, too, because I'm getting out of here and no one's going to stop me. But you're right between us, Eve. You can't get us both. He's right, baby. You're not good enough to get us both. And killing just one of us isn't going to solve anything. What do you say? <laughs> it's been a long night, baby. You just couldn't tell when you were late. <laughs> You want any more of this coffee, Marlowe? No, it's sludge, Lieutenant. 
I wonder what Julia Perry uses for a heart. You know, she planned the thing for six months when she first set herself up as Eve Bentley. Mm. And it probably would have... Check now? Oh, oh yes. It probably would have worked if everything hadn't closed in on her. Yeah, a friend Anne from Kansas, Ruby the leg man. And you with that torn book of matches. Mm. Incidentally, that was pretty fast figuring up in the hotel room there, Marlo. Oh, not so fast, Ibarra. I knew Eve had those matches because I left them with her. So when you found the same matches in the pocket of Julia's plaid coat, it figured Julia almost had to be Eve. And that left Anne to furnish the body for the suicide. Yeah. You know, I wasn't so sure about that until I found the brown coat with a Haven, Kansas label in Eve's apartment. Yeah. Well, I'd better wait on back to the office, Phil. Look at that rain come down. Think it'll ever stop? I don't know. I doubt it. Oh, by the way, uh, here, it's her hat. Mooney finally got it out off that hotel canopy. Maybe you'd like it for a souvenir. Yeah. The military people call it a halo hat. Good night, Marlo. I sat there a while after Ibarra left, looking at the rain in the street and the cold coffee in front of me and Julia's little round halo on the table. And finally, I got up and went outside. Dirty water scudded along the gutter and gurgled thickly into the sewer drain at the corner. For a minute, I caught a glimpse again of the girl I'd figured Julia Perry to be when I went through her cottage in Santa Barbara. Yeah, that girl was an angel. But when I finally caught up with her... A halo turned out to be black, jet black, inside and out. I dropped the little hat into the gutter and watched it go as far as the drain at the corner. And then I went home. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Paul Fries, Peter Leeds, Jack Crucian, and Lois Corbett. Lieutenant Detective Abar is played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard O'Ron. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... A startled corpse, a blue-eyed woman, and a cryptic message scrawled by a dingy man with the pieces of a Chinese puzzle that wouldn't fit together until I found out what was deadly about the orange dog. You'll find a whole hour of fun, variety, music, and thrills on Sing It Again tonight and every Saturday, for it's heard over most of these same CBS network stations. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. A startled corpse, a blue-eyed woman, and a cryptic message scrawled by a dying man with the pieces of a Chinese puzzle that wouldn't fit together until I found out what was deadly about the orange dog. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Orange Dog. By six in the evening of a very slow day, I had resigned myself to the business of no business. So I took my feet down from my desk, switched off the lights, and started out the door for home with the prospect of a nice, quiet evening ahead of me. But I didn't make it, even as far as the door. Oh. Hello, Philip Marlowe. Marlowe, my name is Shelley Martin. 
I'm at 8412 Los Feliz, a private residence. I want you to come out here right away. My sister is in a jam, a nasty one. Well, Miss Martin, as a matter of fact, I was just closing up for the night. Look, I was... you. I need the services of a private detective right now this minute. And I'm prepared to pay for them. There are plenty of others in town. Are you coming or not? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, and thanks for the reminder. That's me you hear sprinting up your front walk. That's much better. And Marlowe, bring your brains along. You're going to need them. And that was the end of my quiet evening. But I just couldn't resist those government engravings of Mr. Lincoln. So I drove down to Weston, turned off on Los Feliz, and found the number 8412. The yard was an overgrown tangle of perennial plants losing their battle with the weeds. <laughs> it was like a girl in a strapless evening gown with her hair up in curlers. However, I could see a light through the Venetian blinds and the doorbell worked with a resonant two-tone chime that caused the door to open just far enough to allow a pair of eyes so blue they were almost purple to peek out at me. Yes, what is it? I, uh, I'm delivering that private detective you ordered. Oh, Marlowe, come in. Thanks. Sit down, won't you? Thanks again. All right, what's the next move? It's about my kid sister. Mm -hmm. She's involved with a man named Lou Horner, a San Francisco broker. She's quite deeply involved, I'm afraid. Oh? You see, some very strange things are going on, Marlowe, and my sister is a naive kid caught right in the middle of them. Yeah, I see. What sort of strange things, Miss Martin? Shelley. Sweet. Well, to begin with, when I arrived from San Francisco today, my sister called me and asked me to meet her here in this house. When I got here, the lights were on, the radio was playing, and the front door was open. But the place was deserted. Whose house is it, Horner's? No, I think she said it belongs to a friend of his who's in Europe now. This Horner person uses it when he's in Los Angeles. Well, couldn't they have stepped out for a while? Mm -mm. You know, you don't look the type, Shelley, but maybe you're just panicky, huh? No, I'm not being panicky. All right, all right. Where's the nasty jam? Right behind the couch. Take a look. Okay. But you know, I... Oh, I see what you mean. Who is he, Shelley? How'd he get here? Maybe it's Horner. I don't know. I uh, tried to search him, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Well, it wouldn't have helped anyway. Whoever shot him cleaned him out. No wallet, no papers, nothing. I found this magazine lying under his hand. Look here. Mm -hmm. He must have written this just before he died. Where's that? Here. Oh, oh. It says, call Marion tonight about the orange dog, a foe. Orange dog, a foe. For what? That's why I called you, Phil. Marion is my sister. And whatever the orange dog of foe is, it must be awfully important. We've got to find out what it means, Phil, for Marion's sake. So far, it means murder, honey, and that's for the cops. No. I... Well, all right, call them. But keep Marion's name out of it. A thing like this could destroy her. But look, maybe she pulled the trigger on our friend here. Maybe, you know. but I don't think so. She's a sweet kid, Phil. Give her a break. If I'm wrong, I swear I'll help you bring her in myself. Is that fair enough? Okay, Shelley, it's a deal. It makes just as much sense as the orange dog of foe, but no more. <laughs> After I checked as far as I could on my client and set her home, which was to the Villa 12 at the Wilshire Gardens Hotel, I ripped the general squeegee tire ad with a message scribbled across it out of the magazine, folded it up and stuck it in my pocket. Next, I called Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide and told him where I'd found a body, probably named Lou Horner, leaving out all the details about Shelley, Marion, and the orange dog. Then I started out the door, but got back as the shadows slid across the walk. I caught a glimpse of a large, ugly head of long, dirty hair set on a small, ugly body that was moving fast. By the time I got out on the walk, long hair was already putting mileage on a green coupe with a broken tail light. It winked mockingly as it went out of sight. So I got in my car and headed for New Chinatown. It was the logical place to get some information regarding a Chinese dog. I saw a light filtering through a dingy window. Illuminating the words, James Tang, dealer in Oriental Curios. Inside the musty shop, a little man, dressed in a black kimono, drifted forward softly. Yes? I, uh, uh, think perhaps you can help me, huh? I am honored. To be able to help will bring fragrance of plum blossoms to my nostrils, carpet of rose petals to my humble floor, 
and thousand blessings upon my head. Oh, that was very pretty. Tell me, what is the dog of foe? The, the dog of foe? Why? Why this? This fantastic creature here is called the dog of foe. His fierce eyes and snarling mouth are to frighten away evil spirits from temples of Buddha. Why do you say called the dog of foe? Amateur collectors and auctioneers have named him that. It sounds exotic to cash customers. Actually, he is a lion. The lion of Korea. I see. Tang, would you happen to have an orange dog of foe? Very strange that you should ask that, my friend. Strange? Why? Reason number one. There is no authentic orange dog of foe. That's a good reason. Why not? Because two Buddhists... Orange is color of sorrow. The piece you speak of could not possibly be authentic. What's reason number two? You are second person to inquire after this non-existent orange dog of hope within the last few minutes. Was it an ugly little man with long hair? Quite contrary. It was very pretty girl with short hair. Was her name Marion? She made point of not leaving her name. Now it proves something. However, my friend... Old Chinese proverb, loosely translated, says, A little knowledge is the instrument of a fool. There were nine other curio shops in the neighborhood, so I started making the rounds for the non existent orange dog of foe and a girl who was interested in one. From the first three shops, I got a fast horse laugh in the fact that the girl was still ahead of me. The next two netted an insult apiece and a total blank on the dame. And from the sixth called Saxons, a glossy, well-ordered place on West 7th Street, the only effect was a coldly curious raised eyebrow. The man in front of me, whom I took to be Mr. Saxon himself, was a gaunt, white Russian, with a high, naked head the color of warm paraffin. His slender fingers played nervously with each other as we talked. The orange dog of four. Yes, I have heard of such a piece. I think it would be porcelain. Probably. This is your business. Who has it, Mr. Saxon? Can you tell me? No, no, I'm sorry. I believe I heard this orange dog mentioned just once somewhere down in the village. But I'm sure I could never remember who spoke of it or when. Oh, no idea of its value then, huh? Now that you mention it, I seem to remember the figure 20,000. You mean yen. How much in American money? I am speaking of American money. It would be an importation from China, you know. How could it be worth that much? It's not even authentic, Mr. Saxon. Authentic? <laughs> you seem to know a good deal more than I about this orange dog. Possibly one would have to see it to appreciate its value. Yeah. Tell me, has a girl been in here tonight looking for this orange dog? A girl? I know. Know anybody named Marion? Marion. Marion. No, there is no one in my acquaintance by that name. But why do you ask? Because Marion has quite an interest in the orange dog. I have a feeling they'd make a great team if we could get them together. I see. And what is your name, sir? It's not Fu Manchu, Mr. Saxon. Good night. <laughs> Saxon's expression didn't change. I turned and walked out of the place, and then because with both of us using double talk, the conversation was bound to deteriorate. At least I had found out that the orange dog of foe existed and was going for a very high figure, especially for a phony. And it didn't take enough backers to figure out that Saxon knew more than he told me. Well, I started up the sidewalk for the next brick of brack emporium when I saw something parked on the side street which brought me to a halt. It was that green coupe with the broken tail light. I went over to it, found it empty, and stuck my head inside to check the registration card for Longhair's real name. Yeah, it was a very foolish move because Longhair at that very moment prodded my kidney with the muzzle of a thirty-eight, And neither he nor the gun had a sense of humor. All right, Mr. Wise Guy, come on, walk. You and me are going up the alley here. What's the matter? Don't you feel at home in the light? Shut up. I don't like you much anyway, so you better ease off with the smart science. Okay, this will do us far enough. Well, Mr. Wise Guy, did you find what you're looking for? You mean the orange dog, Shorty? The answer's no. The orange dog? So that's where the plates are. What plates? You're working for Horner. You don't know what plates. Look, chum, when you get your next haircut, have your brains dusted off. Nobody works for Horner anymore. Horner's dead. Dead? Since when? What's the surprise act for? You saw the body. You were sneaking around that house on Los Feliz. 
In fact, you might have killed Horner yourself. That body wasn't Horner. Why, Horner is three times the size of that guy on Las Pimas. He's bald. Also, he's so dumb he can't remember his own phone number. Oh, hold it. I'm looking for Vastly where they sold those insurance. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I don't want to... Hey, man, I'll blow your brains out. All right, now, come on, Mr. Wise Guy. Tell me what Horner's got on his mind. You know all right. I saw you taking orders from his girl. You mean Shelley Martin? Who else? Thought maybe you meant Marion. Marion? Who's Marion? Shelley Martin's sister. And don't let her worry you. Marion's got the orange dog eating out of her hand. I don't say. It ain't funny, mister. It's just peculiar. Because Shelley Martin don't have a sister, I know. So it seems like you're a very mixed up character. In fact, Mr. Wise Guy, you're so mixed up, you're no good to me at all. So get over there with the rest of that. No! Oh! took my time getting up. A dirty, long-haired little man was gone. My head ached from the rap he'd given me with a pistol barrel. And I was disgusted with myself. Dry, dirty, disgusted like a drunk at sunrise because a nasty little jerk with an oversized head and a blue-eyed dynamo with auburn hair had me jumping through hoops like a trained ape. I stood in the alley and swore at myself until the futility of that routine dawned on me. Then I decided to go hunting. But I made one stop first at a telephone to at least get Ibarra off my conscience. Lieutenant Ibarra. Marlo, Lieutenant. I just found out that body on Lost Fearless isn't Horner. I knew that an hour ago. Huh? The body isn't Horner, isn't Horner, is no broke. He's a counterfeiter, a big one. Oh. The dead man was a treasury agent named Slade who was closing in on Horner. So if you've got anything you haven't told, Phil, you better get it off your chest. At this point, it's a pleasure. A girl named Shelley Martin's calling the signals about now, and she can be found at Villa 12, Wilshire Gardens Hotel. Mm-hmm. You hurry, you'll just about meet me there, Ibarra. Now, wait. Suppose you go alone and find out what you can first. That's a switch. I'll follow in half an hour. Let's not freeze her up, Marlo. Let's keep her talking, okay? Okay, Ibarra. That's easy for her. She's got a forked tongue. Only this time it's going to wag strictly on the straight and narrow. I guarantee it. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, it's no mystery that hunger and cold confront many families abroad this winter. CARE will help feed and clothe these needy people. CARE, the safe, sure, non-profit way to send supplies to Europe and Asia. A check to CARE for $10 will send a 21.5-pound, 41,000-calorie food package or a baby food package or a layette or a baby blanket package or material for clothing. CARE guarantees delivery. You get a signed receipt that your package has reached its destination. Write your check tonight. Mail it first thing in the morning to CARE, C-A-R-E, 50 Broad Street, New York City. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Orange Dog. I pointed my car toward the Wilshire Gardens and a beautiful liar named Shelley Martin. I was sure of two things. The plates that long hair had wise cracked about just before he piled me into a row of garbage cans were the engraved kind that counterfeiters used to make money the easy way. And second, both long hair and Lou Horner were racing for the plates as well as the orange dog, which could be one and the same thing. But 20 minutes later, as I pulled up near Villa 12, which was strips of yellow light, raised voices drifting out of half-open Venetian blinds. I forgot about the gentleman involved and concentrated on a lady who didn't have a sister called Marion. I went around to the back of the villa where I found the service door unlocked and the kitchen beyond dark. And when I entered and quietly moved to a spot near the living room where I could see Shelley snapping at a pompous, excitable man with a red face, I figured that a little eavesdropping might pay off. I'm here in Los Angeles. Is there anything wrong with that, Mr. Horner? Yes, everything. Why, I wouldn't even have known you were in town if I hadn't gone back to the place in Los Feliz where I saw you and some man having a delightful little chit-chat over the body of that tea man. Treasury man? Yes. Is that who he was? A meddlesome fool I caught snooping through my papers. Then... Then you killed him, Lou. Of course I killed him. I had to. Now stop asking questions and get out of here. 
Because this is business, not pleasure, Shelley. And that leaves no room for you. Or Marion. Mar what do you know about Marion? Not enough. But what I do know, I don't like. Look, Lou, who is Marion and what does she mean to you? Marion means money to me, Shelley. Nothing more. So just leave me alone here so that I can make a call according to schedule. A call about... Lou. What's the matter, Shelley? Behind you, Lou. They're in the garden. Lou! <laughs> crashed through a closed window didn't stop until it got to Horner, who grabbed at his chest and dropped to the floor even before the glass quit flying. And by the time I got outside to where the shot had come from, I found nothing but a little wind. And I got back to Shelley and the blood of a tweet on the carpet. Horner was already dead. Marlowe. Marlowe, the man out there was Henry Peel. Peel? Something in long hair and dirty clothes? Yes, I met him in Horner's office once. Lou said he was a broker from Chicago. Come on, both Peel and Horner are counterfeiters. What? Lou, a counterfeit. That's right. Never mind the carefully arched eyebrows, honey. They mean nothing. But, Marlowe, I swear I never knew that Horner was anything but a broker. A broker maltreating poor sister Marion? You're a liar, Shelley. About Marion, yes. I haven't even got a sister. But from there on out, I'm telling the truth, Phil. And tell some more and fast. All right, here it is. Lou Horner's been my boyfriend. And, uh, checkbook? For the past year and a half. But about a month ago, he suddenly stopped being very attentive. And I couldn't figure out why. So you decided to keep your big blue eyes wide open, huh? Exactly. And it paid off. Because I found out that, one, he had taken better than $20,000 out of his bank account. Two, that he was coming down here to Los Angeles. And three, that an item named Marion might be beating your time. Yes. And that part of it upset me plenty. Until ten minutes ago. But then I found out that Horner here was a murderer, and that, Marlowe, I don't buy. Three cheers for the all-American girl. Oh, skip it, Marlowe. I'll live my way. You live yours. Don't worry, honey. Nobody wants to change places with you. Hey. Hey, look. Why does Horner wear a little rubber band on his little finger, do you know? Oh, he had a bad memory. He used every kind of gadget in the books to keep himself from forgetting things, especially numbers. Oh. Well, for example, that rubber band might mean oh, 10 o'clock. How do you figure like five and five. The fingers on each hand reading from left to right. He used things like that. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hmm? Horner was going to make a call to Marion just now, and the message the tea man left was... Call Marion tonight about... About the orange dog of foal. Shelly, baby, where's your phone? Fast. Come on, it's quarter after ten already. Well, it's out there in the hall, Marlowe. Oh. Well, what are you talking about? A line, honey, a line on your ex-sister, Marion. This is Mr. Saxon. Oh. Uh, Lou Horner, Mr. Saxon. I, I, I know I'm some 15 minutes late with this call, but I'd still like to see you about the orange dog of Bo. Certainly, Mr. Horner. The orange dog is here, waiting for you. Good. I'll be right over. Hello, who is Mr. Saxon? A man very close to a lot of trouble, Shelley. Now, look, you wait right here for the law, and in particular, one Lieutenant Ibarra. Tell him nothing but the truth about Horner and what he meant to you in dollars and cents, and you may be all right. But where are you going, Marlowe? To a curio shop on West 7th Street to see, among other things, the orange dog of foe. You are the Mr. Horner who called? Yeah, yeah. Also the one who was here this afternoon, you remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry I didn't call you at 10, Mr. Saxon, according to schedule. I hope it hasn't inconvenienced you. No, that's quite all right, Mr. Horner. One moment, sir. Ah. What's the matter? Is anything wrong tonight? You seem on edge, Mr. Saxon. I am. So please, Mr. Horner, don't make a single stupid move. What? Wait a minute. Why the gun, Mr. Saxon? I promise not to bite the orange dog. You won't even touch the orange dog. Now, who are you? Now, we've been all through that. I'm Horner, Saxon. Lou Horner of San Francisco. No, you're not. Horner would have had no reason to wander around curio shops as you did this afternoon, asking any and everybody about the orange dog. Now, once more, who are you? And where is the real Lou Horner? All right, we'll take him in that order. I'm a private detective named Philip Marlowe, and Lou Horner's a corpse. Hmm. But also, I'm a good friend of yours, Saxon, because I'm going to give you a little bit of advice for free. Call it quits, Buster. You're licked. What are you talking about, Marlowe? The tea for treasury man named Slade. Before he died, Saxon, he talked. I see. And believe me, he said enough to put you away till orange dogs are as popular as lifesavers. And what do you say, Saxon? Do we play it smart? Very well, Marlowe. We will play it smart. 
my kind of smart. Now, turn around and walk through that curtain there. I want to show you something. Orange dog, maybe? Yes. The orange dog of four. I want you to see it for yourself before you die. Saxon said die like it already happened. And after he relieved me of the comforting bulge of the gun in my pocket and marched me to a large, windowless room that was a little darker than the lining of an eight ball, he told me to stand very still. Then he turned on a single lamp that rested on a large, scarred table, and next to it, an ordinary shipping crate and cushioned on all sides by white wrapping paper, I finally saw the orange dog of foe. It was a porcelain lion, pop-eyed and majestic in a crazy way. And also it was colored orange, bright and clear. But now that I'd seen it, I knew that the next move was Saxon's. And I turned to face him. It was then that I noticed the black curtain behind him moved slightly. And long hair quietly stepped into the room. This Mr. Saxon did not know about. Well, Marlowe, now that you have seen the orange dog for your first and last time... What do you think of it? He thinks it's just jet. Yep. Daddy, mister. Now drop your gun before I blow the top of your head off. Go on, drop it. Uh, it's better. Now sit down there and stay put. You, Marlowe, get across the room. Okay. Thanks for showing up, Peel, before Saxon here ran out of small jokes. Don't kid yourself, Marlowe. I didn't just show up. I've been right behind you all the way. That's how I work. So what do you want, Peel? A couple of very fine engraved plates that I've been after for six months now. Plates which could be in the orange dog of foe? No place else but... Or do you think that maybe the late Mr. Horner wanted as an ornament? But that's all it is. There are no plates in the orange dog. It is only a collector's item. Now, you're a liar, Saxon. And I know the best way to prove that. Marlow, pick that thing up and toss it against the wall. No, no, don't. I tell you, there's nothing in it. Toss it, Marlow. Go on. Okay, Peel. Ah. Now, we'll see who's right up about the plates. See it. Nothing, huh, Peel? No. Nothing. All right, Saxon, get up. I want to know what the plates are, so I'm going to count to three. That's how long you have to live if you don't tell me. No, no. Peel, believe me, there are no plates. One. Two. Hold it, Peel. Wait. Here are the plates here. In this jewel box. Look, I... right here, under your nose. Is he... Is he out, Marlowe? Yeah, he's out, all right. He took the light with him, too. Is there, is there another lamp in here? No, no, there isn't. Nor is there another gun. Why, you stinking little... Wait a minute, those sirens, Saxon, they're heading this way. Police? Yeah, the police. Looks like sooner or later everybody gets together in the back room at Saxon's, but huh? But not everybody stays here, so I'll take this wrapping paper and leave now. Wrapping paper? The stuff that was around the orange dog? Yes, a sample of the best grade of counterfeiting paper made, Marlowe. And that's what Horner was supposed to buy, not plates. Those he got a month ago. Still makes you a crook, Saxon, and one who'll never get past the front door. Oh, no, we'll see about that. Marlowe! Keep shooting, Saxon, in the dark. You got four shots left. You filthy maggot! Only one now, Saxon. That's number six. You're through, Saxon. By the time Ibarra and his boys, plus a half a dozen very anxious team men, got into the room, Saxon was already coming apart at the seams. After a half hour of steady questioning, he split wide open and led us all to a basement hideout where the team men went wild over a few thousand sheets of A1 counterfeiting paper. But an hour later, after Peel, who admitted murdering Lou Horner, and Saxon, who was ready for the nearest straitjacket, were both in the lockup, there was still the problem of the glib lass from San Francisco. But finally, when Shelley, Lieutenant Ibar, and I stood under the green light of the globe in front of police headquarters... I knew that the girl who technically was only guilty of withholding information from the police was not going to spend any time in the pokey. Because, after all, I was more or less guilty of the same thing. Besides, Lieutenant Ibarra was still interested in the others. Well, Marlo, it looks like the whole business actually boils down to a single transaction between Clay Saxon, who had the counterfeiting paper, and Lou Horner, who was supposed to buy it. That's right, Ibarra. But Horner, who must have made his contact with Saxon via some middleman in San Francisco, only had a telephone number and the password, the orange dog of foe, to work on here in L.A. But how'd you get hold of that number, Phil? 
from the message the tea man left before he died. You mean you actually called someone named Marion? No, honey. I just dialed Marion. M A Madison. R I O N seven four six six. Madison seven four six six. You get it? Yeah. <laughs> Another one of Horner's screwy memory tricks. Like the rubber band on his tenth finger. Hey, that's pretty good, Phil. Ah, oh, it's an old gimmick, really. I read it in a dozen detective stories. What do you know? And maybe I ought to read some of those. <laughs> well, good night, fella. Look for you tomorrow. Good night, Lieutenant. Well, Shelley, do I, uh, do I show you the way home? No, Marla. Aren't you hungry or thirsty or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess I am at that. Well, I know just the place for us, darling. Oh? It's a cute little place right smack in the middle of Chinatown. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Francis Robinson, Edgar Barrier, Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, and Ed Begley. Lieutenant Detective Abar is played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I was hired to find a blackmailer, and I did. But first I found a badly beaten Adonis, a Jezebel with an accent, and a man who had been an easy mark for murder. I was hired to find a blackmailer, and I did. But first I found a badly beaten Adonis... A Jezebel with an accent and a man who had been an easy mark for murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Easy Mark. I'd spent a dull day on a duller subject, which was don't get caught with your income tax return down at midnight, March 15th. After calling time for a thick stake designated to bolster the stamina of a private detective, but nevertheless non-deductible, I reluctantly headed back to my office where I found both my conscience and the long-form 1040 still waiting, which meant there was no way out. The dull day was going to stretch on into the night, but then I got a break, because my telephone rang and the call was from one Mrs. Corey Gilbert, a prospective client who wanted action in a hurry. Marlo, you've got to move fast. I just found out that my husband, Ross, will be at 3806 Melrose Avenue in 20 minutes, and I know that means trouble. Well, just for size, Mrs. Gilbert, how do you spell trouble? With a capital B, as in blackmail. There's no time for details now. Just get to that address and find out who Ross is meeting with. Only hurry, Marlowe, please. Well, hurry after what, Mrs. Gilbert? I've never met your husband, remember? Oh, oh, yes. Well, he's tall, dark eyes, dark hair, very handsome. And the blackmailer, short, stocky, and repulsive, I suppose. I've eh? never seen the blackmailer. All right, Mrs. Gilbert, where can I reach you? Well, I live at 439 and a half Ogden Drive. Ogden Drive. The phone number is Gladstone 8195. 8195. All right, Mrs. Gilbert, I'll call you. Thanks. Oh, and Marlo. Yeah? Hurry, will you? You see, I... I love my husband. I was a little more than 20 minutes finding the address on Melrose. But when I finally pulled up and parked away from the place, I figured being late didn't matter because... Number 3806 turned out to be an unfinished house set deep in an acre of building materials. I was about to head for a telephone and get an explanation from a confused lady named Corey Gilbert when a lot of noise from what would someday be a living room changed my mind. Then I knew that my client had the right address after all because there in the pale light of a slice of moon taking the last of an awful beating from a thin man with a thick beard and a lot of muscle 
was Ross Gilbert. Dark eyes and dark hair, like she said, but no longer very handsome. Don't! Don't hit me again. Stop worrying, Gilbert. I'm almost through with you, except for this. A present from Nanette. And just one more from Nanette. <laughs> last punch stacked Ross Gilbert onto a pile of rough lumber like he was another one by twelve. And as he slowly scraped to the floor, unconscious thick beard dusted himself off lightly, jerked at his tie, and stepped out of the opening reserve for a future front door. I started over to help Ross Gilbert, but then I remembered that my client wanted to know who her husband was meeting and why, not how hard or fast he could swing. So I decided for the time being to play it quiet. When thick beard got into his car, I got into mine. <laughs> Followed him all the way to Beverly Hills, where he pulled to a stop in front of the Camden Arms Court. I parked lights out and watched him strut up a flagstone walk and knock on the door of a bungalow number four, which was dark. When he knocked again and it stayed dark, he took an envelope out of his pocket, wrote something on it, and jammed it into the mailbox. Then he got back into his car and started away fast. I walked up to the bungalow and helped myself to Thickbeard's empty envelope. On one side, scrawled in pencil and smudge, was the telephone number Sunset 31676. On the other, payment delivered okay, plumber. Plumber, huh? I shoved the message into my pocket, struck a match, and started looking for a name on the front door. But then a cab pulled up, and a moment later, I had help. I can be of some assistance, Perret? Yes, I, I was just... Oh. Uh, <laughs> Nanette? Oui. Nanette Lamarck. But I do not know you, monsieur. No. No, you don't, uh... I, um, I think if you will stop staring and begin talking, we will do much better. Who are you? Uh, Philip Marlowe, a friend of Plummer's. He asked me to deliver a message for him. Do I go on? Of course, Mr. Marlowe. But please come inside. It is so much nicer there. <laughs> Nanette was so right about it being nicer inside. There were lights. And that made it easier to see that the lady with the thick French accent and the gorgeous waistline was something that could have mustered her own foreign legion. She was narrow green eyes and open red lips, topped by a lot of close-cropped soft brown curls that kept running into each other. And for a dress, she was wearing about a quarter of a mile of draped chiffon that, in the right places, fitted a little closer than her own skin. When I told her what I claimed had been a message from Plummer himself, she purred her thanks and started to mix me a drink. When I brought up the subject of blackmail, she stopped abruptly, spilling a bottle of perfectly good Kentucky Tavern all over the table. Blackmail? What do you mean, Mallow? Extortion, honey. A malpractice of getting a lot for knowing a little that's not nice. <laughs> You're swinging wild now, mon cher. Maybe. But if it doesn't bother you, I'll stay right with it. Because I'd like to know why you and Plummer, who have such an easy mark, insist on throwing rocks. What easy mark are you talking about? A tall, dark, and used to be a handsome guy named Ross Gilbert. Ross? Soda, Marlowe? Yeah. But don't make it too sweet, honey. I can't take it that way. Nanette will be very careful not to make it too sweet. There. Tell me, mon cher, when did you last see Plummer? Uh, before tonight, I mean. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was at the fights over at the Legion Stadium last week. Now, do I get my drink? Oui, mon cher. You will get your drink in your face, <coughs> liar. Mm. <coughs> oh, tell me, Frenchie. Is that Pearl Handle 32 considered the very latest along the Champs-Élysées? You have lied to me, mon ami. <clears throat> you see, Plummer only arrived in Los Angeles the day before yesterday. For the first time in his life. All right, I made a mistake about seeing Plummer at the fights last week. Now, why don't you put away the gun and we'll talk about Ross Gilbert. Ross Gilbert is a man I hate with all my heart. A man I could kill right this minute. And that Marlowe goes for anyone connected with him. So now get out. Oh, without even so much as an au revoir? I reserve au revoir for my friends, Marlowe. Good night. <laughs> Ma, 
Marlowe, Mrs. Gilbert, is Ross all right? Ross isn't here, Marlowe. What happened to him? He ran into an ugly beating at that address on Melrose. Something nasty from out of town named Plummer is responsible. Ever hear of him and or an imported Jezebel called Nanette Lamarck? No, I haven't. But what about Ross? What's wrong with him? Nothing that a pound of beefsteak and enough liniment can't cure. But before we worry about Ross, Mrs. Gilbert, one more thing. It's a phone number I found on the back of an envelope that belonged to Plummer. Number is Sunset 31676. What? Somebody you know? Yes, someone I know very well. It's the telephone number of my ex-husband, Emery Marsh. Emery Marsh, huh? Fancy dress designer on Wilshire? That's right. But what's he got to do with all this? Emery only met Ross once in Mexico, a party at Ensenada. Yeah, well, look, Mrs. Gilbert, why don't we postpone collecting Ross until I find out a little more? Where does your uh, ex-husband Marsh live? In Santa Monica. But there's a good chance that he's still at his place on Wilshire. He does most of his work at night. Well, then Wilshire Boulevard's my next stop. I'll try to make it a quick one. Goodbye. Emery Marsh's place on Wilshire was an expensive shop with a single velvet-lined show window that was home for a beautiful mannequin wearing an evening gown that would drop at the first sneeze. And after I spent five minutes thumping on a plush leather-upholstered portal, a light finally clicked on someplace inside. And a moment later, Emery Marsh opened the door. He was tall, 45, sandy-haired, and looked less like a dress designer than I did. So after following his tweed back into an inner sanctum that was comb plywood behind Chinese modern furniture, I decided to play it almost straight. Now, Mr. Marlowe, what can I do for you? Well, it's a little too early to tell. I'm a private detective, Mr. Marsh, and I'm working for your ex-wife, Corey Gilbert. Corey? Mm-hmm. Is she in trouble, Mr. Marlowe? No, no, we're close to it. Tell me, Mr. Marsh, when you were last over to Nanette Lamarck's place at Camden Arms, when was that? Nanette Lamarck? Yeah. I've never heard of her. Nor a man named Plummer? Nor a man named Plummer. Who are they? Well, in the order I tossed them out, a mademoiselle with a touchy temper and a thug who needs a shave. I don't understand. How do they concern me? Well, maybe they don't. But your telephone number turned up on Plummer. Both Plummer and Nanette are tied on to a man who at this moment is probably picking himself up off the floor of an unfinished house at 3806 Melrose Avenue. His name, Mr. Marsh, is Ross Gilbert. Gilbert? Yes, that's right. What do you know about him? Well, very little. I only met him once at the Riviera Pacifico. Riviera Pacifico? The hotel at Ensenada in Mexico. Mm. Matter of fact, it was the same night that he met Corey. Which didn't make you very happy, huh? Uh, no, you've got it wrong. Corey and I were already divorced. The three of us meeting was nothing more than an accident. Oh. And when Ross and Corey parlayed that accident into marriage, were you still smiling? Better than that, Mr. Marlowe. When that happened a month ago, I was grinning. You see, until then, I had been paying Corey $1,200 a month alimony for two and a half years. Hmm. And Corey gave all that up for love and Ross Gilbert, huh? Uh, Ross Gilbert isn't exactly a pauper, Mr. Marlowe. No, I guess not. Blackmailing a pauper doesn't add up. Uh, what did you say, Mr. Marlowe? I said putting the bite on somebody who has nothing is like sucking a lollipop with a cellophane on it. You get action but no results, you see? Oh. Now tell me, why does the word blackmail come home to roost, Mr. Marsh? You wouldn't happen to know who the guilty party is, would you? No, Mr. Marlowe. Hmm. And what's more, if I did, I certainly wouldn't keep that sort of thing to myself. Oh, no, I don't think you would. Well, thanks anyway, Mr. Marsh. You've been a big help. I'm glad. And if I can be of any further help, don't hesitate to call on me, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, please. No, I won't, Mr. Marsh. You can depend on it. All the way from Wilshire Boulevard to Mrs. Gilbert's place on Ogden Drive, I kept wondering who wanted how much out of Ross Gilbert and why. About 20 minutes later, when I pulled up in front of the house, I started concentrating on my client, who had to be the woman standing next to a green coupe in the driveway and waiting in double time. Corey Gilbert was long, flowing blonde hair draped over shoulders that at the moment looked like they were carrying the weight of the world. But she was prettier worried than most women who always keep it gay. Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, Mrs. Gilbert? Yes. Your husband's shown up yet? No. Marlowe, what do you suppose... Take it easy. Maybe we'd better have another look at uh, 3806 Melrose Avenue, huh? Whatever you say. Shall I drive? If you've got a license. Yes, Mr. Marlowe. I've got a license. Well, okay, let's go. The way we 
took off in Corey's Nash, I wasn't sure whether her license was for driving a car or an airplane. And while she kept her 83 and a half AAA on the accelerator, she talked about her husband and why she was worried. By the time we were near the place, I knew all about the party in Ensenada, their whirlwind courtship, and what a fine guy Ross Gilbert was. When we got out of the car and started over the last hundred yards toward the unfinished house, I'd learned everything Corey knew about the blackmail angle, which wasn't very much. It started last week, Marla, when we got back from our honeymoon. Ross wasn't himself at all. He was worried. He forgot how to laugh. He argued with me over any and everything. Mm. Where does the blackmail come in? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me what was wrong. Then this evening, just before I called you, I overheard him talking on the telephone. That's when I caught the word blackmail and this address. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe Ross will be able to fill in a few of the blanks for us. Oh, he was over here in this room on a pile of lumber when I... I... Ross! Ah, Plummer must have done a lot more damage than I figured. Ross! Ross! Take it easy, take it easy, baby. I'm afraid he is, Corey. That man! That man! He beat him to death! No, Corey, that round hole in Gilbert's chest wasn't made by a fist. From where I stand, it looks like a 32 caliber bullet. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first... For some new wrinkles in the mystery field, look on the face of Mr. Jack Benny, eminent producer of the mystery comedy The Lucky Stiff, which opened in New York today. Although Mr. Benny's stars are Dorothy L'Amour, Claire Trevor, and Brian Donlevy, Jack's face is covered with new wrinkles because he couldn't be in New York to sell the tickets himself. He's remaining in Hollywood to appear tomorrow night on CBS on The Jack Benny Show with Mary Livingston, Don Wilson, Dennis Day, Phil Harris, and Rochester. So be sure to listen. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Easy Mark. Corey Gilbert's face went sickly white. And her mouth twisted on the brink of hysteria as she stared at the dead man. I turned her away from it and led her to a window. She did the fastest job of pulling us off together I'd ever seen. Then I went back to the body. On the way, I noticed a folded scrap of paper on the floor. It was a page torn out of a desk diary, but all that was written on it was the address of the unfinished house we were in. I looked down at what had once been Ross Gilbert. The setup didn't make any sense. A victim of blackmail had been beaten up by a total stranger, and then, a little while later, murdered. Somebody had killed a goose that was laying the golden eggs, and it didn't figure in any direction. Well, I just about decided to go through his pockets when a sound from Corey changed my mind. <gasps> Marlo! Marlo, come here, quick! What is it, Corey? There's someone out there. I saw a shadow move. Get away from the window. Marlo, there, running. Why, it's a woman. Yeah. And quite a woman. What do you know? She's crossing the street now. Who is it, Marlo? Who is she? Character as French as Milani's 1890. Only she's more like nitric acid than salad dressing, Corey. Her name is Nanette Lamarck. She's getting in that car. Aren't you going to stop her? No. I've got a line on Miss Lamarck. I can find her. But she was hiding here. She could be the one who shot Ross, couldn't she? Easily. In fact, right now, she's the odds-on favorite. But she's also cagey, and we'll have better luck if we get her on home ground where she'll talk. Besides, there's a big chunk of this business that doesn't follow. What do you mean? Well, look, the murder came out in reverse. Ross was paying off. So he should have been the killer instead of the corpse. Which means there's more than blackmail involved. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is he's dead and, and, and that woman killed him. Maybe. Come on, Corey. Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Well, first you take me back to my car and then I got a job for you to do. What kind of a job? Well, I found this page ripped out of a desk diary, probably Ross's. I want you to go through all his things and find that diary for me. There might be something else in it that'll give us a connection. All right. Where are you going? Better pay a call on Nanette. Only this time I'm bringing my own welcome mat. I think I'll need it. After Corey dropped me off, I called Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide, reported the body, and then I got into my own car and drove out to Beverly Hills again, to the Camden Arms Court. Annette's bungalow had lights on. I parked down the street and made tracks back through the landscaping to a side window. Annette was playing pinup girl on the arm of a divan as she watched someone pace back and forth across the room. 
When I got close enough to hear what was being said, that someone turned out to be right, Corey right. Gilbert's first husband, Chicken Emery Marsh. Like chickens with their heads off. So Ross Gilbert was shot to death. But I've got to know the truth about one thing, Miss Lamarck. My entire life's work is at stake. Can't you understand? Now, hide, Monsieur Marsh. Do not break out into tears, I will tell you. Plummer is merely a private investigator I hired to, to locate Ross Gilbert for me. Now, are you happy? No. Why did such a person have my telephone number? That's what I want to know. I'll be ruined if I'm involved in this mess. My reputation means everything to my business, and... Well, things aren't going too well just now. If I'm connected with a scandal, I'll be wiped out. Well, stop worrying. I saw you with Ross Gilbert three or four times before he disappeared. So I gave your name to Plummer as a, as a possible lead to Ross. That is all. Why did you want to find Ross Gilbert? That, mon ami, is none of your business. You found out what you wanted, so good night. All right. I'll go. But can I count on you to keep my name out of this? Listen, I am counting on me to keep my own name out of it. And I will be very busy doing that. Good night. <laughs> I plastered myself up against the side of the house and watched Emery Marsh leave. He looked anything but happy over the result of his interview with Nanette, but I figured I had the benefit of experience to work with and less to lose than he had. So I waited until he was out of sight, and then I stepped up to the door, braced myself, and tried my luck. You again? Yeah, and I want to talk to you. Get your foot out of my door! Oh, get out of here! Get out! Not until we've had a nice, quiet chat, Nanette, and I think we'll take up where Emery Marsh left off. What? Look, just who exactly are you, Marlow? Your boy Plummer and I are distant fraternity brothers, but there the similarity ends. Just another chief private detective. Oh! Okay, baby, if that tough stuff's the only language you understand, we'll talk that. Oh, stop it. Leave me alone. Now get over there. Sit down. Oh, oh you, you ape. I'd be nice to me if I were you, Nanette. Because I just love to see a rope around that lovely neck of yours. And what's more, I can almost put one there. You're in a mess right up to your accent. So start making answers beautiful and keep them straight. First, why did you put Plummer on Ross Gilbert's trail? Because he double-crossed me, that is why. Double-crossed you how? He ran away from me. He was mine, all bought and paid for, you understand? Not exactly. When I met him, he was flat broke. I bought him every decent stitch of clothes that he had. Gave him everything he needed to be a gentleman because we were going to be married. And then he ran out on me and took everything with him that he could lay his hands on. Go on. Nobody does that to Nanette Lamarck. Nobody. So you hired that licensed thug plumber to find him and beat him half to death, right? Exactly. Well, go ahead, baby. The story doesn't end there. Tell me the rest, the good part. About how you waited until Plummer got through with him. And then you went down to that unfinished blueprint out of House and Gardens and killed him. No. No, that is not true. I, I did not do that. I, I, I could not. That's no bigger lie than the rest of it. Where's that pearl handle 32 of yours, Nanette? And don't reach for it. Just tell me. What do you want with it? I want to see if it's been fired. Now, where is it? Call it, Jack. Oh, fine. Plummer. Miss Lamarck might not like for you to see her gun. Oh, I thought you would never get here. Who's this character, Miss Lamarck? Another private detective. Marlow by name. No kidding. Well, we got a lot in common, haven't we, Jack? Yes, yes. We've each got two arms and two legs. And the name is Phil. Oh, that's the way it is, huh? Well, listen, Jack, you got no business here in the first place. For two cents, I'll chop you down. You're even cheaper than I figured. Why, and you... you can put big... away that big, nasty gun, too, because I got you cold. That envelope you stuck in Nanette's mailbox tonight had a slip of paper inside, one of your old clients. Huh? Well, what, are you, what are you talking about? Can't you guess? Hey, you want to see it? Well, yeah, yeah, let's have a look at that. Okay. Take a good look. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, drop the gun, Plummer. Come on, drop it. My arm! All right, now, fold up. Oh. There's your bargain basement detective. Now, Nanette, you didn't get your money's worth, did you? Now, shall we take a look at that pearl-handled gun of yours? It is over there in my bag. Thanks. Mm. Clip's full and that smell sure isn't gunpowder. Of course not. I did not kill Ross. Why, I was not even inside of that building where he was. Yeah, I know, but you... Wait a minute. Say that again. I said I was never inside that unfinished house where he was found. When I drove up, you were already there, so I left. Yeah, yeah, I know. And Plummer's gun is... Uh-huh, fully loaded. Hasn't been fired either. Baby, you've just given me a great idea. An idea? But I do not understand. Yeah, never mind, I'll explain it to you later. And incidentally, you better be around. Right now, I've got to find out one more thing, and then maybe I'll pop this whole shebang wide open. Marlowe. Good evening, Mr. Marsh. 
Lucky to find you still working, huh? Late hours are a habit with me these days. So come in. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Marsh, I've come back for that help you offered me earlier this evening. I see. Well, the offer's still good. Fine. I think your ex-wife, Corey, is lying to me. She claims you didn't know Ross Gilbert, that you only met him once at that party in Ensenada, but you did know him, didn't you? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I did get acquainted with Ross slightly. We had dinner together a few times. Uh-huh. And you really did favor his marriage to Corey because it freed you automatically from that alimony load you were carrying. That's correct, Marlowe, but I don't And see... it's also correct, isn't it, that you couldn't afford to go to court to have your alimony reduced because that would let your snobbish clientele know you were going on the rocks. Yes, that's also true. And maybe it's true that you actually engineered the marriage and it backfired on you. Very smart, Mr. Marlowe. Just keep your hands at your side. This might go off. Yeah, oh, yes. Well, I expected a reaction, but not quite so soon. Too bad. I'll trouble you for your gun, now that you've got it all figured out. Yes, Marlowe, I engineered that marriage. Corey was attracted to Gilbert, but he was broke. I knew that would scare Corey off if she found out. So you and Corey made a deal, particularly with Ross. He wanted to marry Corey. You supplied the cash for his courtship, right? Yes. Only he wouldn't stop there. He kept demanding more. Sure, that figured from the start. Ross wasn't being blackmailed. He was the blackmailer himself, and that made you worse off than before, so you killed him. You're so right, Mr. Marlowe. And remember, the price for two murders is the same as for one. So you've really left me no alternative. I'll give you an alternative, what? Emery. <laughs> Corey! One thing you didn't count on. I really loved Ross Gilbert. Well, I guess that winds it up, Corey. Emery's in the hospital, and Nanette and Plummer are both in the clink. Too bad I only hit Emery in the hand. I never could trust my aim. It's always been bad, in a lot of ways. It was good enough tonight, baby. Lucky for me you showed up when you did. Say, what made you come to Marsha's place, anyway? Well, that page from the desk diary paid off, Marlo. Only we made a mistake. No? It didn't come from Ross's diary. It came from Emery's. I finally remembered his handwriting. Mm-hmm. Now, you tell me something, Marlo. Yeah? How did you know Emery was guilty? Oh. Well, he made the oldest slip in the book. When he was talking to Nanette, I overheard him say that Ross had been shot. Oh. Emery had no way of knowing that Gilbert was dead or how he'd been killed unless Nanette told him. And for a while, I thought she had, but then I found out that she couldn't have because she'd never been inside the house where we found Ross. So it had to be Emery. Sure. I see. Well, Marlo, uh, what does a gal say at the end of a night like this? Thanks or something? Just thanks will be enough. <laughs> I got to do my income tax. Can I give you a lift? No. No, I'll walk a while. I've got some thinking to do about marksmanship. Call me sometime later on, will you? Just to see if I'm shooting in the right direction. You can count on it, Corey. Thanks. Good night, Phil. I watched her for a moment as she walked down the street all by herself, deep in her own thoughts, and it looked to me like she was playing it strictly square. I almost wanted to follow her. <laughs> the first time in a long time, I felt like I wanted to get to know a client better. But March 15th can slip up awfully fast, and that long-form 1040 was still unfinished and waiting for me in my office. So I decided to go back and work on my income tax and play it strictly square, too. After all, that's really the easiest way in the long run. Yeah, I keep telling myself. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced by Norman MacDonald. The script by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt was directed by Ralph Rose. Featured in the cast were Sylvia Sims, Lorette Philbrandt, Ken Harvey, and Paul Duboff. The special music was by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... There was a man with a bad heart, a telephone number scribbled on a cash register receipt, 
and a corpse on the other side of town. But I couldn't see the connection between them until I realized they were all tied together by the same long rope, worth $30,000. Next Wednesday evening, February 2nd, CBS will bring you a moving, powerful drama of a reporter who took an assignment he eagerly sought, only to find it came too close to home. Its title is Mind in the Shadow, its star is Eddie Albert, and its story tells how the reporter set out to reveal the shocking facts about our mental hospitals, and then learned that his lovely young wife might have to enter one. Based on actual documentary evidence of conditions existing today, you'll find Mind in the Shadow, a revealing story of something which could happen to you. Here, Mind in the Shadow, starring Eddie Albert, next Wednesday evening, over most of these same CBS network stations. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, Jack Benny's new address, Sunday night on CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. was a man with a bad heart. A telephone number scribbled on a cash register receipt and a corpse on the other side of town. But I couldn't see the connection between them until I realized that they were all tied together by the same long rope worth $30,000. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Long Rope. I'd finally wound up a sour case in which I'd been kicked around, disillusioned, and shortchanged. And in my book, a routine like that calls for relaxation. So I'd spent the morning sleeping and the afternoon in a Turkish bath, being worked over on the table by Nick Takalakis, a non-talking masseur who untied knots in more muscles than I thought I had. He was trying to tear loose my Achilles tendon when the phone rang. It was for me. Nick wouldn't let me up, so I took it lying down. Yeah? Marlowe speaking. My name is Sidney Vanetta, Mr. Marlowe. I've tried all afternoon to reach you. Oh? Nick, what can I do for you, Mr. Vanetta? I've already made your reservation with American Airlines. You're leaving on the 10 o'clock plane tonight, and you're taking with you a set of pearls for a certain buyer in Chicago. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Vanetta. Maybe I can... No, maybe, Marlowe. I've checked thoroughly on you and find you entirely qualified, which is important because the pearls are a perfectly matched set in a rope valued at about $30,000. The buyer wants them, and I made up my mind just this morning to sell. The proceeds will go to my niece. Lucky girl. Indeed she is, particularly since I have no respect for her as a woman. She presumes to be a sculptress of all things, but she's my only heir. I'm selling the pearls simply because I know she would, and I can get more for them. Yeah, I... Ooh! Hey, Nick, wait a minute, will you? Why all the hurry, Mr. Vanetta? First, the buyer is leaving Chicago tomorrow. Second, my heart may fail me at any moment. That's the hurry, Mr. Marlowe. I see. Well, I'll take the job, uh, conditionally. But suppose I come out and talk with you. Telephones are deceptive. Very well. Come to 7241 Adams, just below Western. I'll expect you in an hour, at 6, sharp. Side door will be open, so let yourself in. Sounds like you're alone out there. I am. I just fired my nurse, a Miss Drew, and as stupid a woman as the earth was ever cursed. But <coughs> well, I shouldn't get excited about it. I've engaged a new one due here at 5.30, but who will no doubt be late... So as I say, Marlowe, when you get here, just let yourself in. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, Nick, you better hurry it up. I got to see a man about a rope worth 30 grand. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A rope worth $30,000. 
Benetta's place on Adams was a big, fancy, and dirty gray place. Forty years ago, it had been a proud, expensive house. But now it squatted at the back end of a rundown yard like a bitter old man, too tired to move. I found the side door unlocked and went in. The hallway was dusky and had the odor of moldy wool. I called Vanetta's name but got no answer. So I poked on in until I heard the snapping of an open fire. It came from the library. A big chair was drawn up in front of the fireplace, and there Vanetta sat. His chin sunk deep in his chest and his eyes closed. I coughed, but he didn't hear me, so I stepped close and shook him gently by the shoulder. Mm Mm-hmm. All it took was a gentle shake. He sagged forward and poured out of the chair like stiff syrup. Mr. Vanetta was dead. I started for the phone to report the body, but then I heard gravel crunch in the driveway. Someone else was coming in that side door, so I stepped out into the hall and waited. Mr. Vanetta, it's... uh... Oh. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, who are you? Steve Temple, I'm Mr. Vanetta's business agent. You're on business now? Yes, I am. It's all the same to you. I came to see Mr. Vanetta regarding some pearls. So if you'll excuse me. Oh. Yeah, the pearls can wait. Their owner's dead. So it finally happened, huh? You're taking the news very well, Temple. I've been expecting it every day for five years. You found him, I suppose? Mm Mm-hmm. We had an appointment at six. He wanted me to fly his pearls to Chicago. Uh, What are you staring at, Temple? What? Why, this uh, bottle of medicine here. What about it? For years, he's kept this stuff beside him in case of an attack. Yet, when he actually needed it, it was over here on the sideboard out of his reach. (laughs) Ironic, isn't it? Very. He fired Miss Drew, his old nurse, today and didn't expect a new one until 5.30. Say, do you happen to know her name? No one. You mean uh, he's engaged a new nurse? That's right. She's an hour late already. Yeah. Well, for once, that doesn't matter to Mr. Vanetta. Say, Temple, are you acquainted with his niece? Vivian Russell? Mm Mm-hmm. Of course. She's a sculptress. There's a studio out on Fountain uh, near Bronson, I believe. She was to get the proceeds from the pearls. I I assumed that, although nothing was ever said. She's his only heir. Mm. Where would those pearls be now? He kept them in a wall safe behind that picture there, consistently against my advice. Yeah, sure. Hmm. Opens with a key. Where would that be? He carried it with him on his watch chain. Why? Hey, what are you going to do? I'm going to take a look at the pearls and then have them impounded. Yeah, this must be the key. Now let's open it up. It's there, that uh, velvet case. As big as an overnight bag. Must be some string of beads. It is, Marlowe. Hey, here, let me open it. There. All right. All right. It's nothing but tissue paper. Yeah. It's not too surprising. <laughs> While Temple called the police and tried to keep the details straight on a natural death and an unnatural theft, I went over the room again with a new viewpoint. All that turned up without an easy explanation was one, a cash register receipt for $1.34 with the phone number Republic 2809 penciled on the back, and two, the peculiar position of Mr. Veneta's medicine bottle, which Temple had already noticed. I dropped the receipt in my pocket and told Temple to wait for the law. He gave me his home address and phone number, and I promised to check in with him later and left. The first stop was a phone booth where I dug into the nurse's registries and hit pay dirt on the fourth call. Miss Drew? Yes, we have a Miss Drew. Is she the one who worked for Mr. Sidney Vanetta but was fired this afternoon? That's his opinion. Actually, Miss Drew quit. All right, have it your way. Where can I get in touch with her? She's right here where she's been since 3 o'clock this afternoon. What is the nature of your business, sir? Never mind. You've already answered my question. Uh, But look, Mr. Vanetta hired another nurse to replace Miss Drew. Is the new girl one of yours? Absolutely not. Mr. Veneta will never get another nurse from this registry or from any other that I know of. You're so right. He's utterly impossible to please in any way, and we're through trying. Goodbye. Well, Miss Drew was in the clear. Veneta began to focus as a pretty odd Johnny. But I was still trying to figure why the new nurse hadn't shown up when I reached for a cigarette and brought out the cash register receipt with the phone number on the back. So I tried it. Republic 2809. It rang, but nothing happened. I got in my car then and drove up to Hollywood and out Fountain to Bronson, where the only Vanetta heir, Miss Vivian Russell, had a studio. It was a converted double garage with a lot of north windows, so her new close-to-the-ground Hudson sat outside in the driveway. The adjoining four-room apartment looked cozy enough. 
if you liked wading through chunks of marble and eating off of last week's newspaper. <laughs> yeah, I was braced for a dowdy Amazon with broken fingernails as I rang the bell. That's why the dainty 118 pounds of taboo-scented blonde who was clad in ten chartreuse yards of whispering silk cut like lounging pajamas caught me as flat-footed as a duck when she opened the door. Hi. Did you want something? Uh, yes. Yeah, I... My name is Marlowe. I'd like to speak to Miss Vivian Russell. You are. So go ahead and enjoy yourself, Marlowe. Uh, may I come inside? I have some bad news, Miss Russell. Oh, oh, sure. Come on in. Now, uh, shall I sit down or just hang on to something? Suit yourself. Your uncle, Mr. Vanetta, died this afternoon. Oh, his heart finally gave up, did it, huh? Yeah, yeah, but you shouldn't go all to pieces like that, Vivian. Now, wait. He meant nothing to me, but I'm glad his suffering is over. The pearls are missing, too. Well, really? What happened to them? They were stolen. And don't tell me that means nothing to you because you're getting the money, 30,000 bucks worth. What? Uncle Sidney intended to give me the money from those pearls? How do you know that? I'm a private detective, he told me. He was my client. Oh, then you're out of a job. Say, how would you like to work for me, Marlo? I I'm serious. Now I want those pearls back, you know. Now, for 25 a day in expenses, it's a deal. Now, you tell me something. Who did your uncle hire today to replace Miss Drew? The nurse. Hmm. Why, I didn't even know Miss Drew had been fired. How did you know she didn't quit? With Uncle Sidney? <laughs> Try me again. Republic 2809. That doesn't mean a thing. Mm. You know, Marlowe, you've got an awfully good head. Are you speaking as a sculptress or just an ordinary chiseler? And what is that crack supposed to mean? You didn't know you were getting the money legally. You might have taken the pearls yourself. Oh, stop it, Marlowe. Okay, client. Well, I'll run along. I've got work to do. All right, but... Uh, don't forget that all work and no play makes for a dull companion. Yes, and it also makes 25 bucks a day. <laughs> I'll be seeing you. All the way down Sunset to Vine Street, I kept telling myself a buck's a buck regardless. But the idea that I'd been grabbed at stayed with me. Vivian Russell had plenty of motive as a dry land pearl diver, and if that's true, she'd need a patsy just to keep her abreast of the situation. I turned north on Vine and twisted up Beachwood Drive to 2000, the number Steve Temple had given me. He had had two hours of playing 20 questions policeman style, and I figured it was time to check his score. Also, Temple was the man to fill in a few blanks on my new client for me. His place was dark, but I got out anyway and started up the walk to his door. I'd gone about a dozen steps into a tunnel of overhanging shrubs when I heard it. Psst. Hey, you. I turned as a man stepped out onto the walk and came toward me slowly. He was tall, wiry, with a thin, arrogant face that sneered out from under an expanse of forehead big enough for three sets of eyebrows. All shaggy. We're going to have a talk, Mr. Tim. Hey, you're not Temple. Now we both know that. I'm a friend of his. What do you want with Temple? I've got a message for him, but it's personal. Who from? Like I say, it's personal, mister. I'll be back later. Come here. I said I'm a friend of Temple's. If you got a message for him, I'll see that he gets it. Well, okay, then. Tell him that some of his friends are too blasted no see. Oh! The guy with the forehead had a great left jab and a pair of hurdler's legs And by the time I untangled myself from the brush and got out on the walk again, he was gone Well, I knew it was a waste of time, but I tried Temple's doorbell twice before I went back to my car Nothing made sense, except that somebody who knew his way around had stolen a long rope of pearls And somewhere in the city was a nurse who hadn't shown up on a new job Beyond that, it was all question marks I drove down to the filling station on the corner and went inside with the phone. I started to call police headquarters, but instead dropped the nickel in and dialed Republic 2809 again, just on a hunch. Lieutenant Ibarra speaking. Ibarra? I didn't dial you, Ibarra. What? This is Marlo. Well, you got me anyway. Now, listen, Phil, I hear you're on that Veneta case. Yeah. If it'll help you any, the coroner says definitely he died of a heart attack. No homicide involved. Mm. Thanks, Lieutenant. Hey, but look, where are you now? In a flat on the corner of Union and 59th Street. Why? Well, is that phone number there, Republic 2809? Well, that's a great piece of deduction. You just called it. Ibarra, listen, I found that number at Veneta's place this afternoon. What's going on down there? There's a girl here named Betty Larson. Yeah, she's a nurse, right? No, wrong, Phil. She's a corpse. Oh. Before that, she was a waitress. Just a waitress. Somebody came to a door and killed her for no apparent reason whatsoever. <laughs> In 
just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, Jack Benny will be along on CBS tomorrow night with one of his funniest shows ever. In addition to his regular hecklers, Dennis, Don, Phil, Mary, and Rochester, Claudette Colbert and Vincent Price will pay a call on Jack. And with Don Wilson still wanting a raise in pay and with Jack still trying to starve him into talking terms, you're sure to find the situations full of the hilarity and fast-moving fun that have made CBS's Jack Benny Show the top-rating comedy of all. Yes, remember, CBS also means Catch Benny Sundays. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Long Rope. It was 40 minutes of thick stop-and-go traffic from the time I quit talking to Ibarra until I pulled up near the four stories of faded, sagging tenement on the corner of Union and 59th. But even then, the crazy question that had been weaving in and out of my mind like a 2 a.m. drunk looking for the way to go home was still with me. Why was the telephone number Republic 2809 bracketed by a couple of dead people who, as far as I could see, should have had nothing to do with each other in the first place? And right there for the tenth time running, I drew a complete and unabridged blank. But a minute later, when I climbed out of my coop and over the bumpers of the half-dozen squad cars that were jammed into the narrow street like so many toy autos that a kid had forgotten about, I quit asking myself riddles and started looking for Detective Lieutenant Ibarra, a quiet man who always preferred fact to fancy. I found him in a cheap but clean uniform crowded room on the second floor, standing a few feet away from the body of Betty Lawson, a girl in a bathrobe who had once been something pretty in her early 20s. Well, Phil, the coroner says she was shot twice in the chest at close range. Died instantly. Is that where she fell, Lieutenant, there near the door? Yeah, it looks like she'd just gotten home and into her robe and someone she didn't know knocked on the door. The safety chain was still on when we got here. The windows lead no place. Those chains let a door open just wide enough for the barrel of a gun, is that it? Yeah, but how does all this add with those missing pearls and the rest of that business over on Adams, Marlowe? Not like two and two, believe me. So far, Ibarra, the only question is the telephone number. Tell me, where did this Betty Lawson work? Well, we haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, so long, Lieutenant. Yeah, so long. Right now, we only know that she was a waitress who stayed here with her brother, who was some kind of a student. They got along pretty well together. She was single, too. Lived here since... Oh, wait a minute. Mm. Danny Barr. Oh, yeah, Mooney. Ryan's Cafe, huh? Ryan himself runs it. Okay. No, I'll check it personally, right? Hey, is that where she worked, Ibarra Ryan's Cafe? Yeah, but it's funny, Phil. She lived here since early 1947, and Mooney tells me she worked that 24-hour hash house just as long, yet it's way over on the other side of town in Western. Western and where, Ibarra? The 2300 block. Should be near Washington. Washington, which is only one block from Adams, and that starts to close the big circle. What do you mean, Marlowe? Well, that the Veneta place is on Adams near Western. Look, Ibarra, how about letting me huddle over a cup of Ryan's coffee before the law steps in, huh? Oh, I got a hunch you want to check, Phil? Yeah, yeah, that and a cash register receipt. What do you say? Uh, all right, but play it close, fellow. Ryan probably doesn't know about this yet. No? Unless, of course, he squeezed the trigger. Goodbye, Ibarra. <laughs> It was a half hour getting over to Ryan's Cafe on Weston, which turned out to be a lot of steamed over plate glass, bragging about a 40-cent hot roast beef sandwich and two-foot-high white chalk letters. And inside, the motif was the same. Everything that Mr. Ryan sold was a bargain. I slid onto a shaky stool opposite a cash customer who was something dirty in a torn overcoat, buried deep in a handicapper sheet and coffee. He looked up once, grinned no teeth at me, then hollered for Ryan in the kitchen who said that he only had two hands and would be out in a minute. But before those 60 seconds ran out, I looked around, and over in a corner in a collection of trash piled next to a broom, I saw a very welcome piece of paper. It was a brother of the cash register receipt that I'd found on Sidney Vanetta's desk, the one that had tied Betty Lawson's murder onto the rope of pearls. I turned back to the counter just as Ryan started toward me. He was a little bigger and a little better looking than the average ape. And on his right arm, under thick, coarse black hair that was long enough to braid, there was a tattoo of a dancing girl who, if Ryan ever shaved about his wrist, would freeze to death. What'll it be, mister? Coffee? Yeah. And a little information. You know Sidney Vanetta, Ryan? That screwball with a bump ticker over on Adams? Yeah, I know him. Why? What's up? His time on Earth, for one thing, he's dead. Too bad. Should have taken it easier. Mm. Cream? No. Pearls. 
Did you say nothing? Ryan, who brought that tray up to the Veneta place this afternoon? I did. Sure it wasn't Betty Lawson? I'm positive. None of the girls that go near that place. Veneta was hard to get along with. Now you tell me something. What are you, mister? Newshound collection man of cop. Getting warm, Ryan. I'm a private detective named Marlowe. I'm thrilled. Good night. Before I finish my coffee? Before I throw you out. I don't like too many questions. Not even easy ones, huh? Like who murdered Betty Larson? Be- Betty's dead? Yeah. Over in a flat on 59th Street, shot twice with the 32. When'd you last see her, Ryan? Why, a couple of hours ago, and she quit for the night. Marlo, have the cops got any idea who did it? I don't know. Right now, they're looking for a boyfriend. You're crazy. Betty didn't have a boyfriend. Outside of you? Outside of me. So I'm going over to straighten them out now. Mitchie! Mitchie! Yeah? Get out here and take over. Okay. I gotta move fast. No, you don't, Ryan. Betty's dead, remember? Yeah, but whoever did it ain't. Now, don't try to stop me, Marlo. You'll get hurt. Look, Ryan, why don't you play smart and... Oh, what's the use? Go on, start running. You won't get very far. For the first time that night, I felt sure of what I was saying. Because even as Ryan had squared himself away to play bounce the private detective, I suddenly noticed a friendly face working hard over a stale donut at the far end of the counter. It was Lieutenant Ibarra. And when Ryan tossed his apron aside, grabbed at his coat, and slammed out the front door, Ibarra turned and nodded at a short man nearby who was idly picking his teeth with the end of a book of matches. At that, the man dropped the matches into his pocket and left. Then Ibarra moved over to me. Didn't mean to crowd you here, Phil, but after you left, we found out that Ryan and Betty Larson used to see quite a bit of each other. Don't apologize, Ibarra. Probably would have cost me a couple of front teeth if I hadn't noticed you. Warm up your coffee, mister? Yeah, please. You, Ibarra? No, Phil, I got to move now. You see, I don't think Ryan did this. Mm-hmm. I told Mooney to follow him, but not to pick him up. The chances are good that Ryan's heading straight for Betty's apartment to demand that the police find out who killed his girl. So I'm going the other way, to Ryan's house. There may be another woman in this... Jealous one. But no rope of pearls. No, Marlowe, I don't think so. (laughs) Good night now. Night, Lieutenant. Well, Mitzi, how long have you worked here? A couple of days. But I don't know nothing about Mr. Ryan. I'm a married woman and I... What do you think you're staring at, mister? Maybe something wonderful, Mitzi. Tell me, baby, do you always wear that kind of a uniform when you're working here? Sure. Ryan says this girl should look neat and clean. It helps business. Anything wrong with that? No, no, no. Matter of fact, it might be just the lead I'm after. What are you talking about? Yeah, and if I'm right, baby, the rest of this case will be a cinch. So good night and thanks. You've been a big help, sweetheart. When I got back to the corner of Union and 59th, I took the stairs up to Betty Larson's flat two at a time, crossed the fingers on both hands and prayed that Ibarra was right about Ryan returning to his girl's place. When I stepped into the room a second later... I knew that I'd never doubt the good lieutenant again because standing next to an open window and staring out at nothing was Ryan himself, numbed and red-eyed. I asked him one question. And although his answer was only a couple of words mumbled between trembling lips, it was all I had to know. Now everything. Betty Larson's murder, the death of Vanetta, the guy with the forehead and the missing pearls, the whole shebang was starting to fall together. Oh, come on, baby, be home, please. Marlo, Vivian. Look, honey, I want you to do me a favor. Get hold of Steve Temple and meet me over at your uncle's place on Adams as soon as possible. I need your help. Goodbye. Well, Marlo, what took you so long? I understood you needed our help and in a hurry at that. I had quite a way to come, Temple. Is Vivian here? Yes, Marlo, Vivian's here, and that means that we can stop counting noses. Now, why do you need our help? Catch someone who stole once and murdered twice? Murdered twice? That's right. You know, it's my guess that whoever stole that rope of pearls also moved Vanetta's medicine out of reach when his heart started skipping beats. Can you prove that? No. No, I can't. But it doesn't matter, really, because the guilty one also killed a party named Lawson. And when you pay for one, Vivian, you've paid for them all. I don't follow you, Marlowe. Who are you talking about? I'm not sure, but this much is certain. Vanetta called me at five. When I got here at six, he was already dead and the pearls were gone. Now, I figured that whoever took them argued with them first, which makes that person, one, somebody who knew Vanetta, and two, responsible for the old man's death. Then the new nurse couldn't possibly have been the one who stole the pearls. No. 
But the new nurse could have been the one who overheard everything while standing right here. Haven't you been able to find this nurse? No, not yet. But sooner or later, honey, I'm sure we'll catch up to him. Him? Yes, I, Temple, uh, I said him. Nurse Larson is a male with a lot of forehead and few ethics. The person you killed was a sister Betty, a waitress. And don't move, Temple. Or I'll be glad that I was forced to put holes in you. Temple's the one? He stole the rope of pearls? Yeah. But this nurse Larson who saw him do it got in touch with him, right, Temple? It was filthy blackmail. Which you were going to stop by a filthier murder, and you almost did. Because somehow or other you got the right room in the right house on Union and 59th with the wrong party. Isn't that about it, Temple? Yes, Marlowe. That's about it. Oh, leave me alone, Temple. Now, Marlowe, you don't shoot me without going through Vivian first. Dear Vivian, Sydney's precious niece was going to have the pearls all to herself. Don't move, Marlowe. It'll cost Vivian her life if you do. Oh. I doubt that very much, <laughs> Temple. Larson. That's right. Joe Larson, forehead and all. Now, you, Temple, step away from that girl or I'll tear you to pieces. No, Larson, no, no. Now, we can still do business like you said in that note you sent me. I'll split with Shut you. up. You forget two things, Temple. First, you tried to kill me. And second, you did kill my sister. Now, why don't you run for it? Or are you afraid? Which is it? Come on, Temple, talk. I... I am afraid. Well, Marlowe, that just about winds things up. Yep. Joe Larson sent up for attempted extortion, and Temple... Sent up for good. Mm Mm-hmm. Say, Marlowe, when you called a while ago and said that you wanted Temple and me to help you, did you know then that Temple was the murderer? No, I didn't, Vivian. Then I only knew that whoever had killed Betty Larson had mistaken her for the new nurse, and that the actual nurse was Betty's brother, Joe. Where'd you get hold of that, Phil? Well, it started in Ryan's Cafe, Barra, just after you left. I had nurses on the brain, I guess. And when I took a good look at the waitress there, I suddenly realized that her white uniform, white shoes, and white cap could easily confuse a guy like Temple who also had nurses on the brain. Well, um, I can see a killer making a mistake about appearances, all right, but I still don't understand how it is that the telephone number of my uncle's nurse turned out to be Betty's apartment. Because a nurse did live there, honey. Betty's brother was a medical student, part-time male nurse, and full-time bum. You see, Ryan, who brought food to Uncle Sidney, knew that he needed a new nurse, and he sold him on the idea of Joe Lawson, because he wanted his girlfriend's brother to have a job. Oh, I get it. Say, I know what I'm going to do with those pearls. Sell them? To the highest bidder. Oh, no, I'm going to break up that set. Break up the set? Yeah, I'd like very much to get a pair of earrings out of them. Oh, and uh, for each of you, uh, a set of cufflinks. Good night, gentlemen. When Vivian got into a car aimed it toward a collection of chipped rocks on Fountain near Bronson, and waved goodbye, it was nearly three o'clock in the morning. No. After I said so long to Ibarra and started back to my apartment on Franklin, an idea hit me for the first time. A pearl is the result of the irritation of an oyster, a disease. And when you string a lot of diseases together, the result is frequently a plague. (laughs) But it's from plagues like that that I make a living. That's what I get for reading books. I wonder if I'll ever go any place where I can wear pearl cufflinks. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Junius Matthews, Louis Van Ruten, Faye Baker, David Ellis, Lillian Byeth, and Ed Begley. Lieutenant Detective Ibarra is played by Jeff Corey. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... A corpse that wouldn't stay dead, a pistol with a silencer on it, and a fortune in a black satchel spelled death for the big city boys when they finally got together in lonesome Arizona. Population 802.
stars light, stars bright. And that's no optical illusion. The brilliant, gleaming list of stars on CBS tomorrow night. Van Johnson's the star on the Prudential Hour drama. Spike Jones will positively appear in a sketch getting the war paint off Bob Hope's latest movie. Jack Benny will have Claudette Colbert and Vincent Price as his special guests. Amos and Andy, Dashiell Hammett, Sam Spade, and Lumen Abner are the next bright stars in line. Then Helen Hayes, first lady of the stage, starring on her Sunday night electric theater, followed by Hollywood's own Eve Arden in the wonderfully comic series Our Miss Brooks. In the next to closing, another bright comedy, Life with Luigi, and the whole star lineup, topped off by the world's most brilliant adulpates, the experts on It Pays to Be Ignorant. Jack Benny's program will come to you over all of these same stations, and the others in this vast array of stars will be heard over most of them. Top writers, top directors, and top stars of American show business come to you on CBS. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. A corpse that wouldn't stay dead. A pistol with a silencer on it and a fortune in a black satchel. Spelled death for the big city boys when they finally got together in lonesome Arizona. Population, 802. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Lonesome Reunion. At 8,000 feet on a clear afternoon, you can see enough Arizona real estate to become an authority on the subject. And as I huddled around a circle of window aboard an American Airlines flagship and gaped like a two weeks would pay vacationer at the carpet of sand, stone, and cactus unrolling a slow inch at a time below, I was impressed. Also, I was thinking about a job which was providing both the switch and scenery and two crisp $100 bills, less the cost of a round-trip ticket from L.A. to the capital city of Phoenix. But then, at the thought of money, I stopped sightseeing and started to think about the work ahead and how easy it had sounded that morning in my office. When Kay Gordon, who was something pretty and blonde, but slightly tarnished for 28, had hired me, all in one breath. Marlowe, my brother Joe Gordon is in a room at the Granada Court Hotel in Phoenix, Arizona. In one hand, he no doubt has his usual smelly cigar. In the other, a small suitcase filled with a mess of papers, all legal, all proper. You fly there, pick up the suitcase, fly back for that $200 cash. Yes or no? Yes, on one condition. The papers, do I get to see them? If I look, I go. All right, you look. Good, I go. Goodbye. That was the way it had started an hour after breakfast. Lunch was alone and at the airport. Then it would wait until I'd seen Mr. Joe Gordon, a man who was willing to pay a lot for a little. My plane dropped out of the sky over Phoenix gently at 3. At 3.15, I was in room 111 of the Granada Hotel and only 36 smelly inches away from the usual cigar. The man behind it was heavy, pale, and maybe 40. And like his sister, Joe Gordon was overbearing in a hurry. This, Marlowe, is the bag. These, the papers. Stocks, bonds, and mortgages. In themselves, worthless to anyone else, they're non-negotiable. But as information to my competitors, they're priceless. Satisfied? More or less. Meaning what? Exactly what is your line, Mr. Gordon? Oh, I'm a broker. One who bets on long shots. When they come in, I don't like to split with the boys who sit on their hands. Mm. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. I've got some time to kill before I fly back. Do I take the bag now or later? You take the bag now, Mark. Okay. And uh, don't let go of it until you're with my sister in L.A. I'm paying you money to stay away from my enemies, not to shop for trinkets. Oh. Oh, and uh, incidentally, my enemies also play rough. So watch your step and act smart. Real smart. <laughs> I still had two hours to kill when Gordon locked the bag and handed it to me after dropping the key in his pocket. So I decided to take a room there at the Granada Hotel, shave, shower, and stretch. The sleepy clerk in the lobby was not in a hurry, nor did he hear anything I said the first time. 
So when I finally got to my suite on the second floor, which had as much elbow room as the inside of a lifesaver, 30 of the idle minutes were already gone. I locked and bolted the door, checked all the windows carefully, and then peeled off my shirt, broke out my shave master, and reached for the knob on the bathroom door. But I never made it. Because as the door swung open, I caught a glimpse of a fist the size of a cantaloupe starting from my jaw. Oh! Now stay right there, Buster. The first time I swing, the second time I shoot, and I do both good. Equal nice, huh? Everything all figured out ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, but it ain't very hard, Marlowe. Especially when the guy you're after shouts it all to a desk clerk. My error. Yeah, which leaves just the three of us. Real cozy like. Three. You, me, and 120 grand here in this bag. You're way off pace, brother. This bag's got papers in it, nothing more. They belong to a businessman. <laughs> I said something? Yes, you're very funny. Look, Buster, Joe Gordon's no more a businessman, and his real name is Joe Gordon. So after I leave, you go back to Sam Dietrich in room 111 and tell him that Marty Stopka says thanks. For what? For the $120,000 I've been waiting two long years for. And also tell him and Gigi Ganther, who might still be around, that Stopka had it all figured, like you say, Marlowe, ahead of time. I don't follow you, bud. You're not supposed to. Just turn around, face the wall, and listen carefully. You tell Sam Dietrich that I knew he'd pull something like this just as soon as he got back into circulation. You got that? Yeah, yeah. Word for word, stop you. Good. Now all you have to do is remember. When Marty Stopka said remember, he put that cantaloupe with fingers in the small of my back and shoved hard. By the time I got to my feet again, both he and the black bag were gone. That made Joe Gordon or Sam Dietrich my best bet. So I took the stairs to the ground floor fast and raced for the end of the corridor in room 111. But when I threw the unlocked door open, I found something I hadn't counted on. A curtain flapping in the breeze of an open window and nothing more. The desk drawers, the closet, the bureau empty. And on an end table next to the telephone, a bus schedule unmarked. At that, I was beginning to get very mad at a private detective with public patsy named Philip Marlowe. Then the telephone rang, and when I answered it, the operator said that she had a long-distance call for Joe Gordon. I said, thanks, I'd take it. Hello? Sam, this is Kay. I... Marlowe? Yeah, honey, Joe Marlowe is in Brother Gordon, remember? Oh, I can explain all that, Marlowe. Oh, sure, sure, baby, but not now, later. Later, after you've had a chance to think up a few more lies. All right, all right. So I didn't tell you the whole story. What's the difference? Did you get the bag? I did, but I didn't get to keep it very long. Something ugly named Stopka wanted either it or my life, so I made a quick decision. Stopka has the bag. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, isn't it, though? Huh? One thing, baby. I'm the decoy with suitcase for some kind of shenanigan that's wrapped around 120 grand, which you and Sam Dietrich have. And there's a trio in the act. Namely, Sam Dietrich, Marty Stopkin, one Gigi Ganther. Gigi? Marlowe, have you seen Gigi? Uh, have you, Marlowe? Maybe yes, maybe no. Now, why don't you come clean? Admit you're happy that Stopkin got the suitcase from me while Sam beat it out of an open window. That my part of the job is over with. Come on, baby, talk. All right. I'll make it short and to the point. You got $200 for doing nothing. Out of that, 60-odd went for an airplane ticket. The rest is yours, right? Go on. There's no need to, Marlowe. I'm finished, and so are you. So why don't you just be a good fella and keep the change? So long, sucker. When Kay Gordon hung up, I slammed the phone down, counted ten twice, and went back to the unhappy business of getting mad at Marlowe. But again, I was interrupted. This time, it was a newspaper, the Phoenix Herald, sticking far enough out of the wastebasket under the telephone to expose the dateline, which made it exactly a week old. I picked it up and saw the two inches of story circled in pencil and slug, five released from state penitentiary. Uh, Sam Dietrich, 41 of Los Angeles, who was arrested in Lonesome, Arizona for the armed robbery of a general store in February 1947, also was released today. Now everything was beginning to add, with one high-priced exception. Very few general stores in towns called Lonesome keep 120,000 bucks in the till, even on a busy day. So I headed for the office of the Phoenix Herald and the chance that I could learn something about the cash involved from newspapers that were two years better than one week old. Thirty minutes later, I was in the back shop of a Herald receiving fax willingly supplied by a sandy-haired liner-type operator with a sad face who had never heard the word forget. That's right, mister. It was the Second National Bank of Land Company here in town. 
Uh, held up at 1.10 p.m. February 7, 1947, by three men who took $120,000 in unmarked cans, 20s, and 50s. One was badly wounded and run in gunfight, but they all got away clean. No arrests, no suspects? Well, other than the usual rigmarole of trying to pin the job on every two-bit stick-up man hauled in the next six months, no. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, thanks. I don't think... Say, wait a minute. Lonesome, Arizona, that unmarked bus schedule. Tell me, do you happen to know where something called Lonesome is, and if so, how a guy could get there if he doesn't have a car? Sure. It's 87 miles west of here, and the bus will do the trick. But not anymore today. Oh. Uh, the only bus left an hour ago. And uh, now, young fella, you tell me something. What in Sam Hill is lonesome and a bus departure got to do with a bank robbery was pulled two years ago? Where I stand right now, Dad, I can't say. But when I get the lonesome, ask me again. I may have the answer for you. I was 30 minutes renting a car and an hour and 30 minutes getting the lonesome. Population 802. I drove without seeing anything that could possibly be mistaken for Sam Dietrich. And I was about to turn back when I saw something that brought my right foot down hard on the brake. It was a brand new green Nash standing outside a motel. California license plate. I got out of my car and got a look at the registration card wrapped around the steering wheel. It said Catherine E. Gordon. The motel only had three cabins that showed any light. The first belonged to the manager and the second to Kay. Close to an open window, I saw the man Kay was talking to. He was an ex-convict and part-time broker named Sam Dietrich. All right, all right, so Marlon knows he was set up for Marty Stavka. Who cares? We're here, and so far Stavka isn't. And if and when he does show, we'll be gone with the real black bag safe in our hands. Yes, but what about Gigi, Sam? I told you Marlon mentioned his name. And I told you to forget it. Marlon must have been swinging in the dark. Gigi can't be alive, Kay. He was badly hurt when Stavka and I got clear of the bank. Why wasn't his body found? I don't know, Kay. I've told you that a thousand times. Ah, now, now, look, honey, why don't you just relax and think of us a little, huh? <laughs> Gigi's dead, baby. There's only you and me. Sam, you know how I feel about that. I love Gigi. The only reason I'm helping you, I don't want anything to do with this money. I only want to know for sure about Gigi. Okay, okay. Hey, did you get a line on Leland Mills, the name that was on that mailbox two years ago? Uh, yes, yes. He owns the place and lives there alone. A, a once upon a time small ranch on the last block in town, coming apart at the seams. Mm -hmm. What about Mills himself? He's an old duffer, maybe 50. Lives close to the fireside, day in and day out. <laughs> Good. That means I can handle him without any trouble. And now, look, baby, it's uh, 7 now. At 9, this town will be fast asleep, and at 10, I'll take care of everything. So, uh, why don't you just curl up there on the couch and think about nice things? Huh? Oh. Nice things like what? Well, like the money I hid at Leland Mills' place five hours after the boys and I took that bank. <laughs> the $120,000 that's soon going to be back here with me where it belongs. Dad, I took my cue and left because one, Leland Mills was a man to be forewarned while 10 o'clock was still three hours away. I was 10 minutes finding his place, which was on the edge of town. And another two locating the doorbell, which was the kind you pulled and start a bunch of jingling inside. It was three pulls later before the door creaked slowly open, and what had to be Leland Mills stood in front of me. He was shaggy, gray hair curling on the sides of his neck, a face with a thousand crisscross wrinkles and dirty old clothes. Everything I'd expected with one exception. Gripped firmly in both hands and pointed directly at my head was a long, long rifle. Who are you? Uh, Mr. Mills? Maybe. Well, I'm a private detective named Philip Marlowe, also someone who knows that there's $120,000 in cash hidden here on your grounds. $120,000? To the penny, yes. Two years ago, Mr. Mills of Phoenix Bank was robbed by three toughs named Dietrich Stopka and Gigi Ganther. Gigi? Huh, that's a queer name. It's not important, old man, but this is. Now, somehow or other, that stolen money was hidden here, in or around your place. Mm. And tonight, one of those men is due back to collect. That, of course, means trouble for you. Do you think we should call the law? No, no, not yet. If we play it smart, we can get the dough spotted first and at least one of the three. All right. Mr. Marlowe, if you're sure of what you're saying, I only hope you are. Oh, I'm sorry about this gun here. I don't like poachers on my land. Yeah, we all have our pet peeves. Now, Mr. Mills, I want you to sit tight till I get back. And no matter what happens, don't open that door for anyone. Have you got that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Where are you going? To town. To check on the only two things that can possibly give us any unexpected trouble. One, a nasty man named Marty Stopka, and the other, a guy I've never even seen. The elusive Mr. G.G. G. Ganther. 
Let's pause here on KRLD. Stan Freeberg here. The Radio Spirits catalog features thousands of cassettes and CDs of old-time radio. Call right now and Radio Spirits will send you their latest catalog plus a 90-minute cassette featuring the Jack Benny Show, Suspense, and Dragnet absolutely free. Limit one call per household, please. Call Radio Spirits right now at 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. Now back to the adventures of Philip Marlowe on KRLD. I left Leland Mills standing in the doorway and worried my way back to town. If Stopka and Gigi Gantha had no more trouble getting lonesome than I did, a reunion about as quiet as a truckload of hot dynamite was due to take place any minute. I passed the motel where Kay and Dietrich had holed up and saw that her car had been moved into the stall between cabins and draped with a blanket to hide its California place. So they were thinking along the same line that I was. At the hub of town, I parked and started to case the lively spots on Main Street, which took me all of ten minutes at a slow walk. But a short side of the mouth conversation with a couple of resident sports revealed that the local underground stemmed from the Red Dog Cafe, a warped wood two-story wiki up on the one side street in town. It was operated by a hard-bitten blonde, 160 pounds of western motif, complete with Stetson, red flannel shirt, hickok belt, blue jeans, and the name, Flora. She sat at a table at the back of the barroom, lending a cynical ear to nobody else but my old pal, Stopka. I walked up behind him, and when he turned around, I hung one on him. A good one! Hey! <laughs> Lobby and jackass, what do you think you're doing? Sorry, Flora, nothing personal. <laughs> now that's enough! Now stop it, you hear me? No rough husband in my joint. Come on, handsome, I mean you. Me? Why, Flora, how can you say that? I just came in to ask my old pal here some questions, that's all. Here we go, pal. Come on, sit up in that chair. Uh, okay, okay, let me alone. See, Flora, it's the only way Stopka here knows how to start a conversation. Bring him another beer, will you? His old one got spilled. Sure, bright boy. When he see that you do tourists leave your beefs outside next time. Now, look, Stopka, I want to know what happened two years ago on that highway out here. You guys split up, didn't you? You better talk, Stopka. All right, we split up. The heat was on bad, and Gigi was half dead already from a cop slug in his back. Dietrich had all the dough, right? What do you think? I left him and Gigi off outside of town. I took the car to try to suck the cops away from him. We were supposed to meet later. But you kept going to save your own hide, didn't you? Certainly. It's going to pay off, sucker. You'll see. Uh -huh. Since the money was never found, you figured Dietrich hid it around here, and he's coming back to dig it up. Is that it? Keep guessing, Shamus. Maybe we ought to loosen your jaw again. Stop that. Oh, you do. Now turn this to be handsome and by Sadie, I'll plug you. Well, a real genuine 44. What museum just swipe that from, Flora? Never mind. Got a legal right to defend the peace and quiet of my joint, and after 22 years in this dodge, I know how to do it. Now, I ask you nice once, now I'm telling you. You, ah. get out. That back door there. Hey, sure, I'll go, sister. Thanks for nothing. Hey, wait a minute, Flora. Don't let that lug get away. Shut up. Now, you sit down right there and count up to 50. And you leave by the front, quietly. Okay, you win. One, two, three... Flora, look out. He's back. What? What? Sorry, Eddie. Uh, you buzzer bait. I'll leave this cannon on the back steps. So long, Flora. I beat it out the back door and into an alleyway between the shacks. Stopka was still in sight but walking fast. And when I took after him, he saw me and started to run. There was a hard, flat sound like someone striking wet sand with a hammer. <laughs> Stopka faltered and lurched up on his toes as if he'd suddenly changed his mind about running. At the same instant, on a wall, even with him, I saw the shadow of a man holding a pistol with a long, awkward barrel. The hard, flat sound came again. Stopka curled up on himself and fell. Then the shadow slid off the wall and disappeared. I ran for the wounded man, but by the time I got to him, there was no trace of the gunman. I rolled Stopka over. He was hit hard, slipping away fast. Silence. Gigi always... Used the silence. Punk Gigi. You dead, huh? You wise guys never know when to quit, do you? You're in real trouble now, handsome. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't do this. Come, I couldn't hear the shots, the silencer. Yeah, that's right. 
trademark of a guy named Gigi Ganther. All I saw of him was his shadow on that wall there. Say, what kind of law have you got in this town, Flora? None. Except the highway patrol. They stop in every night. Okay, call him. Get him over here. This guy's Marty Stopka, wanted for a bank job, nearly two years old. No kidding. Who are you, his trainer? I'm a private detective who's got no business here, except I don't like to be pushed around. Now listen, do you know Leland Mills' place at the edge of town? Sure. Well, you get the cops out to Mills' place by 10.30, do you understand? That's where the big attraction's going to be, if I can keep Gigi in a silence from interfering again. Now let me down, beautiful. I won't let you down, handsome. For a city boy, you're all right. <laughs> I stuck to a back road and drove with my lights out until I was a good, safe distance beyond Leland Mills Ranch. Then I hid the car in a dry gully and walked back. The house was dark and still. I thought once of what might have happened to Mills if Gigi had gotten there ahead of me. I kept in the shadows and worked my way across the yard to the back door. Who's there? Marlo. Open up. I was beginning to worry. It's pretty near 10 o'clock. Yeah, I know, I know. Seen anybody so far? No. Nope, not a soul. Been watching close, too. Did you find the men, that G.G., that Stopka? Yeah. Stopka's dead and his killer's you to show up here any time now. Oh. We're going to have our hands full, I... Now, wait a minute, is that a car? Sure sounds like one. Yep. There, you can just make it out. Turned in down by the covert and stopped. Yeah. I think a man got out. Yeah, yeah, there he goes, across the field there behind your shed. It's Dietrich. I'm going out now, Mills. You stay here. No, I'm going too. But that fellow's heading right for my water tank. All right, he's heading for your water tank. Don't get excited. You'll tip our mitt. Ooh. I get this, Mills. You've got to stay here and watch for Gigi. He's bound to show up, and when he does, you better have that rifle of yours handy, because he's a killer. Do you understand? Yep. Sure, I understand. Don't worry, Marlo. I'll keep my eyes open. Don't you worry about a thing. out of the door and started across the yard, I, I knew I was getting myself out on a nice, long limb. Leland Mills was about as reliable as William Tell with their hiccups, and the apple was on my head. It was too late to back up, so I skirted the barn, stayed below the crest of a low rise, and moved toward the elevated water tank until I heard a shovel biting dirt. I got a comfortable grip on my gun and headed up over the rise to where I could see. Yeah, it was Dietrich, all right. He was bent over under the tank and working on a hole as if his life depended on it. He didn't even look up until I was almost on top of him. What? Who is it? Who's there? Who is it? Me, Mr. Gordon. Marlowe. Marlowe? How did you get here? Wasn't easy, Sammy boy. But I had to come and apologize for losing your precious bag full of waste paper. You sure picked a dangerous time to show, sucker. You were fired once. Too bad you can't take a hint. Uh-huh. And being tagged as a patsy is lousy for my business, Dietrich. You should have thought of that. So just leave your hands on that shovel handle, Sam, and keep on digging. Maybe I'll let you take a peek at that 120 grand before I turn you both over to the police. Go on, dig! No! no not so fast, Marlowe. Mills, I told you to stay in the... Hey. hey. That's quite a pistol. Don't move. Neither one of you. I'll kill you if you move. You, Marlowe, drop your gun. Drop it. <laughs> well, this is where it's been all the time. A hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I've looked everywhere. Every day for two whole years, but I, I never thought of looking here under the water tank. You mean you knew where the money was all the time? You lie, you lie. I'm the only one that knew that. Oh, no. One night, two years ago, I heard a noise in my barn. It was a man groaning. I looked in and I saw him. He was wounded. And I saw you when you come back from burying the money. I overheard the whole thing. You wouldn't tell him where you'd hidden it. You said you'd never tell anybody. But I was sure I could find it. And I looked everywhere except... Yeah, my... Mills, everywhere except here, under the water tank, where you buried Gigi's body after you killed him. And with his own gun at that. Oh, no, I didn't kill him. Dietrich here did. I only buried him so nobody would find out that him and Dietrich had stopped at my place. I almost went crazy looking for that money, but now I know where it is, and I'm going to have it. Well, you fool, you don't think I'd come out here with nothing but a shovel, do you? A friend of mine is right behind you with a gun in her hand. So come on, drop yours, Rube. <laughs> come on, come on, drop it. All right. Hey. That's an old trick, Dietrich. <laughs> Let him have it. Shoot, Kay, shoot. Didn't work, did it? 
I knew I'd have to kill you sometime anyway if you ever came back, so... You fool, Mills. I suppose that makes me next. Yep, Mr. Marlowe. I think it does. Think again, Mr. Mills. Who's that? Kay. You, you were there all the time, and Dietrich wasn't bluffing. Oh, I love you, Kay, baby, and I'll take the gun now, Mills. Oh. Turn it loose. Oh, Come on, I'll break your arm. Ah. There. That's better. I'll look after this gun until the police get here. And uh, look after this one, too, Marlowe. I haven't got the courage to use it anyway. I couldn't even shoot Sam Dietrich with it. He's the one I wanted to use it on. Why? Because of Gigi? Yeah, because he killed Gigi and lied to me. I promised to help Dietrich only because I figured all three of them would show up here. Sam Stopka and... and Gigi. That way I hoped to find him again. You were right, baby. All three of them did show up. Only this time they finished their job. For good. <laughs> Thirty on the nose when we got back to the house. And the highway patrol had just pulled up. So the question and answer period started, and by the time it was over, all the field work finished up four hours plus had gone by. It took some fast conversation, a lot of promises to stay handy, but finally, Kay was left with me. After all, her only real mistake had been falling in love with the wrong kind of a guy. When the last patrol car drove away, the desert was suddenly... Very still. The stars were small and sharp in the clear sky. The air was cold. Maybe that was why Kay Gordon trembled. Marlo, I... I'm sorry about all this. I got you into it, remember? Mm-hmm. You also got me out of it, Kay. Well, I can forget about Gigi. Now that I know for sure what happened. And all because of a jerk named Leland Mills. No, oh, Mills was a desperate guy, Kay. After he buried Gigi, he just about went nuts trying to find the money. When he finally realized Dietrich was the only one who could lead him to it, he shot Stopka and would have killed anybody else. Keep him from interfering with Dietrich until he uncovered the hiding place. You know, in a way, Marlo, it was a horrible trick of fate. They both picked the same place to bury things. Not really. Mills and Dietrich had the same jobs to do, under the same conditions. They each had to bury something in a hurry and in the dark. So both of them picked a spot where the ground was soft and one that was clearly marked at the same time, under the water tank. Yeah. And it... Marlo, I'm kind of scared. I don't like this place. This spooky little town. It's the end of nowhere. Yeah. I wouldn't be caught dead here myself. Let's go, baby. I walked Kay to a car, started her safely on her way. So long, sucker. She waved once, then drove down the road and out of sight without looking back. Soon even the sound of the motor was gone. A ah, long night and a strange reunion. And now two lonely lights were the only sign of life in lonesome Arizona. I stood on the empty highway for a few minutes and listened to the immense quiet of the desert. Then I went back to my rented car and headed for Phoenix and a plane for home. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, Jeff Chandler, Bill Boucher, and Jack Crucian. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a weird racket that mushroomed in a world of gaudy canvas. And the man with purple hair, the inquisitive midget, and the lady with strong hands each played a part. But all that was only a sideshow when death got into the act.
Across the nation, communities and the parents of Boy Scouts are observing Boy Scout Week, agreeing with the boys themselves that adventure, that's scouting. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. When my telephone rang, it jerked me out of one nightmare and right into the middle of another. Where a woman with a secret, a worried man, and a shadow out of the past met with fear and fury in the dead of night. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Friend from Detroit. There was a wood nymph dressed in nothing but a veil of dewdrops. She was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another on gossamer wings. And with every turn, she smiled and came closer. But just as I reached out for a hand, something happened. The bluebells changed into old tomato cans and started to ring. A bandy-legged little man with a jackhammer went to work on my head. I fell over a cliff, and just before I landed on a red-hot pile of broken scotch bottles... Oh, I woke up. Yeah. But the jackhammer didn't stop. I switched on the light and looked at my watch. It was 1 in the a.m., and the phone on my bed table was screaming for an answer. Hello? Marlo, this is Dave. Betty's gone. She's in trouble. You gotta help me, Marlo. You gotta come over to my apartment yeah, wait right away. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is this? Dave, Dave Pryor. I run the coffee joint in the corner. You know oh, me. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Dave. I remember. What's the matter? My wife, Betty, she's gone. You gotta help me. Dave, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm in bed. Besides, you know I don't monkey with family quarrels. It's not like that, Phil. Believe me, I'm scared for her. Phil, please, come over to the apartment. 2,000 beats would right away. It's okay, a matter of life Okay, and... I'll be there in ten minutes. Marlo. Marlo, I thought you'd never get here. Look, somebody fired the shot through the door, and when I got back with the aspirin, Betty was gone. Right, wait a minute, the... Dave, hold it. I'm not even awake yet. Look, sit down. Take it from the top. Slow. Yeah, okay. Maybe it started this morning at the coffee joint when a fancy guy came in and talked to Betty. She waits on the table. Yeah, 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 I know. What do you mean, fancy? Well, a slick dress, a cufflink, stick pin, all that. I didn't know him, and Betty tossed him off to me as a masher. Maybe he was, but she seemed upset. Or, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, tonight about nine, another guy came in, a chunky bird with a deep voice. Betty had just got back from shopping, and I was in the kitchen. See, when I heard a tray of dishes fall, and Betty came back, white as a sheet. She was scared, Phil, scared, scared. Hey! Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. All right. Go oh. ahead. I looked out, and, and that chunky guy was leaving. Betty insisted he had nothing to do with it, that she was just nervous. Was somebody else in the place at the time? Uh, let's see. Yeah, some Tribune reporter that comes in every night was up at the counter. He was the only one. And Betty stayed on the job till you closed, huh? Yeah, till midnight. But, Phil, she was in a bad shape. Mm -hmm. After we got home here, she sent me out with some aspirin. I was only out for 15 minutes, Phil. When I came back, she was gone. And look, look, this bullet hole in the glass door to the backyard. Somebody out there shot at her. And maybe hit her All or right, something. All right, Dave, steady. Now take it easy. You and Betty have a gun? No. Why? Well, in the first place, the bullet went out through this glass. It didn't come in. And another thing, Dave, who who did you call tonight after you phoned me? Why, nobody. Phone directly on the dresser here is open to the bees. Boone to wardrobe. Mean anything to you? No. I didn't even realize it was over there. I looked you up in the classified. Mm-hmm. Okay, come on. Let's take a look in the backyard. Any light out there? Yeah, I rigged one up for the barbecue. Look, Marlo, there must take be it something easy. you... Now, we'll straighten this out, believe me. Let's see. The line of sight seems to run somewhere between the barbecue and the gate. No footprints, though, maybe. Marlo! Hmm? Marlo, here by the tree, it's a hat. Gray snap brim, initials V... VR on the sweatband. VR? Mean anything to you? Why, no. What? Shh! 
Sure. That's Van Remini's hat. He's the newspaper guy I told you about. Tribune reporter that was in your place tonight? Yeah. Why should he be dodging bullets in your backyard? I don't know. Dave, where's Betty from? Detroit. When she came out here, I gave her a job. And then you both fell for each other and got married, huh? Yeah, two years ago next month. And we've been happy, Phil. We've been... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, look, Dave. Why did you call me instead of the cops? I... Well, I guess I'm afraid she's mixed up in, well, in something bad. You know, if it turns out that way, I'll have to call him myself. Okay, Phil. But you're on my side until you know for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, now you stay here, close to your phone. Okay. I'll check with you. Right now, i got to get a line on a bare-headed reporter. He can get us started if he hasn't lost anything more than his hat when I find him. So long, Dave. A reporter's hat, two strangers, and a bullet hole somehow added up to the fast fate of a hard-working kid named Betty, whose husband's only claim to fame was selling the best cup of coffee in town. It made no sense, but as I walked up the street toward my car, I figured that through Van Remini, I could get to the first answer. I was wrong. The first answer got to me. A thick hedge suddenly sprouted arms. One jerked me around while the other held the cold throat of a forty-five against my throat. Your car registration tag says your name is Philip Marlowe. No kidding. How do you suppose that happened? But it doesn't mention your racket. Shamus, maybe? Could be. And you? I'm a tourist. Oh, sure, sure. Just out to see the sights. That's huh? it. One in particular. $25,000 that belongs to me. I don't want any interference from you or that square inside there. You mean Dave Pryor? I mean Dave Pryor. I'll go back in there and tell him to cool off. A little woman is all right. She's just helping an old friend, you might say. Might I say you're the friend? Never mind. Unless Mr. Jitt is in there, kicks up a fuss, everything will be fine. Betty knows what she's doing. She's got a lot of talent for it. Too much to waste slinging hash. And remember what I said, Marlowe. Lay off. I'll remember more than that about you, Foghorn. Just remember to count ten before you move, boy. Well, there's no point in trying to outsmart a forty-five. And with three steps, Foghorn vanished in the night. Also gone was a big chunk of my respect for a doll named Betty Pryor and a taste in old friends. But just so I wasn't jumping to conclusions, I went to my car and drove down to Hollywood Boulevard. At the first all-night gas station, I stopped and put in a call to the Tribune. Where a guy on the desk told me, through a mouthful of mangled cigar, that unless Remini was at Bungalow 24, Beverly Crest Hotel, covering the murder of an ex-Detroit hood, he was fired. Then he hung up. But the one word, Detroit, made the call a jackpot. So I headed for the hotel on the double. It was pink and Spanish and squatted in a grove of well-behaved palm trees at the edge of a domesticated jungle which gave the illusion of privacy to a string of bungalows that weren't. But number 24 had all the privacy of a glass-faced cutaway beehive when I pulled up in the middle of two squad cars and an ambulance and went inside. Sprawled on the floor in front of a desk was a very well-dressed Exhibit A. Complete with cufflinks and stick pin and presiding as usual was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra, who didn't see me until I walked up beside him. What are you doing here, Marlowe? I can smell blood clear across town. What's the story, Barra? The name is Speck Willard, a gambler from Detroit. Retired out here to California a few years back to play horses and women. He was shot to death at about 8 o'clock tonight by a person or a persons unknown. Another gang jam? No, I don't think so. It looks more like armed robbery that got out of hand. How so? He found a currency wrapper from a local bank that read $25,000 in an open drawer in the bedroom. And one of the bellhops saw a woman, unidentified so far, run out of here about the time the coroner says that Willard was shot. A woman? Yeah. That fits because he was known to be quite a nightclubber and general playboy. You wouldn't happen to know something about this woman, would you, Marlowe? Me? Certainly not. <laughs> no, I'm after a man alive when I hope. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Marlowe, take this nickel. Hmm? In case you should just happen to hear something, I want you to spend that on a phone call to the police department. <laughs> now, who is it you're looking for? A Tribune reporter named Van Remini, you know him? Unfortunately, that's him over there, the sticky-fingered one by the window, swiping that book of matches just now, the one without a hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Thanks, Lieutenant. I'll see you. Hey, uh, Remini, can I talk to you a minute? Yeah, sure. What's on your mind? I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective. Don't apologize. What's up, Marlo? No girl named Betty Pryor. Pryor? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah. She and her husband run a one-arm joint on Franklin, don't they? That's right, Remini. I understand Betty got into a little trouble tonight. Heard about it? Nope. Wouldn't worry, though. Trouble's not new to Betty. Right, yeah, that's one popular school of thought. 
Incidentally, you seem to be going a long ways out of your way on this run-of-the-mill murder story, Remini. You're taking a long way around to the point, pal. Get with it. I'm in a hurry. Okay, pal. But keep it under your hat, won't you? The gray one, I mean. Oh, so that's how... Yeah, that's the way it is. Now, do you mind telling me what you saw in Pryor's backyard tonight? You name it. Shall I play dumb or lie? Suit yourself. See, my press card's just as good as your license, sweetheart. It gets me in, gets me out again. In my dodge, that's called reporting. Remini, I'll squeeze the truth out of you eventually. I'm sorry, I can't wait. We got a deadline. Anything else? Yeah, one thing, a match. Yeah, sure, Marlo. Anytime. Thanks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Remini. Yeah? Don't hang on too long, huh? Blabless sends your pinkies. The reporter blew out the match and looked at me steadily for a moment. And his lips shaped a word I ignored. And he walked away. I had seen enough of the book of matches he'd stolen to know it was in the Starkist room, a glossy, glass roof, dine, dance, and drink emporium near Arthur Murray's studio on Wilshire Boulevard. So I made like I was in for the night and watched Remini leave. All the way to his car, he kept looking back over his shoulder as if he expected to be followed. I waited till he was out of sight, and then I headed for Wilshire in the Starkist room. But when I got there, it was closed. Remini's car wasn't in the neighborhood, and the only thing that kept the trip from being a total loss was a spotlighted picture. Ten feet square of a sultry, svelte chanteuse labeled Carla Borden. It was come on in smile and almost costume was a cinch to increase the accident rate of the block by 20%. But then I took another look at her name and got back to business. It started with a B, as in phone book, opened a Boone and Bordeaux. I found a directory, got it open to Boone and Bordeaux, and halfway down the page was Borden, Carla, 2840 North Lucerne. It took ten minutes to get there and two more to find out that she had an apartment, number 17, at the end of the first floor hall. The door was open and I started for it, but got back close to the elevator when a woman came out and ran down the corridor toward me. It was Betty Pryor. Hold it, Betty. Whoa! What? Well, what are you... Never mind the stall, Betty. I've been in a long time. Why, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, look, about. you left a pretty worried guy at home. Dave, did he send you after me? That's right. Why oh, can't you fools leave me alone? Why does he have to be so stupid? Hey, you've got a few ideas mixed up, kid. Oh, sure, I'm wrong. I'm the one who's all mixed up. <laughs> Let go of me. Not until I've got a couple of things straight. Now, what happened? Did life in a hamburger stand get a little stale? Yes, you two-bit snoop. Okay. Dave thinks you're in trouble. I think you're in trouble. And I think somebody waved a few bills at you and you lost your grip. Why? And you're in so deep now you can't get out and it's no more than you deserve. Now, come on. We're going right back down the hall to call his apartment. We're going to have a little chat. Just the three of us. No, I won't. Let Come on. Take your hands off my little stand still. Well, my two chums, the Foghorn and his 45 caliber equalizer. Easy does it. You were lucky the first time. Little Betty, did you get it? No, something went wrong. Something terrible went Shut up. Milo isn't deep. The talk after he's out of the way. All right, you. Get in that elevator, chum. And we'll wait right here to see you leave. Go on. Here. That 45 makes you awful brave, chum. <laughs> this way we don't offend the lady by being uncouth. You get a chance to go up in the world. Just put your finger on the button. Now, wait a Come minute. Come on. All right. Now, all you have to do is push. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, the most famous neighbors in radio, the Ronald Colemans, will pay Jack Benny a visit again tomorrow as CBS's great Sunday night gets underway with another star-studded group of famous entertainers. Amos and Andy, Lum and Abner, Eve Arden as the gay schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks, and Helen Hayes as a hillbilly. These are only four more of the ten great entertainments which will come your way tomorrow night. Go visiting with the Colemans on all of these same stations on the Jack Benny Show. And hear the rest of CBS's great Sunday Night 10 as they come one by one over most of these stations. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Friend from Detroit. Cage on cables was ten exasperating seconds getting to the next floor. 
And I was another ten getting free of it back down the stairs and out into the dark street where the red splash of a taillight disappeared around a corner. And that was all that was left of Foghorn and company. So I turned back toward Carla Borden's room. When I stepped across the threshold, I found that with the exception of a single bureau that was still intact, apartment number 17 looked like it had just played host to the vortex of a cyclone. The bed, a chest of drawers, another bureau, a desk, everything was inside out. In the middle of all that was the body of Carla Borden. Blood from a deep, ugly cut on her head staining the snow-white front of her Angora sweater. I saw something else, which reminded me that this was not the first corpse of the night. The plush leather frame was shaped like an oversized lifesaver, and in it was the picture of a handsome man, all smiles, inscribed with love to my very best girl, Speck Willard. It was ten minutes before I got through to Lieutenant Ibarra, who was still up at the Beverly Crest Hotel. And after I told him about Collar and her connection with the late Mr. Willard and Betty Pryor and my connection with Dave, I stopped talking and listened. Marla, we just learned that Willard had some kind of a $25,000 cape going with one of his old mobster friends from Detroit, named Joe Lazar. Who so maybe is something with a voice and active below bottom? The same, Phil. Anyhow, it looks like they worked out a gambling deal for old time's sake. At the last minute, Willard tried to welch on Lazar and got killed for his trouble. And Lazar searched the place until he found the 25000 No, no, no. That part doesn't fit, Ibarra. How so? Well, I've run into Lazar twice tonight. I know he and the money are still strangers. Oh? And after what happened here with the team of Betty and Lazar getting to the singer Carla, I figure they're still looking for it. Also, I figure Carla was somewhere near when Lazar killed Speck Willard. And that she took the money and... I'll call you later, Ibarra. We got clumsy company in the hall outside. All right, ballerina, get your foot out of that bucket and come on in with your hands up. Well, <laughs> the man with a very long nose for news. What brings you around, Remini? For one thing, the fact that you got no corner on brains, Marlowe, and for another, who did that to her? Our mutual friend, Betty Pryor, and her running mate. I believe they were looking for 25,000 bucks. Did she and Joe Lazar get the money, Marlowe? No, they... Remini, how did you know the man with Betty was named Joe Lazar? Haven't you heard? I'm a good reporter, Marlowe. The mm. kind that keeps eyes and ears open and mouth shut. It isn't until I know the whole story. Which, as far as you're concerned, is precisely what? That I happen to you be... You happen to be? That I happen to be in Dave's restaurant early this evening where I recognize the only other cash customer is Joe Lazar. Oh. An out-of-work mobster from Detroit. He said something to Betty that scared her right out of a tray of dishes, so I figured I'd find out what was going on. I've been in on this show ever since. Yeah. Including a corny blackout of a 2000 Beachwood Drive where you lost your hat running away from a bullet. That's right. Mm -hmm. And just so you don't toss and turn when you get around to going to bed tonight, I'll fill in the rest. I followed Betty and Dave from the restaurant to their apartment. I watched her get rid of Dave, and then when I saw Lazar come in, I moved up close to the window. And stayed there. Until Lazar spotted you and threw a bullet your way? You're very clever. Yes, I am, man. But before that happened, I heard him tell Betty that Speck Willard had talked about a girl singer at the Starkist room named uh, Carla Borden. And that since he didn't know Carla on sight, she could have been the lady he'd seen running out of Speck's apartment with a 25 grand. Oh. Now that phone book of Dave's open to the bees ties in. I'm so glad. Now, Marlo, lest we digress too far, how come this one bureau here hasn't been turned upside down along with everything else? I don't know. Any more than I know why you're holding back so much from the law. Well, maybe it's because I don't like cops, Marla. Oh, the black ones. Or maybe it's because I'm in the same kind of racket as you. Chin way out and a lot of fast talk, just so papers can know what's going on an hour ahead of the rest of the world. Well, there's no 25000 in here. I got to blow. Before Ibarra shows? Before Ibarra shows. He always arrives with an entourage, Marla, one that includes other news hounds. So it's me for a fast cab in downtown and my paper with a story. So on, fellow. See you around. Hey, wait a minute, Remini. Yeah? I'll give you a lift. I'm going that way myself. Okay. I got a story, too. A lousy story. I've got to tell a nice guy named Dave. Come on. All the time we drove, Remini half-faced me and smoked one cigarette after another while he rattled on about Joe Lazar. The great story he had and a lot of other things I didn't hear because I was busy trying to find the right words with which to tell Dave Pryor that his wife was no good. 
So when we were about halfway yeah, to Beachwood Drive and Remini I'll was pushing it. close to his deadline, decided to get out and phone a story in from a drugstore, I was glad. So on, Marlo. The second after that, I knew I was kidding myself. Because even with just silence for company, I was still no place with the right word. Ten minutes later, when I stood in front of Dave on the steps to his house and stammered out the facts just as I had run across them, I forgot about words, right or wrong. I thought instead about my client, a badly hurt guy, but one who would never say die. Marlo, I can't believe all this. I won't. Tell me, where's Betty now? I don't know, Dave. Now, look, maybe we ought to head for police headquarters because sooner or later we're each going to have a story to tell Lieutenant Ibarra. Come on, my car's over here. Okay, Phil. I guess that's the only thing to do, all right? Yeah, I guess so. Here. Better have a cigarette, David. Oh, thanks. Kid, we'll try to make this as painless as we... As we what, Marlo? What is it? Hmm? Well, what are you staring at? Front seat. But I don't see anything, Phil. What is it? What shut up, Dave. Shut up. Give me a minute, will you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Come on, Dave. Pile in. But why, Marlo? Where are we going? Our kiss room to play a long shot. Slapped my foot down hard on the accelerator and kept it that way right through a string of I didn't care what color traffic lights until five minutes later when we screeched to a stop away from the side entrance to the star kiss room. I left Dave in the front seat, piled out fast, and ran a dozen yards to an abrupt halt. At the sight of something that turned the long shot I was playing into a, into an odds on pavement. It was the stage entrance door open a couple of inches, and in front of that, and unconscious on the hard sidewalk where it had fallen, was the clad in blue form of a private patrolman, his pistol holster conspicuously empty. Inside, I slowly picked my way along an L-shaped corridor until I saw a shaft of bright yellow from a flashlight that was moving away from a door marked Carla Borden. It brought me up short and flat against the wall. But then as the man on the other end of the beam of light moved away from me, I... I got a very steady grip on the 38 in my pocket and started after him. A minute later, he entered the main room of the club, and it was there as he started across the glass ceiling dance floor. But I recognized the very self-confident gait of a very self-confident guy. And that made the next move mine. Bars closed, Remini, and don't move, Buster. I'll blow your head off. Ah, looks like you're making news this time, good reporter. Or isn't that package in your hand the 25 grand you just found in Carla Borden's dressing room, huh? The same Carla Borden you murdered not an hour ago in an apartment on Lucerne, where you first thought the money was, where Betty Pryor surprised you before you could finish searching, where you later returned in the role of an all-American newsboy so you could get to that last bureau. All right, all right. I've heard enough, Marlowe. But I'm not going to stick around for more details. You make a break and I'll shoot, Remini. Try it, Eagle. Stop, Remini. Stop. Uh, Marlowe. I... Nice shooting, Marlowe. But don't turn around because where I'm standing, it's dark. And where you're standing, it's light. Now, throw your gun away, fella. Come on, toss it! That's better. All right, Betty. Get over to that dead newspaper guy and get the money. Uh, we'll take care of the private detective here. What do you mean, take care, Joe? I I can't go along with murder. Speck Willard's death didn't seem to bother you any. Shut up, Marlowe. Speck Willard! Joe, you... Joe, you killed... Yes, I killed Speck, that... Welcher... Eight o'clock tonight. And I had to stay under cover, but still get my hands on the money. So, I came to you for help. But I didn't tell you about the killing, because I didn't think you'd play ball if you knew about it. Now, all that's history now, and I'll still go to your dear husband, Dave, and talk lots about the kind of cheap kid you used to be in Detroit if you don't get moving. Now, what do you say, Betty? I say no, Joe. I also say I made a mistake in the first place letting you use me to run your filthy errands. Just so the guy I love wouldn't have to know about the kind of people I once ran around with before I had any brains. All right. That's the dumb way you want it. That's the dumb way it'll be. And taking care of two years is much harder than taking care of one. What about three, Lazar? <laughs> Dave, stay back. No, Marlo, no. I stayed back too long already. I stayed back while Betty has been risking her life to protect what we've got. If you take another step out, shoot, kid. I'm warning you for the last time. Stay back. No, Lazar, I won't. <laughs> you think no. scum, Lazar? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But but I'll be all right. I'll be all right now, Betty. Dr. Reese. Dr. Reese, please report to surgery. Well, Mr. 
Mrs. Pryor. And Dr. Reed. Harlow, the Reed. doctor Reed. says Dave's going to be surgery. fine in a couple of days. Yeah. Caught one on the shoulder, the other on the hip. He certainly had courage, didn't he? Yeah, and you did all right, too, Betty. Mixing in this whole mess just to keep the home fires burning. Uh, Tell me, Dr. whatever made you Reed. think that a guy like Dave Reed. wouldn't understand Reed. that you'd turned over a new leaf? Well, Dr. I... Reese wanted in surgery. I don't know, Phil. I guess I wasn't very smart. No, you weren't, Mrs. Pryor, but you're lucky because Marlowe here was. And that brings me around to a loose end, Phil. How did you know that Remini was your man? No, oh, that. Because of something I saw in the upholstery at the front seat of my car, he bought Tufts of snow white angora, which was the kind of sweater that Carla Borden had on when she was murdered after they struck him. And since you didn't touch the body yourself, they couldn't have come from your suit. No. And Remini was the only other one who had been in my car. So I figured that the Angora fuzz had gone from Carla's sweater to Remini's suit to my upholstery. Yeah. All of which means that Remini must have been in Carla's room before I got there as well as after. See? And then once I thought back about his getting out of my car to phone his story in, I... Well, I realized that when I dropped him near a drugstore, he had also been near the star room. Yes. That's exactly where he'd headed. Mm-hmm. You see, Phil, Joe and I followed both of you from Carla Borden's place because... Well, after Joe put you in that elevator and we ran, Joe said we had to return and wait for Remini, who was sure to come back and finish his search. And the whole business, because Lazar, after he had murdered Speckwillard, was afraid to publicly go after Carla Borden and the money he felt was his. Yes. He knew about me and Dave because Speckwillard accidentally dropped into our place this morning. Uh, correction, or... baby. What? Yesterday morning. Oh. It's now 9 a.m. Oh. <clears throat> and a good time to call quits, huh? Good night, kids. Well, by the time I got back to my apartment on Franklin, it was half past ten in the too bright morning. I was sporting sandpaper eyelids and a knot in the small of my back that felt like a wet dish rag. Oh, but once I had all the shades down and was undressed and in bed, I forgot about that. And I thought instead of the wood nymph dressed in nothing, with a veil of dewdrops. But then suddenly I stopped. The telephone. I got out of bed. I picked it up with both hands, opened the dresser drawer, and jammed it deep under all the socks I owned. And then I got back to bed. And the wood nymph, in her veil of dewdrops, she was she was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another. Oh my! On gossamer wings. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg as Betty Pryor, Peter Leeds as Dave Pryor, Harry Bartell as Van Remini, and Ed Begley as Joe Lazar. Lieutenant Detective Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard O'Ron. Sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a hunt through a jungle of city streets with danger waiting at every intersection until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted and death brought an end to the game. Coleman's visiting Jack Benny, plus Amos and Andy, Eve Arden, and Helen Hayes as a hillbilly. Yes, that earlier announcement about CBS programs tomorrow night sounded great, didn't it? Except you Philip Marlowe fans may have been wondering, isn't there a mystery show among that great Sunday night 10 on CBS? Of course there is. One of the great detectives in the mystery world, Dashiell Hammett's one and only Sam Spade. 
Sam will be here, hard-hitting, fast-moving as always. Tomorrow night, on most of the same CBS network stations. It was a hunt through a jungle of city streets, with danger waiting at every intersection, until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted, and death brought an end to the game. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Grim Hunters. morning paper had headlined prices rising. My bank statement in the afternoon mail had worn balance falling. And I had wasted the evening on behalf of a client who ran out on me when I tried to collect. All of which added up to the end of the day and me unhappy in my office at 10 p.m. With one hand on my checkbook and the other one raised in almost solemn oath. I, Philip Marlowe, private detective and too often public servant, hereby resolve to one way or another jockey my budget into something close to equilibrium. And from this day for... Hello. Marlowe speaking. My name is Helen Palmer, Marlowe. I need your help badly. Yeah, but look, I... I'm up at 8700 Magnolia Terrace in the Hollywood Hills. Now, please, drop whatever you're doing and... No. No. No! I must have let go of the phone, grabbed my hat and coat open and closed the office door, piled into my car outside and raced up into the Hollywood Hills because... The next thing I remember after Helen Palmer's scream was swinging off North Bronson Drive onto Magnolia Terrace. But a minute later, when I scraped to a stop away from number 8700, scrambled out from under the wheel and started on the run for the front door, I was no longer sure of anything. Because the house in question, a stock southern mansion complete with stable boy statue in a gravel driveway, which according to the book should have been as dark and as quiet as the inside of a coffin, was anything else but... And when I got to the oversized bronze door knocker and dropped it hard, I was beginning to doubt that I had the right address. Can I be of some assistance, sir? I don't know. I'm looking for a woman named Helen Palmer who called me at my office. Said she needed help. And a second after that, she screamed. Uh? <laughs> Tell me, sir, what is your name and occupation? In that order, Philip Marlowe, private detective. <laughs> Good for Helen. Good for Happy, her. aren't you? What's going on here? What is this? Why, it's a party, sir. A scavenger hunt. And it looks like Helen Palmer's the Now, winner. wait a minute, laughing boy. I had a call that was interrupted by pistol shots, and I... <laughs> All just part of the play, sir. Yeah, Helen Palmer had to bring back one private detective. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you see, Marlowe, each list, aside from the usual hard-to-find objects, had a human being on it. That's right. I had to bring back a Hoover vacuum cleaner salesman, and believe it or not, he's already sold our good host, Thaddeus is Go with a deluxe model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, he did it bad. You see, Mr. Marlowe, Helen Palmer wasn't permitted to actually hire you. That's why she had to pretend to be in trouble. With well, a net result that I nearly broke my neck getting up here. Mr. Grover, where is Miss Palmer? Well, I don't know for sure, Marlowe. She called just a bit ago and said that she only had to catch on to you and one other item and would be back after that. Which makes her the winner, Mr. Marlowe, because none of us did better than half our list. Oh, by the by, you don't happen to have the breech lock of a 57-millimeter anti-tank gun with you. <laughs> At the moment, no. Nor do I have time for scavenger hunters. Not even when they most cordially invite you in with the finest serve and a party-style southern fried chicken imaginable. Come on, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I... Come on. Come well, on, come on, come it's on. delicious chicken. Well, okay, the chicken did it. <laughs> the inside of Thaddeus Grover's house was also a stock southern mansion from a giant cut glass punch bowl. Belonged to my mother, sir, first lady of Atlanta, Georgia, sir, to a wide and winding colonial staircase. It left you expecting the descent of Scarlett O'Hara at any moment. There was one strange note in the soft southern surroundings. Piled three feet high in the middle of the room were the crazy quilt results of the evening scavenger hunt, including a wooden cigar store Indian, a pair of Hickox suspenders from a local fire chief, one red motorcycle, a stuffed owl, a set of antlers, and more. And behind all that, my counterparts, the bring-em-back-alive items from each list, a streetcar conductor in uniform, 
A waiter bald and under 40. A schoolteacher red-headed and over 50. But I was the center of attention. But Thaddeus introduced one after another of the guests to the genuine, 100% non-shrinkable private detective. And now, Mr. Marlowe, sir, a very special friend of mine. At 31, sir, the president of Sample and Claiborne, best building contractors in the city of Los Angeles. Oh, that's so very interesting, Mr. Grover. Yeah, moreover, Mr. Marlowe, Sample made it right to the top in the past two years. Uh-huh. Yeah, ever since old Joshua Claiborne got killed falling off a scaffold. He did. Because between you and me and the gatepost, some folks say it was Suicide. Oh, Larry! La- uh, boy, I, I'd like you to meet Mr. Marlowe, private detective. Mr. Marlowe, Larry Sam. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Glad you're with us. Uh, Thaddeus, has Rhonda called in yet? Last time I heard from her was when we split our list in two and she headed out after a Latin American rumba team. <laughs> <laughs> well, if she went after a boy, she'll bring her back. That's Rhonda Langley we're speaking of, Mr. Marlowe, Larry's lady friend. Oh? Nicest person I know. Except, of course, my fiance, Helen. Helen is in Palmer, my patron, Mr. Grover. <laughs> yes, sir. What and the same, sir. Well, we certainly have a lot of fun, even if we don't make much money, eh, Marlowe? Yeah, you certainly... <laughs> Mr. Grover, did you say money? Most surely did, boy. Oh. You know, dollars and cents. Yes. Well, gentlemen, you'll excuse me, please, but I do have to run. Good night, Mr. Sample. Good night. And Mr. Grover, sir, it's been a distinct pleasure, sir. I bid you goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. You're a card. <laughs> <laughs> back to my office, which I had left, lights on and unlocked. My telephone was ringing. At this late hour, gullible me took faint hope that it could be a client who might still save the day. When I picked up the receiver... Marlo? I let go of that straw fast. Marlo? It was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra. Marlo, do you know a girl named Helen Palmer? Helen Palmer? Hey, Ibarra, don't tell me there's a pair of somewhat flat feet on the lady's scavenger hunt list. Very funny, Phil. How do you know her? No, not beyond a panic telephone call that ended in a make-believe scream and a couple of pistol shots. All designed to bring me running to a party at 8700 Magnolia Terrace. Mm-hmm. Well, that adds all right, because the only items not checked off a list are a night watchman's badge and one detective private, which must be you, since your name is circled in the classified directory here in this phone booth. Here in what phone booth? Where are you, Ibarra? At a closed filling station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Why is a girl's list there with you? Because it's clenched in her right hand, Phil, and she's folded up on the floor of this booth, dead. Oh, no. Two bullet holes in her back. Oh, yeah, but but Ibarra, her call was a gag. The shots weren't. Anyhow, it looks like a stick-up since the lady's purse is gone and a wino we Who? picked up. A wino we picked up saw what he calls a curly-headed guy with short legs do it and run. Also, the wino says that the murderer had been hanging around for a couple of hours like he was looking for a well-to-do prospect. Yeah, I know, but it's still kind of strange. Me getting that call, I mean. Well, I'll drop around to headquarters tomorrow morning, Lieutenant, if you need any statement from me. I think you'd better make that tonight, Phil. At the 8700 address. I'm sending Mooney up there now. Oh, but wait a minute, Ibarra. You don't need me, and I do need business. If you think I'm going to get it by... Phil. Huh? Phil, let's say that I'd appreciate it if you'd show for a few minutes. Okay? No. Well, okay, a few minutes. Just so long as you appreciate it. Goodbye. Driving back to Magnolia Terrace, I used Detective Lieutenant Ibarra as an oversized whipping boy for the day's disappointments. So when I finally break to a stop behind a half-parked squad car, which meant that Police Officer Mooney was already on hand, I was about back to normal. But then in the next quick moment, I forgot all about Ibarra because... In the shadows ahead, sneaking away from a side entrance to number 8700, and looking as guilty as Lucretia Borgia leaving a corner pharmacy, was a young lady, brunette and beautiful... She hurried directly to a gray Nash parked in the rear and, without looking back, climbed in and took off. Following her had to be more fun than conversation with Mooney. (laughs) Ten minutes later, the lady came to a stop in front of a dark, politely landscaped cottage on North Ogden Drive. In another two, she was inside and the light was on. When I got to the front door and leaned against the bell, a card over it said... But this could be one Rhonda Langley, Mr. Larry Sample's girlfriend. But that same card also gave another name, Helen Palmer, the lady dead in the phone booth. I rang again. When the door opened, it was the brunette, still beautiful. Only this time, something had been added. In her right hand, a forty-five, ugly and pointed straight at my head. What do you want? One straight answer, Miss Langley. <clears throat> Why did you run away from 8700 Magnolia Terrace? And a cop with routine questions. Wait a minute. 
Who are you? How do you know my name? I'm a private detective, labeled Philip Marlowe. Item number eight on the late Miss Palmer's list. I know about you because I've already been to Thaddeus Grover's party. Now, after you put this gun away, <clears throat> we'll get back to my question. Why'd you run? Come on, talk, lady, now before I yell copper. Well, all right. Come in. Thanks. Mr. Marlowe, I don't think Helen Palmer's murder was any run-of-the-mill robbery. You don't think what? I stayed just long enough to hear the policeman say Helen had been killed. Oh. When I got to your welcome, Matt, I was greeted with a forty-five. Talk some more, Miss Langley. Real plain well, like, all right. huh? Give me half a chance, will you? I didn't say anything to the police about this because I don't want to do any damage before I'm sure about a few things. Like what? Like the kind of a mess that Helen was in. Mr. Marlowe, I need help. I- I've got to know some facts. Please, will you work for me? I'll pay you anything. Well, at this point, let's call anything 25 a day in expenses, huh? Uh, About Helen and the mess you spoke of, how much do you know? Very little. Only that I think Helen was blackmailing somebody. Somebody who was at the party tonight. Like Grover, your boyfriend, Larry Sample? I don't know. Oh, you've got to believe me, Mr. Marlowe. Well, all right. For the time being, I will. Now, first of all, how'd you lash on to this blackmail? Well, yesterday morning, I accidentally overheard Helen talking to someone on the telephone. She spoke of a payoff that was to be made at Thaddeus's party. I don't know who she was talking to, but she warned the person not to try anything rash. As in murder? She didn't say. But she did say that she'd already airmailed a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco that would protect her from any harm. Then she laughed about the scheduled scavenger hunt and hung up. Mm -hmm. You said nothing to her about this, huh? Well, no, I I was afraid... All right, the letter to San Francisco. Did you see her mail it? Well, I mailed it myself earlier in the day, along with one of my own. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it until after her call, when she pointedly asked me if I'd remembered to mail a letter. Uh, My letter, that is which she knew that I'd written to an aunt I have in Passaic, New Jersey. Well? Well, that's the whole story. If you want me, I'll be over at Thaddeus' place. Thaddeus? Yes. He was in love with Helen. Yeah. Maybe she was returning that love with blackmail. What do you think, Rhonda? I don't know. The thinking is now your job, Mr. Marlowe. When I left Rhonda Langley and started back to my car as a bona fide private detective with clients, I wasn't sure whether or not I was happy about the whole thing. But a second later, at the sight of a man in the dark ahead, half crouched behind a tree, I quit deliberating the point and got ready for trouble because, from what I could see, the gentleman in hiding had both the curly hair and very short legs that Ibarra had mentioned as a sign of Helen Palmer's killer. I kept walking straight until I was abreast the tree, and then I pivoted sharply, took one step toward him, and swung! <laughs> Come on, brother. Why, you dirty... You haven't got the time. They believe me. Enough, fella. Enough, will you leave me alone? Sure. Sure I will. After you start talking. Now, get up. Okay. Okay, don't hit me again. I'll talk. I'll tell you everything. Hey. Hey, look there. No. No, don't. Oh, that lousy nut. just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, you can do a lot of singing for $14,500, so they say. And tonight, some CBS listener may be able to speak with authority on the subject because $14,500 is what's waiting for whoever can solve the mystery behind the new Phantom Voice on CBS's great Saturday night quiz game, Sing It Again. Listeners from coast to coast will be quizzed by telephone about the new Phantom's identity. And they'll also be given a chance to win one of the other famous prizes for solving the riddle songs which feature Sing It Again's Hour of Saturday Night Fun. Here's Sing It Again on most of these same CBS network stations tonight and every Saturday night. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Grim Hunters. Shots crashed out of the darkness. The life ran out of the little man like air from a kid's balloon. I couldn't figure exactly where the shots had come from, and I stopped trying when a pair of spiked heels clicked fast across the concrete driveway between me and the house. Then a motor started, and a second later, a car roared by with Ronda Langley at the wheel. I yelled at her to stop as she went by and ran out in the street after her and yelled again at the retreating car. But she ignored me. When another car came around the curve behind me, I tried to flag it down, but the driver didn't even slow up. 
I just stood there while the two cars twisted out of sight down the winding street, leaving nothing but silence and a lot of unanswered questions hanging in midair. I walked back to the corpse, went over it carefully. But there was no identification, nothing but a gun to indicate how he fitted into the screwy mosaic of murder, scavenging, and blackmail. I went inside to call Ibarra, and five minutes of tracers, relays, and busy signals went by before I finally got through to him with my news about Helen Palmer's killer. What? Uh, where are you, Marlowe? In a house on Ogden Drive, 4310 North. It was shared by Helen Palmer, my new client, Rhonda Langley. Uh-huh. Did she kill my suspect, Marlowe? It could be. She left here in a big hurry. Another thing, Ibarra, there's more behind this business than robbery. Like what? Like blackmail. Maybe so. We just found the Palmer's girl handbag in a trash can. Nothing left but a lipstick and two letters. Incidentally, one is addressed to your client, Rhonda Langley. That figures. They shared the house, so Helen happened to pick up the day's mail. What's the other letter? It was one return for insufficient postage. They forgot that air mail is six cents these days. Oh, return... Wait a minute. Is that letter addressed to a law firm in San Francisco? No, it's addressed to Sophie Kilberty. Sophie Kill who? Kilberty of oh. Passaic, New Jersey. Why? Oh, Ibarra, listen. Helen was blackmailing somebody, and she covered herself by mailing a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. If that letter was returned for insufficient postage and the blackmail victim knew it, he'd have no qualms about killing her, right? Sure, but the letters were in Helen's purse. Oh. Don't you think she'd have known her protection was gone? Phil, I'm going to put out a pickup call on your client. And you get on down here so we can go over this mess one step at a time. Where's here? Still at the gas station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Okay, Barra. How long are you going to be there? Just until Thaddeus Grover shows up to identify the body and give me some answers personally about that scavenger hunt he threw tonight. What about this curly-headed corpse I've got here? Have you gone over him? Yeah, yeah. Nothing but a gun, some small bills on him. Then he'll keep. I'll expect you in a few minutes. Okay. So long, Ibarra. When I put down the phone, I was convinced that a big switch was due any minute because... Finding those letters in Helen Palmer's purse made a lot of sense in one direction and not a bit in another. I could have made more heads and tails by flipping a ball bearing than I got out of the facts he borrowed given me. Just then, the shadow of a man slid up the walk. I heard a pair of feet mount the stairs two at a time. It was the Wonder Boy executive I had met at the party. Better hold it right there, Sample. What? Marlow. Why the gun? So the same thing won't happen to me that happened to the dead little guy outside? Another murder? Marlo, where's Rhonda? Is she all right? She left here as fast as an eight-cylinder motor wide open could move just after it happened. Then it was Rhonda I saw. On my way over here, a speeding car almost crowded me off the road. It looked like Rhonda's, but I wasn't sure. And Marlo, she was being chased by another car, a fast one. Chased, are you sure? Yes. The first car missed me by inches when it swung around a curve. I don't know yet how she made it. Then a second car came along and passed the curve, but it stopped, backed up, and then took the same road Rhonda had taken. You think she got away? I don't know. Hmm. Well, come on outside, Sample. I want you to take a look at this. By the way, how long have you known Rhonda? About a year. Mm hmm She's a brilliant girl, Marlowe. Came out from the East, and I gave her a job as my secretary. She's more than that now, huh? I'm in love with her, if that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is. Oh. Marlowe, I... I know this man. That's Nate Murdoch. He used to be a foreman with our firm. He left and went back to Atlanta right after Claiborne's death. Atlanta? Isn't your host Thaddeus Grover from Atlanta? Why, yes, he is. Oh, brother. When did you see Grover last? Well, the police asked him to go and identify Helen's body. He left the party while the officer was still questioning the rest of us. Yeah, and on the way, he could have taken time off to drop by here, kill Murdoch, and make a try for Rhonda, too. Come on, let's get to the phone. But why, Marlowe? Good heavens, Grover's our friend. He and Helen were engaged to be married. All right, so it doesn't make sense. But his fiance and his short friend from Atlanta are both dead. And Rhonda's burning the tires off a car to keep out of reach. Those are the facts. It'll make sense later. Now, call Grover's place and hurry up. Yes. That's where she intended to go when she left here, to console him, no less. Scavenger hunt my Aunt Minnie. Uh, hello? Hello, is Mr. Grover there? No. Well, has Miss Langley arrived yet? Oh, it's the maid, Marlon. Mm -hmm. Rhonda had... What's that? She's coming up the walk now? Uh, hold the line a minute, please. She just got there, Marlon. What'll I tell her? Tell her to leave again. Tell her... No. Where do you live? 4406 Ardmore. All right. Tell her I said for her to wait outside in the back of the house until you can get over there to pick her up. Take her to your place and I'll pin Grover down. Right. Where are you going now? See Lieutenant Ibarra, and I can get there faster than I can call him on the phone. Good luck, Sample. Sample was repeating my name over to Grover's maid on the phone as I left. 
And a few minutes later, at the mobile gas station off Hollywood Boulevard, I found Ibarra looking sardonic in the blinking light from a flying red neon horse above his head as he flipped through a stack of papers on top of an oil drum. It's about time, Arnold. Where's that client of yours? Now, wait a minute, Ibarra. I had her pegged all wrong. She's a pigeon. Has Thaddeus Grover been here yet? Just left. He's quite a character, that guy. You didn't let him get away alone? Yes, he was... What do you mean, get away? Ibarra, there's a, there's a big connection between Thaddeus Grover and Murdoch, the guy who killed Helen. Now, Grover might have hired him for the job, and now he's trying to get Rhonda. Now, Marlo, how does that figure? It doesn't, but so help me, Ibarra, that's the way it is. Well, Grover was heading for his friend Larry Sample's house, and he left. Happened to know where Sample... Holy smoke, that's exactly where I told Sample to take the girl. 4406 Ardmore. Well, that's great, Marlo. They'll all be together in one place. I'll pick up the whole crew in right now. You're going to pick up the pieces, you mean? You think there'll be a showdown? Any minute, Ibarra, it can't miss. Okay, so we'll take some firepower along. Hey, McGollum, great. Let's go. Come on, Phil. Now, look, Ibarra, maybe Sample hasn't gotten home with Rhonda yet. I'll go up to Grover's and try to head them off, okay? Okay, Marlo. But if you get them before I do, bring them in. And no alibis. I'll see you. Ibarra was grim as he climbed in his car and drove off fast. I headed for my car. Then as I turned, my arm swept the scavenger list Ibarra had left on the oil drum off onto the ground. When I picked them up, Rhonda Langley's name was on top. Her list was as goony as the others, but near the bottom was an item strangely familiar to me, which hadn't been checked off. It was a canceled ticket from Woodhaven Ballroom. All at once, I realized why it was familiar. The sign I'd been half conscious of on top of the big squat building across the street read, Woodhaven Ballroom, closed tonight. On a hunch, I dug for Helen Palmer's list. Yeah, Ibarra was right. Everything but a night watchman's badge and one detective private had been checked off. And that gave me half of the switch I knew I had to show up. I ran to my car and headed for that southern mansion in the Hollywood Hills. In the end of a very complicated frolic. And with every turn of the road, I gave myself another whack for being such a nearsighted sucker. When I got there, the big house on Magnolia Terrace was dark except for a light in the servants' quarters. I stepped down the block, walked back, and edged around to the patio where the garage, the hothouse, and the king-size barbecue loomed only as... Shapeless lumps of shadow. I stood still and watched. And I saw him move, walking slowly, gun in hand along the fence toward the hothouse. I started toward him quietly, just as he found out what he was looking for. Oh, you're clever, my dear. But it's all over now. I know you're in there, so come on out with your hands up. Oh, no. You're hanging yourself for murder right now, Larry Sample. I've got all the proof I need. I don't know what good it'll do you, Rhonda. I'll never pay you a cent for it, you blackmailing tramp. I'll kill you first. And that protection letter you wrote to your lawyers was returned, darling. I found it accidentally in Helen's purse tonight at the party. So no one will know. Now, come on out, or I'm going in after you. I wouldn't try that if I were you, Sample. Marlowe's due here any minute now. He called me and told me. That was I, dear. You? I used his name when I talked to the maid. Oh, I should have done this myself in the first place instead of trusting that stupid Murdoch. Are you going to come out of there? No, and I've got a gun. You can't see me, and I know it. Your white dress makes a perfect target, you little fool. Drop it, Sample. Oh. Now let's have that gun. Well, I'm so glad you got here. It, no, it, no, he's not dead. Oh. And he won't be from bullets. Give me your gun, too, huh? Come on. All right. I, I was too scared to use it anyway. Thanks. Now sit down and shut up. We're going to wait for Lieutenant Ibarra, then you're both going to the pokey. Listen, you, I don't go for blackmailers, male or female. Even the cute ones are ugly, lady. Very ugly. Oh, Phil, wait. You've got to understand something. Two years ago, Larry Sample killed his partner, Joshua Claiborne. I knew it, but I couldn't prove it. So I pretended I could and blackmailed him. Don't you see? If he paid off or, or tried to kill me, that would be proof of his guilt. And he did, Marlowe. Mm-hmm. Why should you pull a stunt like that? I'm a divorcee, Marlowe. Langley is only my married name. Okay, so what? My maiden name was Claiborne. Claiborne? I'm Josh Claiborne's daughter. Oh. And I can prove that. Is that reason enough? Well, why didn't you level with me instead of labeling Helen a blackmailer? Well, Helen was already dead. And I needed your help desperately. I thought I had to lie to get it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, baby. <laughs> Anyone care for more coffee? How about you, Lieutenant? Oh, no thanks, Mr. Grover. Well, Marlowe, you 
Got it all to come out even, anyway. <laughs> Frankly, that's more than I expected, and I left you at that gas station. Yeah, yeah, we were lucky, Burr. I, um, I guess I owe you an apology, Mr. Grove. Oh, shucks, it's all right, son. It was a shock to me to be accused of poor Helen's murder, but, well, it's over now. Yeah. Um, you said it was the scavenger list that set you straight. How'd you figure that, boy? Well, there was a Woodhaven ballroom ticket on Rhonda's list, so she had to go there for the ticket, you see. Ah. Uh-huh. A sample knew that. And he told his killer, Murdoch, coincidentally, he hired to murder Claiborne two years ago, that the girl who went to the Woodhaven ballroom was his target. Ah. Uh-huh. But Helen happened to go there after the night watchman's badge. Which he could have picked up any place in town. Yeah. What a terrible coincidence for Helen. That that was all that saved my life, really. That's right, honey. Murdoch made the mistake, and when he and Sample discovered it, they made another try at Rhonda's house. But I caught Murdoch there, so Sample shot him before he could talk. And when I left, he followed me in his car. I knew they were after me, and I thought for sure they'd killed you, Phil. That's why I ran. Yeah. That threw me for a loop. And Sample came back to make sure that Murdoch was dead and sold me a great big bill of goods at the same time. Ah, oh, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Yes, Mr. Grover, it is. Uh, Lieutenant, I want to thank you personally for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I've got everything I need, so I'll say good night. Yeah, me too. Hey, I... Phil? <clears throat> yes? Yeah? Shall I mail you a check? Why, yes, I, I think... Uh... No, no, no. Wait a minute. Yes? Yeah. You know, honey, with uh, with your knowledge of postal rates, uh, why don't you uh, just deliver it in person, maybe? Huh? Love to. Count on it, Mr. Marlowe. Good night. I drove down from the Hollywood Hills with a check warming my wallet and the echo of a soft invitation warming my imagination. You know, that was quite a party at Grover's house. (laughs) Scavenger hunt. People determined to have a good time even if it killed them. You know what? It did. I know another game. Associations. It goes like this. Grover's party. Rhonda Langley. Rhonda... Hmm date. Hmm. I wonder if she likes baseball. Born at the same hour on the same day of the same parents. And they were identical in beauty and talent. Only one was deadly, but the other was not. And I couldn't tell which was which until I found a green purse, a fresh corpse, and a pair of dancing hands. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Dancing Hands. The telegram I found stuck in the mail slot when I got back to my office after a long and roundabout day read, Enclosed find a $50 money order. I want you to investigate a man. A table is reserved for you at the saddle club where I work. Come in time for the second show at 11, important. It was signed, Beth Tyler. So at a quarter to 11, with 50 bucks worth of inspiration behind me, I drove over the Coenga Freeway and out Ventura to the saddle club, which pretended to be old English by showing its beams through a flagstone facade. I went in the carefully rough-hewn oak door, and even before my eyes became adjusted to the cozy lack of candle power inside, Neil Redmond, owner and operator of the place, glided toward me sporting his genial host smile, which tonight was even more forced than usual. How are you, Marlo? It's been a long time. Business a pleasure, Phil. It's always a pleasure to come to the Saddle Club, Neil. I've even got a reservation. You know my food better than that, Marlo. Ha-ha. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just don't let it get rough, will you? Come on, I'll find your table out front. I want you to see this show. 
A pair of twins in a twin piano act that's sensational. Yeah? Edie and Beth Tyler. Oh, here, how's this? Fine. Incidentally, uh, Edie will be the one on the left. Well, if they're twins, what's the difference? Plenty. Edie may be Mrs. Redman one of these days. Well, oh. Mrs. Redman, but you are wanted on the phone, sir. I uh, Get the number, George, and I'll call back. This gentleman said you would talk to him, sir. It is uh, Mr. Paul Cedar. Paul Cedar. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Excuse me, Marlo. Uh, this is important. Redmond reacted to the name Cedar like a punch in the nose. But I figured that was none of my business, which was more than I could say for a flabby, dull-faced character at the next table who followed the nightclub owner all the way out of the room with a pair of watery red eyes, which he deliberately avoided turning in my direction. But at that point, an MC stepped out on the stage, and so I stopped worrying about flabby in favor of the first look at my client. curtains parted on a stage set with an oversized full-length mirror which reflected a grand piano, a black vase of yellow flowers and a tall brunette with a wry crisp waistline, who touched up a piled-high hairdo, put on a pair of long black gloves, checked her hemline and sat down at the piano. And she ran through an involved arpeggio while her reflection in the mirror looked on in admiration. It was an old but cute routine, and the illusion was perfect because the Tyler twins were practically identical. I took another look at Flabby, whose face was pushed up in a nasty leer. He stood up, dropped his cigarette into his drink, and tossed a crumpled bill down on the table, just as the lights went out for the trick part of the act. On the dark stage, two pairs of purple hands danced over two glowing silver keyboards, which would have been good except that the pair of hands on the right, which belonged to Beth, suddenly stopped in midair and hit blue notes like a nine-year-old at her first recital. When the lights came up again, my client's face was as white as middle sea. And the flabby character oozing a victorious smile was on his way to the door. Well, they wrapped it up fast after that. And Beth ran into the wings, leaving Edie to take the bow alone. The band took over in a hurry and brought things down to normal. So as couples moved down to the dance floor and George the waiter headed to my table, I sat back and waited for that message from my client. Here you are, sir. Compliments of the house. Oh, Thanks. Any message with this? No, sir. Just that Mr. Redman had to leave. Oh, thanks, George. I sipped the double scotch and wondered if I should take the initiative and contact my client. When the message I'd been waiting for came, good and loud. I jumped up, shoved my way through the gaping dancers to the dressing room hallway behind the stage. A gang of club personnel was bunched in front of a door, obviously locked, labeled Edie and Beth Tyler. Hey, it was one of the twins, wasn't it? Hey, what's the matter? Uh, it's one of the twins. She's free. We gotta get in. Uh, that door's locked. Break it down. Uh, but get I, out I, of the I, way. Hey, it's Edie. It's Edie. All right, no, no, wait, a minute. wait a minute. Hold it. She's all right. Clear out and give her a chance. Come on. Outside, everybody. Beat it. That means you two. Come on. Out. <laughs> Here, Miss Tyler, take it easy. You're all right now. Come on, sit down. Tell me what happened. I don't know for sure. I was worried about Beth. I came back and didn't see her anywhere. Then I heard a noise in here. It was dark. I came in and, and someone grabbed me. A man? Yes. I don't know who it was. Mm-hmm. I screamed. He knocked me down. Then locked the door. Got out through the window there. Who are you? Oh, I'm Philip Marlowe, a private detective. Your sister hired me to investigate a guy. I was to meet her here after your number and find out about it. Any idea what's up? No, I can't imagine. But, gee, Beth has been terribly upset ever since last night. Oh? What happened last night? Well, for one thing, my purse was stolen. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't see why that should upset her. Gee, there was nothing in it but $12 and my makeup stuff. Where's Beth now, do you know? No. I haven't seen her since she ran off the stage. I'm not even sure she came in here. No, she was here all right. She dropped one of her gloves. You're still wearing both of yours. Where do you girls live? Maybe she went home. Well, Beth has a cottage out on Hazeltine. 4179. You don't live together? How come? Well, gee, Mr. Marlowe, just working with Beth is hard enough. She's so sarcastic. <laughs> Okay, I'll wear my thick skin. Uh, one more thing, Miss Tyler. Do you happen to know where Neil went? Oh, Neil's gone? Mm-hmm. Gee, that's funny. He always stays till the place closes. Oh, he must be coming right back. I'll take a look. Then I'm going out to see your sister. Sarcasm and all. I spent 
ten minutes questioning the help on the whereabouts of the boss and got nothing but double talk for answers. So since I was still carrying Beth's glove around with me, I dropped it in my pocket and went outside to my car. I'd opened the door and slid far enough under the wheel so I couldn't back out before I realized that the dough-faced flab was already there on the seat. His right hand wrapped around something blunt and menacing in his sloppy jacket pocket. You better come on in. What are you doing in my car, blubber boy? Don't get sassy now, mister. And the name is Sippy. That's no improvement and that's no answer. All right. I, uh, saw you inside making with the big talk, so I says to myself, he's an interested party. I should look him up. Maybe we can do business together. All right, stay over there. What kind of business? I'm particular about the gutters I crawl in. It has to do with the twins inside there. You can get in touch with me later for further details. I got an angle, mister. You'll see when I leave. Yeah? When you try to work that angle, you got to the wrong twin in the dressing room. Do you know that? I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sippy, where can I reach you? You'll find out if you really know what's up. (laughs) Don't try to follow me, though. I'll be seeing you. When Sippy slid out of the car and beat it, I made one move after him and then stopped cold. Because lying on the seat where he'd been sitting was a green leather handbag with the name Edie etched on it. I snapped it open. It had been stripped of everything but the scent of Amir and the smudged slip of paper that read, Number 9 Arrow Motel, Lancashire Boulevard. So that was Sippy's address, and he had the stolen purse. But the why of all the commotion over 12 missing bucks was still the number one question mark. And I figured the best place for an answer to it was at Beth Tyler's. So I drove out to Hazeltine. But even before I stopped at number 4179, I heard the piano. I walked to the door and stood there a moment, listening. I eased it open. Slipped inside. Soft, indirect lighting accented the figure of the girl at the piano. The little waves of iridescent crimson chased themselves over the smooth, satin gown as she played. Glossy, blue-black hair fell to her shoulders. Beside her, a burning cigarette sent a single plume of smoke into the still air. Just for a moment, I found it difficult to remember that she was my client. You're... you're looking better, Beth. You're Philip Marlowe, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I dropped by to return your glove, among other things. Just put it there on the table. With the other one. Where did you get it, Marlowe? In your dressing room at the club. Your sister tangled with an unidentified man who was hiding there after you left. While we're on that, why'd you shove off so fast? I was scared. How'd you know I'd find you? You're a detective. Remember? Mm-hmm. Look, if you want to burn up your retainer playing hide-and-seek, it's your business. Now, who's the guy you want me to check on? The flabby one who made you blow up tonight? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because I think my sweet twin sister is mixed up in something a little more serious than her usual scatterbrain escapades. Hmm. And the flabby guy is in on it because he has a green purse, right? How did you know that? He left it with me. Name is Sippy. He lives at the Arrow Motel, number nine. Knows something worthwhile about this business, and he's anxious to sell it. All of which puts him a hop, skip, and a jump ahead of your detective. Now tell me, why is everybody, including Neil Redman, all wound up over one stolen purse? What's it all about, baby? I don't know. Baby. Suppose you find out and tell me. Wouldn't have anything to do with the fact that Neil loves your sister and you love Neil, would it? Marlowe, I hired you to investigate a man, not to pry into my personal affairs. You'll get more for your money if I stop holding out on me. It's my money. Besides, I'm not holding out. Believe me. I'll try. Real hard. Well, as soon as I've got something, I'll call you. Where are you going now? Uh, My retainer entitles me to know, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. First to the club to find Redmond and get his side of it, and then... I'll probably drop in on our chum, Sippy, at the Arrow Motel on Lancashire. Good. I'll, uh, keep a light in the window for you. Oh, sweet. <laughs> also keep your door locked. From the inside, baby. As 
I drove down the dark, winding street toward Ventura Boulevard, I caught a flash in the rearview mirror of a station wagon behind me. It looked like a tail, so I opened up. But it stayed with me. When it swung out into the left lane to pass, it suddenly cut in front of me. I jammed on the brakes as a spotlight slashed at my eyes, and when my front wheel banged against the curb, I was already half out of the car. Stop right where you are, fella. Don't come one inch closer, or I'll drop you. <laughs> I switched off the spotlight and I saw a face the texture of a doormat over an embroidered purple shirt and orange tie. He had hand-tooled high-heeled boots on and was topped off by a ten-quart cream-colored Stetson. But the doormat face was grim and the silver-barreled cold pistol in his hand looked right at home. I followed you up here from the saddle club. I don't know what your game is or why you're messing around and what don't concern you, but... I aim to find out mighty quick, so start talking. Okay. First, I resent being crowded off the road. Second, I resent a spotlight in my face. And third, I don't like pistols pointed at my stomach. So cool off, Jesse James. You're wasting your time and mine. You got it wrong there, friend. Paul Cedar don't waste his time, and you're going to find that out. Paul Cedar? Huh? Yeah. Don't tell me you're all excited over a stolen purse with 12 bucks in it. Twelve dollars? Yeah. Listen, clown, there's 30 grand missing somewhere between Redman and me, and I'm going to get it. 30,000? Yeah. Redman's a high roller, and that's okay with me. But he lost it fair and square in my joint over in Nevada, and I've been holding his markers much too long. So if I have to chalk that dough off to experience, it's going to be a pretty unpleasant experience for a certain party. Get me? Yeah, I get you. But you're shoving the wrong way, Longhorn. Somebody's trying to make a fool out of me, bright boy. And I don't stand for that. I'm liable to shove a lot of ways. And hard. So don't get underfoot. Now you're sure to get stepped on. So long, dude. <laughs> just a moment, we'll return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, tomorrow marks the anniversary of an important event in American history, the signing of the first peace treaty between the Indians and the Plymouth colonists. In commemoration of these events, CBS's Sunday night stars, Amos and Andy, will be found with a kingfish burying the hatchet deeper than ever in their hopes and dreams. And CBS's own Jack Benny will be back again tomorrow with his special guest, Van Johnson. Invite some friends over Sit back and enjoy the Jack Benny program. You can hear Amos and Andy every Sunday on most of these same CBS network stations and Jack Benny over them all. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Dancing Hands. The Texan from Nevada galloped off in his t- trusty station wagon. I forgot all about Neil Redmond and headed instead for Sippy and his further details at the Arrow Motel on Lancashire, where Bungalow 9 turned out to be an all-alone green and white collection of clapboard that showed light, a half-open door, and nobody home to my knock. When I tried knuckles on wood again and still got only a faint echo for reply, I stepped inside. There in the center of an ivory-white throw rug and clamoring for attention like an only child at a family reunion was a wide and wet circle of red. From there, the ugly splotches that narrowed as they got farther away trailed off until, finally, in the next room, the path ended where I expected it to. The quiet form of Skippy, sprawled over an upset chair and holding his hands tight against the red on his left side. When I got to him, he was going fast. Thirty grand. A lot of dough. Didn't know I was... Shooting that high, and the, the twins. The twins. One, one, one what, Sippy? One of them. Did one of them do this? One, one, He's dead, isn't he, Marlo? Yeah. Yeah, Redmond, he's very dead. Oh, no, Marlo. I only found him a few seconds before you did. Yeah, and the rest of that run, you heard someone coming, you didn't want to be seen, so you ducked back out of sight, huh? I don't buy it, Redmond, because for one thing, it's too pat. For another, how do you explain being here in the first place? Come on, fast. Okay, I'm here because I'm on a nasty jam. Like what? Like $30,000 I've got to pay in the next hour to a guy named Paul Cedar who's running out of patience in a hurry, believe me. About that, I do. I've already met the gentleman. But right now, Redmond, we're talking about Sippy. Okay. Last night, I had things to do, so I gave Edie Tyler the money for the payoff to Cedar. A couple of minutes after she stepped out of the club, somebody roughed her up and got away with a purse and the 30 grand. You're a liar, Redmond. Eat yourself told me that purse only had 12 bucks in it. How come? Simple like, Marlowe. 
In my business, you never yell copper too soon or too loud. It doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. Now, look, for the third time, Redmond, you and Sippy, how do you figure? I don't know. He was at the club tonight, acting funny. When he left, I got a glimpse of Edie's green purse sticking out of his topcoat pocket. Later on, I saw him run away from a car near the club, so I followed. I ended up here a couple of minutes behind him, and... That Marlowe was a truth, I swear. Would you do at the drop of a... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Look, if you're telling the truth, I begin to get a different picture. And by that, I specifically mean a very talented but very sly dame named Beth Tyler. Oh, no, Marlowe. Why not? Because you love Beth's sister? Face it, Redmond, it doesn't add up any other way. Sippy here couldn't have stolen that purse from Edie. If he did, he'd have taken his dough and blown, not spent his time putting out feelers... But on the other hand, if Sippy happened to see Beth take it from Edie, empty it and toss it away, we've got another story, right? Yeah. Because he wouldn't make a move until he knew how much he had gotten away with. Exactly. But there he ran into trouble because he was trying to get close to Beth. And in doing that, he got mixed up and went for Edie instead, like tonight at the club. Sure. And that dying man's words just now about one twin. To which you can add the unpleasant fact that I personally ran off at the mouth when I was up at Beth's an hour ago. But she knew where to come for Sippy. Look, Redmond, it's got to run that way. I'm sure of it. Well, maybe you're right, Phil, but right or wrong, I'm still in the jam. So if you don't have any objections, I'm going back to my club now for a last try of raising that money again before Cedar shows. You mean you're going to face him, Neil, with or without her? I've got him, Marlo. You see, I own a fast club, all right, and I gamble a lot, too. But I don't welch on my markers no more than I knock over flabby little guys. You know what I mean, Phil? I think so. But don't fold now, Neil, because... I might still be lucky enough to catch up to Beth Tyler and your money both before your time runs out. And right now that means fast to a phone and a call to Edie who might know which way a runaway twin would head. I'll see you, Neil. The nearest phone was at an all-night mobile gas station a block away. As I dialed Edie's number, a thought hit me. Maybe Beth wouldn't head anywhere. Maybe she'd just stick around. <laughs> Hello? Edie, this is Marlo. Seen anything of Beth? No, I haven't. But why? What is it, Marlo? Well, from where I stand, two things. First, your sister has the $30,000 and $12 that was in your purse last night. Oh? And second, she's just about it for a sloppy around the edges murder. Oh. Now, look, have you any idea where Beth would head if she had to get out of town in a hurry? No, I don't, Marlo. Oh, well, maybe somebody up around her place does. I'll call you later. Marlo, wait. Are... Are you sold on this? I mean, about the things you said Beth did? Just about, Edie. But for your sake, let's hope I'm wrong. All the way, honey. Goodbye. <laughs> Driving fast back toward Beth's place on Hazeltine still left me enough time to think about a not-too-small detail that I'd completely overlooked. Thanks to me, the entire Los Angeles Police Department knew nothing about what was going on in and around the Saddle Club. Five minutes later, when I'd parked away from the dock and obviously deserted number 4179, I'd walked back and around to a pair of uncurtained French doors at the side. I knew that oversight is what is generally called a blunder. But in the next second, I knew it was nothing compared to the one I was making currently. If you so much as turn your head again, Marlowe, I'll kill you. Not like you did Sippy, please, Beth. I'd hate to go that way. Sippy was a mistake, Marlowe, believe me. I was rushed. So you shot and ran, huh? Yes. But I didn't run too far, because from where I stood, I could hear and see both you and Redmond and talking the whole thing over. And when you knew that we'd caught on to your act, you decided to follow me and see where I was going before you made your next move. Is that it? Exactly. Now get inside. Go on, the door's unlocked. Mm. All right. Now get over there, near that closet, and don't turn around. Why not? Afraid of the look on my face when you shoot? Shut up, Marlowe. And stop being brave. Because unless I have to, I'm not going to kill you. After all, you've already served your purpose. Which I presume was getting mixed up in this mess just long enough to find out about Sippy for you. You presume correctly. Mm -hmm. Also, you talk too much. Now open that closet and get inside. All right. Go on. As you say. But first, baby, one question. Did you do all this for the 30 grand alone? Or does it tie in with Neil Redmond and the way he feels about your sister, Edie? a little bit of each, Marlo. But as I said, you talk too much. So get in there and shut up. Getting out of Beth Taylor's half-inch thick old closet was like arguing with an umpire. You couldn't be subtle. 
So 20 tiring minutes went by and the heels on both my feet were numb before the paneling finally gave in and I was out and over to the telephone to put in a call to the police. It should have been made a long time ago. But then, even as I was halfway through dialing the numbers, I saw something on an end table nearby that made me slowly change my mind. It was the two black gloves that Beth wore in the Dancing Hands Act. And while I stared at them like they were alive and beckoning, I thought hard for what must have been a full minute. And then suddenly I knew that my next stop had to be the Saddle Club. As I parked at the Saddle Club, I saw light drifting out of Neil's office, which was something I had expected. Inside, I moved along a dark hall toward what I knew would be the trio of Neil Redmond, the Nevada Texan, and Eddie Tyler. All right, Redmond. The raucous voice of Paul Cedar was anything but happy. How stupid do you think I am? Cedar, I'm telling the truth. Edie had the 30 grand, but somebody got it from her when she was on her way to you. That's a stinking line. You know it, Redmond. You never had the money. This whole thing's been a frame to stall me. And one way or another, I'm going to get you to admit that. No, you're not, Cedar. Uh, and if you don't drop that gun now, you're never going to do anything ever. Come on, let it go. Uh, All right. Now sit down and shut up and listen hard, because Redmond's telling you the truth. What? Paulo, you know where the money is? That's right. And I also know who took it. Less than an hour ago, a little after I called you, Edie, Beth caught up to me and confessed the whole shebang, exactly as we figured it, Neil. You mean she admitted getting the money from Edie and using you to locate Sippy? That's right. But there's only one drawback to everything she admitted. None of it's true. What do you mean, Marla? I mean, Cedar, that Beth Tyler didn't steal your money from Edie here any more than she killed Sippy. I also mean that as far as I can tell, Beth Tyler was nothing more than a girl who played the piano and got upset when a stranger named Sippy started to bother her. And I never saw the real Beth Tyler after she ran away from a piano in the club tonight. That she's dead and that you, Edie, have been posing as Beth all night because, one, you yourself stole Neil's money and, two, you murdered your sister as well. No! Yes, Edie, come on, admit it, it's true. No, no, it isn't. I... I guess it isn't that, Marlo. In Beth's body? In our dressing room. In the closet. I didn't want to kill her. But she found out that I had only pretended to be robbed when there was no one around. And that Sippy had seen me scream and get rid of the purse myself. Sippy, who was only trying to muscle in on a deal, went to her by mistake, huh? Yes. That's how she knew what I'd done. When she confronted me in the dressing room, just before you came in, and said that she wouldn't stand by and let me do a thing like that to Neil, I lost my temper. You kill her, Edie. Yes, I did, Neil. And when Marlo showed up after a scream, I said that someone had attacked me. And then I pretended to be both Beth and myself from there on to get out of the whole thing. And I... I almost did. But... But now I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> A couple of bad hours went by before the police had everybody's story and Paul Cedar and the 30,000 was gone for Nevada and Edie was gone for good. That left just Neil Redmond and me alone and standing near the main bar in the club. <laughs> Neil was doing his best to stay all in one piece. Well, Marlowe's got a tough night for you, hasn't it? Yeah, but a tough one for you, Neil. What with Cedar and the money and the girls, Marlowe? Yeah. Yeah. At least it came out right before the cowboy got too tough, thanks to you. <laughs> So tell me, Phil, how'd you know that Beth was dead and that Edie was both people all along? That was a couple of gloves, Neil, the ones they wore in their dancing hands act. You see, when I first met Edie in the dressing room, she was wearing hers, and one of Beth's was on the floor. Hey, pour me one, will you? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. I took it, and later when I met what I thought was Beth, I returned it, and she put it with what we both thought was its mate. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. But a little while ago, when I got close to the gloves again, I saw that that couldn't be, that they were both for the left hand, Neil. Ah, then when Edie went to Beth's place to pass herself off as her sister, who she had already killed, she was smart enough to know that she should have only one glove around. Yeah, but not smart enough to think about which glove it should be. From there, I worked backwards. Until you got to the three of us at the club and tried what you knew might be the right answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you were right, Phil, all the way. Yeah, but I was still gambling. If I had been wrong, Neil, I was giving the real Beth a long head start. Mm. It's always that way when you gamble, Phil. I know. Sometimes you pick right, sometimes wrong. Mm -hmm. Cards, dice. <laughs> Even with twins. Good night, fella. When I 
finally got to my car, started out of the valley and back toward Hollywood. It was better than 8 o'clock in the morning. And here and there as I drove, I... I saw people who I'd never heard of and who... Well, who'd never heard of me. Stumbling outside after their morning papers. And I got to wondering what they were going to think when they read about a girl who... had killed both a twin sister in a nightclub and a flabby guy in a motel... who wasn't much good. Well, it was hard to say. And for myself, I was too tired to think. Or maybe... I just didn't want to. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Lou Krugman, Ed Begley, Paul Fries, and Bert Holland. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... When it started, it was simple. Just a lawsuit for damages. But before it was over, it was far from simple, and the damages were murder. All because of a red-headed woman, a ghostwriter with ambition and a match that burned with a bright green flame. <laughs> started, it was simple, just a lawsuit for damages. But before it was over, it was far from simple, and the damages were murder. All because of a red-headed woman, a ghostwriter with ambition, and a match that burned with a bright green flame. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Green Flame. It had been the kind of early start, late finish, crowded in between day that had made breakfast coffee, lunch a ham sandwich on the run, and dinner nothing. So by the time it finally ended, it was pushing nine o'clock. I was both a little tired and a lot hungry. All of which made the feast I could imagine spread out in front of me over an emerald green tablecloth something better than good enough to eat. Blue point oysters on a half shell, a Caesar salad. Veal scallopini topped with mushrooms the size of silver dollars. Oh, I was ready for it. Yes. Yes, well, the oysters once again became a blue ashtray. The scallopini a notebook. A green cloth underneath all... My desk water. Hello, Marlo speaking. Jody Whitmore, Marlo. Ever hear of me? I have. I've also heard you own half a dozen screen magazines, a local radio station, and a daily published for the motion picture industry called the Hollywood Trades. Is that covered? Not quite. Today I acquired something else. A libel suit for 100000 that was just slapped against the trades by a has-been actor named Bradford Colby, which, Marlo, is the reason I'm calling you. Oh? So drop whatever you're doing, boy, and get over here to the Whitmer Building. Whitmer Building? We're on El Centro near Gawa and closed tomorrow Sunday, no addition. Figures. When the night watchman lets you in, turn left, keep walking till you get to an office numbered 116. You got that? Yeah, 116. But if you don't mind, Miss Whitmer, I'd like to do something. I'd like to eat first. Make a coffee and a ham sandwich at the outside and get over here fast. Coffee? Look, Miss Whitmer, I'm starving. Hello. You... How much do you get a day? Twenty-five in expenses. Why? I'm willing to pay a hundred and twenty-five, and you keep track of the expenses. Now, what do you say, boy? Boy says coffee and a ham sandwich will leave him stuffed. Goodbye, Miss Whitmar. Come in, Marlow. Sit down over here, and if you smoke cigars, don't. I can't stand them. Drink? No, thanks. Marlow, our A1 gossip columnist, Stanley McGrath, had this to say in today's edition of The Trades. Mm-hmm. 
The sometimes actor Bradford Colby won't call it quits. When refused a part by an independent producer who's short on funds, Colby offered to hawk all and come up with 20000 if the producer would change his mind. The producer wouldn't. End of quote. And beginning of noise from Colby, huh? Yes, a clamor that we can only silence by proving that McGrath, what he said, is true. Which shouldn't be impossible, because Max was a thorough man and never heard of the word rumor. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean, was a thorough man? He died of a stroke, Marlowe, at five this morning, en route, en route to the hospital, age 61. Mm. His column, as usual, arrived here yesterday afternoon in the mail. He always wrote from his home, which is a junk-filled cracker box upon North Bronson. And now you're being sued by Colby for damages, huh? The late Mr. McGrath isn't around to prove what he said is true. You catch. And being very unpopular with producers myself these past 30 years, Marlowe, <laughs> I have no chance of any help from the one who actually turned Colby down for that part, whoever he is. All of which makes my job what? Precisely this. Find Max source of information. Come in, Larry. Larry North, Marlowe. My editor and anybody's Napoleon. Larry, meet Mr. Marlowe. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Dodie, I've just found out that old Max only Lakeman, a queer duck named Leonard Phipps, left town sometime yesterday for San Diego. May or may not be back by now. Where's Marlowe going to start? Well, I think. Figured... At old Max place. Larry and I have already checked there, Marlowe. 8312 North Bronson. Maybe you'll grab onto something that we overlooked. Here's the key. Thanks. Mac lived alone. Don't get wrapped up in his notes. That gibberish. And remember, my lawyers are sure that we lose this case if we can't prove what Mac said was the truth. Well, yeah. But... All as soon as you get a lead, and if I'm out, Larry will be in his office next door. And Mallow, don't waste any time. There's a lot at stake, boy. <laughs> Dodie Whitmer had labeled a cracker box turned out to be a five-room, slightly beat-down, almost square house set back some 50 carelessly landscaped feet from a high stucco wall that said the late Mr. McGrath had lived alone and liked it. And when I entered and went to his study where I turned on a desk lamp, I saw what my client had meant by junk. There were the odds and ends that a man collects in a lifetime. On his desk, a tarnished loving cup for excellence in reporting, dated 1927. Beyond that, on the mantel, an autographed picture of Teddy Roseville, and next to it, a paperweight from Niagara Falls. And then... And then an item I hadn't expected. In a shadowed corner of the room, there was somebody else. A tall, gaunt somebody else, wearing horn-rimmed glasses and papers sticking out of every pocket. He was slowly, an inch at a time, backing off from the edge of the circle of light in which I stood. I took one casual step toward the desk, and then... <laughs> Get your hands off me. Why? Take a start running, Mr. Leonard Phipps. How do you know my name? I'm psychic. I also know you just got back from San Diego. What I don't know is what you're doing here. Now, come on. Talk. Fast. Please let go. Leave me alone. I'll talk. I've got nothing to hide from the right party. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private detective, was working for Dodie Whitmer, a lady impatient to know which producer McGrath was talking about in that article on Colby this morning. Now, do I qualify? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Of course, we're... Both after the same piece of information, Mr. Marlowe. No. I want to find that answer, too, and then whisper it into Dodie's ear. Just to save her a hundred thousand bucks? No. Just to get a chance to fill McGrath's shoes. And don't laugh, because I've been ghosting that column for the past month now. Didn't McGrath write this morning's column himself? No, he didn't. I did. But the piece on Colby was not mine. McGrath must have added that himself, the fool. Well, you don't sound like you're happy in your work, Phipps. I wasn't. Mac was a tyrant. I put up with him because he promised sooner or later to let Dodie Whitmar know that I was doing his work. Don't be too bitter, Phipps. I couldn't have known exactly when he was going to die. Well, what if he But to get die? back to the subject, have you any idea where we can get a hold of something real to go on? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, out there in the living room. Oh. Follow me, Marlowe. If you can, in the dark. Come back here. I'll see. <laughs> By the time I got to my feet, Phipps was gone. I found another lamp in the dark, turned it on, and started for the telephone. But then I stopped. In the center of the floor, where it must have fallen when the leg man made his wild break, was a wrinkled piece of paper. When I picked it up and turned it over, I was suddenly glad that Mr. Phipps had gotten away because, in his hurry to leave, he had dropped his checkoff list for Operation Bradford Colby. There were a half a dozen producers crossed off above the notation Max Place, but below that, and not yet discounted, was a name I'd never heard before. Sherry Sheldon. At that, I called Dodie Whitmer, gave her a quick rundown on what had happened with Phipps, and then tossed the name Sherry Sheldon in. She talked it over with Larry North before she answered. 
But when she did, I knew that finally we were all getting someplace. Marlo, this is good. Larry tells me that Sherry Sheldon is the ex-Mrs. Bradford Colby. Oh? And better than that, a redhead with temperament to match. That kind will talk. Mm-hmm. Any idea where this item lives? Yes, a bungalow on Sheremoya. 5,800. 5,800, huh? Larry says it's a quiet, dead-end street, but not to let that throw you. Because from what he's heard about the lady herself, she's very much alive. So play it smart, boy. You're probably in the big time now. Good luck. Only a furlong plus the bungalow on Sheremoya, so when I pulled up and parked away from number 5,800, I was still wondering exactly what play it smart, boy meant. When the lady in question was known far and wide as a shock of red hair capping so much dynamite. But a minute later, as I walked toward the house, I labeled that thought introspection, dismissed it, and concentrated instead on an acre of tweed jacket that was unfolding out of a long, honey-colored sedan parked a little ahead of me. When it straightened up to something over six and a half feet, slammed the car door shut and stomped inch-thick sole brogans off in a king-sized huff, I knew that this was an angry man. And in the next second... I knew that it and the thespian Bradford Colby were one and the same. When Colby got to Sherry's doorbell and jabbed at it impatiently for attention, I ducked below a hedge nearby. When the door opened and then slammed shut again, I left the hedge in favor of an on the biased palm tree that bowed toward my lady's chamber where I could both see and hear what had to be an exciting reunion. You said that you knew something that couldn't fail to intrigue me on this of all days. So now that I'm here, start intriguing Sherry, darling. All right. How's this for a starter? I want, to the penny, exactly one half of the money you're going to get from Dodie Whitmark. Oh, Sherry, how droll. <laughs> now, why in the name of the great American dollar do you think I'd give you so much as a sly glance at that delightful little fun? For two reasons. The first, I deserve it for putting up with both you and your abominable conceit for exactly one year. <laughs> Still droll, darling. <laughs> Go on, keep laughing, Mr. Colby. Keep <laughs> laughing while I light my cigarette with one of these matches, <laughs> these cute ones that burn with what? a green flame. Where did you get those? <laughs> In a little no known lodge out beyond Malibu called the green flame. Don't you remember, darling, I, I ran into you there one day last week when you were having lunch with a mysterious stranger whom you tried to keep me from seeing. You nasty little sneak, Sherry. When you were so engrossed in keeping yourself between me and your guests that, that you left this souvenir book of matches at the bar after you graciously lit my cigarette for me. And what of it? They give those matches out by the thousands. That they do, but Brad, dear, they all don't have numbers penciled on the inside. Numbers? Ah, <laughs> What numbers are you talking about? <laughs> now, who's being drawn? What are you getting at, Sherry? This. I had a call a minute before I got in touch with you from a delightful gentleman who's very interested in what I'm getting at. So here, take your stupid book of matches and get out. No. I, I don't need them anymore. No, wait, Sherry, not please. Fred, I am going to have exactly one half of that easy money that's coming your way. And after the gentleman I mentioned and I get together... I may want more. But don't say anything you'll be sorry for later on. Oh, Just Sherry. get out now. And don't come back until I send for you, dear Brad. It was the better part of a minute before Colby the actor quit running the gamut of theatrical expressions indexed under hate, and Colby the man stopped biting down hard on his lower lip. And without another word, he slammed out of his apartment, ran to his car, and started off. I waited long enough for the steam in the room to condense, and then I walked to the front door and rang the bell delicately, the way I imagined a delightful gentleman like Mr. Leonard Phipps might. Yes? Can I help you? I think so, Miss Sheldon. It's only a matter of a simple question. Did you give that Brad Colby story to McGrath yesterday? Wait a minute. Who are you? Why, Leonard Phipps, of course. I talked to you on the phone, remember? Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. It was only half an hour ago, Mr. Phipps, and... And yet, in those 30 minutes, it's surprising how your voice has gone from tenor right down to bass. Good night. Not so fast, baby. It's out of my shoe shine. All right. Come in. I I'll tell you what you want to know. I, I did give that story to McGrath. I, I did it for revenge. I hate Colby. Uh-huh. And when your revenge boomeranged and the ex came out 100,000 ahead of you, you decided to cut back in. Is that it? Yeah, that... Wait a minute. You've been listening. How else would you know all this about Brad and me? Same way I know you're a liar about giving McGrath that story. You're in, honey. It's strictly something different like a book of matches. 
that burn with a green flame an accidental meeting at the lodge of the same name. Let's take it from there. Huh? Yes, why don't you? Right outside where both you and it belong. Good night, mister. Marlow, Marlow, Philip Marlow, Sherry. But tell me, why the hurry? Anxious to party your nose before Mr. Phipps arrives? Frankly, Philip, I'm anxious to do just about anything that doesn't involve talking to... What? What are you doing? Somebody's hit. Come on. He's over there near the curb. The car didn't stop, Marlow. No, and that scream sounded pretty... Pretty bad. Oh. oh, he's dead, isn't he, Marla? Yeah. That can mean only one thing to you, baby. To me? Why, who, who is it? Your late date, Sherry. One Mr. Leonard Phipps. <laughs> just a moment, the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, on the special program, One Great Hour, later tonight on CBS, President Harry S. Truman will be joined by Gregory Peck, Isla Lupino, and Quentin Reynolds to tell the story of what American religious groups are doing to bring relief to the world's war-stricken people. Be sure to hear One Great Hour tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time over most of these same CBS network stations. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Green Flame. As the red-haired, sophisticated knives teared down at what seconds ago had been Leonard Phipps, the sound of the powerful car that had slammed the life out of him whirred into silence far down the street. All that was left of Stanley McGrath's overambitious leg man was a twisted, broken scarecrow sprawled over the curb and half up on the sidewalk. It wasn't pretty. And the sight of it cracked Sherry's self-assurance like a rock through a window pane. When she stopped pressing the knuckles of one hand against her mouth and looked at me, she was scared. Clear through. Mama, this horrible thing... It was an accident, wasn't it? Oh, sure, sure. But as accidental as if they'd use a sledgehammer on him. Oh. Oh, yes. You only wish it was an accident because you're next in line and you know it. Remember, he was on his way to see you when this happened to him. I don't know what you mean. I mean, it's a high-priced game, baby, and they're playing for keeps. So you better level with me and fast. What's so important about those green matches? I don't know. You're a liar. You're going to wind up looking like Phipps here before the sun comes up. No, no, And tell me the truth, you little fool. Come on. I am, I swear. It's called me because he, he thought I might have given McGrath that story on Brad, but I didn't. And why was Phipps still interested? Why do he want to talk to you? Because I, I told him I'd seen Brad with someone at the Green Flame last week, and, and that Brad was very upset when he found me there. All right, who is he with? I don't know. That's not the impression you gave your ex-husband, beautiful? I was swinging in the dark, Marlowe. Five people left the Green Flame at the same time. I, I, I couldn't tell which one had been with Brad, but I'd know them if I saw them again, and... Phipps thought that together we could figure out who it was. Go on. What about the numbers in that book of green matches? What were they? Eight, one, one. Eight, Eight eleven? Side, yes. What does that fit? A hotel room? Oh, I don't know that is. You mean it was just another swing in the dark? Yes, but it connected, Marlowe. It scared him when I mentioned it, so it must be important. Yeah? Take another look at Phipps, baby. See how important it is. Now try again real hard. Remember what eight eleven means. Marlowe, I just don't know. Please believe me. <sighs> Maybe you're just thick. Maybe you got too much nerve, but I'll tell you one thing, Sherry. I wouldn't be in your spot for ten times a hundred grand because I don't think you're going to live until morning. Oh, I didn't think that Brad would go this far. What, what I've told you is the truth. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Shut up. Somebody's coming. It might be Bradford. Now you get out of here. Well, I, I don't have my car. Take mine, that coupe. Here are the keys. Go down to the office of the Hollywood Trades. He won't show his face around there. Find Larry North or Doty. Well, all right, but what about go you? Go on, will you beat it? I stepped into the shadows of the trees that bordered the walk and waited. I heard Sherry slam the door on my car and burn five bucks worth of rubber off my new fist tires getting away. A second later, the visitor I was expecting showed up, but it wasn't Brad Colby. It was Larry North. He ran three bustling steps out into the street and watched my coupe scoot out of sight. Then he spotted the corpse. His mouth fell open and he tiptoed slowly toward it like he was afraid he might wake it up. When I moved out into the light, he saw me in turn. That's him, Marlo. Do you know about this? Who is it? It's Leonard Phipps. Phipps? The grass leg man? Yeah. 
Driver didn't so much as look back. What a stinking break. Trips in the hit and rub accident at a time like this. Look, you jump to your conclusions north, and I'll jump to mine. Eh? What do you mean? Phipps knew something fishy about that item in McGrath's column. And Sherry Sheldon knew something fishy about Colby. So from where I stand, Colby couldn't afford to let them get together. No accident? That's a daring observation, Marlowe. For a hundred thousand bucks, I know plenty of guys who do a thing like this every day in a week. You can buy a lot of distance with that kind of money. Hey, you're right, of course. What exactly does the Sheldon girl know? Did you find out? Only partly. Bradford's mixed up with someone else on this deal. Sherry doesn't know who, but if we can get the other tie-in, she'll be able to identify that person on sight. Uh, or did she... Or did she have, have anything else? Number 811 in a book of matches. Mean anything? 811? Uh, no. Hey, no, hey, no. hey, come on, North. Quit uh, staring at him. You're making yourself sick. Let's get out of here. Yes, yes, yes. All right, I guess I better. And Bradford Colby must be out of his mind. Maybe. I'll let you know. I'm going to drop in on him now before the cops do and check my theory over with him. Where does he live? Yeah, on Wilcox, a villa in the Midcliff Gardens. Marlo, I'm going in and talk to Sherry. Maybe I can find out who Colby's working with. Uh, she's not here. I sent her down to the paper in my car to stay with you or Dodie until things cool Yes, but Dodie isn't there. She went out for some reason right after you called. There's no one there now but the night watchman. Oh, great. <clears throat> now, look. Drop me off at Colby's place, and you get down there and find Sherry. She's worth 100000 bucks to Dodie Whitmer, but only if she lives. Now, let's go. <laughs> While the natty little Napoleon in the elevator scurried off to fetch his car, I ran inside. Put a fast call through to the police and submitted the shortest report on record of a hit-and-run death. By the time I got back, North was waiting at the curb with the door open. I piled in beside him, and ten minutes later, we glided to a stealthy stop on Wilcox at the ivy-covered archway over the Midcliff Garden gate. Neat slices of amber light poured through a big Venetian blind on the window of a villa at the rear of the court, which North identified as Colby's. And the same breath reminded me that the actor was a strapping 6'6 six, six and a desperate man. He urged me to be careful, and I urged him to hurry. And as he left, I walked toward the big window and saw Bradford inside, slumped deep in the lap of a suede easy chair, doing a solo with a bottle of Paul Masson champagne, and looking about as desperate as a sleepy St. Bernard. I walked around to the front door, decided to try the shock treatment to blast him out of his blase attitude. Yes, what do you want? Get inside. Go on, move. Take your hands off me. You might have gotten away with that puffed up suit for damages, Colby, but you're not going to get away with murder. You killed Leonard Phipps, didn't you? What are you raving about? Who's Leonard Phipps and who are you? Name's Marlowe, and I'll tell you something, Colby. The only reason I'm not busy knocking your head off at this minute is because I want to hear the whole story right from the top. Now, first, who wrote that item in McGrath's column for you? Are you you mad? McGrath wrote it himself, the venomous little creature. He and Dolly Whitmer used that to damage on my reputation, and now they're going to pay for it. Oh, stop it. You knocked your reputation into a cock's head every time you step in front of a camera. Well, your I... damage suits are phony, and you know it. Now, where's that book of matches with the famous 811 inside? 8... 811? Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, yes. Those that burn with a green flame. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, You've been yeah. talking with my imaginative ex-wife, I see. She's burning with quite a green flame herself, isn't she? How that woman hates to see me get a... Never mind. Where is it? If you'll allow me, Marlowe, I'll just answer this. Mm. Bradford Colby speaking. Mm. I see. Yes, I heard. That's right. I'll do my best, darling. At least ten. Goodbye, Helen. Just an old friend, Marlowe. You can let your eyebrow down again. Helen, huh? You know, you always were a lousy actor. I'm getting a little sick of you, Colby. And I've got a hunch I'm due for quite a stall, so start talking, huh? Where's that book of matches? Easy, Marlowe. Take it easy. Here it is. Come on, let's see it. Of course. Here, take a good look. Oh! <clears throat> what a character. Up to your chin in trouble and you make way. You lousy snoop. Oh! oh. Ah. That does it. Tough guy. You're not leaving, Marlowe. You're staying right here. And just to make sure... Oh, you know it's cold, me. You sucker. Should have loosened your corset. I waded through the Chelsea Blaze ceramics that Kobe had smashed on my head and worked hard to hold back the, the wave of darkness that kept rising up under me until I made it to the kitchen where I splashed a few quarts of cold water on my face. And then I went back. 
Colby was still holding down the hooked rug he landed on, and the book of matches that had started the argument was on the floor beside him. I picked it up and opened it. The number was there, inside, written in blue wax pencil. But I thought I'd made a mistake. Until I realized that maybe Sherry Sheldon had made the mistake. When that idea hit me, it brought another one along, and I remembered that Colby had received orders by phone to delay me. Oh, my. Then I knew I'd better hang on to my head and move, but fast. I rolled him over and found the keys to his car. I was halfway out the door when he came to. Uh, Stop. Come back. You can't leave here. It's my exit, not yours, Hambone. Good night. It took all of five minutes to get from Wilcox to El Centro and Colby's long, honey-colored sedan. And on a hunch, I drove down the alley to the back door of the Whitmer building. The hunch paid off because I had stopped and turned on the parking lights when the door opened and I saw exactly what I'd expected. The watchman was on the floor out cold and the little Napoleon in elevated shoes was staging a big exodus with his arms full of a very limp redhead named Sherry Sheldon. As soon as he saw the honey-colored car, he started talking. Brad! Brad, you idiot! I told you to stay home! To do it! No, she's only unconscious. There wasn't time. We'll have to finish it someplace else. Put her in the back seat. All right. Here. Now let's get out. Marvel. Don't move, little man. I'm too tired for any more trouble. I'll shoot first. So you're the boy on the inside with all the brains, huh? You cook this whole thing up with Colby. He gets liable and sues Dodie Whitmer for damages, and then you two split the settlement between you. Correct me if I'm wrong, North. You got your chance when McGrath died after turning in his copy. All you had to do was write that one libelous item included in McGrath's column, and nobody could ever explain where the story had come from. That stupid fool, Bradford. I could never trust him to do anything right. Is that why you killed Phipps? Yes. And if Brad Colby had held on to you for another five minutes, I would have had time to get out of here. Yes. And so would I. Sherry, are you all right? No, not you. Hey, hey, go! Oh. Where he and Brad are going, Marlowe, I'd never get another chance to even the score. Oh, baby. You handle a spiked heel like Babe Ruth handled a bat. He's out. (laughs) Yeah, but Phil, you should see what he hit me with. Oh, brother. (laughs) Come on, beautiful. It's time to turn out the lights, get in touch with Dodie, and call the law. Let's go. Hey, thank you, Mr. McMahon. Good night. Good night. <laughs> well, I'm glad those cops and the cigars are gone. Here, kids, help yourselves. You both look like you need it. This you can say again. How oh, I need it. <laughs> Marlo, you could have slid me through the hole in the lifesaver when you said my own editor, Larry Knopf, was it. Yeah, it gave me a joke, too, Dodie. Yeah, and me. <laughs> the hard way. But, Phil, I, I am sorry about that mistake I made. I could have saved us some trouble. What mistake is this? Well, you see, honey, we knew that whoever was working with Colby had written down a number for him in a book of matches. Sherry here thought it was 811. But when I saw it, it was upside down from that, so it came out 118. 118? Mm-hmm. Why, that's Larry's office number and phone extension. Check. Yours is 116, and his was right next door. I remembered. So 118 was it. That, coupled with the fact that it was written in blue pencil, which is standard equipment for all editors, gave me the tip. Honest now, Phil. Hmm? Did you figure that out, or was it luck? Uh, well, it's a trade secret. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know something? I missed dinner tonight. You know I'm starving? Well, uh, I know a wonderful place. Uh-huh. They have uh, matches like this, uh-huh. see? It burns with a green flame. Will you join us, Dodie? Yes. Yes, we uh, would love to have you. You'd rather have whooping calls. <laughs> Go on, you. Get out of here and good night. Good night, Dodie. Oh, and it will be from here on in. I guarantee it. supper was waiting for us at the Green Flame restaurant. It was all arranged by a call from Dodie. And it waited until it got cold because we didn't show up to eat it. There was something about the moonlight glinting on the ocean. And a certain stillness in the morning air. 
that made food seem somehow unimportant. So when I finally dropped Sherry off at her place on Sherimoya, went home to my apartment on Franklin, it was either very late or very early, depending on the viewpoint. There was just one lonely sardine and a cold baked potato in the refrigerator. So I ate. Then I sat down on my bed to light my last cigarette. But I wasn't disappointed when the match flared into an ordinary yellow flame. Good night, Phil. Happy Marlowe. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Faye Baker, Larry Dobkin, Myra Marsh, Howard McNear, and Parley Bear. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a grim joke that started when six heirs came to an ugly house on a rain-swept island to hear a madman's will. But the joke soon turned to murder. And in the end, it was hard to tell who had the last laugh. Tomorrow night, Helen Hayes stars in the famous comedy The Farmer Takes a Wife on CBS's Electric Theater. And Eve Arden stars as America's favorite schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks. You'll delight in the expert comedy of these two great feminine stars when The Electric Theater and our Miss Brooks come your way tomorrow night over most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It was a grim joke that started when six heirs came to an ugly house on a rain-swept island to hear a madman's will. But the joke soon turned to murder, and in the end it was hard to tell who had the last laugh. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Last Laugh. I'd spent a week waiting through moldy beer joints and cheap hotels after a dancer on the downgrade. And when I found her, she was two days dead in a coal cellar, all of which left me with a rancid taste in my mouth. But when I woke up after a night's sleep to the tune of a robin on my window sill, I realized it was spring and time for Marlowe to take a long, easy weekend someplace. Someplace where the surf meets sand like it does at, say, Ensenada. Without so much as a second thought, I threw some clothes in a bag, phoned the Riviera Pacifico for reservations and charged out the door, where I ran head on into a funny man with a studious face charging in. Oh, oh, it's all... oh I, I, I'm awfully sorry. What? Are you Philip Marlowe? Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, my name is Darwin. I represent the law firm that handles the interests of Julius Spangler. Therefore, Did you say Julius with... Spangler? Goodbye, Mr. Darwin. Uh, now, wait, Mr. Marlowe. It's now, listen, I had a run-in with that screwball Spangler less than a month ago. A man was knocked down a flight of stairs, I got shot at, and the popping house was set on fire, and Julius called it a practical joke and laughed himself silly. 
Best I could do for him was three days in jail. It should have been three years. Goodbye, Mr. Darwin. Yeah, that sort of thing is all over now, Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Spangler is dead. Spangler's dead? Yes, he died last week in Brazil, the result of a hunting accident. And he has named you in his will. He's named me? You mean I... Uh, precisely. You're one of Mr. Spangler's heirs. Mm. I shall read the will tonight at 8 o'clock in his home on Catalina Island. I, uh, I trust you'll be pleasant. Not on your life. It's me, for Ensenada, and nothing's going to stop me. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. There are only five other heirs. Huh? And the estate runs well over $500,000. Oh? Almost any way you spit that much up, Mr. Marlowe, it comes out something more substantial than a weekend at Ensenada. Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. It was fantastic. But then so was Judith Spangler. Who knows? Maybe he actually admired me for throwing him in jail. And after all, what's old Mexico got that Catalina doesn't have him better? What could I lose? It was only a matter of minutes before I was in Wilmington and climbing the gangplank of the last boat to Catalina Island. She nosed past the breakwater and headed for the open sea in the green water glistening with gold from the sun, planting into a bank of clouds on the horizon. Ah, this is a life. I sat back and relaxed for all of ten seconds before the name Spangler came up again. This time being volleyed between a matron meticulously tailored by I.J. Fox, who clung to a pipe-smoking gentleman at the rail and a cute blonde ball of fire You're facing them. Some of my friends are aboard, and I don't want to be seen with you. Look, you may be your highness, Millicent Burke Ashby, to those snoots, but you're still just Millie Spangler to me, you overstuffed social climber. Why, you insufferable little upstart, I... You're just... nothing. I'll give him a good show, like this. Oh, oh, oh Spangler, take me away from here. I, I think I'm going to see I'm not. I think I'm going to well, what are you staring at, Buster? Haven't you ever seen a red jersey sweater before? Uh, how do you do? <laughs> yeah, that sweater plus that right hook of yours adds up to quite an exhibition. You must belong to Judith. He was my uncle, but... Now, wait. Don't tell me you're in his will, too. Then you're Philip Marlowe. Yeah, I got him three days in the cooler, so now I'm an heir. Who are your two friends? Millicent Burke Ashby, my half-sister. A professional snob I'm going to get mad enough at to kill one of these days. The jerk with her is Bennett Haynes, a cousin not enough times removed. They're also heirs. Which still leaves two more. Yeah, an old geezer who collects butterflies and that blockhead Roderick who passed for secretary and companion to Uncle Julius. Yeah, I know Roderick. And what do you pass for, Nicky? As if I couldn't tell. You can't. Ever been in Nick's bar and grill on La Brea Marlowe? Well, I'm Nick. No kidding. Mm-hmm. And if this inheritance hadn't come along, I'd have lost my shirt. Oh, I'm really in a money jam, and Uncle Julius is saving the day for me. Yeah, but he had to die to do it. Well, sure, that's the only way he ever would. Hmm. I wrote and asked him for a $10,000 loan once. Got a check back in the return mail, but it was signed by Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> so I came out here to Catalina to see him, but he'd already left for Iceland. I spent a week by myself painting his launch for amusement. Then I went home again without a cent. Yeah, he was a charmingly whimsical old man. By the way, where's his house? Over on the deserted side of the island, naturally. Naturally. The only way to get to it is by launch. Roderick's going to meet us, meet us when we dock at Avalon. Oh, fine. You mean we'll be stuck at Spangler's old house all night? Is that bad, Phil? Quite lovely. In a lot of ways. Two hours later, we docked at Avalon. The clouds that had been on the horizon were now overhead and looking very soggy. Roderick, the late Mr. Spangler's secretary, in a striped silk shirt, gold hiccock cufflinks, polka dot bow tie and derby, was waiting for us with a launch. And after we had all shivered through another spray splash wave bucking hour and a half, we finally pulled into a small cove. A house squatted alone on a point of rocks a hundred practically vertical feet above the water. And as we laboriously made our way up to it, the rain came. Julius Spangler would have loved it. When the door closed behind us, everyone dashed for the nearest fireplace except me. I was cornered by a septuagenarian with a shock of white hair, a scraggly yellow mustache, and spectacles so thick it looked like shot glasses with horn rims. He rolled up in a wheelchair, which he handled like it was a hot rod, skidded to a stop, and shoved a fistful of brandy out at me. Howdy, young fella. This, I figured, was the butterfly-collecting cousin, yeah. Matthew Spangler. Yeah, they have a slug of this before pneumonia sets in. <laughs> Well, sir, I suppose you're here for the reason that Cousin Julius is well. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, my, right. I... Oh, my. Wouldn't miss it for the world. No. He's uh, leaving me his collection in Libya. Butterflies, you know. I don't like money, just bugs. Figures. <laughs> yes, sir. Been an entomologist for 50 years, lepidopterist for 40. I've got specimens of 12,000 species. Only a few thousand left to go. Practically nothing. <laughs> You've a keen mind. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, have a cigar. Thank you. No, uh, I, I... Go I... on, go on, go on. It's the best. Save it for later when you got something to celebrate. Oh, there's Roderick. He'll show you around. I want to go meet these young ladies. 
Get on, can I see you? I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Hey, 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 Wolf, watch it. Crazy wheelchair jockey almost ran me down. Well, Mr. Marlowe, it's nice to have you with us. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Look, Roderick, why did Julius stick me in his will along with all his relatives? I don't know. Maybe it was nuts. You can say that again. Keeping all his junk, for instance. Junk? Well, these are trophies. That burnt match there was used in the first hot foot. Julius perfected that gag in 1903. Bang the contribution to American culture, huh? Well, getting you, what did you ever do? Wait, wise guy, this one's even better. He panicked the whole city with this phony newspaper headlines. Here. Hmm? Report of baby snakes and city water system falls? Yeah. He tells them there's nothing to it, and they still blow their tops. <laughs> That's tremendous, huh? Yeah, yeah, quaint. Julius was right. You got no sense of humor. The lawyer Darwin will read the will in 30 minutes, so be ready. I passed a half hour at a window with Nicky watching the rain splash at the glass. And at 8 o'clock on the button, the library door swung open and Darwin summoned the six of us into the room. As we sat down, the lawyer chewed his way through the legal preliminaries for the first time. It was a tense hush. A half a million dollars changing hands was an impressive occasion. And what was more impressive was that I might get some of it. I even caught myself wondering about inheritance taxes as Darwin completed the introduction of the will. Yes, it will bring us up to the disposition of the real and personal property of Julius Spangler, who passed away this life March 26, 1949. Oh, poor old Julius. I can't believe he's really gone, Millicent, you know. Oh, he was a darling beneath it all, Bennett. Poor, lonely, dear Uncle Julius. Mm. Oh, quiet, quiet. quiet. Get on with it, you old relic. Read it. Yes, go on, please. Uh, yes. <coughs> well, there you are. First, uh, to uh, my dear cousin Matthew, I leave my cyanide jar, the silk net, and the collection of nymphalidia. <laughs> Good old Julius. I knew he'd do it. Bless his old bones. Yes, well, to Philip Marlowe, intrepid shamus. Uh, uh, oh, that, that's a uh, private detective, I think. Oh, yes, <laughs> private detective. With no sense of humor, 10,000 empty beer bottles with five cents apiece. Hey, clean. Uh, please, on. Yes. Well, for this, I skipped and sonata. I should learn. Oh, Phil, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, well, Nicky, what did you expect, really? Millicent, be quiet. Go ahead, Darwin. Uh, what about us, his real heirs? Yes, yes, yes well, well, to Millicent Burke Ashby, Granny, $50,000, which is... Uh, yeah, Uncle Julius. Which is the value of a fish market at Central and Norfolk Street on the condition uh, that she personally operates this market for one year. <laughs> oh, good heavens, I <laughs> think uh, I'm going really to... Really <laughs> Shut up, Matthew. Uh, go on, Darwin. <clears throat> Am I next? Uh, yes, you are. You are. Yes, yes. $75,000 oh. and, uh, and a dog sled. And a dog sled. Dog sled? Well, what, what, what's that for? Why, to get your claim. You see, the money is the assayed minimum value of a gold claim at Point Anxiety, Alaska. Oh, no. which, which, it says here, you must develop with your own hands. Oh, 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 this courtesy of a will through every court in the state. Right You'll never get away with it. Oh, wait a minute. You've never worked for anything in your life, Bennett. What was that? Oh, you two got no more than you deserved. Why? What about me, Darwin? I've worked at least. Mm, hey, well, Miss Spangler, I believe you, you better sit down. To my grandniece, Nicola, who has learned how to work hard for what she wants, I leave my sincere congratulations and one dollar. Oh, no. He wouldn't. I, I need money now. And finally, all the remainder of my property, real and personal, I bequeath to a most genteel, brilliant, and loyal man, my secretary, Roderick D. Driscoll. Uh, well, me this no, ain't that sweet of the old man? Oh, you love me you all that Set over $300,000 to this baboon here. You'll never get it. I'll call my lawyer. Mom, I'll fight you here. I say? Oh, this is horrible. Yeah, it's too bad, baby. Well, you can have my $500 fortune in old beer bottles. Me for instant <laughs> Oh, what's so funny, Matthew? He got what he wanted, Nicky. Let him live. <laughs> I'll say I did. Whoa! What's up, Matthew? Stop it, Matthew. You're hysterical. <laughs> hysterical? Yeah, I sure am, kiddo. But, Matthew... <laughs> Get a load of this! <laughs> we all stood there with our mouths hanging open as the old invalid leaped to his feet, tipped over his wheelchair, made a grab for a shock of white hair with one hand and ripped it off. It was a wig and a good one. With the other hand, he saw the pony yellow mustache off his lip and still laughing like a ticklish hyena. He identified himself as the one and only Julius Spangler, alive and in the flesh. <laughs> yes, this is the crowning achievement of my career. <laughs> Look at you. Look at your silly faces. I wasn't going to give it away till tomorrow, but I couldn't hold it back. <laughs> Ooh, this is rich. The best gag we ever pulled. <laughs> right, Roderick? Roderick? Huh? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, this is humiliating. I'm calling the firm at once. <laughs> You're mad, Julius. Absolutely insane. <laughs> Why? Why? Because you can't stand the smell of fish? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Marlowe? Did I get the last laugh on you, or didn't I? Eh? You did. <laughs> you sell nothing but a mixed-up jerk, Julius. Wonderful. But I want to see you mixed up with those dirty beer bottles. Wash the labels off. Get nickel back, you know. <laughs> I'd like to break every one of them across the bridge of your nose, funny man. That's what I like. A good sport. <laughs> How about it, Nicky? Isn't it funny? Not very. Huh. What do you mean? I stand in at the reading of my own will. So now I know what you really think of me. Not quite, you don't. Because I think this. But, you vixen, you spit on me. How dare you? I'll kill you. Man. No, you know, Spangler, stop it. You lay a hand on it, I'll flatten you in spite of your years. Ah. That goes for you too, Roderick. Stay back. <laughs> uh, none of you can take a joke. <laughs> Look after these fools, Roderick. Give them anything they want. I'm going to have a good laugh all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> After the mastermind of the impractical joke had got fought his way out of the room, Roderick took his life in his hands and invited everyone to coffee and brandy. But the zest had gone out of the erstwhile airs like the snap from a second-hand girdle. So without as much as a backward glance, they all went their separate ways to their rooms. All but Marlowe. I drank coffee and brandy, and since the rain had stopped, tried for 20 minutes to threaten, bribe, and argue Roderick out of a way back to Avalon. But he swore it was impossible, and I was about to swear back at him when we heard it. <laughs> he ran to the French doors at the end of the room and out. Millicent was on the walk outside, her hands clamped against the mouth, tearing down at the rocks near the surging water 80 feet below. Mrs. Ashby, what happened? What is it? Millicent, what's the matter? It's Julian. He's down there. He must have fallen. Yeah. By the battery was pushed by somebody who couldn't take a joke. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, it stands to reason. It's a proven fact. If we all work together to produce more per man, per machine, per hour... Every one of us will gain from the cooperation. This is the American economic system. It operates for the benefit of all the people. We can and should cooperate for better jobs, higher incomes, more of the good things of life. For your free copy of the booklet, The Miracle of America, write Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Last Lap. It was 80 feet from Spangler's balcony to the ugly jumble of sharp black rock that lined the shore. And it was there minutes after Millicent's all-out scream that Roderick and I found the broken body of the man whose raucous slab still seemed to be tangled in the wind around us. And when we turned our eyes up from the desk at our feet back to the balcony above, we could barely make out the cross piece of the porch rail still dangling at a crazy angle from its single remaining support with all the ominous silence of the gallows. Gee, Mr. Marlowe, I can't believe that he's gone and that all this really happened to... Mr. Marlowe, what are you looking at? Up there, on the balcony. Huh? There's someone moving, Roderick. Which makes this a good time to start counting noses. Let's go. Well, what about Millicent? Shouldn't we look after her? No, no, for the time being. Come on. Come on, Roderick. I went the fastest way over those side stairs there. They lead us back up to the balcony because right now I'm in one big hurry. <laughs> There's nobody here, Marlo. Are you sure you saw... Hold it, hold it. Somebody's coming. Get back away from the rail. Why, it's Bennett Haynes. Yeah. I'm very interested in the spot where that cross piece came loose from the top of that post. Well, what's he doing there now? I mean, the way he's scratching something across the top of it. The gentleman, Roderick, has forgotten that it rained. Oh. He's trying to strike a match on wet wood. Mr. Haynes! Uh, what? Would you like to use my thumbnail? It's dry. Oh, fine. Marlo, uh, what are you and... In... Roderick doing here? It's called spying. And you, Mr. Haynes? I am here, Marlowe, because I think it's very strange that this accident should have happened less than an hour after Julius Spangler left a room full of people who hated him. Which incidentally included you? Yes. But I know that I had nothing to do with this. Now, here. A couple of matches for that stellar thumbnail. Uh, don't go too close to the edge, Marlowe. Thanks, Roderick. I won't. 
I'll only go close enough to... Marlowe, if you're staring at that mark across the top of the post, stop wasting your time. I just made it with that match that wouldn't light on wet wood, remember? Mm-hmm. But that mark is not what I'm staring at. It's this green one here on the edges of the top of the post. A mark that could mean somebody pried the cross piece loose with an object that was covered with green paint. All of which points up two things, huh? First, that someone murdered Spangler by loosening this rail, and second, that I've still got a couple of noses left to count. One belongs to a lawyer named Darwin, and the other is a fancy owner of Nick's Bar and Grill. Oh, what's that? It's Willis and Third. Yeah, trouble. trouble. Come on. Follow the leader with me out in front, back down the wooden stairs and over to the spot where Millicent Burke Ashby, the tailored lady, was sprawled over a lot of soft ground. Unhurt, but coming apart at the seams in more ways than one. I sent Bennett Haynes off to find Darwin and then help Millicent to her feet. Shook well and waited for his help. Millicent! Millicent, make sense. Come on. Take it to the top, will you? Tell us what happened. Oh, it was me. Yeah? I saw her running away from the house. Go on. She was running towards the warm water. And when you tried to stop her, she knocked you down? Not me. Did I just see my mom? Yeah, Did she say why? No, she just threw something about green, green paint. Green paint? What about it? Come on, Millicent, think hard. What about the paint? Oh, I, I don't know. What does it mean, Marlo? we got to get to Nikki Spangler fast. Roderick, she was headed down toward the water. How many boats are tied up there? Uh, just a launch and a little. Yeah? No, wait a second. There's the outboard. She used to run that herself. All right, then we split. You for the launch and me for the outboard. Now, where is it? We're down there in that porch behind the trees. But you better let me take care of that, Marlowe. It's dark and slippery in there, and I know my way around. Oh, thanks. I'll take my chances. At the moment, I'm very anxious to meet up with that lady again in person. Now, you get to the launch, and you, Millicent, back to the house. Whoever finds her, yell, good and loud. <laughs> It was a one-room bungalow on stilts. When I started inside, slowly, unsure of both my footing and the company on hand, I was suddenly very sorry that I'd left my 38 back in L.A. But in the next minute, I began to breathe easier because just visible ahead of me was a Spangler outboard. And when I got closer, I saw that it was empty. Then I heard somebody behind me. I turned just in time to see a thick, crooked branch coming at my head fast. Oh! I couldn't, I couldn't tell if the warm blood trickling from the cut just below my ear was from where the branch had hit my head or from where my head had hit the planking. But it didn't matter because either way it hurt. I, I got to my feet slowly. I reached into my pocket for one of the matches that Haynes had given me in the faint hope that a little light might, might reveal something about whoever had been guilty of relaxing me like a chocolate soldier in a Turkish bath. But then, even as I was about to strike the match, I stopped. Framed at one side of the open doorway was the silhouette of a man. I stood where I was and waited motionless while he slowly took a step toward me from another. When he started on his third, I... Grab me! Let go of me! Stop twisting your arms, Owen! Just in case you're still carrying a thick branch. I haven't got anything in my hand. All right. Now, what are you doing here? Come on, barrister. At the moment, you're my witness. I'll talk. Why are you here? I, I, I spoke to, to Millicent. Now, Mr. Marlowe, is, is the witness relieved? Yeah, I guess so. <sighs> Sorry about your arm, Darwin, but the last visitor here wasn't empty-handed. This time I wanted to be ready. Do you have any idea who the visitor was, Mr. Marlowe? No, no, I don't. I was just going to strike this match to see if I could... Oh, oh, my head. Oh, here, 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 Mr. Oh. Marlowe. Let, let, let me strike it for you. Thanks. I doubt it will do any good. Oh, oh. how dare you... You see anything? No. No, nothing. That well, was a long shot anyway. And what? What do you see, Mr. Marlowe? What is this? Darwin. Something I should have seen a long time ago. And by that, I mean that the launch of Nicky Spangler is my next stop. Goodbye, friend. Thanks for the interruption. It may save a life. <laughs> it was a 440 with plenty of obstacles and no lights from the boat shed down to the launch. But even as I got there out of breath with the shooting pains in my head making a dartboard out of the lining of my scalp, I knew who had murdered Julia Spangler. But I didn't know with the whys and wherefores of the green paint that had everybody running. A minute later, I quietly climbed aboard the launch and started slowly to the stern where I could hear voices. I knew that the explanation wasn't far off. When I was close enough to see Nikki standing in the reflected light of the moon wash, I didn't have to hear anything because 
clenched in her hands and held close to her side was the answer to the marks I'd seen on the post on Spangler's balcony. It was a crowbar, the business end of it covered with green paint. Opposite her was the reason for the fear in her voice. It was the man who had killed the practical joker, Julia Spangler's ever faithful secretary, Roderick. You're being awful stubborn, Nicky, which is something you must have got from your late grand uncle. Now, give me that crowbar. Why? So you can get rid of it, me too, and then return to the others and mourn the loss of your employer? Sure. I just love everyone that thinks that I miss him terribly when the truth is that I kill him. I hated him and his stupid jokes every minute of every day that I worked for him. Hated him, Nicky, the way I hate you and your stupid ways. Don't give me that crowbar! Don't tell it, Nicky. Don't move, Roderick. I'll blow your head off. Bill, 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 thank goodness. Now get back, Buster. Get away from her and stay in one place or I'll shoot. Oh. Now help me. Marlo, he did it. He killed Julius because he hated him. That and a chance at a half a million bucks, right, Broderick? I don't know what you're talking about. Then, oh, 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 my God. What is it, Marlon? Nothing, honey. I, I walked into a branch that our friend here was holding a little while ago. I still don't know what you're talking about. And I'll make it real plain. Broderick, you killed Julius Spangler because you wanted to turn his greatest practical joke into a bonanza for yourself. You wanted that cruel will to stand. Nobody else was in on the gag, not even the lawyer. So nobody else would ever know that it was only a gag. Nor would anybody care that some wacky old cousin who... Who, like butterflies, accidentally fell to his death. But, Marlo, Julius was killed after. We all knew the whole thing was only a practical joke. Yeah, yeah, but that wasn't part of the original plan, Nicky. Julius wasn't going to unmask himself and the joke about the will until the next morning. Isn't that also correct, Roderick? Yeah, yeah, that's correct, smart guy. Yeah. I was going to get everything. But when that fell, I still wanted him to die. And I would have gotten away with that if this dame here hadn't been so curious about those green markings on the railing. And, Roderick, if this same dame hadn't also remembered a crowbar that she'd once spilled some green paint I on... I heard enough! Yeah. Yeah, for the time being, I... I, I, I guess, guess you have. Oh, oh Marlo. Marlo, it's your head again, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? The poor boy... No, you don't, oh. Roderick! Stay back! Oh. Oh. Marlo. Marlo, you all right? Huh? Are you? Uh, not, not exactly, honey. Did you, did you get him? Yeah. With the crowbar, I know that. Oh. But you better give me your gun in case you wake up suddenly. I can't. I can't. I, I haven't got one, baby. You don't have one. But you're going to pass out. What will I do with him? Oh, baby, there's only, there's only one thing to do. Let him have it again. Marlo. 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 Are you all right now? Hmm? Oh, yeah, I'm all right. What's going on? Oh, Nikki. Mm-hmm, Nikki. And before you can say, where am I, I'll tell you, honey. Mm? This is Avalon, a lovely spot on the island of Santa Catalina. It's now 2 o'clock in the morning, your head isn't so much as fractured, and you're sitting up in a chair that belongs to the nice lady who rented you this room at a reasonable price. And the others? <laughs> all back at the place, except, of course, Roderick. Last I heard of him, he was still answering questions for policemen. Mm. Which, by the way, brings me right to the point. This I gotta know. Phil, how did you figure that Roderick was guilty? Wet wood, Nicky. Wet wood that should have been dry. It was up on Julius smiling his balcony. The top of the post that had green moss on it was wet. Even though the tight-fitting cross piece that rested over it should have kept it dry. So obviously the rail was pried loose just before the wood was red, while it was still raining. How do you figure, Marlowe? Well, no, because it had stopped raining and the moon was shining by the time Matthew identified himself as Julius Spangler. But no one would have wanted to kill Uncle Julius without having heard the will. Nobody but Roderick. He was in on the whole joke and knew that he was going to get 300,000 bucks out of the phony will. So he nearly pushed the old man off the balcony, made it look like an accident, see? Yeah. And, uh, and you doped all this out just like that? No, well, no, not just like that, Nicky. <laughs> Finally, I caught on. And now, sweetheart, in spite of the bandage, I think a little stroll on the beach is going to do me a lot of good. You know, I'm officially on vacation. Rest and recreation for two full days, at least. Uh, here in Avalon, maybe? Where else? See you later, Nikki. I got outside and down to the pretty strip of beach that runs along behind the spot where the steamer docks. I felt a lot better. I sat down on the moon-drenched sand and relaxed for the first time that night. As I sat there, I reached into my breast pocket for a cigarette, but... Instead came out with the expensive cigar that Matthew Spangler had given me. It wasn't until I had lit it and was puffing along that I suddenly remembered that Matthew Spangler had really been Julius, so I got rid of the cigar. Hey, just in time. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure, but maybe Julius Spangler, wherever he was, was having the last laugh after all. <laughs> 
The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Alan Reed as Julia Spangler and Dora Singleton as Nikki, with Ann Morrison, John Daner, Paul Duboff, and Peter Leeds. The special music is by Richard O'Ron. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... The partner from Mexico City, the stranger dead in Nevada, and the man with the cauliflower ear. All added up to a corpse on a concrete floor. But I couldn't figure why until I'd found out that there was one name above all that had to be remembered. Tonight, CBS's great hour-long Saturday night fun show, Sing It Again, will be back on the air after a week's absence. Be sure to be around later tonight when Sing It Again returns with its phantom voice mystery and its riddle songs, which pay off in wonderful prizes. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for The Case of the Red-Headed Bank Robber, tonight's gangbusters drama, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The partner from Mexico City, the stranger dead in Nevada, and the man with the cauliflower ear. All added up to a corpse on a concrete floor. But I couldn't figure why until I found out there was one name above all that had to be remembered. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Name to Remember. The big clock at the far end of the Beverly Room cocktail lounge with the opaque glass ice cubes where there should have been numbers said it was 20 after 5. That meant my new client, Eddie Millette, was late. So sitting at an uncomfortable mushroom for two, I waited and worked on a long drink and stared down into the mirrored top of my table. I stopped staring when the reflection in the tabletop changed from red ceiling to gray Hamburg and pale blue eyes in an almost friendly face. I looked up to find easygoing Eddie Millette looking about as he had been a year ago, dapper in draped flannel, carnation attached, and a thin smile on thinner lips. He sat down, took off his hat, and shook hands all in one quick motion. And I knew he was either in trouble, a hurry, or both. Marlowe, business. Business. You gotta find the nut who's been following me for the last couple of days. He's big. A lot of muscle under a t shirt and a kind of jacket like the Dodgers wear when they're warming up, you know what I mean? I can't figure out what this bird's after. That bothers me. All the time he's like it. What? Hanging around. Oh. And if I go for him, he runs. So what I want you to do is, uh, uh, you get next to him and the answer to this tag. Here. 50, 70, 80, 100 bucks. Enough, Phil? Enough. You know, Eddie, the law might do this for you for free. Yeah, for John Doe, they might. But Eddie Millett's another story, Molly. You know what I mean? Today I got a respectable business, war surplus. But the cops, they only remember me as a guy who once did time for being careless with other people's dough. Yeah. Besides, I'm in a hurry. My two partners, Lou Tripp and Ruth Dunn, she's also my girl. They're coming back to town tonight. I'd like to spend some time with both of them without interruption. What do you mean, girl, Eddie? You and that pretty wife I've heard about split up? Yeah, I'm soon for divorce right now. Tina and I never should have been, Marlo. We ne- yeah, I need someone who's softer, more honest and understanding. Know what I mean? Mm. Now, take this here, Ruth. Uh, can I help Gee- you, sir? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, scotch. No buzz. Uh, make it a double. Very well, sir. This Ruth Marlo, she's different. Uh-huh. Good head for business, sweet kid at the same time. Like, for instance, the letter I got from her today. She and Lou were both in Mexico City. She's got all the dope on the deal we're working on, plus the fact she's worrying about me. Now, that should bring us right back to T-shirt. Remember, where do I start, Eddie? 
That's the only place I know of, Marlowe. Yesterday, I kind of turned the tables on this guy, trailed him down to the corner of Wilshire and Western. But he got away in the middle of a lot of traffic, you know what I mean? In a car? Huh? Car. Oh, no, we were both walking. No. No, I figured from his bill and that T-shirt, he could work in one of these health clubs around it. You find out, then come to my place on Hoover before eight, huh? By the way, he's got black curly hair and uh, one ear is all, all banged up uh, cauliflower-like. Right one. Anything else? No, Eddie, I'll see you. Know what I mean? Huh? Two hours after I'd left Eddie Millette, I checked with a half a dozen hooray for health clubs in the neighborhood, smelled a lot of liniment, and came away with nothing more than distended nostrils. So at 7.30, I pointed my car toward 8400 North Hoover in the hope that my client could give me something else to go on. The Millette home was well-groomed and sat sedately behind 50 rolling yards of carefully clipped hedge and said the gardener must have gone to Barber's College. So when I leaned against the front doorbell, I expected Eddie in at least a silk lapel smoking jacket with slippers to match. When the door swung open, I got a surprise. Because I was greeted instead by a lot of white T-shirt, and in front of that and coming straight from my head was a fist the size of a muskmelon. Oh! Okay, private detective hired by Eddie Millett in the Beverly Room. Get her up. Oh. Don't so much as smile crooked or I'll twist your arm in two. Uh, uh, what is it you want? Oh, one thing, a chance to bust you in the nose. <laughs> what nerve. Yeah. Listen, stupid, if I had the time, I'd tie your arm into a square knot, then rip it off at the hinges and throw it away. But right now, I've got what I came for. I'm in a hurry, so you're real lucky. How about Eddie Millett, Muscles? How lucky is he? Very. He's inside, resting. Just like you're going to be, Mr. <laughs> By the time I got back to my feet and had my right arm unscrewed to where I could reach across my chest and my shoulder holster, a T-shirt was gone. So I started into the house and what I knew was going to be a slightly beat-up client. When I turned on the lights and found nothing in the kitchen, bathroom, or bedroom, I began to worry a little more. I got to the den and saw that the drawers of a desk that were turned inside out, but there was still no Eddie. I opened a side door and started out to the patio, which ran along the front of the house. But then at the staccato report of high heels coming up the flagstone path that led to the front door, I stopped and waited. When the lady, who was a quiet face and quiet clothes, came to a halt in the open doorway, puzzled and called Eddie's name out loud, I figured this had to be Ruth Dunn, girlfriend and partner out of Mexico City. So I walked back through the house to the Eddie? living room. Eddie, it's Ruth. Eddie Millette, are you playing a game with me? Why... Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm Philip Marlowe, Miss Dunn. I was hired by your boyfriend because he was worried about a bunch of muscles in a T-shirt with curly black hair, a cauliflower ear, and a brain you could drop through the hole in a lifesaver. Mean anything to you? Well, no, it doesn't. But where's Eddie, Mr. Marlowe, and why is the front door open like this, and why are all the lights on? In that order, I don't know where Eddie is. The front door's open because that's where T-shirt and I played Ben, the private detective, and all the lights are on because I was looking for Eddie. But he's not here any place? The bedroom, the kitchen? So far, no. Come on in here, see if this desk in the den adds for you, maybe. Drawers have been slightly rearranged by a very heavy hand. And incidentally, T-shirt was bragging about getting what he'd come for just as he collapsed me for the second time, so if you... Oh, the letters. They're gone. What letters? The ones I wrote to Eddie while I was on the road. He always kept them here in the bottom drawer. Were they business or pleasure? Well, business mostly, but I... I did talk of... Other things, too. Yeah, I know. Eddie mentioned that when he told me about you and Lou Tripp being due back tonight. Oh, by the way, where is Tripp? Well, I don't know. He left me in Mexico City the day before yesterday and said he'd be here tonight at the latest. Oh, surely, Marla, you don't think that Lou had anything to do with this? Could be. Letters are part business. And part love. So I'd say that the only person who could possibly be behind this is Mrs. Millette. Tina? Yes. And for the oldest and best reason in the world, Marla jealousy. Tina'd do anything to make Eddie and me unhappy. She could twist the innocent wording of those letters so that any divorced judge would see things her way. She's cruel, Marlowe, and she... Marlowe. Hmm? Under that door there that leads to the garage. It... It's blood, Marlowe. Stay over there, Ruth. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, are you... Oh, Marlowe, he, he's 
dead. Isn't he? Yeah, honey. I'm afraid he is. Eddie Millet was dead. Real dead. Oh, Eddie. The right side of his head crushed in. Eddie. And next to him and on the edge of the ugly pool of blood that had seeped under the door was the grease-coated tire iron that had done the job. Eddie. I turned Ruth away and it wasn't until we were back in the living room and she'd stopped sobbing long enough to take the double shot of brandy that I'd forced on her that I started for the telephone and the call of Detective Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide. But before I could pick up the receiver, it went off. Hello? Now, this is Lieutenant Ibarra at police headquarters. I've Ibarra? Huh? <laughs> How great can service be? This is Marlowe. I was just going to call you. Did I dial your office number by mistake, Marlowe? No, no mistake, Lieutenant. I'm at Eddie Millett's. I've been working for him since this afternoon. What's up? Why the call? A dead man named Ellis Clay in a motel outside of Carson City, Nevada, Phil. Yeah? It looks like an accidental explosion in his room there, and the best the sheriff has for identification other than his name in the city, Los Angeles, is a blank sheet of letterhead paper from Eddie Millette's war surplus outfit. So I thought Millette might be able to help us out. Is he there? Yeah. And dead, Ibarra. Huh? Murdered with a tire iron sometime in the last hour. What? Mm Mm-hmm. Any idea who did it? A muscle man in a T-shirt, maybe. But at the moment, Ibarra, the motive seems to be a little mixed. Say, wait a minute. I may be able to help you on that Nevada guy, Mm -hmm. Bruce. Ruth, do you know anything about a man named Clay in Carson City? He had Eddie's address on him when he was killed in an accident. Clay? Yeah, yeah. In Nevada? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, Phil, no, I don't. No. Hello, Ibarra. Yeah? The girl here who was one of Eddie's partners never heard of him. All right, but that's unimportant now. What I am interested in is Millette's death. What's the address out there? And why... It's 8400 North and... Hoover. North what? Hoover, as in vacuum cleaner. But look, if it's all the same to you, Ebar, I'd like to move. And I think if I do it fast enough, I've got an even chance of catching up with this T-shirt. Okay? Well, all right, Marlo, but don't forget, we've got a couple of thousand policemen here in L.A., just in case you can't... Yeah, yeah, goodbye, Ibarra. Ruth. Ruth, honey, why don't you go over to your own place and try to take it easy, huh? When I talk to Ibarra again, I'll tell him where you can be found. All right, Phil. But where are you going? To the only place that adds now, Tina Millett's. You know where it is? Yeah. The cameo house on Rexford Drive in Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. Also, if, it, if it's any help, she she drives a new cream-colored Nash. But, Marlo, be careful. Tina may be the one who hired that man in the T-shirt. Yeah, I know. And that, honey, is exactly what I'm banking on. I'll call you. After I got the vital statistics on where I could reach Ruth later on, I piled into my car and headed for Beverly Hills in the cameo house which was six stories of white stone and glass brick. Tina Millette managed to uh, scrimp by with half of the top floor, and a couple of minutes later, when I got out of the old mirror elevator, walked to her door, rang and waited. I was wondering what kind of a reception I'd get. But when the door opened, I stopped wondering and started concentrating. You, uh, you want something? something the texture of spun smoke rings. It stood five feet six inches over the threshold and must have weighed in at close to 120. With every inch a thing of beauty and every pound just in the right place. I asked you if you wanted something. Do you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, I mean, <laughs> the name's Philip Marlowe, Mrs. Millette. I'm, I'm a private detective your husband hired this afternoon. Why don't you let me in like a good little girl, huh? Because that's something I'm not. Now, get out of here before I call the police. Who are probably on their way up here right now. Oh? Your husband's dead, Mrs. Milletti. was murdered. Eddie murdered? Yeah, yeah. Now, do you still mind if I come in? No, of course not. I... I don't know what to say. Oh, that's a trite line. What was that? I said you're acting and doing a bum job of it. I ought to slap your face. Or call your boy with the muscles and have him go back to work on my arm for a while. What are you talking about? A lad in a white T-shirt who killed Eddie and then stole a bunch of letters that were going to help you lie your way through a countersuit for divorce. It would leave Eddie both broke and embarrassed. You don't make sense, bright boy. No? First of all, I don't know who you're talking about. And second, if I were going to file such a countersuit, why would I want my husband killed first? Maybe you didn't. We all make mistakes, Mrs. Millette. Which is only one man's opinion. Hmm. So why don't I just pick up my coat here and... Let the perfect gentleman escort me to the nearest police station. All right, it's a date. I see you bowl quite a bit, Tina. Good enough to win that cup there from the Maplewood Alleys on Wilshire near Weston. <laughs> Eddie figured a health club and I went right along. 
Never thought about the bowling alley near there, and I, uh, oh. Yes, Marlowe? You were saying something? Uh, yes, I was, but the little gun in your hand made me lose my place. Marlowe, I don't believe that Eddie's dead. Nor do I believe that you work for him at all. For my money, you're just a not-so-smart boy who was hired by that hussy Ruth Dunn. She's going to need an army of private detectives before I get through, and I mean that. Now back up through those doors and get out on the fire escape. While you do what? Well, I find out exactly what's going on. I get out there. It's six long floors to the ground, Marlow. And I hope with the first step you take that you trip, fall all the way and break your neck. Goodbye, private detective. <laughs> just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, just a little later on CBS Tonight, you'll hear Sing It Again's Master of Ceremonies, Dan Seymour, giving a perfect characterization of a man going crazy. The reason? Well, Dan's got the biggest, hottest news in the history of quiz shows ready for announcement right after someone knocks off tonight's $20,500 Phantom Voice mystery. So be sure to hear Sing It Again tonight when it comes to you at 10 o'clock. Eastern Time, on most of these same CBS stations. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Name to Remember. When Tina Millette prodded me out onto the fire escape through a pair of French doors, slammed them shut and snapped the lock, there was a cold look in her smoky eyes and an unwavering potential about the snub-nosed gun clenched in her hand and pointed straight at my belt buckle that melted all the gambler out of me fast. So I watched quietly as she backed across the room to the hall door and out. I knew my chances of climbing down six flights of iron fire escape in time to head her off was an idiot's dream. So, <clears throat> kicked a panel out of one of the doors, reached through and finally got it unlocked. And I went back inside to the phone. Since the vixen was on the prowl with a gun in her fist, I figured the least I could do was pass the word along. Hello? Ruth, this is Marlowe. Oh, Phil. Have you found the letters? Not yet, but never mind that now. You got something more important to worry about because your guess on Eddie's ex-wife, Tina, was right on the button. You mean she's the one who's really after the letters? Yeah, yeah, that muscle man in the T-shirt is just doing a heavy work for her. And I've got a good idea that he's connected with a Maplewood bowling alley on Wilshire. Where are you now, Phil? In Tina's apartment, alone. I just lost a small debate with her. And get this, Ruth. She hates you, and she's the type who hates hard. Yeah. When she left here, she had a gun, and the chances are at least 50-50 that she's coming your way. So keep your doors locked and stay away from windows, savvy? Yeah, okay, Phil. Oh, oh, one more thing before I shove off. Has Millette's partner, Lou Tripp, shown yet? No. At least he hasn't called me. Uh-huh. But where are you going, Phil? At Bowling Alley on Wilshire. Only this time I'm swinging first. <laughs> Maplewood was a small and dusky combination six-lane bowling alley restaurant bar and magazine stand and cigar store, all slightly down at the heel and more than hungry for business. Only two alleys were in use and a lanky postgraduate delinquent with a mouthful of gum and a complexion one tone greener than his eye shade was the only houseman in sight. He looked up and watched me as I moved over to the bulletin board where a bank of photographs were tacked up, picturing the champions of the uh, local league. Sure enough, there in the top row and holding a bowling ball that had more expression than his face was the pile of muscles in a T-shirt, which the caption tagged as one Sid Sawyer. So I walked over to the counter where the house man sat and made like a one-man fan club. What's your problem, Mac? I, uh, I see Sid's up there with the champs. Is he around tonight? I wouldn't know. Uh, where can I get in touch with him? I wouldn't have the faintest idea, Mac. He works here, doesn't he? Yeah, off and on. But you don't know where he lives or what his phone number is, huh? Well, you're just beginning to get the idea. Uh, Come here, hey, you! Cut it out, will you? Take your hands off now, You get me. the idea and get it fast unless you want your teeth crammed down your throat. Where does Sawyer live? Now, wait a minute, mister. Take it easy. I'll tell you. He, he's got a room over on Shadow Street, 6340, upstairs. He don't have no phone. All right, that's better. Is he there now? I... I think so. But, gee, I don't know why everybody is so interested in Sid Sawyer all of a sudden. Who else is interested? Some babe called a couple of minutes ago. An old friend, she said. And 
the reason I give you the store. Yeah. Honest. You see, Sid don't like to be interrupted when he's entertaining old friends. Is that so? Well, this is one party that's going to get crowded whether he likes it or not. 6340 Shadow Street was a top heavy stale gingerbread house. Left over from the days when Los Angeles was a stopover between Spanish missions. I got out of my car and started across the street toward the door when I saw Tina Millette's cream colored sedan sticking out through a tangle of overgrown brush in the driveway, which meant I was still in time for the big reunion. So I went inside and up the steps to Sawyer's door. There was a light on and movement, but no voices. I slipped my gun out of its holster, knocked lightly, and stepped back. And the knob turned slowly and the door cracked open. I kicked hard! <laughs> Yeah, don't move muscles. I'm returning your visit. Where's Tina? Who's Tina? Look, her car's outside in the driveway. She's here after the letters, isn't she? What letters? You're nuts. I don't know what you're talking about. And these suitcases, you wouldn't be skipping town, would you? Listen, Shamus, you're barking up the wrong tree. I don't know anything, get me? Yeah? Okay, Sawyer, if you insist, we'll do it the hard way. That squares us for that arm-twisting job you gave me. Now we'll start all over again, even. Get up! Come on! Quit hitting me with that gun. I don't enjoy doing it, so the faster you talk, the sooner I'll stop. Where's Tina? I don't know hey. what you do. I'll make it straight. I haven't got all night. All right, all right. No more. That's better. She she came and picked up the letters, and she left again. Five minutes before you got here. Five minutes, you're lying. Take a look out that window and tell me why your car's still outside. I don't know what... It... Where? I don't see it. In the driveway next door. It... Holy smoke, it's gone. All right, Sawyer, that means I can spare 30 seconds for the rest of the story, so make it fast. She told you little Eddie Millette is dead. That's why you're blowing town, isn't it? No. Now, wait a minute, Marlo. I never kill him. I just knocked him down. Sure, sure, on a concrete floor with a tire iron. No, Skip I Skip it. Those letters you got were written by Ruth Dunn. Was Tina heading for Ruth when she left here? I don't know. Come on, Sawyer, I'm running out of time. Won't do you any good to try to protect Tina now? Oh, no. We'll see about that, Marlo. <laughs> why, you... <laughs> I hope Tina was worth a broken jaw. Good night, muscles. I took a close look at Sawyer to be sure he was down for the long count. Then I stepped out the door and into a whispering circle of wide-eyed neighbors who had heard the fight and had already called the police. I flashed my identification, issued a battle order to the three huskiest ones, and then ran down the stairs to my car. I made it from Shadow Street to Ruth's bungalow on Normandy in something under five minutes, but still not fast enough. Because when I ground to a stop in front of the place, I saw that same cream-colored sedan already there, close to a side door. I'd belted up the walk and was halfway to the house when I heard it. <laughs> Made me sick. Went up to a front window where the only light was burning and looked in. The room had been torn up and in the middle of it all, face down on the tangled carpet, was Tina Millett. And it was Ruth who was slumped in a chair, her face buried in her arms and sobbing hysterically. And still dangling from her hand was Tina's snub-nosed revolver. She looked up as I walked in. Oh, oh Phil. Phil, I, I killed her. Phil. I know, I know. Come on, baby. Take it easy. It's going to be all right. Oh, she had, this, she had this gun. She was crazy. Phil, yeah, she was yeah. going to kill me. I, I don't know what happened. I struggled with her, and then I I realized I had the gun in my hand. I, I shot her. I didn't even think I just pulled the trigger on you. She's dead, Phil. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Ruth, leave it alone. It's over now. Now try to get hold of yourself. She brought the letters back. They're on the desk. She said that they didn't matter anymore, that she was mixed up in Eddie's murder and there was nothing left for her but to run. She said she, she took the gun out of her purse and said I'd ruined her whole life and that she was going to be sure I got what was coming to me before she left. That's when it happened, Phil. I was so scared I went out of my head, I guess. Yeah, we better call Ibarra, honey. I think we can explain it all now, except except one thing. Uh, Ruth, do you remember that guy Barra called us about? The one who was killed in Nevada? He... Ellis Clay? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Clay. I've had the feeling all night that some way his death is tied up with all this. It's only a hunch, but something seems to be missing. What is it, Phil? What's missing? I don't know yet. Look, honey, I want to take a look at these letters. You go call the police, will you? It was a long shot, but while Ruth went down the hall to phone the police, I flipped through the bundle of envelopes that had caused all the trouble. And the long shot began to pay off. 
I could hear Ruth talking to her desk sergeant as I picked up Tina's revolver. I broke it open. But then a pair of headlights and a red spot of a police car flashed in the driveway, and I knew that he borrowed, figured out a few things for himself. I put the gun down on the table again, told Ruth to forget her call, and when the lieutenant came in, Ruth and I together explained everything that had happened right up to Tina Millette's body on the floor. Well, it's quite a mess, isn't it? Anyway, this part of it looks like a clear case of self-defense. Right, Marlon? Exactly right, Ibarra. It looks like self-defense, only there's something missing. Something missing? What do you mean, Marlon? At least three letters from that packet there. I think they're the last ones you wrote to Eddie, Ruth. They're gone. Oh, that's strange. I don't understand it. And another missing item is Lou Tripp, Eddie's partner. He didn't show up tonight because I think he's in Nevada, dead under the name of Clay. What? Marlon, you... You mean that Lou and that... that... that Clay were really the same man? Mm -hmm. What are you getting at with all this theory, Marlon? You'll see, Barra. Lou Tripp was double-crossing Eddie Millette. Lou went to Mexico with Ruth here, only he left early and flew to Nevada to close a big deal under the name of Clay. Meanwhile, some letters were written from Mexico to preserve the illusion that Lou Tripp was still there. Understand what I mean, Ruth? Yes, sir. I think so. Yeah. And then the unexpected happened. Lou, identified as Clay, died accidentally in Nevada. That meant that sooner or later those letters would be exposed as lies. Right, Ruth? Marlo, that gun on the table, what? Too late, Lieutenant. Now, don't move. Either one of you. You haven't got a chance, baby. Stay back. Please, Phil, I don't want to kill you, but I will if you come one step closer. Stay back, Marlo. She means it. Look, baby. You're licked. Marlo. It was a good try, but you lost. Stay back. Why not go out? Like a lady. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Oh, what difference does it make now? <laughs> well, Marla, when she cracked, she really went to pieces and told the whole story. Yeah? Yeah, she and Lou Tripp were working together all right. When he died in Nevada, the lie she told in those letters put her in a tight jam with Eddie, see? So when she found Eddie unconscious in his garage, she finished him. But when she went for the letters, Sid Sawyer scared her off. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Incidentally, the state is going to give Sawyer a long vacation in one of their better institutions. Good, good. What happened down at Sawyer's place, Ibarra? You know, Ruth had a lot of nerve, Marlon. Yeah. She found Tina Millette's car at Sawyer's, so she waited in the back seat until Tina came out with the letters. Then she sapped her, drove the car to her house, and faked that slick self-defense setup. And she still doesn't know where she made the mistake that caught her. Hey, where was it, Phil? Well, she was being real cagey, Barra. She decided it was too dangerous to write the name Clay down any place, so she made it a name to remember. And she did. But too well. What do you mean, Phil? <laughs> well, when I asked her for it, the first name Ellis popped out, too. Mm -hmm. There was no legitimate way for her to know that you gave me the full name over the phone, but I only gave her Clay. That was an opening, but I needed proof. Mm-hmm. So you needled her until she made a break. Mm. Then you walked into the gun she grabbed. Uh, you take some long chances, Phil. Oh, oh, I'll do anything to see justice prevail, Ibarra. I smell a rat. You should. I emptied the gun <laughs> when she was phoning. <laughs> Good night, Phil. Good morning, Ibarra. I left police headquarters and walked to my car. First gray streaks of a new day were breaking in the east. It should have given me a lift, but it didn't. And now it was time for me to go home and go to bed, but instead I sat in my car with the door open and smoked a cigarette while I watched the dawn come up. I couldn't help thinking what an odd trick nature plays on us. Some of the most beautiful creatures most deadly. For instance, Ruth. How soft and sweet and lovely she was. And how hard she could swing a tire iron. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Paul Fries, Yvonne Patey, Jack Moyles, and Jerry Hausner. Detective Lieutenant Ibarra is played by Jeff Corey. The special music is by Richard Orant. <laughs>
Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was hot and still. An August night in the middle of April. But that didn't matter to the striptease dancer in the golden mask. Because murder made her blood run cold. The night the heat wave struck. <laughs> There'll be more dramatic excitement of the chase tomorrow on CBS's two Sunday shows, Broadway is My Beat and The Adventures of Sam Spade. Broadway is My Beat brings you The Adventures of Danny Clover, whose beat is the Great White Way and whose cases involve a vast, strange assortment of Broadway characters. Later, Dashiell Hammett's great detective, Sam Spade, cuts another caper surrounded by mystery and mayhem in the grand style. The Adventures of Sam Spade and Broadway is My Beat our regular Sunday features on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. hot and still, an August night in the middle of April, but that didn't matter to the striptease dancer in the golden mask, because murder made her blood run cold the night the heat waves struck. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Heat Wave. Spring was only three weeks old, but the sun bore down on Los Angeles with the middle of the summer vengeance. At noon, it was 102 in the shade, and by 3.30... With doors, window, and shirt collar all open as far as they would go, I still sweltered in the kind of heat that wilts both your clothes and your character. As I tried to make sense from the crisp words of a telegram I just received from one Karen Driscoll Jr., no less, of Knob Hill, San Francisco. It told me to go to the Palace Theater, a burlesque house on Main Street, watch the performance of the featured dancer, get backstage, and take a close look at her face. Then meet the 7 o'clock plane from San Francisco and report what I'd seen to Miss Driscoll. Uh, Junior. It was a strange request coming from Knob Hill, but the enclosed $50 money order wasn't kidding, so I perspired my way down to the Palace Theater. There, instead of the usual 30 beautiful girls, 30 sign over the marquee, was a 50-foot gold banner that screamed, The Heat Wave, Who Is She? And the showcase cards that led to the box office were all a circle of question marks that centered a woman wearing a strange gold mask and little else. I bought a ticket and went inside in time for the tail end of the matinee. A baggy pants comedian was just winding up a corny south of the border routine as I sat down. I a a hard time. Ah, but there was Manuel, my brother, Manuel Labor. He was, he was the latest man in all Mexico. Yeah, until he got a job shooting bulls for the government. He shot 800 bulls a day. Yeah. That made him the biggest bull shooter in Mexico City. Oh, <laughs> Tommy kicked the crown out of an oversized sombrero in a hybrid hat dance and then galloped off into the wings. After reminding myself that I was here on business, I sat down again as a personality boy in brown flannel and a yellow shirt stepped into the spotlight with his arms raised. Ladies and gentlemen, you're now privileged to witness one of the most unusual and breathtaking spectacles ever presented on any stage. In a moment, you will see her, the woman of mystery, performing exotic rites to the pagan sun god of the Incas, exactly as they were performed 3,000 years ago in the strange temples of the Andes. But who is she? Who is this woman? And who knows what secrets lie behind her mask of gold? The Palace Theater presents the mask marvelous, the beautiful, the dazzling, the mysterious Pete Way. <laughs> I had to admit it. 
this was special. She was the color of alabaster and as supple as a cat, and as she moved across the stage, she got more convolutions out of her two arms than a restless octopus could with eight. A costume from the neck down was about as sheer as a new spider web. And above that, and covering her face completely, was a gold mask, grotesque and glistening. As the dance headed for a climax designed to knock the cash customers right out of their seats, I uh, reminded myself again that I was here on business. So I walked down the side aisle to a door that led backstage and went through it just as the dance ended. And while the audience tore the house down begging for more, the heat wave tossed a couple of kisses through a gold mask and ran to a dressing room. I started after her and was halfway there when a bulging hulk in a shark skin suit that measured 6'6 in every direction lumbered casually out of the shadows and took a bulldog stance with his back against the dressing room door. I started thinking up fast ad libs and was hot for a switch on the eager reporter gag when the baggy pants comic slid up beside me. Hey, chum. Huh? You're asking for a load of mayhem if you try to get to the heat wave past Jesse there. Jesse? He the man mountain in the shark skin suit? Yeah, with orders to break bones. No. Uh, maybe I can help you out. Good. But how come? Hey, yeah, let's go around to the side. Uh, you're a reporter, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Inky Barnes can use a little publicity, too, you know. Hey, hold it here by the door. Uh, now, what does you have to know? Well, all I want is one look at her face. Yeah, that's a cinch. I said I'd help you out, and I will. Like this, you... Yeah. Right out there in the alley. And don't come back before midnight, goon. You can see her face then when she takes the mask off. <laughs> I should have known better, but all I wanted at the moment was to kick the slack out of a pair of baggy pants. So I bounced back up the steps, jerked the door open, and ran head on into three square yards of shark skin suit. It was Jesse. You ain't welcome around here, bum, so stay out. Have you got it? Okay, Jesse, let's say I've got it. Yeah. Also, don't drop it as you walk away. <laughs> I was glad to remember that I had a client to meet at the airport. So in spite of the fact that the heat wave's face was still a well-kept secret behind a gold mask, I took Jesse's good advice and left. Flight 11 from San Francisco arriving at gate 4. Will Dr. Robert Reamer please report to the information desk? When the plane taxied to a stop at the airline's gate, it was 7 o'clock sharp. And as the passengers unloaded a tall, sinuous brunette with arched eyebrows, an imperial gesture and a hat that had kept some imaginative milliner out of the red for several months had to be Miss Karen Driscoll, Jr. I introduced myself, ushered her to the cocktail lounge, and when a Gibson sparkled in front of each of us, she got down to business. Well, Marlowe, did you see her? Uh, yes and no. I have a photograph here. Look, is this the same girl? Uh, oh, it's a headshot. It's pretty, but no help, Miss Driscoll. You didn't see her face, then? No. Look, Junior, do I refund your money now or start asking questions? Don't be ridiculous. I must know who that girl is, and I'll tell you why. This picture is of my sister, Midge Driscoll. Oh? Think your sister's the heat wave? Yes. Oh, she's doing it to humiliate me, Marlowe. Tomorrow, I'm being married to a man whose family is distinguished in diplomatic circles. No. And this burlesque heat wave woman is, is to be revealed at midnight tonight. If she is my sister... Can you imagine what the papers will do with that story tomorrow morning? Yeah, some wedding present. But your own sister, I don't get it. Why? Oh, it's an old hate, Marlowe. Midge lost a love affair, and I won it. Years ago, she's never gotten over it. Oh. And she's done things before. The day I was elected president of the Metropolitan Club, she faked an elopement with my chauffeur. The night of my engagement party, she rode a horse into the flamingo room. A brawl started, and she spent the night in jail. Last yeah, I year, see what you I... mean, but this heat wave's got a lot of talent for burlesque. A lot of experience in a line. In fact, uh, <laughs> she's a sensation, let's face it. So what makes you think it's Major, huh? Oh, no. I found the name Tracy Leake in her apartment in San Francisco. He's the manager of the Palace Theatre here. I learned that from a newspaper story in which Josh Freeman... Josh Freeman? Yes, the big producer. Oh. He's supposed to be bargaining with Lake for his heat wave discovery. Oh, she's done a thorough advanced publicity job, all right. What if she turns out to be your sister? What then? That's my business. I know how to make money talk, Marlowe. And I've more than enough for a polite but firm conversation. Your job is merely to find out for sure, between now and midnight, if my sister actually is this heat wave. I'll take care of everything else. <laughs> Can 
Karen Driscoll Jr. gave me her local phone number, then got up, cursed the hot night, bid me hurry, and summoned a taxi. All with a regal wave, one hand. And I was left to my own devices and something less than five hours to make them work in, so I drove back to the Palace Theater, which was stalling until midnight by showing a triple feature movie. Paid another admission and slipped backstage again. It was deserted except the two electricians tied up in pinnacle under the switchboard light. The heat wave's dressing room was locked. Jesse was nowhere in sight, and I was about to leave again when I heard a familiar voice cooing into a dark note that turned out to be a phone booth. It was Hinky Barnes, the baggy pants comic. Judy did the beautiful, you know. Hey, hey, uh, listen, baby. About that other deal, did you talk to her? She won't. You sure? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, look, I gotta talk to you. How about dinner? You can't? Well, I know you got things on your mind, but... Yeah, honey, I know you're tired. Well, okay. Don't worry, things are gonna be okay. You'll see. Bye-bye, baby. Hey, Hinky. Oh, you again. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> that brings us up to date, even Stephen. Now, get this. First, I'm not a reporter. Second, I represent Josh Freeman's office. And third, I haven't got all night. You... You mean Josh Freeman, the big producer? Know any other Josh Freeman? I want to talk to Tracy Lake about the heat wave, but I want to see her before I talk. Is she here? No. no. She won't be back until the big midnight show. Where's Tracy, then? He's home. The Toppet House on Wilshire. About two blocks down from Arthur Murray's. Hey, but listen. Uh, tell me something. Is, uh, is Josh going to make a star out of her? With a talent like hers? What do you think, Yankee? <laughs> I left Hinky with his mouth hanging open and the fire of ambition burning like an alcohol lamp in each eye as I drove out to the Toppet House on Wilshire. Leaning on the bell at Tracy Lake's apartment, I got ready to be a hard-hitting, practical-minded producer's right-hand man. Yeah, what is it? Tracy, my name's Marlowe out of Josh Freeman's office. Caught the heat waves act this afternoon, willing to wrap her up and take her home right now. But not sight unseen. Wait, Who is she? wait a minute. Huh? You say you're from Josh Freeman, Marlowe? That's right. And I got a blank check right here in my pocket. Authorized to fill it out unless you're completely unreasonable. I see. Well, now, look, Marlo, this heat wave thing has gone over a thousand percent better than any of us expected. Yeah, I know, I know, but you see... The I... price is high already, and the bids have only started to come in. Oh, uh, excuse me. I just opened a bottle of Paul Masson over there. Help yourself, Marlo. I'll be right back. A perfectly good telephone sat within an arm's reach of Lake. But instead, he went down the hall to an extension and closed the door behind him. It was distinctly malpractice, but time was running out on me, so I picked up the phone and listened. Is Mr. Ridgely uh, the jeweler? Oh, yes. What is it, Ridgely? The bracelet you selected is ready now. We can deliver it immediately. Fine. It goes to Miss Needle Bar, 44 Edward Terrace. Oh, uh, enclose a card. Uh, don't worry, darling. You are my real heat wave. Sign it, Tracy. Lovely, lovely. Uh, and the engagement ring? Uh, the sunburst? Yeah, that's for Miss Lavar too, but deliver that to the theater at midnight. You got it? Yes, indeed, sir. Uh, thank you. And congratulations. Uh, Tracy Lake and Needle Lavar. Who might she be? Sorry, Marlo. A little personal business. Now, uh, you were saying... Yeah, yeah. I was saying I can hand you a nice fat check if this mass marvelous is really okay. You're building up to quite a surprise, Tracy. You must have something. <laughs> yes. Indeed I have, old boy. Plenty. Yeah? I can't reveal the lady's name until midnight. All right, all right. Play coy. What's her background? Has she got class? Class? Milo, you wouldn't believe it. Not blue book stuff? Society girl in burlesque? Why, anything's possible, Milo. Sure, sure. She could even be from Knob Hill, huh? Why, yeah, like I said. Anything's, anything's possible, possible, sure. Okay, Tracy, that's what I wanted to find out. See you after the unveiling, and you got a great night for it. Oh, Milo, uh, mm-hmm. I suppose uh, Big Ed Peters is in on the deal as usual, along with Josh? Yeah, yeah it's a regular Josh Freeman deal, just as usual. <laughs> See you later, Tracy. <laughs> This is Marlowe, Jr. I just wound up an interview with Tracy Lake. When I threw Knob Hill at him, he turned green. But it's not official yet. The odds are high that it's your sister Midge, all right, who's knocking him dead as the heat wave. I knew it. That horrible, vindictive little tramp. What else, Marlowe? Did you find out where she is? Yeah, yeah. She's going under the name of Needle Lavar and staying at 44 Edgewood Terrace near MacArthur Park. But listen, it's not positive yet, so I'm going there to check right now. Where are you calling from, Marlowe? A phone booth at a closed gas station out here on Wilshire. 
But I... Oh. What's the matter? What is it, Marlowe? Uh, I am about to start earning that fee of yours, baby. 300 pounds of muscle in a sharkskin suit just walked up. Goodbye. Hello, Sonny. Well, my Piltdown pal. So the boss was right. You're just a cheap, nosy reporter after all. It's cramped in there, ain't it? But you're not getting out, bub. Uh, now, wait a minute, Jesse. It's a hot night. Let's not work up a sweat, huh? Don't you worry about that. Mr. Lake pegged you as a phony nosy, and that's bad. What do you mean, phony? You said Big Ed Peters was in on a deal with Josh Freeman. All right, what about it? Big Ed's been dead for 12 years. And you know what? He's still going to look better than you are 30 seconds from now. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, tomorrow night, in order of their appearance... You'll hear Joseph Cotton, Ozzie and Harriet, Jack Benny and his gang, Amos and Andy, Sam Spade, Lum and Abner, Helen Hayes, Eve Arden, and hold tight now, a special show with Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Claudette Colbert, and Dinah Shore over most of these same CBS network stations. And Jack Benny with Mary, Phil, Dennis, Don, and Rochester will be heard over them all. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story... The heat wave. When the little man in big iron boots were kicking at the lining of my temples finally quit, and I dragged myself back up to the vertical, Gargantua was gone. And I was sure of only two things. Tracy Lake did not know that I was anything other than a nosy reporter, and second and more important, it was time for me to head for Edgewood Terrace and the lady known as Nita Lavar. As I started for the front door of number 44, which was an all-alone stucco on the tile old shape that showed a single light, the little men in iron boots went to work again. It reminded me that it might be healthier if I first found out exactly what was waiting behind the mat Mark Welcome. So I made a wise circle around to the back, then in closer past a whispering huddle of palms through a flagstone patio that led to a short flight of also flagstone steps. But there, when I was only a few feet from an uncurtained window, I stopped at the sight of something I hadn't expected. It was the body of a woman lying in a twisted heap at the bottom of the stairs. When I moved closer, I saw that the ugly cut on the side of her head that had killed her had come from the jagged edge of the last step. I also saw that the woman was Midge Driscoll. Next to the body, there was an overturned crushed sprinkling can, which meant that she could have fallen to her death accidentally. Also, it could have meant that if murdered, a killer had overturned and crushed the sprinkling can as well. I was somewhere between the two thoughts when I heard a car break to a stop in front of the house. Then high heels on a cement walk. I quietly moved around to where I could see something tall and blonde who, in a better light, would have been better looking. Good evening. What? Who's that? Name's Philip Marlowe. Mean anything? Nothing. Then try this. I'm a friend of Midge Driscoll's. Midge? I never heard of anyone by that name. I'll bet. <clears throat> Step up a little closer, honey. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Bright Eyes. I... Midge! Yeah, yeah, Midge. Uh, in Driscoll. Name you never heard of, remember? Now, what do you say? Do we play it straight? Yeah, yeah. I'm Nita LeVar, Mr. Marlowe. Baby, you're getting in deeper by the minute, and by that I specifically mean that Midge Driscoll here and Nita LeVar are one and the same. Oh, you're crazy. I know my own name. It is and always has been Nita LeVar. That's Midge Driscoll. All right, since you've grown so cooperative, maybe you can tell me why she's dead. Oh, could be that she fell down those stairs. An hour before her unmasking is the heat wave. Heat wave? You know an awful lot, mister. How come? It's strictly business. I'm a private detective with clients. We'll talk about that later. Right now it's time to go in and call the police. And don't tell me you can't find your key. <laughs> don't worry, private detective. I won't. Here, catch. Got it. Now let's get inside. But let's not call the police, huh? Why not? Are you afraid that they'll... Oh, I see what you and that pretty little gun mean. <laughs> I'm glad. 
I'd hate to have to shoot you. Why? Why tonight's your quota? Don't be funny. I didn't kill Mitch. Then why no police? For a very good reason. Until tonight, Marlo, I've been the heat wave. The substitute heat wave for the lady there who didn't have the time or the talent for the build-up to the great joke she was going to pull on her sister. You mean you were the one I saw today? The one everybody saw every day. And liked. Liked so much the business boomed and all the heads in the front row weren't bald. Which has what to do with me calling the police? In general, everything. In particular, my career. I tried to get that crazy kid there to back off and let me go on with the act that she'd kill after one performance, but no. Miss Bunny Money Banks wouldn't hear of it. Now that she's dead, you're in, is that it? Solid. And that's also the reason why I don't want to spend the next two hours talking to cops. So go on, put the key in the lock, turn it, open the door, and walk in. What happens then? Then, Mr. Marlowe, we call Tracy Lake and arrange for a playmate for you. Playmate named Jesse, maybe. A playmate named Jesse. And no, maybe. When we got inside, Needle Laval handled the prisoner with the finesse of a Marine guard detachment, took my gun, threw it across the room, put me into a faraway straight back chair, and got through to Tracy Lake without once taking her baby blue eyes off me. And when she told the man she called Darling all about Midge's death, which could have been for my benefit, she placed a rush order for the monster. After that, she hung up, sat down with a cigarette, and waited. But a second later, she was back on her feet. When I said that friend Jesse was fast, she said I should shut up and more. Listen, Marlo. You do exactly as I say. Coming! Now stay right where you are and don't so much as open your mouth. Who is it? It's me, Nita. Hickey. Oh, good. Come on in, Hickey. Hello, Nita. Hi. I just happened to be going by, and since I knew it was Midge's night, I thought this... And never mind what you thought. Just come in and listen. It isn't Midge's night, Hinky. It's mine. And don't ask questions now. Here. Ooh, what's the gun for, Nita? What's the matter? A private detective, but public nuisance named Marlowe. Marlowe, a detective? Mm-hmm. He told me he was from Josh Freeman's office. Ah, he was lying. Now, get this, Hinky. Midge Driscoll is out and back, dead. But why... I don't know why, and I care less. But Marlowe here is crazy for calling the cops, which would leave me at midnight doing my big number for the desk sergeant. <laughs> Great. So use that gun, see, and hold him here until Jesse shows up, which should be any minute. Now, goodbye, and be careful, Hinky. So long, bright boy. Gentle soul, huh, Barnes? Never mind, Milo. Save the gap for Jesse. He's a great listener. I doubt if he'll give me the time, considering that I know it's an odds-on bet it'll be a couple of slugs in my belt buckle before he's even in the room. Jesse kill you? Why would he do that? Because he works for Tracy Lake. And Tracy Lake has to kill me, Barnes. I know he's a murderer. Midge Driscoll was murdered? You sure of that? Just about. Doesn't figure any other way. Nita herself told me how much this chance means to her and how hard she tried to get Midge to back off. Yeah, but Tracy, how does he tie in? Two ways. The money he'll get out of the show continuing indefinitely, and better than that, the fact that he and Nita are going to be married. Those two get married? You're nuts, Marlowe. No, no, it's straight, Barnes. I know because I overheard Tracy talking to a jeweler about the ring he ordered. Now, you mind if I have a cigarette? Hey, Barnes, can I reach for a cigarette? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Hey, hey Marlo, you sure of this? Everything you just said, I mean, uh, about them getting married and all? Sure I am. Why, a little disgusted with your buddies? Yeah, a little. So as of right now, you can do as you want. I'm leaving. No, you're not, Mr. Barnes. Hey, Jesse, hey, hey, Jesse, don't shoot. I won't, Mr. Barnes, unless, of course, you or Buster try to get out of here. Oh, who, me, Jesse? Yeah. You were going to let Marlowe go, Mr. Barnes. I don't think Mr. Lake would like that. I'm sure he wouldn't, Jesse. So why don't you just save everyone a lot of time and start pulling that trigger? Well, you can still see what you're doing. Hey, the light! Get going, Barnes! You, you dirty louse! I'll fix you! You'll never get out of here alive! Where? Where are you? Come on, talk! Where are you? Where are you? Answer me, you hear? Answer me! With pleasure. Oh, you stinking slime. I, I'll tear you apart if I get my hands on you. It's Jesse, boy. It's a trick. And now for our meeting in a phone booth, flowers, your big ape, bars and all. Oh. After I got some lights on and found my gun when Nita had tossed it when we first came in, I checked Jesse over once to make sure that he was neither dead nor too alive. And I started for the door. But there, even as my hand closed over the knob, I stopped. A crazy thought from I don't know where wedging its way into my mind. 
I turned back toward the room and stared at the flower and vase strewn form of the ape that covered half the carpet. Then slowly the wedge broke through and there was light, lots of it. The kind in which I could see why Miss Driscoll had been murdered. And more important, why I had to get to the Palace Theater and Needle of Awe before murder happened again. I lurched from the curb in front of Needles at 20 minutes to 12. When I screeched to a stop downtown at the Palace without somehow hitting or being hit along the way, those 20 minutes were gone. And I was worried because midnight meant that Nita would already be on stage for the unmasking. I raced past the general at the door and then across the lobby and into the theater where I figured I could get down a side aisle with the wings. That was figuring wrong. Because fire laws notwithstanding, the place was strictly SRO and packed tighter than the seventh game World Series. Between the backs of perspiring necks, I could see that Nita, who was across stage from Tracy Lake himself and in the center of a single spotlight that could have opened a supermarket, was still masked. So while I prayed that Lake, who was winding up his spiel, would think of bigger and better adjectives, I ran back to the lobby and around to a flight of stairs that led to the first balcony, where over on one side and near the railing, I found an old man who was daddy to a trio of baby spots and the one giant that was on Nita. I shoved him aside just as Lake finished and the maestro took over. And with one hand, I got a good grip on the 38 in my pocket, and with the other, the handle on the big spot. Hey, what are you doing? Hoping I'm wrong, Dad. But if not, hoping the gun I expect doesn't come from the wings, but... Hey, there. In that side balcony near the curtain. See it? Yeah, it's a gun, all right. Hey, that's Hinky Barn. Right. Let's give the funny man a big audience and lots of light. You're on, Barn. Yeah. Watch out, he's going to shoot at us. Yeah, and us at him. It was 20 minutes of bedlam. Police, music, and two quick numbers by Needle Lavar, all of whose shaking was not routine. Before the palace got back to the quiet business of being a burlesque house, and the show went on. It was another hour and 20 minutes before it was all over, and the theater was empty and dark except for a work light on the stage where Nita, Tracy Lake, and I were sitting in the middle of a papier-mâché Inca civilization. Well, Milo, the police say they think he's going to live for a while. Can't figure the guy. Never knew he felt that way about Nita here. Neither did I. I was always okay to him, and I knew he cared some, but that's as far as it went. With you, Nita, yeah. But with Hinky, it was something else. Something strong enough to make him kill Mitch Driscoll so that Nita would get a big chance, eh, Milo? Mm-hmm. But when he found out through me that you two were going to be married, he... He realized that the murder he had committed was for nothing. And now he was going to make one count. So he turned on you, Nita. How did you find out in time to get to him before he could make a try for Nita? Yeah, the way the guy sagged when I said you were going to be married told me all I had to know. But it was cinched by the American beauties draped around Jesse. American beauties? Flowers? Yeah, yeah. See, I remembered a phone call Hinky made. You, Nita, had been the lady he'd talked to and loved. From there on out, it was a little better than a shot in the dark. Two shots in the dark, Milo. <laughs> Good ones that are responsible for Nita still being here with us. Thanks, fella. Yeah, Milo, thanks a lot. Don't mention it. After all, I was paid for my work, and besides, eh, that dance you do, Nita, hmm, belongs to posterity. Ah. <laughs> Good night. It was still hot in the city. I had no enthusiasm for further conversation and a very sticky feeling from head to foot. So I took care of Karen Driscoll, Jr. in a fast telephone call and then pointed my car for my apartment. I couldn't help thinking of poor little Hinky Barnes, who brought laughter to everyone else but could find no happiness for himself. He was like the man who went to see a doctor one day and said... Doctor, I can't laugh anymore. And the doctor said, go and see Grock, the greatest clown of them all. If he can't make you laugh, there's no help for you. The man smiled and said, thank you, doctor. You see, I am Grock. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Wilms Herbert, Ed Begley, Elsie Holmes, 
Barney Phillips, and Byron Kane. The special music is by Richard O'Run. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started at dawn in a Los Angeles taxi and wound up that night on a cliff in the middle of the Pacific. All because of a Dutchman with 50,000 bucks of cops in a lily pond and an Oriental with a chauffeur who wanted a cloak made of nothing but feathers. In just about an hour from now, $50,000, the biggest jackpot in radio history, will be waiting CBS listeners from coast to coast on the Sing It Again program over most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Cloak of Kamehameha. that was delivered by a repulsively wide-awake boy missing at Sue's Front Row Center. Arrived at 6 in the a.m. and had come in two parts. The first scrawled in black ink on a wrinkled piece of paper said, Marlow, get hold of a taxi cab. Pose as the driver yourself and at exactly 8 o'clock this morning, come past 8840 North Ogden Drive. Signed, Pollard Schindler. The second half had made more sense. It was printed in neat letters on neater green paper. And under an engraving of Benjamin Franklin read 100 silver dollars. Payable to the bearer on demand. So at exactly 8 o'clock, I was behind the wheel of a hired cab, leather jacket, peak cap, toothpick, and all, and within hay taxi distance of number 8840. Mr. Pollard Schindler, a round man in square clothes with haircut to match, was not late. Who's there? Taxi, Ray! Yes, sir, Ray. cab. Of course. Why do you think I'm shouting my head off? I want to go to the International Airport. Do you understand? The International Airport at Inglewood. Okay, okay, Inglewood. International Airport it is. Marlo, the meter. Quick, put the flag down. Every minute I'm being watched. Huh? Oh, yeah. Watched by whom, Mr. Schindler? I don't know. Now, listen carefully, Marlo. Later, you do have to go to the Halimawana Hotel and wait for a young lady named Lenny Collier. Uh-huh. Then, at the hour she designates, you go to her house, number 44 Diamond Head Circle, and pick up the clue. Now, wait a minute. Halimawana Diamond... What is it? The hotel isn't by any chance in Hawaii, is it? Uh, didn't I mention this in my notes? No, you didn't. Or did you mention picking up a cloak? Uh, that just proves I haven't been myself ever since yesterday. Uh, yesterday I received this anonymous letter that postmarked Honolulu. All it says is, Kamehameha's cloak of golden feathers will bring no less than death. Oh, great. Malo, have you ever been to the island? Yeah, twice. Once on business and once pleasure. But then surely you've heard people speak of King Kamehameha. Yeah, I think I do. He was back around the 1780s, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big organizer conquered Oahu by driving the defenders over the cliff that divides the island in two and the... Uh... The Pali. Oh, yeah, Pali. Yeah. Now, Marlo, the feathered cloak that Kamehameha wore was about a hundred square feet and every inch of it a golden yellow feather. Uh-huh. And valued at more than half a million dollars. Hey, how come? The feathers. Oh, the feathers. Yeah. They are from the now extinct black mammal bird, Marlo. There was only one yellow feather on each bird. Well, I could explain why they're now extinct. But don't tell me that all this is a game of Collier to Marlo to Schindler with a cloak that belongs to the museum. Oh, no, Marlo, it isn't with the cloak you speak of. But Lani Collier has another one. Uh, less valuable, of course. It's one quarter the size. Oh. But it also belongs to the king. And it also is made of the priceless feather. And is this her property to have in a whole legal like? Yes. Lani is fancy. Oh, about 25. Went to fashionable schools here in California. 
And as a result, cares more about fun and pretty clothes than she does priceless heirloom. I can't understand that. Huh. So, for $50,000, I have bought the cloak to resell to a New York millionaire for almost twice that sum. Eh? Uh, he loves the island, Lord. Marlo, huh? I was right. I'm still being followed. Don't look back. Try faster. No, do nothing. This oh. is exactly as I want it. Now, whoever it is will follow me, not you. And when I am in Honolulu, they will still follow me. Well, I take care of the business on hand, huh? Yes. Now, there's a reservation for you on the next plane. So, after you leave me and collect your cab fare, which will be $500, you drive away. Then wait a while, get back here. Aboard your plane and underway. And tonight, when I've got the cloak? Take it back to your hotel room at the Hale Moana and sit on it hard. Because unless I am a complete success as a decoy, you will have your share of trouble, too, I'm sure. But, Marlo, from what specific direction it will come, I do not know. I got the 500 bucks to cover expenses for my Honolulu trip and was told to keep the change. Back in my apartment, I packed, got another cab, said International Airport, Inglewood, and settled back to think about the crossroads of the Pacific. There I was wrong. Because in the next minute, and those that followed, everything was done the hard way. First, we ran out of gas, then got tied up in a traffic jam, and after that, got stopped for speeding. All of which added up to me at the airport, just in time to watch my plane take off without me. A few minutes later, when I told a cherubic clerk in a gray flannel and insipid smile that my name was Philip Marlowe and that I wanted a reservation on the next flight, which was leaving in an hour... Things got even worse. You can't be Philip Marlowe, sir. That is not the Philip Marlowe who was on flight 21 that just left. You, uh, you have a reason for saying that, huh? <laughs> I most certainly do. Ah. There were 36 seats on that plane, sir, and when she took off, all 36 were full. I know, I know, I checked them myself, and I don't flight make mistakes. Well, bully to you, boy. But I happen to be five. both Philip Marlowe and the man who was supposed to be on that plane. Uh, also, Buster, I'm just about out of patience. How do I get on the next plane or don't I? Come on, I can't stand indecision. Uh, well, well, I... You I, what? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Marlowe, I, uh, I think it can be arranged. That's better. As a matter of fact, I'm almost sure of it. An hour later, the last of California had slipped over the horizon. And there was only clear sky ahead. Oh, I began to relax. My mind drifted pleasantly. Frosted Hawaiian punches. Warm white beaches. Lovely hula. When I opened my eyes again, Diamond Head was in front of us. And majestic in the red glow of the evening sun that gave all of the lush Moana Valley I could see a texture of thick velvet. We landed like the airport was made of marshmallows. And a half hour later, I was in the lobby of the Holly Moana Hotel. It was cushioned rattan and Philippine mahogany over cool tiles. And everywhere, laughing, sunburned people wearing anything from Catalina swimsuits to pea-fabricated hula skirts. So smiling both inside and out, I worked briskly to the reservation desk and told a good-looking Hawaiian in white flannel that I was Philip Marlowe. But at his reply, I stopped smiling both inside and out. But, sir, your reservation was taken two hours ago. There must be some mistake. Some mistake? You are Philip Marlowe of Los Angeles, sir. Yes, so right. And look, I've been through this before today because of what I thought was an error due, due, due to... Due to what, sir? Nothing. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you later. There was a large circle of mirror on the wall behind the clerk. And even as we had talked, I caught the reflection of a beautiful tan girl in cocoa brown suit, white pearls, and no stockings. With the mention of my name and then a take that made her long blonde hair whip straight out. When she saw me watching her, she pivoted sharply on a spiked heel and hurried toward the little nigh under the banyan tree, where there was Hawaiian music and a lot of different looking people drinking at glass top tables under a three quarter moon. I stayed near the reservation desk long enough to light a cigarette. Then I followed her. She was seated away from the lobby entrance, and on a hunch that she just might be Lani Kalia, I started for an empty table next to her. But a middle-aged Chinese and gay gabardine, Panama to match, slipped into the chair that I was at. 
Rose. I forgot about being subtle and addressing her as Mrs. Collier. Introduced myself as an old and dear friend of Pollard Schindler's. One Leland Dunn. Well, this is a pleasant surprise, Mr. Dunn. But tell me, how did you know what I looked like? Well, Pollard Schindler's accent doesn't hamper his vocabulary, Miss Collier. Oh. He used the right adjectives, believe me. <laughs> I'd love to. But I can't, Mr. Dunn. Because Pollard Schindler never saw me in his life. All our business was done by telephone. Okay, my mistake. I'm Philip Marlowe, Lanny, and I want to know when we rendezvous at 44 Diamond Head Circle for the Cloak of Kamea Mayor. The cl- Look, you're no more Philip Marlowe than you are Leland Dunn. And if you need a reason, it's because I just left Philip Marlowe upstairs. Now, look, baby, there's only one Marlowe. That's me. I can prove it. I'll bet you can. Forged papers and all. I've already been warned to watch for imposters, so quit wasting both your time and mine and get out of my way. I've got things to do. Now, wait a minute, Lonnie. Listen. For? Proof that you're actually Kamehameha himself? No, thanks, mister. Goodbye. <laughs> two clues. One an obvious party who'd assume the name of Philip Marlowe and the other, Lonnie Collier. Less obvious, but more intriguing. So figuring the road company Marlowe would keep, I followed Lonnie. By this time, was getting into a long yellow convertible. Before I got to her, she lurched from the curb, so I ran across the street to what I thought was a taxi. But I was wrong. Because it turned out to be a chauffeured limousine and being helped in by a small, swarthy item of dubious lineage in a wrinkled cotton uniform was the Chinese in gay gabardine and Panama to match, who had been sitting near us in the lanai. What counted more was that he obviously sensed my problem. You all wish to follow the girl, sir? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a lover's batch. You know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Jola, quickly. Yes, sir. Uh, you know where she is going, sir? I'm not sure. Maybe Diamond Head Circle. Maybe it's leaning, sir. Oh, well, then let's make a diamond head circle. Is there a faster way there, a shortcut? Oh, yes, there is. Jola, okay. Jola, no, no, no. Which means what? Means uh, never mind diamond head circle. Drive fast to the factory instead. And do not move, Mr. Marlowe. Marlowe? Oh, heavy artillery. Okay, Fu Manchu, what's with the factory? You out of the way until the cloak of Kamehameha is mine. Which won't work, believe it or not, clever one. There's another Philip Marlowe who at the moment is a lot closer to that collection of fancy feathers than either of us. You lie. This stupid bit for freedom. Afraid they will not get you any... Get up! Look out! As we hit, I planted his gun and jerked the handle of the door and jumped. When I got to my feet, I was on the sidewalk and bruised, but better off than the China boy who was draped over the back of the front seat. A crowd that included a towering Hawaiian policeman who promptly told my host to shut up gathered in a hurry, so I ran for a cab, gave the driver ten bucks the address I wanted, and took off. The street on which Lanny Collier lived was a neat curving strip that rose sharply from sea level up into the shadow of Diamond Head itself. And we were there in less than ten minutes. Finding number 44 was something else. And another 30 minutes disappeared before we finally parked away from the place which was glass and cone of wood tucked deep behind a thick grove of date palms. I told the driver to back down the hill without using his motor. Then I slipped into the grounds and carefully moved toward the house until what I thought was the trunk of another palm stepped into my path. Fast. Stop where you are. At the top, which was over six and a half feet, there was a shock of flaming red hair. The whole frame was half covered in dirty yellow shirt, once upon a time white ducks and battered brown sandals. Who are you? Someone with an appointment to see Miss Collier. Why? You belong to this place? Yes, and this place belongs to me as well. All of it, Miss Collier included. She's mine to protect, you understand that? Malahini. Malawich? Malahini, greenhorn tourist, a kind that I hate. A kind that's ravaging all that's beautiful, stealing the islands from those they belong to. Take it easy, Red. I'm not here to stick your pretty island in my pocket when you're not looking. Well, I want his words with Lonnie Collier. You're like the rest of them, trying with cunning and deceit to turn ahead away from these shores and toward the mainland where you come from. I won't stand for it. Why don't we break this round table up and get to the house? I'm in a hurry. All right, all right. But I'm sure that Lonnie will be on my side. So sure, in fact, that we really shouldn't disturb the flower. Should we? Go ahead, we mother hit it! just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, this Wednesday night, Fred Allen will be Bing Crosby's special guest on Derbingle's CBS Half Hour of Laughter and Music. Earlier this Wednesday, the winner of the $1,000 prize in the Dr. Christian Prize Contest 
will also be announced by Gene Herschel, star of CBS's Dr. Christian Show. And don't forget that Groucho Marx and Burns and Allen will also be here on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe, and tonight's story, The Cloak of Kamehameha. A red-headed lunatic with a slow, soft voice and fast, hard fist took me by surprise. I wound up flat on my back before I realized he'd so much as moved. By the time I got to my feet and took after him, he was sprinting for a bamboo thicket and had a 30-yard lead. It was all he needed to lose me completely. When I finally untangled myself in the jungle, I came out on the road. But then I heard a motor behind me, so I dove for the underbrush again just as the heavy car roared by. I had seen it before. In fact, I'd been in it. It was the limousine that belonged to the Chinese. The back seat was empty, but the half-caste chauffeur Jolo was crouched behind the wheel like his life depended on it. Now, as I walked back toward the house, I saw that a door was standing open, spilling a shaft of yellow light across the dark grounds. I started up the walk when it came. <coughs> a second later, Lonnie Collier burst into the path of light and ran for the open door. I went after her, caught her by one arm, and spun her around. No, let me go. What happened? Why'd you scream, Lonnie? Back there. Back there in the pond, I heard a noise, and when I came outside, I... I found him there. Found who? Come on, show me. Oh, I know. I talked to him just a few minutes ago. And yeah? I gave him the cloak. No, it's gone. He's dead. He's dead with a knife in his back. There. Look there in the water. Oh, brother. Who is it, Lonnie? Do you know him? Yes. Yes, that... That's the Marlowe. crawled as Lonnie tagged the thing in the lily pond with my name. It was face down in the shallow water and three inches of crooked steel and the ugly curved handle of a chris stuck straight up between his shoulder blades. Somebody had made a very grim mistake, but it took five minutes of argument and a thorough checking of all the credentials I carried to convince the badly frightened Lonnie. I dragged the body out of the water and up onto the grass, and I went through his pockets. What did you find? A card. From the Hawaiian Island Art Products Company Limited, number 12, Harbor Street. Mean anything? No. Mm. No, I've never heard it. What's that on the back? Flight number and departure time of the plane I was supposed to take out of Los Angeles. Huh? Whoever he is, he's been one jump ahead of me all the way. Right up to your lily pond here. Tell me, was anyone with him when you gave him the cloak? A half cast and a chauffeur's uniform for him? No, no, he was alone. I... Oh. I gave him the cloak just as Schindler had instructed me to. Now, listen, Lanny, there was a down-at-the-heel redhead here just before you came out. He claimed to be a friend of yours. Yes, that must have been Lawrence Cochran, the poet. They're making him rugged these days, huh? Lawrence wrote one great poem years ago about two lovers who leap to death over the valley to keep from being separated and their souls turn into birds. It's still very popular here in the island. Yeah? What happened? Lawrence got the habit of drowning himself in gin. And now the natives call him Papuli. Papuli? The crazy one. Yeah, well, that's closer. He's always hanging around. My mother wanted me to marry him at one time, and now that she's dead, he, he thinks he should look after me. Okay, Lonnie, let him keep thinking so. What do you mean? I mean, you can use a good watchdog right now. Oh. So when Cochran comes back, make him park on your doorstep. You but... stay inside and be careful. With well, guys named Philip Marlowe getting knives in their backs, I've got a few things to do myself, but fast. Oh. I'd like to borrow that souped-up convertible of yours. Where are you going? Number 12 Harbor Street in the Hawaiian Island Art Products Company Limited. <laughs> Harbor Street was a narrow, twisting alley two blocks below King Street. A social sargasso where the derelicts of the Pacific quietly foundered and died. Built of the damp crevices between warehouses. However, number 12 turned out to be a practically blank wall. There was one small window high up, a door with a heavy iron grill over the glass on which Hawaiian Island Art Products Limited, I.K. Lee, president, was painted in small black letters, and a thin passageway blocked by an iron gate at the side of the building. A light burned inside, but the door was locked. So after I'd ruined my shoe shine and skinned all my knuckles, I managed to climb over the gate and edge down the passageway to the rear. I could hear water running marble fountain playing in the center of a walled garden as oriental as the forbidden city. I eased across its rigid daintiness to an open door, peeked in, and then reached for my gun. 
Because sitting inside of the sleek white mahogany desk was the Chinese in the Panama. Well, well, this is a somewhat unexpected turn of events. Please, be careful with that gun, won't you? You be careful, Lee. And you won't have to worry about the gun. Tell me something. Why'd you break your neck to get Kamehameha's cloak? You know what'll happen if you try to sell it? My good man, I can sell that cloak every day for the rest of my life. A few feathers at a time. Yeah? The world must be full of feather collectors. Oh, it is. I manufacture the beautiful feather lays that islanders wear on their heads. And while the bird is extinct, desire for its gleaming feathers is not... One or two golden mammal feathers in each lay. And instead of a mere hundred dollars apiece, I can get double that or triple. <laughs> now, do you understand, Mr. Marlowe? Uh, you know, you got things a little mixed up, haven't you, Lee? Lisa, how so? Your boy Marlowe is dead at Lonnie Collier's place. Oh, that. Uh, no, that was a Mr. Blake, an easily accessible gentleman I hired on Main Street in Los Angeles. <laughs> He only pretend to be you, for obvious reasons. Ah, oh, to intercept the feather cloak, huh? Yes. I've known all about Paula Chindler's plan since their inception. I followed every move he made. In fact, it was I who caused all your trouble on the way to the airport this morning, by means of a bribe to your driver. Too bad you won't be able to keep your nest lined with Kamehameha's bathrobe after all, Lee. Because I'm going to walk out of here with it, or big chunks of your face. Mm. You name it. Where's the cloak now? Oh. Uh, I gather from this that you do not have it, Mr. Marlowe. That's what's known as a shrewd observation. Mm. And uh, that uh, Mr. Schindler, as I suspect, has tricked us both. You're stalling, Lee. I'm warning you. Start talking. Oh, that is all I wanted to find out. You're a... Uh, that is uh, judo, oh. Mr. Marlowe. Almost like magic, isn't it? Uh. Yoro can break oh. your back if I tell him, Mr. Marlowe. You behave. Uh, Schindler has the cloak. No doubt about uh, it. So I must find him at once oh. with no interference from you, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, uh, Jolo, you have his gun. So lock him inside. I may need him later. From something I half cast it under my spine. At the edge of his hand, my, my legs were paralyzed. I felt like the practice dummy in a school for chiropractic. Every joint in my body ached when I moved. So I didn't move until the feeling oozed back into my legs. And I wobbled to my feet and looked around. It was a small high window I'd seen from the street. A heavy chair, a desk with a lamp, and something like a... like a picture framed in bamboo on the wall. I glanced at it and then looked back. Kept looking hard for a long, long time until I finally realized what it meant. The answer to the whole thing was contained in that bamboo frame. I had to get out and get out fast. I unplugged the lamp, plastered my back against the wall next to the door, and tapped on the lampshade to intrigue Jolo into coming in. It worked. When the knob turned slowly, I threw the lamp up at the window. The crash brought the door open with a jerk, and the jerk stepped in with my gun in his hand. What's going on here, Mr. Mark? Where, where are you? Answer! Right here, Jolo! <clears throat> Now get up, I got some magic to show you. A trick I learned in Kansas called the Haymaker. I ran down the hall to the street door and out to the car. There was no traffic problem at that hour, so I jammed the gas pedal to the floor and held it there right through the heart of Honolulu and up the twisting road that led to the mountains back of the city. The echoing roar of the motor as it tunneled through the forest lining the road was finally replaced by another roar. Wind. The unending gale that shrieks through a precipitous pass 3,000 feet above the city. A poly. I swung the car to the side of the road and ran the rest of the way. Out to where the rocks rose to a knife edge. They dropped a sheer thousand feet to the valley floor. Then I spotted them. Lonnie lying at the cliff's edge and standing over us. His red hair ripped by the wind with the mad island point. Drunk as a lord and flapping around his shoulders like a pair of huge gold wings was the cloak of Kamehameha. No, 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 don't weep, my love. I offer you the freedom of the blood. Come, Lonnie. No. No, let me go, Lonnie. You're mad. Oh, no, Lonnie. You're the mad one. To think you could sell your treasures and leave the island. No, no. Your destiny is here. No, no, stop it. Stop it, you murderous lunatic. I tried to warn Schindler, but the fool kept on. I killed his collier. The man you gave the cloak to 
hope to. And I kill a thousand times again to keep you here with me. You belong to the islands, Ronnie. Like this cloak and I. We must never leave. Come, come, it'll all be over soon. And our souls will turn to birds. And live forever in this paradise. Stop, stop. stop. Good black coffee in the morning sun oh. to make one forget uh-huh. an ugly night. Uh, right, my friend? Oh, you're absolutely <laughs> That's right. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, more coffee, Phil? Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks, Lonnie. Uh-huh. So, uh, uh, Lee was picked up by the Honolulu police, huh? Sure. I had it all set up. He spent some time in prison. Mm-hmm. And Jolo, too. Uh, by the way, he was still unconscious when we got to him. What in the world did you hit Jolo with, Marlowe? <laughs> Enthusiasm, mainly. <laughs> And that's when you got away and came up to the party, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Phil, how did you know it was Lawrence and where he'd be? Well, it's all tied with that one popular poem that Cochran had written, Lonnie. Oh? That anonymous letter you got in Los Angeles, Mr. Schindler, was a line from that poem. Oh, um... Kamehameha's cloak of golden feathers will bring no less than... How did you find that out, Marlowe? Well, you see, when I was locked up in Lee's factory, I saw a full copy of the poem on the wall in a little bamboo frame. Oh. When I came to that line, you just quoted. It stuck out like it was printed in neon. Uh-huh. See, for me, that Peg Cochran is the killer. Going on that hunch, I, I try to look at things from his angle. He was a murderer, sure to be caught, desperately in love, insanely possessive of everything he thought belonged here in the island. And he was an unbalanced lush as well. <laughs> rest of it figured, that's all. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. And when he was cornered, he went back to the one important thing that he'd ever done. Exactly, Lonnie. He was lost. Mm. So he identified himself with the hero of his poem and took that as the only way out. It's amazing. Yeah, truly an amazing thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a terrible thing, too, Mr. Schindler. Yeah. Well, we all got what we went after, didn't we? Each of us. Even Lawrence Cochran. Mm. planes to the mainland, and Lonnie said aloha and left to get ready for our date. I sat on the lanai of the hotel and watched the sweep of the Pacific from Diamond Head to the hills across the harbor, from the white sand of white to the green shallows over the reef, to the purple depths beyond. As a warm wind whispered through the palms, from somewhere I heard the soft strum of the ukulele. It suddenly occurred to me, what does aloha really mean? Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in tonight's transcribed cast were Wilms Herbert, Lynn Allen, Jack Crucian, Dan O'Herlihy, Byron Kane, and Peter Leeds. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a dead witness, a $100,000 bribe, the eyes of a beautiful dreamer and a corpse in a tool bin. We're all tied tight to the same thing. A fox's tail. This is 
is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The thick fog that clung to Los Angeles made searching for the girl who was going to kill herself slow and uneasy. But in the end, I'd have settled for that and more. Because murder happened twice before I found the lady in Mink. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Lady in Mink. By Pacific Coast time, it was only five o'clock in the afternoon. But the dense, billowing fog that was heavy over everything, like a huge, thick hand, said it could be midnight. And Los Angeles could be London and May, December. So when I got out of my car and walked toward the fuzz of red neon that marked the hotel cocktail lounge where I was to meet my new client, Grace Tyler, I felt all alone and a little sorry that I wasn't in some nice, cozy nine-to-five business that would leave me heading for home now. And maybe an evening with people who like to laugh. But when I was inside the lounge, which was imitation hunting lodge and friendly, I perked up some. My client was young and almost pretty, with dark shingled hair dressed in somber gray, and wore not enough makeup. Her eyes were swollen and red from crying. When I introduced myself, she tried to come right to the point. Mr. Marlowe, I, I have to find my sister. She... <laughs> oh, take it easy, honey. That won't do it. Who is your sister? I'm sorry. It's all right. Her name is June Drake, Mr. Marlowe, and she's in trouble. Mm-hmm. I got this letter from her. Here. Oh. Trap. No way out. Take my own life. Hateful people. This is to say goodbye. <laughs> Who's this Melnick she mentions? Do you know him, Mrs. Tyler? No, I, I never heard the name Melnick before. I'm Miss Tyler. Oh. My sister was the married one, Mr. Marlowe. Her husband was Stu Drake. He died a few years ago. I see. Have you been to the police with this? No, because... Well, you see, Mr. Marlowe, June is... She's different. More full of fun than I am. And, well, she gets around and sometimes the strange people. Dangerous ones. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Grace, what does your sister look like? Well, she's about my height. Has long red hair and she's pretty, Mr. Marlowe. Very pretty. Mm. Aside from her looks, anything else? Car, clothes? Clothes, yes, definitely. She always dresses well. Except that she's overly fond of furs. Most of the time she wears a mink stole. Stole, huh? Kind of a cape? Yes, it is. I see. June has an apartment in Beverly Hills, Mr. Marlowe. 3,300 wrecks for drive. Mm -hmm. I went there, but it was locked. The neighbors say she left for New York a week ago, and yet I... I... Yes, she couldn't have because this letter was mailed here in town only yesterday. Is that it? Yes. Oh, please, Mr. Marlowe, do something. Here. Here's $50. I'll pay more if only you'll hurry. No, that'll do it. Where can I get in touch with you, Grace? I'm staying here at the Beverly Crest Hotel. I don't live in Los Angeles. Well, as a starter, I think I'll try number 3300, Rexford Drive. I'll call you later. Goodbye, Grace. Outside, the fog felt about the same. But there was more of it, so I was 15 minutes getting to June Drake's apartment, which was a ground floor arrangement. Hardy and about the size and shape of the ale bowl. I was only half that time outsmarting the cheap lock on the back door, drawing all the blinds shut inside and turning on a single light. But then I was no place. There were clothes in the closets, prettier ones in the bureau drawers, and it went on like that for 45 more minutes. Everything just as it should be and no lead. Until I was ready to leave. Then on a coffee table, I saw something that stood out in that nest for the idle rich, like an ear-to-ear grin on an undertaker. It was a book of matches advertising Duke Gray's Billiard Academy, third in Maine, where particular pool players congregate. <laughs> that and the name Melnick had to dovetail or I was licked. The next hour was a lucky one. I found the Duke himself for both new and despised Melnick, whom he described as a hardly ever sober dirty word, front name Frank, who lived third floor rear at the Palace Arms. A tired walk-up also on Main Street. So at exactly nine o'clock, I walked the length of a filthy corridor, stopped and knocked the knuckles on my right hand almost raw. 
before the door inched open. And a pair of shifty eyes and a puffy, pasty face blinked out at me. Yeah? What do you want? If you're Frank Melnick, conversation. I'm not dressed for it, honest. This isn't a social call, Mr. Melnick. Hey, what do you think you're doing, shoving your way into my room? Who do you think you are? Name's Marlowe. I'm looking for June Drake. June Drake? I don't know any June Drake. Honest. You don't convince me, Melnick. Now shake the fuzz off your brain and start remembering, or you'll find yourself in trouble up to your eyebrows. Okay, okay, I know her. When'd you last see her? Three weeks ago. Maybe a month ago. But she's an acquaintance from my hometown, that's all. Honest. You're a liar. June Drake would brush you off like a piece of lint and you know it. Listen, I'm as good as she is any day. Don't, don't forget that. Get your hands off me, Melnick. Now, get out of here. Go on. I told you once, Melnick. Let go. (laughs) Okay, now start talking. Give it to me straight the first time or I'll get real mad. Come on, get up. Okay. There's a guy named Jaffe. Hugh Jaffe. He's June's boyfriend. That's all I know. Honest. All right. What's this stuff, these clippings and these pictures here? I used to be a photographer. Honest. Until your lens got bloodshot, huh? Yeah, on the Salinas Herald Star. All right, Melnick, what's Hugh Jaffe's address? It's 2001 North Beachwood Drive. Thanks, I'll try it. But if you're not telling me the truth, Melnick, I'll be back. Honest. Yes. You want what, senor? I, uh, Mr. Hugh Jaffe. He is not here. I am Margarita Jaffe, his wife. What do you want with him? A few words, Mrs. Jaffe. Do you expect him soon? Since he does not live here anymore, no. Oh. You and Hugh are divorced, then. I didn't know that. And I did not say that. Now, what are you looking for? June Drake. Ju- what do you want to know about that? I want to know where that is. Can you help me? No, I cannot. I do not know and I do not care. But when you find her, senor, I hope you find her dead. If I'd have followed the approved technique, I'd have lost a leg on the lady's threshold. And I was about to lean on her doorbell again to try once more for an address on Mr. Hugh Jaffe. When I saw I didn't need to, because stuck over the mailbox was a letter forwarded to him at 41 Peacock Lane, Brentwood, California which was a half-hour drive due west of Hollywood. Thirty fog-filled minutes later, Hugh Jaffe and I exchanged introductions and I stated my purpose. Then I stumbled behind him through a two-inch thick rug that ended in an oak panel library where he cigared me, then settled back and waited. We looked at each other until it became embarrassing. Then he opened. Marlowe, I wish I could help you, but I haven't seen or heard of June Drake in over three weeks. Well, I was under the impression that you two were on closer terms, Mr. Jaffe, if you don't mind my mentioning it. Not at all. He used to be, but all that's changed now. She was too expensive for me. A lovely creature, but terribly vain. Now that she's out of the picture, you're going back to your wife. No, I'm not. Frankly, Marlowe, uh, my, shall I say, infatuation for June has completely destroyed everything Margarita and I ever had. Which I suppose makes divorce the next step? (laughs) Sure, I wish it were that easy. She refuses to give me a divorce, Marlowe. Her way of striking back. Yeah, I know what you're getting at. I had a brief chat with Mrs. Jaffe myself. Well, if you uh, hear from June, get in touch with me, will you? I'll appreciate it. Of course. I'll be happy to help in any way I can. And please, Marlowe, uh, call me if you find her, hmm? The number here is Crestview 89122. Yeah, I'll remember it. Even if I find her dead. Dead? What do you mean? Why that? Well, from where I stand, Mr. Jaffe, June Drake is dynamite. And that stuff can blow up right in your face, huh? When you least expect it. Good night. Sure, it was double talk, but sometimes swinging wide and praying for a lucky punch beats waiting in your corner. Besides, that was as far as I could go on the book of matches. So after slowly walking a block through the chilling fog, I found a phone, called my client, and brought her up to date on the Jaffe Triangle and my own contention that if June Drake didn't try actually to kill herself, Senora Margarita Jaffe might. That grace wouldn't buy. No, no, Mr. Marlowe, I I can't believe that. Well, maybe you just don't want to. But either way, there's still Frank Melnick. <laughs> We've already met Grace, and believe me, he's got all the charm of a black widow spider. What does this Melnick do, Mr. Marlowe? I mean, what work? Yeah, he's a drunk. He used to be a photographer for some paper, the uh, Salinas Herald Star. Salinas? Yeah. Why, Mr. Marlowe June used to live in Salinas when she was married to Stu Drake. You sure, Grace? Positive. Grace, how did June's husband die? Stu? Yeah. He was killed in a car wreck. 
drove it over a cliff. Mm-hmm. June just got out in time. Nobody knew exactly how it happened. It was a terrible accident. Maybe. What do you mean, maybe, Phil? Well, you might as well face it, honey, because the chances are slim that that's the whole story. What? Look, Grace, suppose... Well, suppose something else happened, like... Like June being responsible for Stu's death. Oh, no. Yeah, and Melnick, the photographer, with a picture to prove it. You know, a small case of blackmail. Oh, no. No, Phil, you're wrong. She wouldn't kill. I know that okay, she would Okay, okay. She's your sister, honey. I'll, I'll do the dirty guesswork for both of us until we get some proof. And right now, that makes back to the hacienda of one senora Jaffe my best bet. Because the lady there is both jealous and hot-tempered. A daily double that always runs in the money. So long, baby. I got back to my car and pointed at a 2001 North Beachwood Drive again. I was feeling pretty low because no matter which way I added things, June Drake always came out a minus, which wasn't good. A sometimes lady had a real sweet sister. But then I told myself it was still the fog making the good look better and the bad worse. And to concentrate on my driving and the facts I had to go on. When I did just that, I took my foot off the accelerator and slammed it down under the brake hard. But it suddenly occurred to me that I was going the wrong way. Because if I was right about Frank Melnick being a blackmailer and June Drake a killer, the senora would keep a lot longer than the drinking man in the Palace Arms, third floor, rear. I was only three quarters of an hour getting back down to Main Street, but even as I started up the foul-smelling rickety stairs, a small voice inside kept telling me that I was too late. But a second later, as I moved quietly toward Melnick's door, two other voices, not so small, and coming from the room in question, said otherwise. Said that Melnick was still around and as healthy as ever. But better than that, that his guest was the lady my client was paying me to find. The lady named June Drake. All of which made this a good time for my right hand and the thirty-eight in my pocket to get together while I listened carefully. Then moved closer until I was next to the door. Oh, an empty gin bottle. What was that? I don't know. Outside in the hall. Open up, Melnick, before I blast my way in. Come on. Marlowe, get out of here, Jim. Okay, wise guy, wait a minute. For what? The ladies' exodus, I warned you, Melnick, get back. Hey! Hey, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? Looking for June Drake, remember? Now, where is she? What are you talking about? I'm alone in here. Yeah? You always talk to yourself in a high voice, don't you? That window to the fire escape there is always open on foggy nights, too, isn't it? Listen, smart guy, I want to know where she... Wait a minute, the smink stole here. Maybe it doesn't matter where she went. Maybe she'll be back after she thinks I'm gone. I don't think so. You see, Mr. June Drake never left. She's right behind you, stupid. Yes. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... You'll find both pleasure and a chance for profit when you listen to Sing It Again, CBS's hour-long Saturday night cavalcade of melody, riddles, and prizes. Your chance for the greatest prize in radio, $53,000. When Sing It Again comes your way over most of these same CBS network stations later tonight, be sure you're listening. $53,000. It might be yours. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Lady in Mink. Maybe June Drake could use the spiked heel of a shoe, maybe the butt of a pistol, but either way, it didn't matter because on the way to the floor, I'd bounced once off the sharp corner of an end table, and this was why all the lights in the world had gone out for me at once. Now, as they blinked on again one at a time, and I dragged myself hand over hand along the length of an iron bedpost until I was standing, I saw there was blood oozing from a cut on the right side of my face. But as the two rooms focused into one again... I forgot about the slightly battered Marlowe and concentrated instead on an open newspaper lying at my feet. Because written across it with an eyebrow pencil and firm but feminine hand were the words, Grace, call off your private detective. It's too late to help me. I'm near the end. But before I go, I'm going to take the two people with me who will break my life. Goodbye, June. At that, I started for the door in a hall phone to call the police. But then I stopped. Conscious for the first time of the half circle of hushed, gaping faces in bathrobes that stood in the doorway. The gaping faces that weren't turned toward me, but over to a shadowed corner where, face down in a pool of his own blood, was the dead form of Frank Melnick. In the middle of his back, an ice pick. 
Red to the hilt. Lieutenant Ibarra's office. Sergeant Mooney speaking. Marlo Mooney, where's Ibarra? He had to go out of town. Oh. Well, look, Mooney, I'm at a place called the Palace Arms on Main near Fourth. Third floor rear. There's a man named Frank Melnick with an ice pick in his back. Very dead. Know who he is, Marlowe? Yeah, an ex-newspaper photographer. Drunk and, I think, a blackmailer in reverse order. Any idea who did it? Uh-huh. One June Drake. A red-headed lady in mink. Was out to kill herself just as soon as she tidies up her affairs a bit, which I think includes killing again. So if you'll put out a call for her... The mink, by the way, is a cape. The lady, young and about five six. I'll try to get to what I think is her next stop before she does. Call you later. I got through to my client and broke the news. She gasped and kept repeating no in a small, strained voice that kicked at the lining of my insides no matter how fast I talked. So in one breath, I told her that I was going first for Margarita Jaffe, then her husband, either of whom could be next on June Drake's final agenda. Then I gave her the Crestview phone number that Hugh Jaffe had given me. Told her to call me there in an hour, hung up and ran for my car in 2001, North Beachwood Drive. Feeling punk. It was a minute better than midnight when I got there, and it was ten wet, dripping minutes more before the door finally opened. A hatchet-faced housekeeper with a stocking on her head said that Mrs. Jaffe had left a half hour ago, saying something about meeting a woman. And the housekeeper would have said more, but I was already back in my car heading for Brentwood in number 41, Peacock Lane. There, the Oriental houseboy said the boss man was busy playing poker in the den. And something stronger than Esperanto, I made it clear that my business was more important. A minute later, a door opened on the far side of the room. Excuse me, gentlemen. Yes. Oh, God, God. <clears throat> Well, aren't you working a little late tonight, Marlowe? Murder isn't always done during office hours, Mr. Jaffe. Murder? Yeah, with an ice pick at that. Tell me, have you heard from your wife or June Drake tonight? No, of course not. Why do you ask? Because June Drake just killed a man named Melnick. Killed a man? What? It... That's what, Mr. Jaffe? That's hard to believe. Why? Because it was a man? What were you expecting? Don't be absurd, Marlowe. I was expecting nothing like this at all. It's a shock to me, it... Yeah, excuse me. I'll take it myself, Jung, in the dining room. Be with you in a minute, Marlo. All right, Mr. Jaffe. Make it fast, will you? Love to listen on telephone. Joan, listen to me. You don't know what you... Wait a minute. There's a private detective here. I think he's listening in on the extension. It doesn't matter anymore. Nobody can stop me now, Hugh. I... I'm leaving tonight. I only call to let you know that you don't have to worry anymore, that I won't be any... Never mind that. Where are you, June? Tell me. I'm out in Santa Monica, the Ocean Way Hotel. But don't try to do anything, Hugh. It's too late. Much too late. Goodbye. Mm Hmm. Pretty talkative. Well, you heard that, didn't you? Yeah, I heard it all right. You heard that too, didn't you? I didn't like it, Jeffy, so... Oh, don't bother. This one's mine. I'm expecting it. Hello? Hello, I wanted to... Oh, is that you, Marlo? Yeah. Look, Grace, your sister just called and... Oh, dear. Well, it doesn't look too good, honey. Oh, Grace called here. Oh, but Phil, where is she? Do you know? Is she all right? No, no, she isn't, Grace. What? Any way you look at it. Oh. Now, tell me, where are you? Oh, at my place, the Beverly Crest Hotel. All right, now stay there. I'll talk to you as soon as I can, Grace. Goodbye. Oh, but where are you going? Thanks for your cooperation, Jeffy. It's been a lot of help. I'll also talk to you as soon as I can. Believe me. When I got outside, piled into my car and took off, I didn't know if I was racing to keep a mixed-up girl from committing suicide or going after a murderer who was scheduled to kill again. I was 20 precious minutes following the wriggle at Sunset Boulevard from Brentwood to Santa Monica, where it hits into U.S. 101 that parallels the Pacific. And out there with the fog even thicker, I was 20 minutes again finding the Ocean Way Hotel. The landlady there was a fat henna blonde with a mouthful of gold and foul language. She said that she never heard of a June Drake until I lied that I was an L.A. cop and described the girl as a lot of red hair flowing over a mink's toe who could be using any name. Then she told me that what I called June had just been a woman visitor a little while ago. At that, we started down a short corridor to a rented room, fast. I, I wouldn't do this for no one but a cop. Brother, believe me, we both better be talking about the same girl. Raising a fuss at this hour of the night. It's a room there. No light on. I thought you said she had a visitor. Maybe the visitor went home. What do you expect? Two o'clock in the morning. Mm, not a peep. 
Come on, open it up. Open it up. Now he tells me. He's got my keys are over on the other side in my room. Okay, and then we'll get in the hard way. You cut it out, you'll bust my door. Take it easy, Blondie. You're in for a shock. Oh, dear. Okay, turn the lights on. Oh. That, that's the woman that visited her. Yeah. Spanish woman known as Margarita Jaffe. Ice pick and all. I better get a little air over here by the window. I don't feel so good. Yeah, and I better get to a phone and... It is a cigarette over there. It's still smoldering. She may not be very far away. Mother, you said a mouthful. Come here and look. What is it? What do you see? Right there. Near the pier under that street lamp. Ain't that the one you're after? Where? Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Red hair and mink stolen. She's seen us. Right out to the end of the pier. She's running. Call the cops. Blondie, sit tight. I'll see you later. By the time I got out to the street and across the way we'd seen her, she was already out onto the pier. I caught one glimpse of her red hair and then nothing but the fog that swallowed her up like she was made of smoke. I ran toward the spot where she had disappeared and tried to yell over the crash of the waves for her to come back when I heard it. <laughs> After that, things happened fast. From somewhere, the cop on the beat, then Blondie, then a couple of scared kids who'd been necking in a car, and then more. Uh, I knew it. Oh, I knew it. I saw her pass me a couple of minutes ago. Dressed too nice. I should have stopped her. Mr. Mr. Cheejump? Yeah. Officer, shine your light over there, will you? I thought I saw something move. Oh, okay, but in this fog, we won't be able to see much. Besides, with those waves in the undertow around here, she hasn't got a chance. Maybe not. You never can tell. Hey, hey, move the light over a little. To your left. Yeah, that's it. There on the piling. I don't see nothing there. Just a greasy pole. Here, look. On that cross piece near the water line on the piling. Was that hers? Yeah, that was hers, all right. What is it, mister? That blondie's a very valuable fur. A stole made of mink. I never could figure where people came from at three o'clock in the morning when something nasty happened. But they always do. Some come to help, some just to stare, and others maybe to see if they can take it. An hour after I'd heard June Drake scream, we'd found nothing but the stole. I couldn't take any more. Maybe it was still the fog. Maybe... Maybe it was the thought that in the hotel room up in Beverly Hills, a sweet kid named Grace Tyler was waiting to hear from me, and I knew that sooner or later I had to call her. I lit a cigarette and started to walk across the ocean way in the nearest phone. But then, just as I was about to enter the hotel lobby, I stopped. And slowly turned back toward the pier in the swirling cloak of ocean-covering fog. A crazy thought seeping into my mind like an ever-widening circle of ink into a white blotter. Until finally there was nothing but dark. I made my call to Grace and told her to get downstairs into a taxi and over to police headquarters where we had a long story to tell. An hour later, we were sitting in Ibarra's office and Sergeant Mooney knew what had happened from the time I had first met Grace at five o'clock that afternoon. Well, Marlowe... Looks like June Drake meant what she said in that note. She took care of Melnick, Mrs. Jaffe, and then herself. Did they recover the body before you left? No, Sergeant, they didn't. And I don't think they will. You mean the undertow? No, I don't. I mean something a little more treacherous. What are you saying, Phil? That this whole thing was a frame, Grace. The interested parties, Hugh Jaffe and your sister, June. The object, get rid of the difficult Mrs. Jaffe. The means, have June Drake kill her without keeping her intentions much of a secret and then... Have June Drake pretend to kill herself. The result? The police never bother looking for June Drake, and when all is forgotten, June and Hugh Jaffe get together in some other city under some other name. Oh, no. No, Phil, I don't believe that. I don't believe any of this. I can't. I won't. I don't believe... Hold it, please, Uh, Miss Tyler. I'm sorry. Go on, Phil. Well, this part's a guess at the moment, but I think it'll hang together. Mrs. Jaffe wouldn't give Hugh a divorce. Jealousy? Yeah, that and one idiosyncrasy. The senora was crazy about money, and since he was doing the running around, a divorce would cost him much more than he was willing to pay. Which means that although Miss Tyler here hired you, you fell into the stellar role of the patsy, the Mm. star witness. Would always be close enough to later tell a story they wanted told, but never close enough to actually catch June Drake, who has already murdered twice tonight. Right. Then, Marlowe, big question. Where is June Drake now? That is something I worked on all night. I almost had the answer once. I almost caught June at Melnick's flat in the Palace Arms because I surprised her. She thought I was going to Mrs. Jaffe's house at the time, but I changed my mind. Remember, Grace? What? Oh, you must remember, baby. 
you were there. You're June Drake. Well, Phil, now that we've picked up Hugh Jaffe and it's all over, I still don't see how you actually knew that Grace Tyler and June Drake were one and the same. I was lucky, Mooney. When Grace called me at Hugh Jaffe's house right after she called as June, I heard a bellboy in the background over the phone. But I didn't think much about it at the time. Yet Grace claimed to be at her hotel in Beverly Hills. It wasn't until I began to think of the whole thing as a frame that everything fell into place. The clues planted so I couldn't miss them all the way down the line. The book of matches, the mink, the red hair was a fall. And another thing, Mooney. Hugh Jaffe was much too surprised when I told him that June Drake had killed Melnick, a man. He expected the murder of his wife, Margarita. Well, why did June kill Frank Melnick? Because he was blackmailing her. You see, Melnick knew that June had murdered her first husband. June was stuck. She couldn't let her future husband know what had happened to her past one. So she included him in as victim number two. <laughs> Besides, that's the only final payment she can ever make to a blackmailer. Uh -huh. Then, Marlowe, June Drake is the real person that never actually was a sister named Grace Tyler, was it? No. No, I guess there never was a Grace Tyler. Ever. Good night, Sergeant. Outside, it was that strange time. Between the end of one night and the beginning of the day that follows. When I looked up, I could see that the thick, heavy fog that had been with me ever since I'd first met the woman called Grace Tyler was lifting, breaking apart, so that here and there it was only thin, spiraling wisps above which there was the pale, gray promise of a nice tomorrow. As I walked along, it seemed to me that there was less and less fog until by the time I'd gone a few blocks, I was sure that I could feel fresh air cold against my face and clean. I figured I might walk until the sun came up. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Lillian Bayef, Edgar Barrier, Whitfield Connor, Anne Morrison, Lou Krugman, and Jimmy Eagles. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... An iron skull was their trademark. Their business was climbing walls and it was all done on wheels at 70 miles an hour. But that was a cinch for the death cheaters until they felt murder with a feminine touch. Sunday is a day when CBS brings you the tops in comedy, but it's also a day when you'll find big-hearted Danny Clover patrolling the Great White Way. Broadway is my beat, says Danny Clover, and every Sunday he brings you a new adventure along the main stem. On CBS Sundays, you'll also find Dashiell Hammett's one and only Sam Spade cutting another of his famous capers. Broadway is my beat, and the adventures of Sam Spade are regular Sunday features on most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. An iron skull was their trademark. Their business was climbing walls, and it was all done on wheels at 70 miles an hour. But that was a cinch for the death cheaters until they felt murder and a feminine touch. <laughs> From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with...
with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Feminine Touch. It was five minutes to five when I turned off Sunset Boulevard and drove between the two wrought iron gates set in a stone wall that hinted none too subtly at the exclusiveness of the Bel Air Estates. I followed a gently curving street bordered by dignified rows of meticulously manicured palm trees as far as number 4412. There I turned onto a white driveway, moted over an acre of rigidly disciplined landscape to a house that could have doubled for Buckingham Palace, where I ground to a soft stop and got out. Bel Air was the soul of peace and serenity until I started across the drive to the front door. A motorcycle, jet propelled by a black-haired lunatic in a leather jacket with a blonde beauty riding behind him. A handlebar missed goring me by inches. I picked myself up, mumbled a few choice words, and went on to the door. I followed a butler through the house to an aviary in the rear, where my client, Mr. Baldwin Granville, putted with a flock of exotic birds in a big wire cage. He looked right at home, a penguin in sport clothes, with the yellow, staring eyes of an owl. Come in, Marlowe, but watch the gate. The birds are all upset. Uh, did you hear that mechanical outburst a moment ago? Hear it? I was almost run over by it. A jerk and a batty blonde dame on a motorcycle. Who were they? Uh, the driver was no doubt one Pepper Riggs, which is all I know about him. However, the batty blonde, as you put it, is my daughter, Adrian. Oh, your daughter, huh? Yes, yes. 23 and already out of school two years. Uh, the best schools, of course. Mm-hmm. Still, it's been one crazy scrape after another. Now it's motorcycles and uh, <clears throat> something even worse, I'm afraid. That's why I called you. Now, look, Mr. Granville, I'm no truant officer. Have you or her mother tried simply talking it over with her? We uh, lost her mother in 33. And Adrian refuses flatly to discuss things with me. I've tried everything from bribery to threats. How about trying to be a father? I'm 20 years late for that. Always been too busy making money. Now I'm worried. I think she's infatuated with this Pepper Riggs. Well, there isn't much I can do about that. If she wants to break her neck on a motorcycle, I can't do much about that either. Uh, You can do something about this. It came to me in this morning's mail. Adrian hasn't seen it yet. Oh? Hmm. Keep your daughter out of our hair. Make her lay off Pepper Riggs, if you know what's good for her. I mean it, Lou Bryan. Who's Lou Bryan? I have no idea. But Adrian's in danger, Marlowe. Well, I'll do what I can. Got anything else to go on besides two names in the motorcycle crowd? No. No, that's all. But Marlowe, listen. Hmm? It may sound strange to you, but everything I've worked for all my life means nothing to me now. I have finally realized that Adrian is all that really matters. Don't let me down. Something close to grief glistened in the old man's yellow eyes. But he hardened up again while we settled the matter of my fee, 100 bucks. Then he hurried me on my way. I figured Pepper Riggs was a wild man, so my first step was a check off of the L.A. dirt track circuit, a wild man's game, if ever there was one. The fourth stop I made paid off. A track manager told me that Pepper was a used-to-be bike racer, all right, but that he quit and was while working at the Redondo Amusement Pier as a wall climber. When I found out what that was, it made the dirt track routine sound about as dangerous as an old lady's quilting bee. It was 9.30 when I got out to the Redondo Pier, wandered through the concessions until I found one with a corny label. The Wall of Death. It looked like a barrel, 30 feet in diameter and 20 feet high, with a grandstand over it and a picture poster in front listing hair-raising shows, 8, 10, and 12 p.m., featuring Pepper Riggs, the death cheater, with lovely Mickey North, and smiling Lou Bryan, the one who had written a letter to my client. Whatever Adrian Granville was mixed up in, the answer was here. I walked around the big barrel to a shed in the rear. A light was on, so I went to work. Hi, Looking for somebody? Yeah. Yeah, you're Pepper Riggs, aren't you? My name's Marlowe of High Spot Magazine. I, I've got a feature lined up on your act. Experiment? Sure. We can talk while I finish shaving. Shoot. How fast do you travel around that wall? Slip under 60 and you drop. It's no life for sissies, buddy. Any little thing goes wrong up there on the wall and it's curtains. Figures. Is this your bike here? Yeah, the one with my name plate on it there. Uh-huh. I see you carry a little iron skull tied to the handlebars. Kind of grim, isn't it? 
It's my trademark, buddy. I've been knocked off the wall seven times in the last three years and beat old Skullface every time. No kidding. That makes for a nice, quiet future for your fiance. Fiance? Yeah, yeah, Miss Granville. Gonna take her into the act with you? Could be, buddy. Could be. What do your partners think of that? The girl, Mickey North, and Lou Bryan, I mean. Is there gonna be room for everybody? You know something, pal? I don't think there is a magazine called High Spot. Really? <laughs> I better make a note of that. Yeah. Adrian warned me your old man be sending a private eye around. So now that I've caught your act and it's corny, I've got a message for you. Lay off, because Adrian's old enough to know what she wants. Okay. And I've got one for you, screwball. See that she lives long enough to enjoy it. Get out, you... Come on. When he shoved me out the door, my first impulse was to shove back in again. But then I heard the spiel for the 10 o'clock show starting out in front, so I decided Pepper Riggs would keep. I walked around the room to where a red-faced barker lashed the crowd with every known simile for danger as he whipped up excitement for the act. I stepped up close to listen. An absolutely vertical wall. Just Hadley's wall it is. Don't push it, folks. Show starts in 15 minutes. Come in and watch them cheat. Hey, Sam, take over for me, quick. Robert. You won, Phil. When the red-faced barker stopped, his eyes had been fixed on a little man in grimy overalls hurrying across the midway. He jumped down from the platform and ran after the little guy, so I pushed back through the crowd and followed him. The red face caught up with the grimy overalls at a hot dog stand, grabbed him by one shoulder and spun him around. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, Moon, I want to talk to you. Oh, oh. You a motorcycle mechanic or a primarana? Where you been? I, uh, I slept in, I, I guess, Mr. Hadley. Yeah. You must have been real tired after last night. Last night? Why, what do you mean? Don't stall with me, Moon. I saw you coming out of the bike shed at 2.30 in the morning. What are you doing in there at that hour? Going over the bikes. I'm sick and tired of taking the blame for Lou Bryan. He's holding back. He says it's because his bike ain't right, but that's not true. He's turning yellow. That's what, and I'll prove it, too. Uh, keep that kind of talk to yourself. Oh, but, but, but it's true. Pepper told him the same thing. Lou Bryan's lost his nerve, and he's holding back. Those bikes are identical. Same make and same model. They're both in tip-top shape. And I'm through taking the blame for a guy that's turned yellow. That's what do you all. have, man? Want something, Jess? Uh, yeah, a couple of coffees, bud. You, mister? Uh, yeah, a hot dog. Nothing on it. Yes, sir. Right up. Now, listen, Moon. You're a good mechanic. I don't want to fire you, but there's trouble cooking around my show, and I don't like it. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Oh, sure, sure there's going to be trouble. You're blaming me, but you ought to blame that dizzy blonde that Pepper's mixed up with. That Adrian Granville. She's the day... Hey, you big ears. Huh? This is private conversation. What are you tuning in for? Pass a mustard, little man. And keep your greasy thumb out of it. You got secrets, you ought to know better than to broadcast them. Yeah. Thanks for the advice. Yeah, go soak your head in it. Skip the coffee, Bert. Your place is crawling. So long, figures. I watched Jess Hadley and Moon walk away, and then I went back to the wall of death, bought a ticket, and climbed the stairs of the gallery at the top of the 30-foot motor drone. The house lights were on, but in the half-darkness at the bottom of the big bowl, I saw three motorcycles in the open trap door. The gallery was nearly full. But it only took one glance around the ring of faces at the lip of the bowl to spot her. She had insolent eyes and wide, soft, red mouth, and her hair tumbled in loose, blonde waves over the shoulders. A shimmering white silk shirt, very wide open at her throat. I moved up beside her and leaned on the rail. Why don't you go home, Sherlock? I can't use a watchdog. You flatter yourself, Adrian. I'm here only to case a setup. If it includes your broken neck, that's just another item in my report. Is that right? Hmm. Well, you're pretty, so I'll make it real easy. Set up simply this. I like to go fast. Motorcycles do that for me. So does Pepper. That satisfy you? Not quite. You got the curves, baby, but somebody else has the angles. Meaning what? Well, these professionals might resent an amateur moving in. <laughs> you think I'm an amateur, Mr. Marlowe? I'll compete with dear little Mickey North on any basis, curves or angles. I got Pepper, didn't I? Now I'll have her stop in the show, if I want. How does all this set with Lou Bryan? Lou's excess baggage, but strictly. Pepper's been carrying the whole show for a week. Oh, I got the house So it's been nice, Sherlock, but that makes it time to run along, doesn't it? No, I think I'll stick around, honey, whether you like it or not. Suit yourself. But don't stick too close. You might get run over. When a floodlight over the center of the drone flashed on and filled the deep bowl with a dead white glare, the 
performers climbed through the trap door in the bottom, closed it behind them, and mounted their bikes. With the first roar of the motors, Adrian gripped the railing and stared down. Her eyes glistening with fascination. And now, Jeff Cassie presents the just Peters in a hair-raising exhibition of riding skills. Performed at 70 miles an hour on a vertical wall. Starring Chuck Barry with lovely Mickey Knox and smiling Lou Bryan. It was Lou Bryan who led off, starting slowly at first, around and around the sloping base of the bowl. Pepper Riggs watched him for a moment, then looked up, waved at Adrian and grinned, while Mickey North glanced straight ahead. There was no smile on smiling Lou Bryan's face either as he whirled past her and past her around the drone. The bowl began to tremble with every revolution as the speeding motorcycles raced over the boards and rose higher and higher on the vertical wall until finally it was only five feet from the ring. Then suddenly from somewhere a black smear fell out on the white under the tires. A smear that grew with every turn it was oil. A second later it happened. The back wheel skid as the bike swung down the blue lines to control it was something alive. And then it fell. Move along, folks. Come on, bring it up. Lou Bryan was dead long before they got him through the trap door and into the ambulance. And watching him fall had put a freeze on my mind that took 20 minutes thawing out. But when the fundamentals of addition went to work again, I started looking around. And just in time to see Moon, the mechanic, barreling a 1930 flivver for all it was worth, out of the parking lot and heading for the highway, lights out. I ran to my car, piled in to take after him, when something long and yellow smashed into my bumper. Can't you see where you're going? You took the words right out of my mouth, Adrian. You timed it perfectly, didn't you? Timed what perfectly? That block. So Moon, your grease monkey assistant, could put a few miles behind it. Adrian, Adrian, what happened? Marlowe. Yeah. Don't worry, Riggs. Adrian here did a lovely job. Our bumpers are braided. What? You know, I'm getting a little sick of you, Marlowe. You'll have to get sick of Speedy. Because I'm going to find out exactly why Lou Bryan died tonight, and you're going to answer some questions. He died because the oil line broke. Yeah, it happens all the time to wall climbers. It was a tough break, that's all. Oh, sure, sure. Now, look. Just in case you two didn't know, Lou Bryan objected to you, Adrian. So much so, in fact, that he wrote a letter to your father threatening to rough you up if you didn't lay off. From where I sit, somebody beat him to the punch. Guess who? Listen, Marley, you're running off at the mouth. You got something to say? Say it. Right out, like a big boy. Okay. Riggs, Lou Bryan's death was no accident. It was cold, premeditated murder. Tie that on your handlebars, death cheater. <laughs> Just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, the greatest jackpot in the history of radio, $54,000 in prizes and cash, awaits the CBS listener who can solve the mystery of the Phantom Boys on our Saturday Night Sing It Again show. $25,000 may be yours in solid cash, plus $29,000 in marvelous prizes. There's also a host of splendid smaller prizes waiting for you listeners who can crack the riddle song. So be around. So be around for Sing It Again tonight when it comes to you for a full hour on most of these same CBS network stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Feminine Touch. I turned without another word and walked away slowly until I was out of sight. I ran for the drome on the off chance that I could find Mickey North and a lead on Moon. I found her alone and on a bench in an almost dark, out-of-the-way corner of an amusement pier. Half watching a couple of hungry seagulls who didn't know when it was time to go to bed circle overhead. I introduced myself and got around to what was fast becoming my only point. The hunch that Lou Bryan's crack-up was no accident. I... I can't believe that, Marlo. Why not, Mickey? It adds... Lou Bryan figured Adrian was breaking up a great act. Figured she'd driven a wedge between him and Pepper. And, uh, Pepper and you. Yeah, but that's not reason enough for Adrian or Pepper to kill Lou Marlowe. Well, by its lonesome, no. But there was more, Mickey. Lou Bryan didn't intend to take all this lying down. For one thing, he sent a threatening letter to Adrian's father to keep her away. Then, Marlowe, you're saying that Adrian... And or Pepper Ray scheduled an accident for Lou Bryan... And then, Mickey, there's Moon. You know, he shoved off without so much as now I'll be back in a minute right after Lou cracked up. Tell me, Mickey, 
You have any idea where Moon could have been heading? He was pointing away from L.A. No, I don't. Mm. Except, of course, his own place. He has a little shack on Ocean Avenue, number 41, over in the oil field. But look, Marlo. Maybe Moon's responsible for everything. He and Lou didn't get along, you know. Yes, I've heard. Also, Mickey, I've heard that Moon was around the bikes unusually late last night. What? Moon around... Marlo, it must have been Moon then, alone. Sure, what's the matter with me? Papa wouldn't do a thing like that. He's too good, too decent and nice to... Still love him, don't you, Mickey? No, I... I don't. He means nothing, Marlo. All right, honey. Let's call it a tie for the moment. It's Moon alone or the triumvirate Moon rigs and Adrian Granville, right? Yeah, I guess so. Mm-hmm. Nobody else had any reason to kill Lou. If you're sure that's what happened. Are you, Marlo? Dead sure? Just about. Ask me again, honey, after I've checked the fire site at number 41 Ocean Avenue. By then I may know more. <laughs> I got back to my car. Adrian's convertible was gone. And the pleading that had been my right fender, which said that she'd left in a hurry, cost me ten minutes of stress and strain before my front wheels would turn in either direction without chewing rubber. Then I was another ten getting to the intersection of U.S. 101 and Ocean Avenue, which turned out to be a paved semicircle of grime, twisting in between a dozen nodding oil well pumps that had never heard of the eight-hour day. I got out of my car and started to move quietly toward the sagging collection of scrap lumber, unpainted and unpleasant. That was number 41. When the sudden splash of a pair of headlights sweeping my way fast sent me sprawling for cover without so much as a reason why. I was glad that I had because it was yellow, long, and convertible, and behind the wheel and alone, Miss Adrian Granville. I took that as my cue to stop sleuthing and start worrying about a guy named Moon. I moved up to his shack in a hurry. When it showed no light and no answer to my loud knock, I closed one hand tight around the thirty-eight in my pocket and the other over the knob on the door, which wasn't locked. Inside, there was only shabby furniture of a scarred linoleum. And in the middle of the wall opposite me, another door half open. I started for it, and what I could almost feel was going to be the too quiet form of the elusive mechanic. And the sound behind me that was not the work of the wind brought me to a dead stop. Move one inch, mister, and I'll kill you. And to think I was worrying about your health... You shouldn't have bothered. I feel fine. But you won't if there's any monkey business. I'll drop your gun. Come on, fast. That's better. Now, what are you doing here? Wondering why you were dumb enough to let that Granville brat talk you into murdering Lou Bryan for a price? You're off your rocker, Phil. I didn't drop Bryan. I got no money from the baby either, only Gab. Gab that kept me from packing and getting out of here. That's a lie. I've got a photostat of a check for 10000 that's made out to you and signed by Adrian Granville. Turn on the light, Buster. Look for yourself. Check for ten grand? Yeah. I don't figure how my name could get out. Hey, this ain't no check. Oh, my mistake. Here. It is. And more. Okay, okay, okay. Come on, get up. I'll tell you the truth, honest, huh? We'll see. First verse. If you didn't kill Brian, why are you running? Because Lou and I didn't get along and just hardly knows that I was around the bikes last night. So what? Well, so sometimes people start putting things together too fast. It gets other people in trouble. I know it's happened to me before five years once on a lousy frame. How unfortunate. Yeah, but... What about Adrian Granville? What's she want with you, Moon? I-, I don't know. Unless she belongs to the lady's handkerchief I found near the bikes last night. Did you say it was hers? We, we, we didn't get that far. She ran off... Well, we heard your car turn off from the highway. That's how come I got the drop on you. That figures. But what doesn't figure, Moon, is why you're still holding back. Well, so maybe we ought to bounce the mechanic around some more, huh? What do you say? No, please, come on, no, do we keep this no, up? No, Get on, Miss Hart. No, 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 please. All right. Quit, 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 will you? Let me alone. I'll tell you, I'll tell you everything. Lou was always beefing at me. Whenever Pep to call him yellow for not riding right, he took it out on me. Said I didn't keep his bike in shape. So I decided to do... So what? What's the matter? Outside. There, Marlo. A gun. No! When Moon grabbed at his chest with both hands, swung in a half arc and pitched forward on his face, I yanked at the light cord in the middle of the room and then threw the door open. The only noise I heard was the starting roar of a motorcycle about 50 feet away. I forgot about being careful and ran out into the street and toward what was fast becoming an increasingly smaller silhouette of I couldn't say who... When I returned to the shack and found Moon dead, I ran for my car, piled in and kept a heavy foot on the gas until I was back at the amusement pier where I figured I might find a team of Granville and Riggs standing around like nothing had happened. 
When I got there, I found just that. Out on the pier was Miss Moneybags herself, walking slowly away from Pepper and Mickey and toward the hot dog stand. When I was next to her and about ready to grab on and start yelling cop, I saw something else. Something that didn't sink in right away. It was a tiny iron skull on an iron chain, swinging from the gold charm bracelet she wore on her right wrist. If you're taking inventory, Marlo, make it fast, will you? The next show starts in a couple of minutes, and I'm going on in loose place, and I don't have... it there on your wrist, Adrian. It's a miniature of the one Pepper has on the handlebars of his bike, right? Right. His trademark. What about it? Does that hang all of us? No, it just hangs one of us, if I'm right. Goodbye. It was only a hunch and a screwy one at that, but... As I ran past Mickey and Pepper, who stared at me like my nose was on fire and headed for the shop out in the back where I knew I could find the bike that Lou had been killed on, I gave myself a 50-50 chance of being right. But when I was inside the place and next to the twisted jumble of steel that had once been a motorcycle, the odds jumped from there to sure thing. Because when I passed my fingers over the chrome handlebars, I found that they were not smooth all the way. In the next second, I knew more. I was not alone. I jumped from the bike, reached for my gun, and wheeled around the wrong way. Oh. oh. When I started back for this world, there were only two things in it. One is sharp, searing pain the length of the right side of my face, and the other, the crazy thought that since I was still alive, I had to get to the drone and stop Adrian Granville before murder happened again. <laughs> and around to the front where I saw that the rider's trap door entrance was already closed and that the act was about to begin. And as I heard the motors roar and a voice announced that Adrian and Mickey were going to ride together, I spotted Jess Hadley at the top of the stairs that led onto the spectator's balcony. I took the dozen steps up to him two at a time and as the house lights faded and the floods over the riders came up, I grabbed them and shouted that we had to stop the act while the bikes were still only getting underway or death would get star billing again. What are you talking about, Milo? Why did I have late? How do we stop those bikes? I don't know, Milo. They can't hear a thing down there. Well, it ought to be something they can see. Get to the house lights, Hadley, and turn them out. We're going to shoot out the overhead flood. No, Milo. You can pile the girls up. Get going, Hadley. I'm going to shoot. No, Milo. Stop! Well, Marlo, before she blacked out, the police say Mickey admitted wanting to get Pepper because she was crazy jealous of Adrian. But they haven't got it straight yet about Moon's death and exactly why Lou was killed by mistake. How'd that go? Well, it went two ways, Hadley. One, Mickey fixed Pepper's bike so that the oil line would give. Do you get it? Mm-hmm. Then Moon, convinced that Lou had gone yellow, switched the bikes to prove that Lou's constant complaint about the bikes was simply an alibi. Mm-hmm. But here's the joker. He switched right into a double play. <laughs> Lou Bryan got killed instead of Pepper. Mm, but then, after the crack-up, Moon knew that it should have happened to Pepper. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. But for a lot of reasons, he didn't want to stick around and talk it over. When he was about to tell me the truth, Mickey shot him. Mm. Because if you knew the bikes were switched, you'd look for someone with reason to kill Pepper, not Lou. Huh? Correct. And once I did know that, there was only Lou and Mickey. See... I picked Mickey because, for one thing, her motive was stronger. And for another, Moon found a lady's handkerchief near the bikes. Mm. So... Uh, Marlo, uh, you come out here, please. Oh, all right, Mr. Granville. See you, Hadley. Yeah, Marlo. Catch the act some night when we play it straight. Still a good show. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm a lucky man, Marlo. The doctor says Adrian's going to be fine in a few days. She wants to see you now, but uh, it can only be for a moment, you know... Frankly, Mr. Granville, a moment's about all I can take. I don't exactly like your daughter. Now, 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 Marlowe, none of that, please. Mm. The poor child's not well. Besides, she she wants to apologize to you and uh, give you my check for a hundred dollars. Now, go on, boy. Go on. She's calling for you. Okay. Hello. Marlowe, I want to ask you a question. And, of course, apologize. I, I'm sorry. Hmm. What's the question? The iron skull on my bracelet. What did it mean to you? Oh. Well, it was a reminder that Pepper had one dangling from the handlebars of his bike. And that if Moon had switched bikes, which was a wild thought at the time, that which was called Lou's bike would have a worn spot on the chrome handlebars where the iron chain had rubbed. And it did. Now my turn. 
You told Pepper, and in particular Mickey, that I was all excited about something, didn't you? Yes. Why do you ask, Bill? Because I was wondering how Mickey knew where I was so that she could come down and play crown the private detective. Oh, Phil, she could have killed you. Yes, yes. But then when she didn't, I could figure that she'd given up and only wanted time. To crash her motorcycle into mine when we were high on the wall. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. All the way around. Now, if you please, my check and goodbye. Hmm? Check? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yes. Here. Here it is. For all that you've done for me. Hey, cut it out. You're supposed to be sick, Adrian. Get back in bed. Oh, Marlowe, I'm not any sicker than you are. That's just to keep Daddy from blowing his top. Now, come here, silly. I'm all right. You sure? I'm positive. Good. Right. Bill. <laughs> That's all I wanted to know. Now, across my knee, your oh, daddy oh, should have gotten her out of this a long, long time ago. No! No! I kept swatting her where I figured it would do the most good. Until daddy, two doctors, and a nurse came in, and then I recommended that my client consult a child psychologist for his daughter, and a full-grown one for himself, and I left. But by the time I was outside, I'd cooled off some. And it was then that I remembered I had carelessly shoved a hundred-dollar check which belonged in my wallet into a side pocket. When I took it out and unfolded it, I saw that it was all in order. Names and numbers correct. But then, as I started to put it away, I saw something else. On the back, and scribbled in pencil. P.S. Working with a private Sounds like much more fun than motorcycles. I'll be at your office first thing Monday morning. Signed, Adrian. Hmm. I turned around and started back to the hospital. This was not going to be. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Barbara Eiler, Ted Von Elts, David Ellis, Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, Paul Dubov, and Peter Prouse. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was only a gambler's marker, a promise to pay worth a thousand bucks, and I was hired to find it. Yeah, that sounded easy, until I realized that it meant the whole future to two men, freedom to a third, and death to the girl in the cottage. Sunday will be Mother's Day, and the boy with the neighbor's prize rose in his lapel and a box of cigars under his arm will be Mrs. Benny's little boy, Jack, ready for his idea of a proper Mother's Day celebration. For an unusually hilarious Mother's Day session with America's only 39-year-old child prodigy, hear the Jack Benny Show Sunday on all of these same CBS network stations. It was only a gambler's marker, a promise to pay worth a thousand dollars. And I was hired to find it, which sounded easy. Until I realized that it meant the whole future to two men, freedom to a third, and death to the girl in the cottage. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Promise to Pay. It started over a bottle of port at five o'clock in the afternoon, when Mama Nodella, a proud old lady who ran a restaurant... Bet me I couldn't prepare a dish of chicken cacciatore. I never pass up a bet. So at 5.30, I picked up a can of chicken, and at 6, had gone to work on it. 
At a quarter after seven, everything was ready for the pan, and my enthusiasm was at a high ebb until the telephone rang. And what I thought was a check call from Mama Nodella turned out instead to be Garfield Randall. He was a used-to-be client who at 32 was currently setting the L.A. business world on its ear. Say, hello, uh, did you see the article about me in this morning's paper? Young Randall, probably next head of Continental Land and Trust? Yes, that's it. Chairman of the board, isn't it, Gar? Yes. Job I've been after for two years. So? Well, it's a job that'll go to somebody else at noon tomorrow, Phil. Unless you can get me out of a nasty mess I'm in. What's her name? Uh, Terry... Du- <laughs> How did you know it was a woman, yeah, It's Phil? a trade secret. What do you want me to do? Well, uh, come over here to my place, 91 Laurel Canyon, immediately. Mm-hmm. I'll explain then. Uh, you can make it, can't you, Phil? I, I mean, now, right away? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Right away, Gar. But it hurts. Arrivederci, cacciatore. Oh, come in, Marlowe, quickly. I'm due there at eight, and it's, it's almost that now. A uh, small point, Gar, but just where is there? Oh, uh, Terry Dodge's cottage over in the valley, 3840 Sunswept Drive, mm. uh, just beyond Arthur Murray's place on Ventura. I'm expected because the lady wants $20,000 to keep her mouth shut. About what? The fact that a few days ago, an innocent evening with some new friends ended up with me gambling and losing $1,000 at Paul Naylor's club on Lancashire Boulevard, also in the Valley 3100 North. I didn't have the cash on me, so he took my IOU. Your marker would interest who in particular? (laughs) Only the entire board of directors of Continental Land and Trust. They feel their executives should be above that sort of thing, even once in a while. Mm Mm-hmm. And this Terry Dodge, can she prove that you lost a thousand gambling? Well, according to this message here, yes. Came a few minutes before I called you, together with my picture, which she returned, frame and all. Here. No. Oh. God, dear, I gave Naylor the thousand and pick up your note as requested. But now I'm confused. Do I give it back to you or submit it to your board of directors tomorrow? <laughs> oh, by the way, the chinchilla we saw last week is on sale. I hear only $20,000 we bought right away. Probably cost more tomorrow. See what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Drop around and see me at 8 tonight, will you? I'd like your advice on the matter. Much love, Terry. P.S. Don't worry about the safety of the note, darling. I have the perfect hiding place for it. Hmm. Tender, huh? <laughs> Tell me, Gar, how close were you in this vampire? Oh, we went together for about a year. But it was getting cold. Because you've been on the way up? Because she's been on the way down, Marla. Hmm. Why'd you give her the money to deliver in the first place? Well, you see, Phil, I... I couldn't afford to go near a gambler like Paul Naylor once I'd been nominated for the chairmanship. Mm-hmm. Of course, I didn't suspect for a minute that Terry would do anything like this. So, when I didn't hear from Terry by six, I called Naylor. He told me that she had already delivered the money, but uh, he also told me that she'd burned the note in front of him at his suggestion. Which might mean that Terry Dodge is just bluffing, you know. Yes, or that Paul Naylor is just lying. Mm. Your job, Phil, is to find out the truth as soon as possible. And if I do and the note does exist, what then, Guy? Then I pay. I have to. It's my whole future. Yeah. Call you in an hour, Guy, from the valley. <laughs> After Randall generously settled the matter of my fee with two crisp $100 bills, I got into my car and wound through Laurel Canyon into the San Fernando Valley in Sunswept Drive, where I parked away from number 3840, which was the kind of all-alone green and white ivy-choked cottage that life insurance ads wonder if you'll own when you're 65 and out of work. With one exception. The place was lit up like opening night at a Hollywood delicatessen. And when I got close to the front door, which was half open and splashing bright yellow over the matte-marked welcome... I heard a radio from someplace deep inside, playing slow, sad swing. When I knocked twice and got only more Dixieland for an answer, I walked in, calling Terry Dodge's name out loud as I moved through the empty living room. I couldn't tell why, but even as I said the name, I had the uncomfortable feeling that I I was wasting my breath. And a minute later, when I entered the bedroom, I was sure of it. Because there, every drawer, closet, and cubbyhole had been turned inside out. And in the middle of all that, and face up on the carpet, was the still form of a beautiful blonde woman in a black silk hostess gown. The monogram in white over her breast pocket said she was Terry Dodge. The ugly circle of dark red on the side of her head said she was dead. 
Next to a body, I found the pieces of two airline tickets for Mexico City. Beyond that, the brass candelabra that had killed her. I dropped the tickets into my pocket and then went back to the living room and a telephone called my client. But when I reached for it, it went off. Hello? Hello, t- Who is this? Friend of the family, why? Oh, I'm curious by nature, friend of the family. Now, is Terry there? Yeah. She can't come to the phone right now. Any message? Yeah, there is. Tell her Rip Stranigan wants to talk to her, if you don't mind. I don't. Oh, Terry. It's Rip Stranigan. What? Okay. Sorry, Stranigan. She'll have to call you back in a minute and... And what? And excuse me, but an unexpected visitor just dropped in. A beautiful one at that. With a gun. Which she knows how to use very well. The lady was tall with dark eyes and darker hair. It framed her face the color of warm honey, and she was wearing something white and plunging, which from the waist up had all the material in it of the average necktie. Who are you? Rip Stranigan. Mean anything? Only that you're a liar. I've seen Stranigan, and in the first place, Terry's boyfriend's an ex-football player about twice your size. Oh? Uh, Also, he's from Texas, and you couldn't be. No. And just between us, you're much better looking. So once more, who are you? Little boy blue, who are you? Me? Well, I'm Annabelle, Terry's sister. Always come home with a thirty-eight in your hand? Well, I only use this gun, Mr. Blue, because I thought you were a prowler. Now, with the radio off so you can concentrate, how about the truth, hmm? All right. I'm a private detective named Philip Marlowe who came here to talk to Terry Dodge. When I found the door open and nobody home, I decided to wait. Now I can't wait any longer because I'm late for an appointment. So if you'll tell Terry I call, I'll appreciate it. Good night, Annabelle. Uh, wait a minute before you go, one thing. What's that? You were wrong about being little boy blue. Oh? You're prettier. Good night. My ego sent the lady went for me. But my professional cynicism labeled her local Matahari and suggested that I keep both feet on the ground. So when I was out of her sight at the front door, I tried the oldest trick in the book, which was opening it and then slamming it hard from the inside, which worked. Because when I quietly moved back to where we'd been standing, she was already in the bedroom. And I was glad to hear surprised at what she'd found there. When she ran back into the living room, her face now the color of wet ashes, grabbed for the telephone and dialed a number that was more than the three digits that would bring the police. Hello? I was close enough to hear what she this said. This is Maxine. She's dead. Yes, in her bedroom. And the place has been turned upside down. So somebody else is after that note, too. No. No, only a private detective named Marlowe. Well, he didn't act like it. Said he was waiting for her. I'll tell you all about it later when I see... What? Keep looking. Listen, maybe you didn't understand me. Terry Dodge is dead. She's been murdered. Well, Maxine Rossi doesn't want to be standing around with jam on her face when the police arrive. It's hard on the reputation. Well... All right, one more look around, but believe me, it'll be a fast one. Goodbye. When she hung up an inch back toward the bedroom like it was a snake pit, I headed for the door and kept going until I was outside and over to where I'd left my car parked in the shadow of a huddle of dwarf palms. But then as I was about to get in, what I thought was just another tree reached out with both hands, grabbed me by the lapels, and slammed me hard against the side of my own car. Before I could get back onto my feet, what had to be the ex-gridiron great from Texas had both my gun and my wallet out and... I was smiling with more teeth than I'd ever seen before. Well, a friend of the family is a private detective, I see. Yeah, and the athlete's a scholar. He reads. Shut up, Marlowe. Smart aleck talk won't get you out of this. Now, what were you doing in my girl's apartment? Looking for a blackmailer named Terry Dodge. And before you get all worked up muscles, make up your mind. You want the truth or hot air out of me? You got a lot of nerve, fella. Doesn't answer the question. All right. I'll take the truth. But if there's anything but that, I'll break you in two. Now start talking. Why'd you call Terry a blackmailer? Because until tonight she was up to a mascara and a deal that called for a man named Garfield Randall to pay her 20,000 bucks to keep his future intact. I don't believe you. I never heard her speak that name. Proves the point, Stranigan. They've been going together off and on for a year now. What? Why, just last night Terry told me that she didn't even want to see any other man. And as of last night, that might have been the truth. But a few hours ago, this Randall got his framed picture back from her with interest. The demand for the $20,000? The same. Stranigan, what would you say if I told you Terry Dodge has been murdered? Oh. No. Oh. No, Marlowe! Hey, you. You're lying! Stranigan, let lying. go of my throat! Lying! Let's throw to your head! Let go! Hey. Uh, I'm 
Sorry, uh, fella. <laughs> do you... Do you have any idea who did it? Yeah. Yeah, but there's... There's still a little groundwork to be done before... Before I go to the police. You mean... Nobody knows about this yet? <laughs> Outside of a girl named Maxine Rossi. Someone she... Talked to on the telephone and the murderer? No. Now tell me, Stranigan, did you... Did you hear Terry speak of either this Rossi girl or a gambling note that a guy named Paul Naylor held? No. No, I didn't, Marlowe. But where do those two fit in? That Stranigan comes under the heading of groundwork. Now, if you can keep all this under your sombrero until you hear from me again, I'll take my gun and wallet and get going. What do you say? I say yes. On one condition, Marlowe. When you do get to the killer, I'll get first crack at him. Fair enough. Now, where can I reach you? 4812 North Ogden Drive. You think you'll need any help? I don't know. Paul Naylor's my next stop, and according to the talk downtown, he's a hard man to get next to. I'll call you later. The club Paul Naylor ran out on North Lancashire didn't have a name, but the numbers 3100 were taped with luminous scotch light and easy to find. However, unless you knew the man behind the peephole, you were nowhere. So 20 minutes later, when I was out of my car and walking toward the steel-plated back door, I decided that getting in to see the head man of the house had to be approached like that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. I stayed in the shadows of the building, moved a slow step at a time, until I saw a little oily man in a pink shirt, white knit tie, and fuzzy black fedora nearby noticed me. Then I moved faster until I was at the steel door, and so was he, with a forty-five in his hand. Lost something, mister? Uh, uh no, I was, uh... Hey, what's the gun for? Trespassers, these are private grounds. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I'll leave right away, I thought this Never was... Never mind the... what you thought. Now get over there, stand very still while I make a phone call to the inside. Phone call? What for, cops? <laughs> no, stupid, the gentleman who lives here, Mr. Paul Naylor... I think he'd like to talk to you while you can still talk. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, a man who knows something about cars makes a better driver than a man who's completely blank about what's underneath the hood. And in the same way, a man who knows something about our American economic system is able to be a better citizen than a man who hasn't any idea at all about what makes the wheels go around. Understanding our system of mass production enables one to feel renewed pride in the high standard of living this kind of production has helped provide. And it's understanding, too, that enables us to work at some of our system's defects, like sharp ups and downs in prices and jobs. So read, study, listen. And with all of us working together, we can increase our productivity still further and provide for even wider distribution of benefits. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Promise to Pay. The oily little man in the pink silk shirt spoke briefly into the phone then breathed garlic in my face while his free hand darted neatly inside my jacket. When it came out, it brought my thirty-eight with it. Then he jerked me around, unlocked the heavy back door, shoved me through, and marched me on the business end of his forty-five down a strip of blue carpet ankle deep to another door of glossy, blonde mahogany. He slammed me face first up against it and then signaled for an audience. When the door swung open, he prodded me. I stumbled into an office of jungle green drapes and pale beige furniture upholstered in leopard skin. The face that peered at me over eight feet of desktop smiled from the ears down. From the ears up, it had never known what smiling meant. We have a front door for our friends. I know. That's why I went to the back. I figured I'd pick up an escort there and bypass all that muscular red tape you keep out in front. <laughs> maybe that's smart figuring, maybe not. Depends. What do you want? Call you a liar, Naylor. Oh! Mind your manners, stupid. You're way out of line. You're building up quite an account, Oily. You take some long chances, mister. What's your name? Marlowe. I still want to know why you lied to a friend of mine about burning his marker. Marlowe, huh? Wait outside, Quincy. I'll call you. Okay, Mr. Miller. All right, Marlowe. So you're Randall's boy, right? I've talked to him. When Randall called you, you told him that his girl, Terry Dodge, had delivered the money okay, but... 
But you saw her burn his marker. That's what I thought I saw at the time. What'd you really see? She put the marker in her purse and started out of here. But I called her back and told her to burn it. Why? Because I don't like my name floating around Marlowe, especially now with things tightened up like they are. So she went over to the fireplace there and burned a piece of paper. But it wasn't the note, huh? Ah, right boy. That call from Randall gave me ideas. I checked the pieces left in the fireplace, and they weren't even the same kind of paper as the marker. So somebody's shooting an angle, Marlowe, one with my name on it. I don't like that. I suppose you got the marker back all right. Not yet. However, I intend to. Mm Mm-hmm. But on your first try, you got too rough too fast. And kill Terry before she talk, is that it? You know, if I were you, I'd bite my tongue off before I'd say a thing like that. Even joking. Who's joking? Girl's been murdered your way. Smart people die every day. Lots of ways. Yes. Well, thanks for the information. Good night. Sit down. Wait a minute, Naylor. The interview's over. Not quite. What's Randall steamed up about? Blackmail. Which puts you both in the same boat. If I get the marker to protect him, I have to protect you at the same time for an oyster charge. Let's be sensible. Sensible? Uh, okay. Quincy? Yeah, Mr. Naylor? Going out. Sit on Marlowe here. Real hard, if necessary. Till I get back. Sure. It'll be a pleasure, won't it, Mr. Marlowe? <laughs> Oily straightened his tie and sat down opposite me, humming to himself. Then he unfolded a racing form, tilted his chair back, and apparently forgot about me. He was a perfect setup for a very old gag. Because the two back legs of his chair were perched on the far edge of a green hook rug that I could reach easily. His eyes okayed my request to light a smoke, and then dropped my matches. I bent down to get them. I grabbed the rug instead and yanked hard. <laughs> Couldn't resist, could you, sucker? I'm faster than I look. Uh, come on, I should have known. Fell 100%. Now I got an excuse to work you. Wait a minute. Naylor will want to talk to me when he gets back, Stooge. You'll be able to talk. Only maybe you won't think so good. Get back there in the corner. Go on, move. That's it. Now turn around and face the wall. He kept the 45 pointed at my middle even while he shifted it to his left hand. And he dipped his right into the side pocket and brought it out, clenched around an ugly set of brass knucks. There was a tight knot in the pit of my stomach as he started toward me. <laughs> I just made up my mind to try for his gun regardless when I heard it. <laughs> when I turned and looked, Oily was sprawled face down on the floor and sprinkled with chunks of shattered crockery and standing over him like a victorious gladiator was Maxine Rossi. Marlo, I... Came as soon as I found out you were in here. He is so vicious, this Quincy. Not at the moment, baby, thanks to you. But I don't get it. There's no How time did you... for talk now. Come to the roulette table as soon as you can. Hurry, darling. I watched her slip through a side door. Then, <clears throat> rolled Quincy over, got my gun back in its holster, and all of seven seconds later went out through the same side door. It opened into a lush room, 50 by 50, checkerboarded with people bunched around evenly spaced gaming tables. I moved toward the click of a roulette wheel and found Maxine there throwing blue chips around. With a subtle recklessness that meant she had a fortune to squander or that she was a shill for Naylor. How's your luck, baby? Still holding? Uh Uh-huh. It is so far. But it may change any instant now. Yeah, well, I guess it's my turn then. Come on, I'll pick up some chips. Ten black. Marla, we gotta get you out of here. You work for Naylor, don't you, Maxie? Yes, but not like I work for you, Marla. Oh? He sent you up to Terry Dodge's place tonight find out what she wanted with that marker. Mm. And it was Naylor you called when you found Terry's body, huh? Yeah. He just left Marla not a minute ago. Fifty double O. Where was he heading? I don't know. But one of those scraps of paper that wasn't burned in the fireplace. It was a telephone number of a travel agency on it. He had that with him. A travel agency? Yeah. That might be the one shot I need. Listen, Maxie, I... Uh-oh. The boys have got me pegged. They're moving in. I was afraid of this. Wait till the lights go out, darling, and then run for it. The lights? Baby, I love you. What about you, Maxie? Don't worry. My father was a longshoreman in San Francisco. I don't know how to get She walked slowly as far as the back corridor, then started to run. And as the two gorillas angled toward the room toward me, I pretended to study the odds on the crap table while I edged for the door. They were almost up to me when the room went suddenly black. And a girl, Maxie. I ducked low and belted to the front entrance all stops open. And a few seconds later, I was outside. I put 50 yards between me and the front porch before I so much as slowed down. When I did, I saw something else. Paul Naylor himself across the street just getting into his car. I pulled my gun out and ran for him. Hey, Naylor! Uh, Marlo, how did you get... 
Say, what's going on? I want that phone number you got in your pocket. Phone number? I don't know what you're talking about. That's too bad because I don't have time to explain. <laughs> Five minutes and all of five miles later when I stopped at a gas station and climbed into a phone booth to call the travel agency number on a half-burned piece of paper that I'd taken from Paul Naylor. I was sure now that at least I'd get an answer to fit the two airline tickets to Mexico City. But the girl who answered the phone exploded that dream with her opening line. Good evening, Canadian and Northern Railway Agency. Canada. It didn't make sense. On a hunch, I shot a girl with a description of Terry Dodge and hit pay dirt on the first try. A woman who matched it had made a reservation that afternoon to leave for Canada at midnight alone. But then the girl asked me a question. And the answer to that made my next stop my client as fast as I could get there. The drive into Laurel Canyon and up the twisting trail they called the road put some new gray in my hair. But before I got to Randall's house, I pulled over, parked, and climbed the rest of the way quietly on foot. A long brown convertible that wasn't Randall squatted under the bushes beside the house. I crossed the patio and went in through an open That's window. What I, said, Randall. I could hear voices, so I inched along the back hall to an open house. study door and listened. And don't try anything cute, buddy, or I'll break you in two, and I mean it. Well, what do you say? Give me the money, and I'll give you that marker. Well, I. How do I know you've got the marker? Where did you get it? I killed that double crossing girlfriend of ours, sweet Miss Terry Dodge, to get it. That's where. What? You. You. You mean Terry's dead? Yeah. We were pulling this deal together and then going to Mexico. But she got greedy, was going to get the money and take off for Canada alone. So now I'm doing it alone. Get the dough, Randall. Time's short. Wait, I... I want to see the marker first. Well, sure. Hand me that picture there. That's right, pretty boy. The one Terry sent back to you today. Well, come on. All right. Here. Thanks. Hey, what are you... What? The marker. It was behind my picture all the time. Yeah, Terry was real smart. And so was that blabbermouth Marlowe. He tipped me off to the whole thing when he told me Terry sent this back to you today. The marker wasn't any place else, so it had to be here. And here it is, Randall. All yours. For 20 grand. No. No, I won't pay it. I had to pay Terry blackmail for that note, but I won't shield the killer. All right, Randall. Have it your way. But I'm walking out that front door, and that means i got to leave you dead on the floor. Randall, that... Not this time, Marlowe. Oh, Marlowe, that... That was awfully close. Never mind that. Come on, let's get him. Oh, you missed him. Yeah, stay here. I'll get him. I... Oh, my car. I left it halfway down the hill. It'll be ten miles away the way he's driving before I can get to it. Well, he's got to be good to drive those roads that fast. Yeah. Phil. He went over. He was going too fast to get around your car. He went over. Yeah. And if anybody ever had it coming, it was Rip Stranigan. All American. By the time we got down to the crash, the canyon was swarming with people. An ambulance and two prowl cars wind in, and 30 minutes later, the mess was all cleaned up. The police verdict was speed on a dangerous road, and the doctor's forecast was DOA. So Randall and I went back to his place and spent another 30 minutes over some much-needed brandy while I told him everything that had happened. Great, Scott. And it seemed like such a simple thing, Phil. Mm -hmm. Pay a gambling debt and get the market. Yeah. It's hard to realize all this happened just because of that. Well, that plus the fact that you let a pair of nasty characters get you in a spot. Yeah. It's also hard to believe that they're both dead now and it's all over. Mm. Oh, and you, you did a wonderful job, Phil. I had some wonderful help from Miss Maxine Rossi. Uh, oh, there's a kid with lots on the ball, believe Say, me. Hey, do you think she got away from Naylor all right? With her talent, you can count on it. <laughs> but just to play safe, I'm going to let Mr. Naylor know his hands off or I'll see his joint rip wide open. I'd sure like to help, but I, I've just sown my last untamed oat. Yeah, I think so. Well, you're in good shape now. Boys at headquarters are reasonable. I'll run along and tell them what they need to know. Okay. Oh, oh Phil, uh, just uh, one thing first. Hmm? Uh, when you called the agency, the, the Canadian Railway, you said the girl there asked you a question, and that's why you came up here so fast. What did she say? Oh, she wanted to know if I was the tall gentleman from Texas with the nice teeth who had inquired earlier about the lady's reservations. Uh -huh. And he got all upset, which, of course, could only mean Rip Stranigan. And that explained the tickets from Mexico, the murder of the ransacked house, and all the rest of it. Oh, I see. You know, the more I think about it, Gar, the luckier you get. Good night. Happy board meetings. <laughs> It 
was two o'clock in the morning. And the thought of my kitchen littered with dead chicken, raw rice, and the jumble of spices practically turned my stomach until I opened my apartment door. And then, one step at a time, I got it. The delicious odor of chicken, gacciatore, cooked to perfection. The sight of a gleaming table set in candlelight. The sound of a cork being pulled from a bottle of wine. And all done in a fine Italian hand. The hand of a longshoreman's daughter from San Francisco. And then, a startling idea hit me. You know, if Maxine Rossi could only... But she can. You know this is dangerous? Oh, brother... Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Bill Johnstone, Betty Lou Gerson, Barney Phillips, John Daner, and Jack Crucian. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure to be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... When it started, the tide was high on the San Pedro waterfront. And a hot-tempered kid had murder on his mind. But there was a knife at my throat, a beating under the piers, and a corpse on the beach before the tide went out again. And the kid was finally stopped. (laughs) 